Section 21 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 30. Francis I and the Reformation, Part 1. Nearly half a century before the Reformation made any noise in France, it had burst out with great force and had established its footing in Germany, Switzerland, and England. John Huss and Jerome of Prague, both born in Bohemia, one in 1373 and the other in 1378, had been condemned as heretics and burned at Constance, one in 1415 and the other in 1416, by decree and in the presence of the council which had been there assembled but at the commencement of the sixteenth century luther in germany and Zwingle in switzerland had taken in hand the work of the reformation and before half that century had rolled by they had made the foundations of their new church so strong that their powerful adversaries with charles v at their head felt obliged to treat with them and recognize their position in the european world though all the while disputing their right in england henry the eighth under the influence of an unbridled passion as all his passions were, for Anna Boleyn, had in 1531 broken with the Church of Rome, whose Pope, Clement the Seventh refused very properly to pronounce him divorced from his wife Catherine of Aragon, and the king had proclaimed himself the spiritual head of the English Church without meeting either amongst his clergy or in his kingdom with any effectual opposition. Thus, in these three important states of Western Europe, the reformers had succeeded, and the religious revolution was in process of accomplishment. In France it was quite otherwise. Not that there too there were not amongst Christians profound dissensions and ardent desires for religious reform. We will dwell directly upon its explosion, its vicissitudes and its characteristics. But France did not contain, as Germany did, several distinct states, independent and pretty strong, though by no means equally so, which could offer to the different creeds a secure asylum, and could form one with another coalitions capable of resisting the head of that incohesive coalition which was called the empire of germany in the sixteenth century on the contrary the unity of the french monarchy was established and it was all throughout its whole extent subject to the same laws and the same master as regarded the religious bodies as well as the body politic in this monarchy however there did not happen to be at the date of the sixteenth century a sovereign audacious enough and powerful enough to gratify his personal passions at the cost of embroiling himself like henry the eighth with the spiritual head of christendom and from the mere desire for a change of wife to change the regimen of the church in his dominions francis i on the contrary had scarcely ascended the throne when by abolishing the pragmatic sanction and signing the concordat of fifteen sixteen he attached himself more closely to the papacy the nascent reformation then did not meet in france with either of the two important circumstances politically considered which in germany and in england rendered its first steps more easy and more secure it was in the cause of religious creeds alone and by means of moral force alone that she had to maintain the struggles in which she engaged at the beginning of the sixteenth century there lived at a small castle near gap in dauphiny in the bosom of a noble and unostentatiously pious family a young man of ardent imagination fiery temperament and energetic character who shared his relatives creeds and joined in their devotions but grew weary of the monotony of his thoughts and of his life William Farrell heard talk of another young man, his contemporary and neighbor, Peter du Terrail, even now almost famous under the name of Bayard. Quote, Such sons, was said in his hearing, are as arrows in the hand of a giant. Blessed is he who has his quiver full of them. End quote. Young Farrell pressed his father to let him go too and make himself a man in the world. The old gentleman would willingly have permitted his son to take up such a life as Bayard's, but it was towards the University of Paris, quote, that mother of all the sciences, that pure and shining mirror of the faith, end quote, that the young man's aspirations were directed. The father at first opposed, but afterwards yielded to his wishes, and about 1510 William Farrell quitted Gap and arrived at Paris the questions raised by the councils of bale and florence and by the semi-political semi-ecclesiastical assembly at tours which had been convoked by louis the twelfth the instruction at the parisian university and the attacks of the sorbonne on the study of greek and hebrew branded as heresy were producing a lively agitation in the public mind 
a doctor of theology already advanced in years of small stature of mean appearance and of low origin jacques lefebvre by name born at etaples in picardy had for seventeen years filled with great success a professorship in the university Quote, amongst many thousands of men said erasmus you will not find any of higher integrity or more versed in polite letters Quote, he is very fond of me wrote Swingle about him he is perfectly open and good he argues he sings he plays and he laughs with me at the follies of the world some circumstance or other brought the young student and the old scholar together they liked one another and soon became friends farrell was impressed by his master's devotion as well as learning he saw him on his knees at church praying fervently and quote, never said he had i seen a chanter of mass who chanted it with deeper reverence end quote but this old-fashioned piety did not interfere at all with the freedom of the professor's ideas and conversations touching either the abuses or the doctrines of the church quote, how shameful it is he would say to see a bishop soliciting people to drink with him caring for naught but gaming constantly handling the dice in the dice-box constantly hunting hallooing after birds and game frequenting bad houses religion has but one foundation but one end but one head jesus christ blessed for ever he alone trod the wine-press let us not then call ourselves by the name of st paul or apollos or st peter these free conversations worked not all at once but none the less effectually upon those who heard them quote, the end was says farrell that little by little the papacy slipped from its place in my heart it did not come down at the first shock End quote at the same time that he thus talked with his pupils lefebvre of etaples published a commentary on the epistles of st paul and then a commentary on the gospels quote, christians said he are those only who love jesus christ and his word may everything be illumined by his light through it may there be a return of times like those of that primitive church which devoted to jesus christ so many martyrs may the lord of the harvest foreseeing a new harvest send new and diligent laborers my dear william he added turning to farrell and taking his hand god will renew the world and you will see it it was not only professors and pupils scholars grown old in meditation and young folks eager for truth liberty action and renown who welcomed passionately those boundless and undefined hopes those yearnings towards a brilliant and at the same time a vague future at which they looked forward according to the expression used by lefebvre of etaples to farrell to a quote, renewal of the world end quote. men holding a social position very different from that of the philosophers men with minds formed on an acquaintance with facts and in the practice of affairs took part in this intellectual and religious ferment and protected and encouraged its fervent adherents william briconnet bishop of meaux a prelate who had been louis the twelfth's ambassador to pope julius the second and one amongst the negotiators of francis i's concordat with leo x opened his diocese to the preachers and writers recommended to him by his friend lefebvre of etaples and supported them in their labours for the translation and propagation amongst the people of the holy scriptures they had at court and near the king's own person the avowed support of his sister princess marguerite who was beautiful sprightly affable kind disposed towards all lofty and humane sentiments as well as all intellectual pleasures and an object of the sometimes rash attentions of the most eminent and most different men of her time charles v the constable de bourbon admiral bonnivet and clement marot marguerite who was married to the duc d'alencon widowed in fifteen twenty five and married a second time in fifteen twenty seven to henri d'albret king of navarre was all her life at pau and at nerac as well as at paris a centre a focus of social literary religious and political movement Quote, the king her brother loved her dearly says brantome and always called her his darling very often when he had important business he left it to her waiting for her definitive and conclusive decision the ambassadors who talked with her were enchanted by her and always went to see her after having paid their first ambassadorial visit she had so great a regard and affection for the king that when she heard of his dangerous illness she said 
whosoever shall come to my door and announce to me the recovery of the king my brother such courier should he be tired and worn out and muddy and dirty i will go and kiss and embrace as if he were the sprucest prince and gentleman of france and should he be in want of a bed and unable to find one whereon to rid him of his weariness i would give him mine and i would rather lie on the hard for the good news he brought me she was suspected of inclining to the religion of luther but she never made any profession or sign thereof and if she believed it she kept it in her heart very secret inasmuch as the king did hate it sorely End quote. Quote, the heresy was seen glimmering here and there says another contemporary witness florimond de raymond in his histoire de l'hérésie but it appeared and disappeared like a nightly meteor which has but a flickering brightness End quote at bottom this reserve was quite in conformity with the mental condition of that class or as one might be inclined to say that circle of reformers at court luther and swingle had distinctly declared war on the papacy henry the eighth had with a flourish separated england from the romish church marguerite de valois and bishop briconnet neither wished nor demanded so much they aspired no further than to reform the abuses of the romish church by the authority of that church itself in concert with its heads and according to its traditional regimen they had no idea of more than dealing kindly and even sympathetically with the liberties and the progress of science and human intelligence confined within these limits the idea was legitimate and honest enough but it showed want of foresight and was utterly vain when whether in state or church the vices and defects of government have lasted for ages and become habits not only inveterate but closely connected with powerful personal interests a day at last comes when the deplorable result is seen in pig-headedness and weakness then there is an explosion of deep-seated and violent shocks from which infinitely more is expected than they can accomplish and which even when they are successful cost the people very dear for their success is sullied and incomplete a certain amount of good government and general good sense is a necessary preface and preparation for any good sort of reform happy the nations who are spared by their wisdom or their good fortune the cruel trial of only obtaining such reforms as they need when they have been reduced to prosecute them beneath the slings and arrows of outrageous revolution christian france in the sixteenth century was not so favorably situated during the first years of francis i's reign from fifteen fifteen to fifteen twenty young and ardent reformers such as william farrell and his friends were but isolated individuals eager after new ideas and study very favorable towards all that came to them from germany but without any consistency yet as a party and without having committed any striking act of aggression against the roman church nevertheless they were even then so far as the heads and the devoted adherents of that church were concerned objects of serious disquietude and jealous supervision the sorbonne in particular pronounced vehemently against them luther and his progress were beginning to make a great noise in france after his discussion with dr eck at leipzig in fifteen nineteen he had consented to take for judges the universities of erfurt and paris on the twentieth of january fifteen twenty the quester of the nation of france bought twenty copies of luther's conference with dr eck to distribute amongst the members of his committee the university gave more than a year to its examination quote, all europe says crevier was waiting for the decision of the university of paris End quote whenever an incident occurred or a question arose quote, we shall see said they of the sorbonne what sort of folks hold to luther why that fellow is worse than luther End quote. in april fifteen twenty one the university solemnly condemned luther's writings ordering that they should be publicly burned and that the author should be compelled to retract the syndic of the sorbonne noel bedier who to give his name a classical twang was called beda had been the principal and the most eager actor in this procedure he was a theologian full of subtlety obstinacy harshness and hatred quote, in a single beda there are three thousand monks erasmus used to say of him the syndic had at court two powerful patrons the king's mother louise of savoy and the chancellor duprat both decided enemies of the reformers louise of savoy in consequence of her licentious morals and her thirst for riches duprat by reason of the same thirst and of his ambition to become an equally great lord in the church as in the state and he succeeded for in fifteen twenty five he was appointed archbishop of sens they were moreover both of them opposed to any liberal reform and devoted in any case to absolute power 
Beaucaire de Peguilhem, a contemporary and most Catholic historian, for he accompanied the Cardinal of Lorraine to the Council of Trent, calls Duprat, quote, the most vicious of bipeds, end quote. Such patrons did not lack hot-headed executants of their policy. Friendly relations had not ceased between the reformers and their adversaries. A Jacobin monk, de Roma by name, was conversing one day at Meaux with Farrell and his friends. The reformers expressed the hopes they had in the propagation of the gospel. De Roma all at once stood up, shouting, quote, Then I, and all the rest of the brotherhood, will preach a crusade. We will stir up the people and if the king permits the preaching of your gospel, we will have him expelled by his own subjects from his own kingdom. Fanatical passions were already at work, though the parties were too unequal as yet to come to actual force. Against such passions the reformers found Francis I a very indecisive and very inefficient protector. Quote, I wish, said he, to give men of letters special marks of my favor. End quote when deputies from the sorbonne came and requested him to put down the publication of learned works taxed with heresy quote, i do not wish he replied to have those folks meddled with to persecute those who instruct us would be to keep men of ability from coming to our country End quote. but in spite of his language orders were given to the bishops to furnish the necessary funds for the prosecution of heretics and when the charge of heresy became frequent francis i no longer repudiated it Quote, those people, he said, do nothing but bring trouble into the state. End quote. Troubles, indeed, in otherwise tranquil provinces where the Catholic faith was in great force, often accompanied the expression of those wishes for reform to which the local clergy themselves considered it necessary to make important concessions. A serious fire took place at Troyes in 1524. Quote, it was put down, says M. Boutillot, a learned and careful historian of that town, to the account of the new religious notions, as well as to that of the Emperor Charles V's friends and the Constable de Bourbon's partisans. As early as 1520 there had begun to be felt at Troyes the first symptoms of repressive measures directed against the Reformation. In 1523, 1527, and 1528 provincial councils were held at Meaux, Lyon, Rouen, Bourges, and Paris, to oppose the Lutherans. These councils drew up regulations tending to reformation of morals and of religious ceremonies. They decided that the administration of the sacraments should take place without any demand for money, and that preachers in their sermons should confine themselves to the sacred books, and not quote poets or profane authors. They closed the churches to profane assemblies and burlesques, or fêtes des fous. They ordered the parish priests in their addresses, or au prône, to explain the gospel of the day. They ruled that a stop should be put to the abuses of excommunication. They interdicted the publication of any book on religious subjects without the permission of the bishop of the diocese. Troyes, at that time, contained some enlightened men. William Bude, or Budeus, was in uninterrupted communication with it. The Pitou family, represented by their head, Peter Pitou, a barrister at Troyes, and a man highly thought of, were in correspondence with the reformers, especially with Lefebvre of Etaples. End quote. And thus was going on throughout almost the whole of France, partly in the path of liberty, partly in that of concessions, partly in that of hardships, the work of the Reformation, too weak as yet, and too disconnected to engage to any purpose in a struggle, but even now sufficiently widespread and strong to render abortive any attempt to strangle it. End of section 21. Section 22 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 30. Francis I and the Reformation, Part 2. The defeat at Pavia and the captivity of Francis I at Madrid placed the governing power for thirteen months in the hands of the most powerful foes of the Reformation, the regent Louise of Savoy and the Chancellor Duprat. They used it unsparingly, with the harsh indifference of politicians who will have at any price peace within their dominions and submission to authority. It was under their regimen that there took place the first martyrdom decreed and executed in France upon a partisan of the Reformation for an act of aggression and offence against the Catholic Church. 
John Leclerc, a wool-carder at Meaux, seeing a bull of indulgences affixed to the door of Meaux Cathedral, had torn it down, and substituted for it a placard in which the Pope was described as Antichrist. Having been arrested on the spot, he was, by decree of the Parliament of Paris, whipped publicly, three days consecutively, and branded on the forehead by the hangman in the presence of his mother, who cried, quote, Jesus Christ for ever. He was banished and retired in July 1525 to Metz, and there he was working at his trade when he heard that a solemn procession was to take place next day in the environs of the town. In his blind zeal he went and broke down the images at the feet of which the Catholics were to have burned incense. Being arrested on his return to the town, he, far from disavowing the deed, acknowledged it and gloried in it. He was sentenced to a horrible punishment. His right hand was cut off, his nose was torn out, pincers were applied to his arms, his nipples were plucked out, his head was confined in two circlets of red-hot iron, and whilst he was still chanting in a loud voice this versicle from the 115th Psalm, quote, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands, end quote his bleeding and mutilated body was thrown upon the blazing faggots he had a younger brother peter leclerc a simple wool carder like himself who remained at meaux devoted to the same faith and the same cause quote, great clair says a contemporary chronicler playing upon his name who knew no language but that which he had learned from his nurse but who being thoroughly grounded in the holy writings besides the integrity of his life was chosen by the weavers and became the first minister of the gospel seen in france End quote. An old man of Meaux, named Stephen Manguin, offered his house, situated near the market-place, for holding regular meetings. Forty or fifty of the faithful formed the nucleus of the little church which grew up. Peter Leclerc preached and administered the sacraments in Stephen Manguin's house so regularly that twenty years after his brother John's martyrdom, the meetings, composed partly of believers who flocked in from the neighboring villages, were from three to four hundred in number. One day, when they had celebrated the Lord's Supper, the 8th of September, 1546, the house was surrounded, and nearly sixty persons, men, women, and children, who allowed themselves to be arrested without making any resistance, were taken. They were all sent before the Parliament of Paris. Fourteen of the men were sentenced to be burned alive in the great market-place at Meaux, on the spot nearest to the house in which the crime of heresy had been committed and their wives together with their nearest relatives were sentenced to be present at the execution quote, the men bareheaded and the women ranged beside them individually in such sort that they might be distinguished amongst the rest End quote. the decree was strictly carried out it costs a pang to recur to these hideous exhibitions but it must be done for history not only has a right, but is bound to do justice upon the errors and crimes of the past, especially when the past had no idea of guilt in the commission of them. A wit of the last century, Chamfort, used to say, quote, There is nothing more dangerous than an honest man engaged in a rascally calling. End quote. There is nothing more dangerous than errors and crimes of which the perpetrators do not see the absurd and odious character. The contemporary historian Slyden says expressly, quote, The common people in France hold that there are no people more wicked and criminal than heretics. Generally, as long as they are a prey to the blazing faggots, the people around them are excited to frenzy and curse them in the midst of their torments. End quote. The sixteenth century is that period of French history at which this intellectual and moral blindness cost France, quote, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands, end quote, most dear it supplied the bad passions of men with a means of which they amply availed themselves of gratifying them without scruple and without remorse if in the early part of this century the reformation was as yet without great leaders it was not nevertheless amongst only the labourers the humble and the poor that it found confessors and martyrs the provincial nobility the burgesses of the town the magistracy the bar the industrial classes as well as the learned even then furnished their quota of devoted and faithful friends. A nobleman, a Picard by birth, born about 1490 at Passy, near Paris, where he generally lived, Louis de Berquin by name, was one of the most distinguished of them by his social position, his elevated ideas, his learning, the purity of his morals, and the dignity of his life. Possessed of a patrimonial estate near Abbeville, which brought him in a modest income of six hundred crowns a year, and a bachelor, he devoted himself to study and to religious matters with independence of mind and with a pious heart. Quote, Most faithfully observant, 
says Erasmus, of the ordinances and rites of the church, to wit, prescribed fasts, holy days, forbidden meats, masses, sermons, and, in a word, all that tends to piety, he strongly reprobated the doctrines of Luther. End quote. He was none the less, in 1523, denounced to the Parliament of Paris as being on the side of the reformers. He had books, it was said. He even composed them himself on questions of faith, and he had been engaged in some sort of dispute with the theologian William de Coutances, head of Harcourt College. The attorney-general of the Parliament ordered one of his officers to go and make an examination of Berquin's books as well as papers, and to seize what appeared to him to savour of heresy. The officer brought away diverse works of Luther, Melanson, and Carlostadt, and some original treatises of Berquin himself, which were deposited in the keeping of the court. The theological faculty claimed to examine them as being within their competence. On being summoned by the attorney-general, Berquin demanded to be present when an inventory was made of his books or manuscripts, and to give such explanations as he should deem necessary, and his request was granted without question on the twenty sixth of june fifteen twenty three the commissioners of the sorbonne made their report on the eighth of july peter lizet king's advocate read it out to the court the matter came on again for hearing on the first of august berquin was summoned and interrogated and as the result of this interrogatory was arrested and carried off to imprisonment at the conciergerie in the square tower on the fifth of august sentence was pronounced and louis de barquin was remanded to appear before the bishop of paris as being charged with heresy quote, in which case says the journal d'un bourgeois de paris he would have been in great danger of being put to death according to law as he had well deserved end quote. the public were as ready as the accusers to believe in the crime and to impatiently await its punishment it was not without surprise or without displeasure that on the 8th of August, just as they had, quote, made over to the Bishop of Paris, present and accepting, end quote, the prisoner confined in the conciergerie, the members of the council chamber observed the arrival of Captain Frederic, belonging to the archers of the King's Guard, and bringing a letter from the King, who changed the venue in Berquin's case so as to decide it himself at his grand council, in consequence of which the prisoner would have to be handed over, not to the bishop, but to the king. The chamber remonstrated. Berquin was no longer their prisoner. The matter had been decided. It was the bishop to whom application must be made. But these remonstrances had been foreseen. The captain had verbal instructions to carry off Louis de Berquin by force, in case of a refusal to give him up. The chamber decided upon handing over the bishop's prisoner to the king, contenting themselves with causing the seized books and manuscripts to be burned that very day in the space in front of Notre-Dame. It was whilst repairing to the scene of war in Italy, and when he was just entering Melun, where he merely passed through, that the king had given this unexpected order, on the very day, August the 5th, on which the Parliament pronounced the decree which sent Berquin to appear before the Bishop of Paris. There is no clear trace of the vigilant protector, or who had so closely watched the proceedings against Berquin, and so opportunely appealed for the king's interference in any incident of this sort there is a temptation to presume that the influence was that of princess marguerite but it is not certain that she was at this time anywhere near the king perhaps john du Bellay, bishop of bayonne acted for her francis i was moreover disposed to extend protection of his own accord to gentlemen and scholars against furious theologians when the latter were not too formidable for him However that may be, Berquin, on becoming the king's prisoner, was summoned before the chancellor Duprat, who, politely reproaching him with having disquieted the church, confined himself to requesting that he would testify some regret for it. Berquin submitted with a good grace, and being immediately set at liberty, left Paris and repaired to his estate in Picardy. Whilst he there resumed his life of peaceful study, the Parliament continued to maintain in principle and openly proclaim its right of repression against heretics. On the 12th of August, 1523, it caused notice to be given, by sound of trumpet, throughout the whole of Paris, that clergy and laymen were to deposit in the keeping of the palace all Luther's books that they possessed. Laymen who did not comply with this order would have their property confiscated. Clergymen would be deprived of their temporalities and banished. Toleration, in a case of suspected heresy, was an act of the king's which itself required toleration proceedings against heresy remained the law of the land constantly hanging over every head eighteen months later in may fifteen twenty five there seemed to be no further thought about berquin 
But the Battle of Pavia was lost. Francis I was a prisoner at Madrid. Louise of Savoy and the Chancellor Duprat wielded the power. The question of heretics again came to the front. Quote, the queen must be told, said Pierre Lizet, king's advocate, as St. Gregory told Bruneau, queen of the Franks, that the best way of driving away the enemies of the kingdom is to drive away from it the enemies of God and his spouse, the church. End quote. On the 10th of April, 1525, on occasion of giving the regent some counsel as to her government, the parliament strongly recommended her to take proceedings against the heretics. Quote, the court, they said to her, has before now passed several provisional decrees against the guilty, which have not been executed because of the evil disposition of the times, and the hindrances affected by the delinquents, who have found means of suspending and delaying the judgments given against them, as well as by transference of the venue to the Grand Council, as by seizure and removal of certain of them, prisoners at the time, whom they have had withdrawn from their prisons, by exercise of sovereign and absolute power, which has given the rest occasion and boldness to follow the evil doctrine." End quote. It was impossible to reproach the king more broadly with having set Berquin at liberty. The Parliament further advised the regent to ask the Pope to send over to France pontifical delegates invested with his own powers to watch and to try in his name, quote, even archbishops, bishops and abbots who by their deeds, writings or discourses should render themselves suspected of a leaning towards heresy, End quote. Louise of Savoy, without any appearance of being hurt by the attack made by the Parliament on the acts of the king her son, eagerly followed the advice given her, and on the 20th of May, 1525, Clement VII, in his turn, eagerly appointed four delegates commissioned to try all those suspected of heresy, who, in case of condemnation, were to be left to the secular arm. On the very day on which the Pope appointed his delegates, the Faculty of Theology at Paris passed censure upon diverse writings of Erasmus, translated and spread abroad in France by Berquin. And on the 8th of January, 1526, the Bishop of Amiens demanded of the Parliament authority, quote, to order the body to be seized of Louis de Berquin, who resided in his diocese and was scandalizing it by his behavior, end quote. The Parliament authorized his arrest, and on the 24th of January, Berquin was once more a prisoner in the Conciergerie, at the same time that orders were given to seize all his books and papers, whether at his own house or that of his friend, the Lord of Rambure, at Abbeville. The great trial of Berquin for heresy was recommenced, and in it the great name of Erasmus was compromised. When the question was thus solemnly reopened, Berquin's defenders were much excited. Defenders, we have said, but in truth, history names but one, the Princess Marguerite, who alone showed any activity, and alone did anything to the purpose. She wrote at once to the king, who was still at Madrid, quote, My desire to obey your commands was sufficiently strong without having it redoubled by the charity you have been pleased to show to poor Berquin according to your promise. I feel sure that he, for whom I believe him to have suffered, will approve of the mercy which for his honor you have had upon his servant and yours. End quote. Francis I had in fact written to suspend until his return the proceedings against Berquin, as well as those against Lefebvre, Roussel, and all the other doctors suspected of heresy. The regent transmitted the king's orders to the pope's delegates, who presented themselves on the 20th of February before the parliament to ask its advice. Quote, the king is as badly advised as he himself is good, said the dean of the faculty of theology. The parliament answered that, quote, for a simple letter missive, end quote, it could not adjourn, it must have a letter patent, and it went on with the trial. Berquin presented several demands for delay, evidently in order to wait for the king's return and personal intervention. The court refused them, and on the 5th of March, 1526, the judgment was read to him in his prison at the conciergerie. It was to the effect that his book should be again burned before his eyes, that he should declare his approval of so just a sentence, and that he should earn the compassion of the church by not refusing her any satisfaction she might demand, else he should himself go to the stake. Whilst Berquin's trial was thus coming to an end, Francis I was entering France once more in freedom, crying, quote, So I am king again. End quote. During the latter days of March, amongst the numerous personages who came to congratulate him was John de Selve, premier president of the Parliament of Paris. The king gave him a very cold reception. Quote, 
My lords, wrote the premier president to his court, I heard through M. de Selve, my nephew, about some displeasure that was felt as regards our body, and I also perceived it myself. I have already begun to speak of it to Madame, or the king's mother. I will do, as I am bound to, my duty towards the court, with God's help. End quote. On the 1st of April, the king, who intended to return by none but slow stages to Paris, wrote from Mont de Marsan to the judges holding his court of parliament at Paris, quote, We have presently been notified how that, notwithstanding that through our dear and much loved lady and mother, regent in France during our absence, it was written unto you and ordered that you would be pleased not to proceed in any way whatever with the matter of Sieur Barquin lately detained a prisoner until we should have been enabled to return to this our kingdom you have nevertheless at the request and pursuance of his ill-wishers so far proceeded with his business that you have come to a definitive judgment on it whereat we cannot be too much astounded for this cause we do will and command and enjoin upon you that you are not to proceed to execution of the said judgment which as the report is you have pronounced against the said barquin but shall put him himself and the depositions and the proceedings in his said trial in such safe keeping that you may be able to answer to us for them and take care that you make no default therein, for we do warn you that if default there be, we shall look to such of you as shall seem good to us to answer to us for it. End quote. Here was not only a letter patent, but a letter minatory. As to the execution of their judgment, the Parliament obeyed the King's injunction, maintaining, however, the principle as well as the legality of Berquin's sentence, and declaring that they awaited the King's orders to execute it. Quote, according to the teaching of the two testaments they said god ever rageth in his just wrath against the nations who failed to enforce respect for the laws prescribed by himself it is important moreover to hasten the event in order as soon as possible to satisfy independently of god the people who murmur and whose impatience is becoming verily troublesome End quote. francis i did not reply he would not have dared even in thought to attack the question of principle as to the chastisement of heresy and he was afraid of weakening his own authority too much if he humiliated his parliament too much it was sufficient for him that he might consider berquin's life to be safe kings are protectors who are easily satisfied when their protection to be worth anything might entail upon them the necessity of an energetic struggle and of self-compromise Trust not in princes nor their children, said Lord Strafford, after the psalmist when, in the seventeenth century, he found that Charles I was abandoning him to the English Parliament and the executioner. Louis de Berquin might have felt similar distrust as to Francis I, but his nature was confident and hopeful. When he knew of the king's letter to the Parliament, he considered himself safe, and he testified as much to Erasmus in a long letter, in which he told him the story of his trial, and alluded to, quote, the fresh outbreak of anger on the part of those hornets who accuse me of heresy, said he, simply because I have translated into the vulgar tongue some of your little works, wherein they pretend that they have discovered the most monstrous pieces of impiety. End quote. He transmitted to Erasmus a list of the paragraphs which the Pope's delegates had condemned, pressing him to reply, quote, as you well know how. The king esteems you much, and will esteem you still more when you have heaped confusion on this brood of benighted theologians whose ineptitude is no excuse for their violence. End quote. By a strange coincidence, Berquin's most determined foe, Noel Beda, provost of the Sorbonne, sent at the same time to Erasmus a copy of more than two hundred propositions which had been extracted from his works, and against which he, Beda, also came forward as accuser. Erasmus was a prudent man, and did not seek strife, but when he was personally and offensively attacked by enemies against whom he was conscious of his strength, he exhibited it proudly and ably, and he replied to Beda by denouncing him, on the 6th of June, to the Parliament of Paris itself, as an impudent and ignorant calumniator. His letter, read at the session of Parliament on the 5th of July, 1526, was there listened to with profound deference, and produced a sensation which did not remain without effect. In vain did Beda persist in accusing Erasmus of heresy, and in maintaining that he was of the brotherhood of Luther. Parliament considered him in the wrong, provisionally prohibited the booksellers from vending his libels against Erasmus, and required previous authorization to be obtained for all books destined for the press by the rectors of the Sorbonne. End of section 22.
Section 23 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This LibriVox recording is in a public domain. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 30. Francis I and the Reformation, Part 3. The success of Erasmus was also a success for Berquin. But he was still in prison, ill and maltreated. The king wrote on the 11th of July to Parliament to demand that he should enjoy at least all the liberties that the prison would admit of, that he should no longer be detained in an unhealthy cell, and that he should be placed in that building of the conciergerie where the courtyard was. Quote, that, was the answer, would be a bad precedent. They never put in the courtyard convicts who had incurred the penalty of death. End quote. An offer was made to Berquin of the chamber reserved for the greatest personages, for princes of the blood, and of permission to walk in the courtyard for two hours a day, one in the morning and the other in the evening, in the absence of the other prisoners. Neither the king nor Berquin was inclined to be content with these concessions. The king, in his irritation, sent from Beaugency on the 5th of October two archers of his guard with a letter to this effect, quote, it is marvellously strange that what we ordered has not yet been done. We do command and most expressly enjoin upon you, this once for all, that you are incontinently to put and deliver the said Berquin into the hands of the said Teche and Charles de Broc, whom we have ordered to conduct him to our castle of the Louvre. End quote. The court still objected. A prisoner favoured by so high a personage, it was said, would soon be out of such a prison. The objection resulted in a formal refusal to obey. The provost of Paris, John de la Barre, the king's premier gentleman, was requested to repair to the palace and pay Berquin a visit to ascertain for himself what could be done for him. Berquin, for all that appears, asked for nothing but liberty to read and write. Quote, it is not possible, was the reply. Such liberty is never granted to those who are condemned to death. End quote. As a great favor, Berquin was offered a copy of the letters of St. Jerome and some volumes of history and the provost had orders not to omit that fact in his report quote, the king must be fully assured that the court do all they can to please him End quote. but it was to no purpose on the nineteenth of november fifteen twenty six the provost of paris returned to the palace with a letter from the king formally commanding him to remove berquin and transfer him to the louvre the court again protested that they would not deliver over the said Berquin to the said provost, but, they said, quote, seeing what the times are, the said provost will be able to find free access to the conciergerie, for to do there what he hath a mind to, end quote. The same day, about six in the evening, John de la Barre repaired to the conciergerie, and removed from it Louis de Berquin, whom he handed over to the captain of the guard and four archers, who took him away to the Louvre. Two months afterwards, in January 1527, Princess Marguerite married Henri d'Albret, King of Navarre, and about the same time, though it is difficult to discover the exact day, Louis de Barquin issued forth a free man from the Louvre, and the new queen, on taking him at once into her service, wrote to the constable Anne de Montmorency, whom the king had charged with the duty of getting Barquin set at liberty, quote, I thank you for the pleasure you have done me in the matter of Paul Barquin, whom I esteem as much as if he were myself, and so you may say that you have delivered me from prison, since I consider in that light the pleasure done to me, End quote. Marguerite's sympathetic joy was as natural as touching. She must have thought Berquin safe. He was free and in the service of one who was fundamentally a sovereign prince, though living in France and independence upon the king of France, whose sister he had just married. In France, Berquin was under the stigma of having been condemned to death as a heretic and was confronted by determined enemies. In so perilous a position, his safety depended upon his courting oblivion. But instead of that, and consulting only the dictates of his generous and blind confidence in the goodness of his cause, he resolved to assume the offensive and to cry for justice against his enemies. Quote, Beneath the cloak of religion, he wrote to Erasmus, the priests conceal the vilest passions, the most corrupt morals, and the most scandalous infidelity. It is necessary to rend the veil which covers them, and boldly bring an accusation of impiety against the Sorbonne, Rome, and all their flunkies. End quote. Erasmus, justly alarmed, used all his influence to deter him. But, quote, the more confidence he showed, says he, the more I feared for him. 
I wrote to him frequently, begging him to get quit of the case by some expedient, or even to withdraw himself on the pretext of a royal ambassadorship obtained by the influence of his friends. I told him that the theologians would probably, as time went on, let his affair drop, but that they would never admit themselves to be guilty of impiety. I told him to always bear in mind what a hydra was that Beda, and at how many mouths he belched forth venom. I told him to reflect well that he was about to commit himself with a foe that was immortal, for a faculty never dies, and to rest assured that after having brought three monks to bay, he would have to defend himself against numerous legions, not only opulent and powerful, but besides very dishonest and very experienced in the practice of every kind of cheatery, who would never rest until they had effected his ruin, were his cause as just as Christ's. I told him not to trust too much to the king's protection, the favor of princes being unstable, and their affections easily alienated by the artifices of informers. And if all this could not move him, I told him not to involve me in his business, for with his permission I was not at all inclined to get into any tangle with legions of monks and a whole faculty of theology. But I did not succeed in convincing him. Whilst I argued in so many ways to deter him from his design, I did nothing but excite his courage." End quote. Not only did Berquin turn a deaf ear to the wise counsels of Erasmus, but his protectress Marguerite, being moved by his courage, and herself also as imprudent as she was generous, persuaded herself that he was in the right, and supported him in his undertaking. She wrote to the king her brother, quote, Poor Berquin, who through your goodness holds that God has twice preserved his life, throws himself upon you, having no longer any one to whom he can have recourse, for to give you to understand his innocence. And whereas, Monseigneur, I know the esteem in which you hold him, and the desire he hath always had to do you service, I do not fear to entreat you, by letter instead of speech, to be pleased to have pity on him." and if it please you to show signs of taking his matter to heart, I hope that the truth which he will make to appear will convict the forgers of heretics of being slanderers and disobedient towards you rather than zealots for the faith. In his complacence and indifference, Francis I attended to his sister's wishes, and appeared to support Berquet in his appeal for a fresh and definite investigation of his case. On the other hand, Parliament, to whom the matter was referred, showed a disposition to take into account the king's good will towards Berquin, lately convicted, but now become in his turn plaintiff and accuser. Quote, we have no wish to dispute your power, said the President, Charles de Guillard, to the king at a bed of justice held on the 24th of July, 1527. It would be a species of sacrilege, and we know well that you are above the laws, and that neither laws nor ordinances can constrain you. Your most humble and most obedient court is comforted and rejoiced at your presence and advent, just as the apostles were when they saw their God after the resurrection. We are assured that your will is to be the peculiar protector and defender of religion, and not to permit or suffer in your kingdom any errors, heresies, or false doctrines. End quote. The matter thus reopened pursued its course slowly. Twelve judges were appointed to give a definite decision, and the king himself nominated six, amongst whom he placed Berquin's friend, William Bude. Various incidents unconnected with religious disputes supervened. The Queen of Navarre was brought to bed at Pau on the 7th of January, 1528, of a daughter, Jeanne d'Albret, the future mother of Henry IV. The marriage of Princess René of France, daughter of Louis XII, with Duke Hercule of Ferrara, was concluded, and the preparations for its celebration were going on at Fontainebleau, when on Monday, June the 1st, 1528, the day after the Feast of Pentecost, quote, some heretics came by night, says the Journal d'un Bourgeois de Paris, to an image of Notre Dame de Pierre, which is at a corner of the street behind the church of Petit Saint Antoine, to the which image they gave several blows with their weapons, and cut off her head and that of her little child, our Lord. But it was never known who the image breakers were. The king, being then at Paris, and being advertised thereof, was so wroth and upset that it is said he wept right sore. And incontinently, during the two days following, he caused it to be proclaimed by sound of trumpet throughout the crossroads of the city that if any persons knew who had done it, they should make their report and statement to justice and to him, and he would give them a thousand crowns of gold. Nevertheless, nothing could be known about it, although the king showed great diligence in the matter, and had officers commissioned to go from house to house to make inquiry. On Tuesday and other days following, there were special processions from the parish churches and other churches of the city, which nearly all of them went to the said place. 
and on the day of the fete dieu which was the eleventh day of the said month of june the king went in procession most devoutly with the parish of st paul and all the clergy to the spot where was the said image he himself carried a lighted waxen taper bareheaded with very great reverence having with him the band and hautbois with several clarions and trumpets which made a glorious show so melodiously did they play and with him were the cardinal of lorraine and several prelates and great lords and all the gentlemen having each a taper of white wax in their hands and all his archers had each a waxen taper alight and thus they went to the spot where was the said image with very great honour and reverence which was a beautiful sight to see and with devotion End quote. in the sixteenth century men were far from understanding that respect is due to every religious creed sincerely professed and practised the innovators who broke the images of the Virgin Mary and the infant Jesus did not consider that by thus brutally attacking that which they regarded as a superstition they were committing a revolting outrage upon Christian consciences. Such an incident was too favorable for Berquin's enemies not to be eagerly turned to profit by them. Although his prosecution had been resumed, he had hitherto remained at large and been treated respectfully. He repaired without any guard over him from the Louvre to the Palace of Justice but now he was arrested and once more confined in the tower of the conciergerie some books of his seized haphazard and sent to the syndic beda were found covered with notes which were immediately pronounced to be heretical on the sixteenth of april fifteen twenty nine he was brought before the court quote, louis berquin said the president to him you are convicted of having belonged to the sect of luther and of having made wicked books against the majesty of god and of his glorious mother in consequence we do sentence you to make honourable amends bareheaded and with a waxen taper alight in your hand in the great court of the palace crying for mercy to god the king and the law for the offence by you committed after that you will be conducted bareheaded and on foot to the place de greve where your books will be burned before your eyes then you will be taken in front of the church of notre dame where you will make honourable amends to god and to the glorious virgin his mother after which a hole will be pierced in your tongue, that member wherewith you have sinned. Lastly, you will be placed in the prison of Monsieur de Paris, or the bishop, and will be there confined between two stone walls for the whole of your life, and we forbid that there be ever given you book to read or pen and ink to write." This sentence, which Erasmus called atrocious, appeared to take Barquin by surprise. For a moment he remained speechless, and then he said, quote, I appeal to the king. End quote. whereupon he was taken back to prison the sentence was to be carried out the same day about three p m a great crowd of more than twenty thousand persons says a contemporary chronicler rushed to the bridges the streets the squares where this solemn expiation was to take place the commissioner of police the officer of the chatelet the archers crossbowmen and arquebusiers of the city had repaired to the palace to form the escort but when they presented themselves at the prison to take berquin he told them that he had appealed to the king and that he would not go with them the escort and the crowd retired disappointed the president convoked the tribunal the same evening and repairing to the prison he made berquin sign the form of his appeal william bude hurried to the scene and vehemently urged the prisoner to give it up Quote, a second sentence said he is ready and it pronounces death if you acquiesce in the first we shall be able to save you later on all that is demanded of you is to ask pardon and have we not all need of pardon it appears that for a moment berquin hesitated and was on the point of consenting but bude remained anxious quote, i know him said he his ingenuousness and his confidence in the goodness of his cause will ruin him End quote. the king was at blois and his sister marguerite at st germain on the news of this urgent peril she wrote to her brother quote, i for the last time make you a very humble request it is that you will be pleased to have pity upon poor berquin whom i know to be suffering for nothing but loving the word of god and obeying yours you will be pleased monseigneur so to act that it be not said that separation has made you forget your most humble and most obedient subject and sister marguerite End quote. we can discover no trace of any reply whatever from francis i according to most of the documentary evidence uncertainty lasted for three days berquin persisted in his resolution quote, no he to his friend bude who again came to the prison i would rather endure death than give my approval even by silence only to condemnation of the truth End quote. 
The president of the court went once more to pay him a visit, and asked him if he held to his appeal. Berquin said yes. The court revised its original sentence, and for the penalty of perpetual imprisonment substituted that of the stake. On the 22nd of April, 1529, according to most of the documents, but on the 17th, according to the Journal d'un Bourgeois de Paris, which the details of the last days render highly improbable, the officers of Parliament entered Berquin's gloomy chamber. He rose quietly and went with them. The procession set out, and at about three arrived at the Place de Grève, where the stake was ready. Quote, Berquin had a gown of velvet, garments of satin and damask, and hosen of gold thread, says the Bourgeois de Paris. Quote, alas said some as they saw him pass he is of noble lineage a mighty great scholar expert in science and subtle withal and nevertheless he hath gone out of his senses we borrow the account of his actual death from a letter of erasmus written on the evidence of an eye-witness not a symptom of agitation appeared either in his face or the attitude of his body he had the bearing of a man who was meditating in his cabinet on the subject of his studies or in a temple on the affairs of heaven even when the executioner in a rough voice proclaimed his crime and its penalty the constant serenity of his features was not at all altered when the order was given him to dismount from the tumbrel he obeyed cheerfully without hesitating nevertheless he had not about him any of that audacity that arrogance which in the case of malefactors is sometimes bred of their natural savagery everything about him bore evidence to the tranquillity of a good conscience before he died he made a speech to the people but none could hear him so great was the noise which the soldiers made according it is said to the orders they had received when the cord which bound him to the post suffocated his voice not a soul in the crowd ejaculated the name of jesus whom it is customary to invoke even in favour of parricides and the sacrilegious to such extent was the multitude excited against him by those folks who are to be found everywhere and who can do anything with the feelings of the simple and ignorant theodore de Bez adds that the grand penitentiary of paris merlin who was present at the execution said as he withdrew from the still smoking stake quote, i never saw any one die more christianly End quote. the impressions and expressions of the crowd as they dispersed were very diverse but the majority cried quote, he was a heretic End quote. others said quote, god is the only just judge and happy is the man whom he absolves End quote some said below their breath quote, it is only through the cross that christ will triumph in the kingdom of the gauls End quote. a man went up to the franciscan monk who had placed himself at berquin's side in the procession and had entreated him without getting from him anything but silence and asked him quote, did berquin say that he had erred quote, yes certainly answered the monk and i doubt not but that his soul hath departed in peace End quote. this expression was reported to erasmus but quote, I don't believe it, said he. It is the story that these fellows are obliged to invent, after their victim's death, to appease the wrath of the people. End, quote. End of section 23. Section 24 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 30, Francis I and the Reformation, Part 4. We have dealt in detail upon these two martyrs, Leclerc and Berquin, the wool-carder and the scholarly gentleman, because they are faithful and vivid representatives of the two classes amongst which, in the sixteenth century, the Reformation took root in France it had a double origin morally and socially one amongst the people and the other amongst the aristocratic and the learned it was not national nor was it embraced by the government of the country persecution was its first and its only destiny in the reign of francis i and it went through the ordeal with admirable courage and patience it resisted only in the form of martyrdom we will give no more of such painful and hideous pictures in connection with this subject and as regards the latter portion of this reign we will dwell upon only those general facts which bear the impress of public morals and the conduct of the government rather than of the fortunes and the feelings of individuals it was after francis i's time that the reformation instead of confining itself to submitting with dignity to persecution made a spirited effort to escape from it by becoming a political party and taking up in france the task of the opposition a liberal and an energetic opposition which claims its rights and its securities 
It then took its place in French history as a great public power, organized and commanded by great leaders, and no longer as a multitude of scattered victims falling one after another without a struggle beneath the blows of their persecutors. The martyrdom of Berquin put a stop to the attempt at quasi-tolerance in favor of aristocratic and learned reformers which Francis I had essayed to practice. After having twice saved Berquin from a heretic's doom, he failed to save him ultimately, and except the horrible details of barbarity in the execution, the scholarly gentleman received the same measure as the wool-carder, after having been, like him, true to his faith and to his dignity as a man and a Christian. Persecution thenceforward followed its course without the king putting himself to the trouble of applying the drag for anybody. His sister Marguerite alone continued to protect, timidly and dejectedly, those of her friends amongst the reformers whom she could help or to whom she could offer an asylum in Bern, without embroiling herself with the king her brother and with the parliaments. We will not attempt to enumerate the martyrdoms which had to be undergone by the persevering reformers in France between 1529 and 1547, from the death of Louis de Barquin to that of Francis I. The task would be too long, and intermingled with too many petty questions of dates or proper names. We will confine ourselves to quoting some local computations and to conning over the great historic facts which show to what extent the persecution was general and unrelenting, though it was ineffectual. In the end, to stifle the Reformation and to prevent the bursting out of those religious wars which, from the death of Francis I to the accession of Henry IV, smothered France in disaster, blood, and crime. In the reign of Francis I, from 1524 to 1547, eighty-one death sentences for heresy were executed. At Paris only, from the 10th of November to the 2nd of May, a space of some six months, one hundred and two sentences to death by fire for heresy were pronounced. Twenty-seven were executed. Two did not take place, because those who ought to have undergone them denounced other reformers to save themselves, and seventy-three succeeded in escaping by flight. The Journal d'un Bourgeois de Paris, pages 444 to 450, does not mention sentences to lesser penalties. In a provincial town, whose history one of its most distinguished inhabitants, M. Boutiot, has lately written from authentic documents and local traditions, at Troyes, in fact, in 1542 and 1546, two Burgesses, one a clerk and the other a publisher, were sentenced to the stake and executed for the crime of heresy, quote, on an appeal being made by the publisher, Mass Moreau, the Parliament of Paris confirmed the sentence pronounced by the bailiff's court, end quote, and he underwent his punishment on the Place Saint-Pierre with the greatest courage. The decree of the Parliament contains the most rigorous enactments against books in the French language treating of religious matters and it enjoins upon all citizens the duty of denouncing those who publicly or not make profession of the new doctrine Quote, the lutheran propaganda say the documents is in great force throughout the diocese it exercises influence not only on the class of artisans but also amongst the burgesses doubt has made its way into many honest souls the reformation has reached so far even where the chisholm is not complete Catholic priests profess some of the new doctrines at the same time that they remain attached to their offices. Many bishops declare themselves partisans of the reformist doctrines. The Protestant worship, however, is not yet openly conducted. The mass of the clergy do not like to abandon the past. They cling to their old traditions, and if they have renounced certain abuses, they yield only on a few points of little importance. The new ideas are spreading even in the country. Statues representing the Virgin and the Saints are often broken, and these deeds are imputed to those who have adopted the doctrines of Luther and of Calvin. A Notre-Dame de Pitié, situated at the Hôtel Dieu le Comte, was found with its head broken. This event excites to madness the Catholic population. The persecutions continue. End quote. Many people emigrated for fear of the stake. Quote, from August 1552 to the 6th of January 1555, says the chronicler, Troyes loses in consequence of exile, probably voluntary, a certain number of its best inhabitants, end quote. and he names thirteen families with the style and title of quote, noblemen. End quote. He adds, quote, There is scarcely a month in the year when there are not burned two or three heretics at Paris, Meaux, and Troyes, and sometimes more than a dozen. End quote. Troyes contained at that time, says M. Boutiot, 18,285 inhabitants, counting five persons to a household. Many other provincial towns offered the same spectacle. 
during the long truce which succeeded the peace of cambrai from fifteen thirty two to fifteen thirty six it might have been thought for a while that the persecution in france was going to be somewhat abated policy obliged francis i to seek the support of the protestants of germany against charles v he was incessantly fluctuating between that policy and a strictly catholic and papal policy by marrying his son henry on the twenty eighth of october fifteen thirty three to catherine de medici niece of pope clement the seventh he seemed to have decided upon the latter course but he had afterwards made a movement in the contrary direction clement the seventh had died on the twenty sixth of september fifteen twenty four paul the third had succeeded him and francis i again turned towards the protestants of germany he entered into relations with the most moderate amongst their theologians with malencon Busser, and sturm there was some talk of conciliation of a re-establishment of peace and harmony in the church nor did the king confine himself to speaking by the mouths of diplomatists he himself wrote to melancon on the twenty third of june fifteen thirty five quote, it is some time now since i heard from william de bullet my chamberlain and counsellor of the zeal with which you are exerting yourself to appease the altercations to which christian doctrine has given rise i now hear that you are very much disposed to come to us for to confer with some of our most distinguished doctors as to the means of re-establishing in the church that sublime harmony which is the chief of all my desires come then either in an official capacity or in your own private character you will be most welcome to me and you shall in either case have proof of the interest i feel in the glory of your own germany and in the peace of the world melancon had indeed shown an inclination to repair to paris he had written on the ninth of may fifteen thirty five to his friend sturm quote, i will not let myself be stopped by domestic ties or by fear of danger there is no human greatness before which i do not prefer christ's glory one thought alone gives me pause i doubt my ability to do any good i fear it is impossible to obtain from the king that which i regard as necessary for the lord's glory and for the peace of france you know that kingdom pronounce your judgment if you think that i shall do well to undertake the journey i am off melancon had good reason to doubt whether success such as he deemed necessary were possible whilst francis i was making all these advances to the protestants of germany he was continuing to proceed against their brother christians in france more bitterly and more flagrantly than ever two recent events had very much envenomed party feeling between the french catholics and reformers and the king had been very much compromised in this fresh crisis of the struggle in fifteen thirty four the lawless insurrection of anabaptists and peasants which had so violently agitated germany in fifteen twenty five began again the insurgents seized the town of munster in westphalia and there renewed their attempt to found the kingdom of israel with community of property and polygamy as in fifteen twenty five they were promptly crushed by the german princes catholic and protestant of the neighbourhood but their rising had created some reverberation in france and the reformers had been suspected of an inclination to take part in it Quote, it is said wrote the chancellor de granville in january fifteen thirty five to the ambassador of france at the court of charles v that the number of the strayed from the faith in france and the danger of utter confusion are very great the enterprise of the said strade about which you write to me to set fire to the churches and pillage the louvre proves that they were in great force please god the king may be able to apply a remedy the accusation was devoid of all foundation but nothing is absurd in the eyes of party hatred and suspicion and an incident almost contemporaneous with the fresh insurrection of the anabaptists occurred to increase the king's wrath as well as the people's against the reformers and to rekindle the flames of persecution on the twenty fourth of october fifteen thirty four placards against the mass transubstantiation and the regimen as well as the faith of the catholic church were posted up during the night in the thoroughfares of paris and at blois on the very chamber door of francis i whose first glance when he got up in the morning they caught they had been printed at neufchatel in switzerland where the influence of the refugee william farrell was strong and their coarse violence of expression could not fail to excite the indignation of even the most indifferent catholics in their fanatical blindness factions say only what satisfy their own passions without considering moral propriety or the effect which will be produced by their words upon the feelings of their adversaries who also have creeds and passions francis i equally shocked and irritated determined to give the catholic faith striking satisfaction and protestant audacity a bloody lesson 
On the 21st of January, 1535, a solemn procession issued from the church of saint germain auxerrois John du Bellay, Bishop of Paris, held in his hands the Holy Sacrament, surrounded by the three sons of France and the Duc de Vendôme, who were the dais bearers, and the king walked behind with a taper in his hand between the cardinals of Bourbon and Lorraine. At each halting place he handed his taper to the cardinal of Lorraine, folded his hands, and humbly prostrating himself, implored divine mercy for his people. After the procession was over, the king, who had remained to dine with John du Bellay, assembled in the great hall of the palace the heads of all the companies, and taking his place on a sort of throne which had been prepared for him, said, quote, whatever progress may have already been made by the pest the remedy is still easy if each of you devoured by the same zeal as i will forget the claims of flesh and blood to remember only that he is a christian and will denounce without pity all those whom he knows to be partisans or favourers of heresy as for me if my arm were gangrened i would have it cut off though it were my right arm and if my sons who hear me were such wretches as to fall into such execrable and accursed opinions, I would be willing to give them up to make a sacrifice of them to God. End quote. On the twenty ninth of January, there was published an edict which sentenced concealers of heretics, quote, Lutheran or other, end quote, to the same penalties as the said heretics, unless they denounced their guests to justice, and a quarter of the property to be confiscated was secured to the denouncers fifteen days previously francis i had signed a decree still stranger for a king who was a protector of letters he ordered the abolition of printing that means of propagating heresies and quote, forbade the printing of any book on pain of the halter end quote. six weeks later however on the twenty sixth of february he became ashamed of such an act and suspended its execution indefinitely punishments in abundance preceded and accompanied the edicts from the tenth of november fifteen thirty four to the third of may fifteen thirty five twenty-four heretics were burned alive in paris without counting many who were sentenced to less cruel penalties the procedure had been made more rapid the police commissioner of the chatelet dealt with cases summarily and the parliament confirmed the victims had at first been strangled before they were burned they were now burned alive after the fashion of the spanish inquisition the convicts were suspended by iron chains to beams which alternately quote, hoisted and quote, lowered end quote, them over the flames until the executioner cut the cord to let the sufferer fall the evidence was burned together with the convicts it was undesirable that the reformers should be able to make a certified collection of their martyrs acts and deeds after a detailed and almost complacent enumeration of all these executions we find in the journal d'un bourgeois de paris this paragraph quote, the rumor was in june fifteen thirty five that pope paul the third being advertised of the execrable and horrible justice which the king was doing upon the lutherans in his kingdom did send word to the king of france that he was advertised of it and that he was quite willing to suppose that he did it in good part as he still made use of the beautiful title he had to be called the most christian king nevertheless god the creator when he was in this world made more use of mercy than of rigorous justice which should never be used rigorously and that it was a cruel death to burn a man alive because he might have to some extent renounced the faith and the law wherefore the pope did pray and request the king by his letters to be pleased to mitigate the fury and rigor of his justice by granting grace and pardon the king wishing to follow the pope's wishes according as he sent him word by his letters patent sent word to the court of parliament not to proceed any more with such rigour as they had shown heretofore for this cause were there no more rigorous proceedings on the part of justice End quote. End of section twenty four section twenty five of a popular history of france volume four this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 30. Francis I and the Reformation. Part 5. Search has been made to discover whether the assertion of the bourgeois de Paris has any foundation, whether Pope Paul III really did write in June 1535 the letter attributed to him, and whether its effect was that the king wrote to Parliament not to proceed against the reformers, quote, with such rigor, end quote. 
no proof has however been obtained as to the authenticity of the pope's letter and in any case it was not very effectual for the same bourgeois de paris reports that in september fifteen thirty five three months after that according to him it was written two fellows makers of silk ribbons and tissues were burned all alive one in the place maubert and the other in st john cemetery as lutherans which they were they had handed over to their host at paris some lutheran books to take care of saying keep this book for us while we go into the city and show it to nobody when they were gone this host was not able to refrain from showing this book to a certain priest the which after having looked at it said incontinently this is a very wicked book and proscribed then the said host went to the commissioner of police to reveal that he had such and such a book of such an one the which sent forthwith to the house of the said host to take off and carry the said two fellows to the chatelet being questioned they confessed the state of the case whereupon by sentence of the said commissioner confirmed by decree quote, they made honourable amends in front of the church of notre dame de paris had their tongues cut out and were burned all alive and with unshaken obstinacy end quote proceedings and executions then did not cease even in the case of the most humble class of reformers and at the very moment when francis i was exerting himself to win over the protestants of germany with the cry of conciliation and re-establishment of harmony in the church melancon Busser, and luther himself had allowed themselves to be tempted by the prospect but the german politicians princes and counsellors were more clear-sighted Quote, we at augsburg wrote seiler deputy from that city know the king of france well he cares very little for religion or even for morality he plays the hypocrite with the pope and gives the germans the smooth side of his tongue thinking of nothing but how to cheat them of the hopes he gives them his only aim is to crush the emperor End quote. The attempt of Francis I thus failed, first in Germany, and then at Paris also, where the Sorbonne was not disposed, any more than the German politicians were, to listen to any talk about a specious conciliation. And the persecution resumed its course in France, paving the way for civil war. The last and most atrocious act of persecution in the reign of Francis I was directed not against isolated individuals, but against a whole population, harried, despoiled and banished or exterminated on account of heresy about the year fifteen twenty five small churches of reformers began to assume organization between the alps and the jura something was there said about christians who belonged to the reformation without ever having been reformed it was said that in certain valleys of the piedmontese alps and dauphiny and in certain quarters of provence there were to be found believers who for several centuries had recognized no authority save that of the holy scriptures some called them vaudians or valdensians others poor of lyons others lutherans the rumor of the reformation was heard in their valleys and created a lively emotion amongst them one of them determined to go and see what this reformation was and he returned to his valleys with good news and with pious books regular relations were from that time established between the reformers of switzerland france and germany and the christian shepherds of these mountains visits were exchanged farrell and saunier went amongst the vaudians and conversed with them about their common faith common in spite of certain differences rustic conferences composed of the principal landholders barbas or pastors and simple members of the faithful met more than once in the open air under the pines of their mountains the vaudians of provence had been settled there since the end of the thirteenth century and in the course of the fourteenth other vaudians from dauphiny and even from calabria had come thither to join them quote, quote, their barbas says a contemporary monk used to preside at their exercises of religion which were performed in secret as they were observed to be quiet and circumspect as they faithfully paid taxes tithe and seigneurial dues and as they were besides very laborious they were not troubled on the score of their habits and doctrines End quote. their new friends from switzerland and germany reproached them with concealment of their faith and worship as soon as they had overtly separated from the roman church persecution began francis i checked its first excesses but it soon began again the episcopal prisons were filled with vaudians who bristled at the summons to abjure and on the twenty ninth of march fifteen thirty five thirteen of them were sentenced to be burned alive pope paul the third complained to francis i of their obstinacy the king wrote about it to the parliament of Aix. 
the Parliament ordered the lords of the lands occupied by the Vaudians to force their vassals to abjure or leave the country. When cited to appear before the court of Esch to explain the grounds of their refusal, several declined. The court sentenced them, in default, to be burned alive. Their friends took up arms and went to deliver the prisoners. Merindol was understood to be the principal retreat of the sectaries. By decree of November 18, 1540, the Parliament ordered that, quote, the houses should be demolished and razed to the ground, the cellars filled up, the woods cut down, the trees of the gardens torn up, and that the lands of those who had lived in Marindol should not be able to be farmed out to anybody, whatever of their family or name, end quote. In the region of Parliament itself, complaints were raised against such hardships. The premier president, Barthélemy Chasseneux, was touched and adjourned the execution of the decree. The king commissioned William du Bellet to examine into the facts. The report of du Bellet was favorable to the Vaudians, as honest, laborious, and charitable farmers, discharging all the duties of civil life. But at the same time he acknowledged that they did not conform to the laws of the church, that they did not recognize the pope or the bishops, that they prayed in the vulgar tongue, and that they were in the habit of choosing certain persons from amongst themselves to be their pastors. On this report, Francis I, by a declaration of February 18, 1541, pardoned the Vaudians for all that had been irregular in their conduct, on condition that, within the space of three months, they should abjure their errors, and he ordered the Parliament to send to Esch deputies from their towns, burgs, and villages to make abjuration in the name of all, at the same time authorizing the Parliament to punish, according to the ordinances, those who should refuse to obey, and to make use, if need were, of the services of the soldiery. Thus persecuted and condemned for their mere faith, undemonstrative as it was, the Vaudians confined themselves to asking that it might be examined and its errors pointed out those of merindol and those of cabrières in the countship of venasque drew up their profession of faith and sent it to the king and to two bishops of the province cardinal sadolet bishop of carpentras and john dorandy bishop of cavaillon whose equity and moderation inspired them with some confidence cardinal sadolet did not belie their expectation he received them with kindness discussed with them their profession of faith pointed out to them diverse articles which might be remodelled without disavowing the basis of their creed and assured them that it would always be against his sentiments to have them treated as enemies Quote, i am astonished he wrote to the pope that these folks should be persecuted when the jews are spared End quote. The Bishop of Cavaillon testified towards them a favor less unalloyed. Quote, I was quite sure, said he, that there was not so much mischief amongst you as was supposed. However, to calm men's minds, it is necessary that you should submit to a certain appearance of abjuration. Quote, but what would you have us abjure if we are already within the truth? Quote, it is but a simple formality that I demand of you. I do not require in your case notary or signature. If you are unwilling to assent to this abjuration, none can argue you into it. Quote, we are plain men, Monseigneur. We are unwilling to do anything to which we cannot assent. End quote. And they persisted in their refusal to abjure. Cardinal Sadolet was summoned to Rome, and the premier president Chasseneux died suddenly. His successor, John de Meignier, baron of Oped, was a violent man, passionately bigoted, and moreover, it is said, a personal enemy of the Vaudians of Cabrières, on which his estates bordered. He recommenced against them a persecution which was at first covert. They had found protectors in Switzerland and in Germany. At the instance of Calvin, the Swiss Protestant cantons and the German princes assembled at Schmalkalden wrote to Francis I in their favor. It was to his interest to humor the Protestants of Germany, and that fact turned out to the advantage of the Vaudians of Provence, and on the 14th of June, 1544, he issued an edict which, suspending the proceedings commenced against them, restored to them their privileges, and ordered such of them as were prisoners to be set at large, quote, and as the attorney-general of Provence, End quote. it goes on to say quote, is related to the archbishop of esch their sworn enemy there will be sent in his place a counsellor of the court for to inform me of their innocence End quote. but some months later the peace of crespi was made and francis i felt no longer the same solicitude about humouring the protestants of switzerland and germany baron d'oped zealously resumed his work against the vaudians 
he accused them of intriguing with foreign reformers and of designing to raise fifteen thousand men to surprise marseilles and form provence into a republic on the first of january fifteen forty five francis i signed without reading it they say the revocation of his edict of fifteen forty four and ordered execution of the decree issued by the parliament of esch dated november eighteen fifteen forty on the subject of the vaudians quote, notwithstanding all letters of grace posterior to that epoch and ordered the governor of the province to give for that purpose the assistance of the strong hand to justice End quote. The duty of assisting justice was assigned to Baron Doped, and from the 7th to the 25th of April, 1545, two columns of troops, under the orders respectively of Oped himself and Baron de la Garde, ravaged with fire and sword the three districts of Merindol, Cabrière, and Lacoste, which were peopled chiefly by Vaudians. We shrink from describing in detail all the horrors committed against a population without any means of self-defense by troops giving free rein to their brutal passions and gratifying the hateful passions of their leaders. In the end, three small towns and twenty-two villages were completely sacked. Seven hundred and sixty-three houses, eighty-nine cattle sheds, and thirty-one barns burned, three thousand persons massacred, two hundred and fifty-five executed subsequently to the massacre, after a mockery of trial, six or seven hundred sent to the galleys, many children sold for slaves, and the victors, on retiring, left behind them a double ordinance from the Parliament of Esch and the Vice-Legate of Avignon, dated the 24th of April, 1545, forbidding, quote, that any one, on pain of death, should dare to give asylum, aid, or succor, or furnish money or victuals to any Vaudian or heretic. End quote. It is said that Francis I, when near his end, repented of this odious extermination of a small population, which, with his usual fickleness and carelessness, he had at one time protected, and at another abandoned to its enemies. Amongst his last words to his son Henry II was an exhortation to cause an inquiry to be made into the iniquities committed by the Parliament of Esch in this instance. It will be seen, at the opening of Henry II's reign, what was the result of this exhortation of his father's. Calvin was lately mentioned as having pleaded the cause of the Vaudians in 1544 amongst the Protestants of Switzerland and Germany. It was from Geneva, where he had lived and been the dominant spirit for many years, that the French reformer had exercised such influence over the chiefs of the German Reformation in favor of that small population whose creed and morals had anticipated by several centuries the Reformation in the sixteenth century. He was born in 1509 at Noyon in Picardy was brought up in the bosom of the catholic church and held a cure in fifteen twenty seven at pont l'eveque where he preached several times quote, joyous and almost proud as he said himself that a single dissertation had brought me a cure in fifteen thirty four study meditation on the gospels discussion of the religious and moral questions raised on every side and the free atmosphere of the new spirit that was abroad changed his convictions and his resolves he abandoned the career of the law as well as that of the established church resigned his cure at pont l'eveque and devoted himself entirely to the work of the nascent and much opposed reformation having a mind that was judicious and free from illusion in the very heat of passion he soon saw to what an extent the success of the reformation in france was difficult and problematical in fifteen thirty five impressed by the obstacles it met with even more than by the dangers it evoked he resolved to leave his country and go else whither in search of security liberty and the possibility of defending a cause which became the dearer to him in proportion as it was the more persecuted he had too much sagacity not to perceive that he was rapidly exhausting his various places of asylum queen marguerite of navarre was unwilling to try too far the temper of the king her brother canon louis du tillet was a little fearful lest his splendid library should be somewhat endangered through the use made of it by his guest who went about arguing or preaching in the vicinity of angouleme the queen's almoner gerard roussel considered that calvin was going too far and grew apprehensive lest if the reformation should completely succeed it might suppress the bishopric of oleron which he desired and which indeed he at a later period obtained lefebvre of etaples who was the most of all in sympathy with calvin was seventy-nine years old and had made up his mind to pass his last days in peace 
Calvin quitted Angoulême and Nérac, and went to pass some time at Poitiers, where the friends of the Reformation, assembling round him and hanging upon his words, for the first time celebrated the Lord's Supper in a grotto close to the town, which still goes by the name of Calvin's Grotto. Being soon obliged to leave Poitiers, Calvin went to Orléans, then secretly to Paris, then to Noyon to see his family once more, and set out at last for Strasbourg, already one of the strongholds of the Reformation, where he had friends, amongst others the learned Busser, with whom he had kept up a constant correspondence. He arrived there at the beginning of the year 1535. But it was not at Strasbourg that he took up his quarters. He preferred Bâle, where also there was a reunion of men of letters, scholars, and celebrated printers, Erasmus, Simon Grinet, or Grimius, and the Frobens, and where Calvin calculated upon finding the leisure and aid he required for executing the great work he had been for some time contemplating, his Institution de la Religion Chrétienne, or Christian Institutes. This would not be the place, and we have no intention, to sum up the religious doctrines of that book we might challenge many of them as contrary to the true meaning and moral tendency of christianity but we desire to set in a clear light their distinctive and original characteristics which are those of calvin himself in the midst of his age these characteristics are revealed in the preface and even in the dedication of the book it is to francis i the persecutor of the french reformers during one of the most cruel stages of the persecution and at the very moment when he had just left his own country in order that he may live in security and speak with freedom that calvin dedicates his work Quote, do not imagine he says to the king that i am attempting here my own special defence in order to obtain permission to return to the country of my birth from which although i fear for it such human affection as is my bounden duty yet as things are now i do not suffer any great anguish at being cut off but i am taking up the cause of all the faithful and even that of christ which is in these days so mangled and downtrodden in your kingdom that it seems to be in a desperate plight and this has no doubt come to pass rather through the tyranny of certain pharisees than of your own free will calvin was at the same time the boldest and the least revolutionary amongst the innovators of the sixteenth century bold as a christian thinker but full of deference and consideration towards authority even when he was flagrantly withdrawing himself from it the idea of his book was at first exclusively religious and intended for the bulk of the french reformers but at the moment when calvin is about to publish it prudence and policy recur to his mind and it is to the king of france that he addresses himself it is the authority of the royal persecutor that he invokes it is the reason of francis i that he attempts to convince he acts like a respectful and faithful subject as well as an independent and innovating christian End of section twenty five Section 26 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 30. Francis I and the Reformation, Part 6. After having wandered for some time longer in Switzerland, Germany, and Italy, Calvin, in 1536, arrived at Geneva it was at this time a small independent republic which had bravely emancipated itself from the domination of the dukes of savoy and in which the reformation had acquired strength but it had not yet got rid of that lawless and precarious condition which is the first phase presented by revolutionary innovations after victory neither the political nor the religious community at geneva had yet received any organization which could be called regular or regarded as definitive the two communities had not yet understood and regulated their reciprocal positions and the terms on which they were to live together. All was ferment and haze in this little nascent state, as regarded the mental as well as the actual condition when Calvin arrived there. His name was already almost famous there. He had given proofs of devotion to the cause of the Reformation. His book on the Institution de la Religion Chrétienne had just appeared a great instinct for organization was strikingly evinced in it at the same time that the dedication to francis i testified to a serious regard for the principle of authority and for its rights as well as the part it ought to perform in human communities 
Calvin had many friends in Switzerland, and they urged him to settle at once at Geneva, and to labor at establishing there Christian order in the Reformed Church simultaneously with its independence and its religious liberties in its relations with the civil estate. At first Calvin hesitated and resisted. He was one of those who take strict account beforehand of the difficulties to be encountered and the trials to be undergone in any enterprise for the success of which they are most desirous, and who inwardly shudder at the prospect of such a burden. But the Christian's duty, the reformer's zeal, the lively apprehension of the perils which were being incurred by the cause of the Reformation, and the nobly ambitious hope of delivering it, these sentiments united prevailed over the first misgivings of that great and mighty soul, and Calvin devoted himself in Geneva to a work which from 1536 to 1564, in a course of violent struggles and painful vicissitudes, was to absorb and rapidly consume his whole life. From that time forth a principle, we should rather say a passion, held sway in Calvin's heart, and was his guiding star in the permanent organization of the church which he founded, as well as in his personal conduct during his life. That principle is the profound distinction between the religious and the civil community distinction we say and by no means separation calvin on the contrary desired alliance between the two communities and the two powers but each to be independent in its own domain combining their action showing mutual respect and lending mutual support to this alliance he looked for the reformation and the moral discipline of the members of the church placed under the authority of its own special religious officers and upheld by the indirect influence of the civil power in this principle and this fundamental labor of Calvin's there were two new and bold reforms attempted in the very heart of the great Reformation in Europe, and over and above the work of its first promoters. Henry the Eighth, on removing the Church of England from the domination of the papacy, had proclaimed himself its head, and the Church of England had accepted this royal supremacy. Zwingle, when he provoked in German Switzerland the rupture with the Church of Rome, had approved of the arrangement that the sovereign authority in matters of religion should pass into the hands of the civil powers. Luther himself, at the same time that he reserved to the new German Church a certain measure of spontaneity and liberty, had placed it under the protection and preponderance of laic sovereigns in this great question as to the relations between church and state calvin desired and did more than his predecessors even before he played any considerable part in the european reformation as soon as he heard of henry the eighth's religious supremacy in england he had strongly declared against such a regimen with an equitable spirit rare in his day and in spite of his contest with the church of rome he was struck with the strength and dignity conferred upon that church by having an existence distinct from the civil community and by the independence of its head. When he himself became a great reformer, he did not wish the reformed church to lose this grand characteristic. Whilst proclaiming it evangelical, he demanded for it, in matters of faith and discipline, the independence and special authority which had been possessed by the primitive church. And in spite of the resistance often shown to him by the civil magistrates, in spite of the concessions he was sometimes obliged to make to them, he firmly maintained this principle, and he secured to the Reformed Church of Geneva, in purely religious questions and affairs, the right of self-government, according to the faith and the law as they stand written in the holy books. He at the same time put in force in this church a second principle of no less importance, in the course of ages and by a series of successive modifications some natural and others factitious and illegitimate the christian church had become so to speak cut in two into the ecclesiastical community and the religious community the clergy and the worshippers in the catholic church the power was entirely in the hands of the clergy the ecclesiastical body completely governed the religious body and whilst the latter was advancing more and more in laic ideas and sentiments the former remained even more and more distinct and sovereign the german and english reformations had already modified this state of things and given to the lay community a certain portion of influence in religious questions and affairs Calvin provided for the matter in a still more direct and effectual fashion, not only as regarded affairs in general, but even the choice of pastors. He gave admission to laymen, in larger number too than that of the ecclesiastics, into the consistories and synods, the governing authorities in the Reformed Church. He thus did away with the separation between the clergy and the worshippers. He called upon them to deliberate and act together and to secure to the religious community in its entirety their share of authority in the affairs and fortunes of the church 
thus began at geneva under the inspiration and through the influence of calvin that ecclesiastical organization which developing completing and modifying itself according to the requirements of places and times became under the name of presbyterian regimen the regimen of the reformed churches in france french switzerland holland scotland and amongst a considerable portion of the protestant population in england and in the united states of america a regimen evangelical in origin and character, republican in some of its maxims and institutions, but no stranger to the principle of authority, one which admitted of discipline and was calculated for duration, and which has kept for three centuries amongst the most civilized people a large measure of Christian faith, ecclesiastical order, and civil liberty. It was a French refugee who instituted in a foreign city this regimen and left it as a legacy to the French Reformation and to the numerous Christian communities who were eager to adopt it. It is on this ground that Calvin takes a place in the history of France and has a fair right to be counted amongst the eminent men who have carried to a distance the influence, the language, and the fame of the country in the bosom of which it was not permitted them to live and labor in fifteen forty seven when the death of francis i was at hand that ecclesiastical organization of protestantism which calvin had instituted at geneva was not even begun in france the french protestants were as yet but isolated and scattered individuals without any bond of generally accepted and practised faith or discipline and without any eminent and recognised heads the reformation pursued its course but a reformed church did not exist and this confused mass of reformers and reformed had to face an old a powerful and a strongly constituted church which looked upon the innovators as rebels over whom it had every right as much as against them it had every arm in each of the two camps prevailed errors of enormous magnitude and fruitful of fatal consequences catholics and protestants both believed themselves to be in exclusive possession of the truth of all religious truth and to have the right of imposing it by force upon their adversaries the moment they had the power both were strangers to any respect for human conscience human thought and human liberty those who had clamoured for this on their own account when they were weak had no regard for it in respect of others when they felt themselves to be strong on the side of the protestants the ferment was at full heat but as yet vague and unsettled on the part of the catholics the persecution was unscrupulous and unlimited such was the position and such the state of feeling in which francis i at his death on the thirty first of march fifteen forty seven left the two parties that had already been at grips during his reign he had not succeeded either in reconciling them or in securing the triumph of that which had his favour and the defeat of that which he would have liked to vanquish that was in nearly all that he undertook his fate he lacked the spirit of sequence and steady persistence and his merits as well as his defects almost equally urged him on to rashly attempt that which he only incompletely executed he was neither prudent nor persevering and he may be almost said to have laid himself out to please everybody rather than to succeed in one and the same great purpose a short time before his death a venetian ambassador who had resided a long while at his court marino cavalli drew up and forwarded to the senate of venice a portrait of him so observantly sketched and so full of truth that it must be placed here side by side with the more exacting and more severe judgment already pronounced here touching this brilliant but by no means far-sighted or effective king Quote, the king is now fifty years of age his aspect is in every respect kingly insomuch that without ever having seen his face or his portrait any one on merely looking at him would say at once that is the king all his movements are so noble and majestic that no prince could equal them his constitution is robust in spite of the excessive fatigue he has constantly undergone and still undergoes in so many expeditions and travels he eats and drinks a great deal sleeps still better and what is more dreams of nothing but leading a jolly life he is rather fond of being an exquisite in his dress, which is slashed and laced, and rich with jewellery and precious stones. Even his doublets are daintily worked and of golden tissue. His shirt is very fine, and it shows through an opening in the doublet, according to the fashion of France. This delicate and dainty way of living contributes to his health. In proportion as the king bears bodily fatigue well, and endures it without bending beneath the burden, in the same proportion do mental cares weigh heavily upon him, and he shifts them almost entirely on to the Cardinal de Tournon and to Admiral Annebault. He takes no resolve, he makes no reply, without having had their advice. 
and if ever which is very rare an answer happens to be given or a concession made without having received the approval of these two advisers he revokes it or modifies it but in what concerns the great affairs of state peace or war his majesty docile as he is in everything else will have the rest obedient to his wishes in that case there is nobody at court whatever authority he may possess who dare gainsay his majesty this prince has a very sound judgment and a great deal of information there is no sort of thing or study or art about which he cannot converse very much to the point it is true that when people see how in spite of his knowledge and his fine talk all his warlike enterprises have turned out ill they say that all his wisdom lies on his lips and not in his mind but i think that the calamities of this king come from lack of men capable of properly carrying out his designs as for him he will never have anything to do with the execution or even with the superintendence of it in any way it seems to him quite enough to know his own part which is to command and to supply plans accordingly that which might be wished for in him is a little more care and patience not by any means more experience and knowledge his majesty readily pardons offences and he becomes heartily reconciled with those whom he has offended it is said that at the close of his reign francis i in spite of all the resources of his mind and all his easy-going qualities was much depressed and that he died in sadness and disquietude as to the future one may be inclined to think that in his egotism he was more sad on his own account than disquieted on that of his successors and of france however that may be he was assuredly far from foreseeing the terrible civil war which began after him and the crimes as well as disasters which it caused none of his more intimate circle was any longer in a position to excite his solicitude his mother louise of savoy had died sixteen years before him september twenty second fifteen thirty one his most able and most wicked adviser chancellor duprat twelve years july twenty ninth fifteen thirty five his sister marguerite survived him two years she died december twenty first fifteen forty nine quote, disgusted with everything say the historians and quote, weary of life end quote. said she herself quote, no father now have i no mother sister or brother on god alone i now rely who ruleth over earth and sky o world i say good-bye to you to relatives and friendly ties to honours and to wealth adieu I hold them all for enemies. End quote. And yet Marguerite was loath to leave life. She had always been troubled at the idea of death. When she was spoken to about eternal life, she would shake her head sometimes, saying, quote, All that is true, but we remain a mighty long while dead underground before arriving there. End quote. When she was told that her end was near, she quote, considered that a very bitter word. End quote saying that, quote, she was not so old, but that she might still live some years, end quote. She had been the most generous, the most affectionate, and the most lovable person in a family and a court which were both corrupt, and of which she only too often acquiesced in the weaknesses and even vices, though she always fought against their injustice and their cruelty. She had the honour of being the grandmother of Henry the Fourth. End of section 26. Section 27 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 31. Henry II. 1547 to 1559, Part 1. Henry the Second had all the defects, and with the exception of personal bravery, not one amongst the brilliant and amiable qualities of the king his father. Like Francis I, he was rash and reckless in his resolves and enterprises, but without having the promptness, the fertility, and the suppleness of mind which Francis I displayed in getting out of the awkward positions in which he had placed himself, and in stalling off or mitigating the consequences of them. Henry was as cold and ungenial as Francis had been gracious and able to please. And whilst Francis I, even if he were a bad master to himself, was at any rate his own master, Henry II submitted without resistance, and probably without knowing it, to the influence of the favourite who reigned in his house, as well as in his court, 
and of the advisers who were predominant in his government. Two facts will suffice to set in a clear light at the commencement of the new reign this regrettable analogy in the defects and this profound diversity in the mind, character, and conduct of the two kings. Towards the close of 1542, a grievous aggravation of the tax upon salt called Babel caused a violent insurrection in the town of Rochelle, which was exempted, it was said, by its traditional privileges from that impost. Not only was payment refused, but the commissioners were maltreated and driven away. Francis I considered the matter grave enough to require his presence for its repression. He repaired to Rochelle with a numerous body of Lanzknechts. The terrified population appeared to have determined upon submission, and having assembled in a mass at the town hall, there awaited anxiously the king's arrival. On the 1st of January, 1543, Francis I entered the town in state, surrounded by his escort. The people's advocate fell on his knees, and appealed to the king's clemency in dealing with a revolt of which every one repented. The king, who was seated on a wooden boarding, rose up. Quote, "'Speak we no more of revolt,' said he. "'I desire neither to destroy your persons nor to seize your goods, as was lately done by the Emperor Charles to the Gentees, whereby his hands are stained with blood. I long more for the hearts of my subjects than for their lives and their riches.' I will never at any time of my life think again of your offence, and I pardon you without accepting a single thing. I desire that the keys of your city and your arms be given back to you, and that you be completely reinstated in your liberties and your privileges. End quote. The cheers of the people responded to these words of the king. Quote, I think I have won your hearts, said the king on retiring, and I assure you, on the honour of a gentleman, that you have mine. I desire that you ring your bells, for you are pardoned. The Rochelese were let off for a fine of two hundred thousand francs, which the king gave to his keeper of the seals, Francis de Montalon, whom he wished to compensate for his good service. The keeper of the seals, in his turn, made a present of them to the town of Rochelle to found a hospital. But the ordinances as to the salt tax were maintained in principle, and their extension led some years afterwards to a rising of a more serious character, and very differently repressed. In 1548, hardly a year after the accession of Henry II, and in the midst of the rejoicings he had gone to be present at in the north of Italy, he received news at Turin to the effect that in Guienne, Angoumois, and Saint-Ange, a violent and pretty general insurrection had broken out against the salt tax, which Francis I, shortly before his death, had made heavier in these provinces. The local authorities in vain attempted to repress the rising. The insurgent peasants scoured the country in strong bodies, giving free rein not only to their desires, but also to their revengeful feelings. The most atrocious excesses of which a mob is capable were committed. The director-general of the gable was massacred cruelly, and two of his officers at Angoulême were strapped down stark naked on a table, beaten to death, and had their bodies cast into the river with the insulting remark, quote, Go, wicked gablers, and salt the fish of the Charente. End quote. The king of Navarre's lieutenant, being appealed to for aid, summoned, but to no purpose, the Parliament of Bordeaux. He was forced to take refuge in Chateau Trompette, and was massacred by the populace whilst he was trying to get out. The President of the Parliament, a most worthy magistrate, and very much beloved, it is said, by the people, only saved his own life by taking the oath prescribed by the insurgents. Quote, this news, says Vieilleville in his contemporary memoir, grievously afflicted the king, and the constable de Montmorency represented to him that it was not the first time that these people had been capricious, rebellious, and mutinous, for that in the reign of his lord and father, the late king, the Rochelese and surrounding districts had forgotten themselves in like manner. They ought to be exterminated, and in the case of need, be replaced by a new colony, that they might never return." The said Sir Constable offered to take the matter in hand, and with ten companies of the old hands, whom he would raise in Piedmont, and as many lanzknechts, a thousand men-at-arms all told, he promised to exact a full account, and satisfy his majesty. End quote. Montmorency was as good as his word. When he arrived with his troops in Guienne, the people of Bordeaux, in a fit of terror, sent to Langon a large boat, 
most magnificently fitted up, in which were chambers and saloons emblazoned with the arms of the said Sir Constable, with three or four deputies to present it to him, and beg him to embark upon it and drop down to their city. He repulsed them indignantly. Quote, "'Away, away,' said he, with your boat and your keys. I will have naught to do with them. I have others here with me, which will make me other kind of opening than yours. I will have you all hanged. I will teach you to rebel against your king, and murder his governor and his lieutenant.'" End quote. And he did, in fact, enter Bordeaux, on the ninth of October, 1548, by a breach which he had opened in the walls, and after having traversed the city, between two lines of soldiers, and with his guns bearing on the suspected points, he ordered the inhabitants to bring all their arms to the citadel. Executions followed immediately after this moral as well as material victory. Quote, More than a hundred and forty persons were put to death by various kinds of punishments, says Vieville and by a most equitable sentence, when the executioner had in his hands the three insurgents who had beaten to death and thrown into the river the two collectors of the Babel at Angoulême, he cast them all three into a fire which was ready at the spot, and said to them aloud, in conformity with the judgment against them, Go, rabid hounds, and grill the fish of the Charente, which ye salted with the bodies of the officers of your king and sovereign lord. As to civil death, or loss of civil rights, adds Vieville, nearly all the inhabitants made honourable amends in open street, on their knees, before the said lords, at the window, crying mercy and asking pardon, and more than a hundred, because of their youth, were simply whipped. Astounding fines and interdictions were laid as well upon the body composing the court of Parliament as upon the town council, and on a great number of private individuals." the very bells were not exempt from experiencing the wrath and vengeance of the prince for not a single one remained throughout the city or in the open country to say nothing of the clocks which were not spared either which was not broken up and confiscated to the king's service for his guns End quote. the insurrection at bordeaux against the gable in fifteen forty eight was certainly more serious than that of rochelle in fifteen forty two but it is also quite certain that Francis I would not have set about repressing it as Henry II did. He would have appeared there himself, and risked his own person instead of leaving the matter to the harshest of his lieutenants, and he would have more skilfully intermingled generosity with force, and kind words with acts of severity, and that is one of the secrets of governing. In 1549, scarcely one year after the revolt at Bordeaux, Henry II, then at Amiens, granted to deputies from Poitou, Rochelle, the district of Onis, Limousin, Perigord, and Saint-Ange, almost complete abolition of the Babel in Guienne, which paid the king, by way of compensation, two hundred thousand crowns of gold for the expenses of war or the redemption of certain alienated domains. We may admit that on the day after the revolt the arbitrary and bloody proceedings of the Constable de Montmorency must have produced upon the insurgents of Bordeaux the effect of a salutary fright. But we may doubt whether so cruel a repression was absolutely indispensable in 1548, when in 1549 the concession demanded in the former year was to be recognized as necessary. According to de Thou and the majority of historians, it was on the occasion of the insurrection in Guienne against the Babel that Stéphane de la Boétie, the young and intimate friend of Montaigne, wrote his celebrated Discours de la Servitude Volontaire, ou Le Contrain, an eloquent declamation against monarchy. But the testimony of Montaigne himself upsets the theory of this coincidence written in his own hand upon a manuscript partly autograph of the treatise by de la boetie is a statement that it was the work quote, of a lad of sixteen de la boetie was born at sarlat on the first of november fifteen thirty and was therefore sixteen in fifteen forty six two years before the insurrection at bordeaux the contrain besides is a work of pure theory and general philosophy containing no allusion at all to the events of the day to the sedition in guienne no more than to any other this little work owed to montaigne's affectionate regard for its author a great portion of its celebrity published for the first time in fifteen seventy eight in the memoire de l'état de france after having up to that time run its course without any author's name any title or any date 
It was soon afterwards so completely forgotten, that when in the middle of the seventeenth century Cardinal de Richelieu for the first time heard it mentioned, and, quote, sent one of his gentlemen over the whole street of Saint-Jacques to inquire for la servitude volontaire, all the publishers said, we don't know what it is. The son of one of them recollected something about it, and said to the cardinal's gentleman, Sir, there is a book fancier who has what you seek, but with no covers to it, and he wants five pistoles for it. Very well, said the gentleman, and the cardinal de Richelieu paid fifty francs for the pleasure of reading the little political pamphlet by a lad of sixteen, which probably made very little impression upon him, but which, thanks to the elegance and vivacity of its style, and the affectionate admiration of the greatest independent thinker of the sixteenth century, has found a place in the history of French literature. History must do justice even to the men whose brutal violence she stigmatizes and reproves. In the case of Anne de Montmorency, it often took the form of threats intended to save him from the necessity of acts. When he came upon a scene of any great confusion and disorder, quote, "'Go hang me such a one,' he would say, "'tie yon fellow to that tree, dispatch this fellow with pikes and arquebuses, this very minute, right before my eyes. Cut me in pieces all those rascals who chose to hold such a clock-case as this against the king. Burn me yonder village.' Light me up a blaze everywhere for a quarter of a mile all round. End quote. The same man paid the greatest attention to the discipline and good condition of his troops, in order to save the populations from their requisitions and excesses. Quote, On the twentieth of November, fifteen forty nine, he obtained and published at Paris, says de Thou, a proclamation from the king, doubling the pay of the men at arms, arquebusier and light horse, and forbidding them at the same time, on pain of death, to take anything without paying for it. A bad habit had introduced itself amongst the troops, whether they were going on service or returning, whether they were in the field or in winter quarters, of keeping themselves at the expense of those amongst whom they lived. Thence proceeded an infinity of irregularities and losses in the towns and in the country, wherein the people had to suffer at the hands of an insolent soldiery the same vexations as if it had been an enemy's country. Not only was a stop put to such excesses, but care was further taken that the people should not be oppressed under pretext of recruitments which had to be carried out. End quote. A nephew of the Constable de Montmorency, a young man of twenty-three, who at a later period became admiral de coligny was ordered to see to the execution of these protective measures and he drew up between fifteen fifty and fifteen fifty two at first for his own regiment of foot and afterwards as colonel-general of this army rules of military discipline which remained for a long while in force there was war in the atmosphere the king and his advisers the court and the people had their minds almost equally full of it some in sheer dread, and others with an eye to preparation. The reign of Francis I had ended mournfully. The peace of Crespi had hurt the feelings, both of royalty and of the nation. Henry, now king, had as Dauphin felt called upon to disavow it. It had left England in possession of Calais and Boulogne, and confirmed the dominion or ascendancy of Charles V in Germany, Italy, and Spain, on all the French frontiers. How was the struggle to be recommenced? What course must be adopted to sustain it successfully? To fall back upon, there were the seven provincial legions, which had been formed by Francis I for Normandy, Picardy, Burgundy, Dauphiny, and Provence United, Languedoc, Guienne, and Brittany. But they were not like permanent troops, drilled and always ready. They were recruited by voluntary enlistment. They generally remained at their own homes, receiving compensation at review time and high pay in time of war. The Constable de Montmorency had no confidence in these legions. He spoke of them contemptuously, and would much rather have increased the number of the foreign corps, regularly paid and kept up Swiss or Lanxnext. Two systems of policy and warfare, moreover, divided the king's council in two. Montmorency, now old and worn out in body and mind, he was born in 1492, and so was sixty in 1552, was for a purely defensive attitude, no adventures or battles to be sought, but victuals and all sorts of supplies to be destroyed in the provinces which might be invaded by the enemy, so that instead of winning victories there, he might not even be able to live there. 
In 1536, this system had been found successful by the constable in causing the failure of Charles V's invasion of Provence. But in 1550, a new generation had come into the world, the court and the army. It comprised young men full of ardor and already distinguished for their capacity and valor. Francis de Lorraine, Duke of Guise, born at the castle of Bar, February 17, 1519, was 31. His brother, Charles de Guise, Cardinal of Lorraine, was only six and twenty. He was born at Joinville, February 17, 1524. Francis de Scepeau, born at Dortal, Anjou, in 1510, who afterwards became Marshal de Vieville, was at this time nearly forty, but he had contributed in 1541 to the victory of Ceresol, and Francis I had made so much of it that he had said on presenting him to his son Henry, quote, He is no older than you, and see what he has done already. If the wars do not swallow him up, you will some day make him constable or marshal of France. End quote. Gaspard de Coligny, born at chatillon sur loing February 16, 1517, was thirty-three, and his brother, Francis d'Andelot, born at Châtillon in 1521, twenty-nine. These men, warriors and politicians at one at the same time, in a high social position and in the flower of their age, could not reconcile themselves to the Constable de Montmorency's system, defensive solely and prudential to the verge of inertness. They thought that in order to repair the reverses of France, and for the sake of their own fame, there was something else to be done, and they impatiently awaited the opportunity. End of section 27 Section 28 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 31. Henry II, 1547-1559, to 1559, Part 2. It was not long coming. At the close of 1551, a deputation of the Protestant princes of Germany came to Fontainebleau to ask for the king's support against the aggressive and persecuting despotism of Charles V. The Count of Nassau made a speech, quote, very long, says Vieville in his memoir, at the same time that it was in very elegant language, whereby all the presents received very great contentment. End quote. Next day, the king put the demand before his council for consideration, and expressed at the very outset his own opinion that, quote, in the present state of affairs, he ought not to take up any enterprise, but leave his subjects of all conditions to rest, for generally, said he, all have suffered and do suffer when armies pass and repass so often through my kingdom, which cannot be done without pitiable oppression and trampling down of the poor people. Unquote. The constable, Quote, without respect of persons, says Vieville, following his custom of not giving way to anybody, forthwith began to speak, saying that the king, who asked counsel of them, had very plainly given it them himself, and made them very clearly to understand his own idea, which ought to be followed point by point without any gainsaying, he having said nothing but what was most equitable and well known to the company. End quote. Nearly all the members of the council gave in their adhesion, without comment, to the opinion of the king and the constable. Quote, but when it came to the turn of M. de Veilleville, who had adopted the language of the court of Nassau, end quote, he unhesitatingly expressed a contrary opinion, unfolding all the reasons which the king had for being distrustful of the emperor, and for not letting this chance of enfeebling him slip by. Quote, May it please your majesty, said he, to remember his late passage through France, to obtain which the emperor submitted to carte blanche. Nevertheless, when he was well out of the kingdom, he laughed at all his promises, and when he found himself inside Cambrai, he said to the prince of Infantado, 
Let not the king of France, if he be wise, put himself at my mercy, as I have been at his, for I swear by the living God that he shall not be quit for Burgundy and Champagne, but I would also insist upon Picardy and the key of the road to the Bastille of Paris, unless he were minded to lose his life, or be confined in perpetual imprisonment, until the whole of my wish were accomplished. Since thus it is, sir, and the emperor makes war upon you covertly, it must be made upon him overtly, without concealing one's game or dissimulating at all. No excuses must be allowed on the score of neediness, for France is inexhaustible if only by voluntary loans raised on the most comfortable classes of the realm. As for me, I consider myself one of the poorest of the company, or at any rate one of the least comfortable, but yet I have some fifteen thousand francs worth of plate, dinner and dessert, white and red, silver and gold, which I hereby offer to place in the hands of whomsoever you shall appoint, in order to contribute to the expenses of so laudable an enterprise as this. Putting off, moreover, for the present, the communication to you of a certain secret matter which one of the chiefs of this embassy hath told me, and I am certain that when you have discovered it, you will employ all your might and means to carry out that which I propose to you. End quote. The king asked Vieville what this secret matter was which he was keeping back. Quote, if it please your majesty to withdraw a part, I will tell it you, said Vieville. All the council rose, and Vieville, approaching his majesty, who called the constable only to his side, said, quote, Sir, you are well aware how the emperor got himself possessed of the imperial cities of Cambrai, Utrecht, and Liege, which he has incorporated with his own countship of Flanders, to the great detriment of the whole of Germany. The electoral princes of the Holy Empire have discovered that he has a project in his mind of doing just the same with the imperial cities of Metz, Strasbourg, Toul, Verdun, and such other towns on the Rhine as he shall be able to get hold of they have secretly adopted the idea of throwing themselves upon your resources, without which they cannot stop this detestable design, which would be the total ruin of the empire, and a manifest loss to your kingdom. Wherefore, take possession of the said towns, since opportunity offers, which will be about forty leagues of country gained without the loss of a single man, and an impregnable rampart for Champagne and Picardy and besides a fine and perfectly open road into the heart of the duchy of luxembourg and the districts below it as far as brussels however pacific the king's first words had been and whatever was the influence of the constable the proposal of vieville had a great effect upon the council the king showed great readiness to adopt it quote, I think, said he to the constable, that I was inspired of God when I created Vieville of my council to-day. Quote. Quote, I only gave the opinion I did, replied Montmorency, in order to support the king's sentiments. Let your majesty give what orders you please. End quote. The king loudly proclaimed his resolve. Quote, then let every one, he said, be ready at an early date, with equipment according to his ability and means, to follow me hoping, with God's help, that all will go well for the discomfiture of so pernicious a foe of my kingdom and nation, and one who revels and delights in tormenting all manner of folks without regard for any. End quote. There was a general enthusiasm. The place of meeting for the army was appointed at chalon sur marne March 10, 1552. More than a thousand gentlemen flocked thither as volunteers. Peasants and mechanics from Champagne and Picardy joined them, the war was popular. Quote, the majority of the soldiers, says Rabutin, a contemporary chronicler, were young men whose brains were on fire. End quote. Francis de Guise and Gaspard de Coligny were their chief leaders. The king entered Lorraine from Champagne by Joinville, the ordinary residence of the Dukes of Guise. He carried Pont à Mousson. Toul opened its gates to him on the 13th of April. He occupied Nancy on the 14th and on the eighteenth he entered metz not without some hesitation amongst a portion of the inhabitants and the necessity of a certain show of military force on the part of the leaders of the royal army the king would have given the command of this important place to vieilleville but he refused it saying quote, i humbly thank your majesty but i do not think that you should establish in metz any governor in your own name but leave that duty to the mayor and sheriffs of the city under whose orders the eight captains of the old train bands who will remain there with their companies will be End quote. 
quote, "'How say you?' said the king. "'Can I leave a foreign lieutenant in a foreign country "'whose oath of fidelity I have only had within the last twenty-four hours, "'and with all the difficulties and disputes in the world to meet, too?' End quote. Quote, "'Sir,' rejoined Vieville, "'to fear that this master sheriff, whose name is Talange, "'might possibly do you a bad turn, "'is to wrongly estimate his own competence, "'who never put his nose anywhere but into a bar-parlour "'to drink himself drunk. "'And it is also to show distrust of the excellent means you have "'for preventing all the ruses and artifices that might be invented "'to throw your service into confusion.'" The king acquiesced, but not without anxiety, in Vieville's refusal, and, leaving at Metz as governor, a relative of the constables, whom the latter warmly recommended to him, he set out on the 22nd of April, 1552, with all his household, to go and attempt in Alsace the same process that he had already carried out in Lorraine. Quote, but when we had entered upon the territory of Germany, says Vieville, our Frenchmen at once showed their insolence in their very first quarters, which so alarmed all the rest, that we never found from that moment a single man to speak to, and as long as the expedition lasted, there never appeared a soul with his provisions to sell on the road, whereby the army suffered infinite privations. This misfortune began with us at the approach to Saverne, or Zabern, the episcopal residence of Strasbourg." End quote. When the king arrived before Strasbourg, he found the gates closed, and the only offer to open them was on the condition that he should enter alone with forty persons for his whole suite. The constable, having taken a rash fit, was of opinion that he should enter even on this condition. This advice was considered by His Majesty to be very sound, as well as by the princes and lords who were about him, according to the natural tendency of the Frenchman, who is always for seconding and applauding what is said by the great." But Vieville, on being summoned to the king's quarters, opposed it strongly. Quote, Sir, said he, break this purpose, for in carrying it out you are in danger of incurring some very evil and very shameful fate. And should that happen, what will become of your army which will be left without head, prince or captain, and in a strange country, wherein we are already looked upon with ill will because of our insolence and indiscretions? As for me, I am off again to my quarters, to quaff and laugh with my two hundred men-at-arms, in readiness to march when your standard is afield, but not thither. End quote. Nothing has a greater effect upon weak and undecided minds than the firm language of men resolved to do as they say. The king gave up the idea of entering Strasbourg, and retired well pleased nevertheless, for he was in possession of Metz, Toul, Verdun, and Pont-à-Mousson, the keys for France into Germany, and at the head of an army under young commanders who were enterprising without being blindly rash. Charles V also had to know what necessity was, and to submit to it, without renouncing the totality of his designs. On the 2nd of August, 1552, he signed at Passau, with the Protestant princes, the celebrated treaty known under the name of, quote, Treaty of Public Peace. End quote, which referred the great questions of German pacification to a general diet to be assembled in six months, and declared that pending definitive conciliation, the two religions should be on an equal footing in the empire, that is, that the princes and free towns should have the supreme regulation of religious matters amongst themselves. Charles V thus recovered full liberty of action in his relations with France, and could no longer think of anything but how to recover the important towns he had lost in Lorraine. Henry II, on the other hand, who was asked by his Protestant allies on what conditions he would accept the peace of Passau, replied that at no price would he dispossess himself of the three bishoprics of Lorraine, and that he would for his part continue the contest he had undertaken for the liberation of Germany. The siege of Metz then became the great question of the day. Charles V made all his preparations to conduct it on an immense scale, and Henry II immediately ordered Francis de Guise to go and defend his new conquest at all hazards. Ambition which is really great accepts with joy great perils fraught with great opportunities. Guise wrote to Henry II's favourite, Diana de Poitiers, Duchess of Valentinois, to thank her for having helped to obtain for him this favour, which was about to bring him, quote, to the Emperor's very beard. End quote. He set out at once, first of all to Toul, where the plague prevailed, and where he wished to hurry on the repair of the ramparts. 
Money was wanting to pay the working corps, and he himself advanced the necessary sum. On arriving at Metz on the 17th of August, 1552, he found there only twelve companies of infantry, new levies, and every evening he drilled them himself in front of his quarters. A host of volunteers, great lords, simple gentlemen, and rich and brave burgesses, soon came to him, quote, eager to aid him in repelling the greatest and most powerful effort ever made by the emperor against their country and their king, End quote. This concourse of warriors, the majority of them well known and several of them distinguished, redoubled the confidence and ardor of the rank and file in the army. We find, under the title of Chanson faite en 1552, par un soldat étant à Metz en guérison, this couplet. My lord of Guise is here at home, with many a noble at his side, with the two children of Vendôme, with bold Nemours in all his pride, and Strozzi, too, a warrior tried, who ceases not by night or day around the city walls to stride, and strengthen Metz in every way. Peter Strozzi, quote, the man in all the world, says Brantome, who could best arrange and order battles and battalions, and could best post them to his advantage. End quote. To put into condition the tottering fortifications of Metz, and to have the place well supplied, was the first task undertaken by its indefatigable governor. He never ceased to meet the calls upon him, either in person or in purse. He was seen directing the workmen, taking his meals with them, and setting them a good example by carrying the hod for several hours. He frequently went out on horseback to reconnoitre the country, visit the points of approach and lodgment that the enemy might make use of around the town, and take measures of precaution at the places whereby they might do harm, as well as at those where it would be not only advantageous for the French to make sallies or to set ambuscades, but also to secure a retreat. Charles V, naturally slow as he was in his operations no less than in his resolves, gave the activity of Guise time to bear fruit. Quote, I mean to batter the town of Metz in such style as to knock it about the ears of M. de Guise, said he at the end of August 1552, and I make small account of the other places that the king may have beyond that. End quote. On the 15th of September following, Charles was still fifteen leagues from Metz, on the territory of Deux Ponts, and it was only on the 19th of October that the Duke of Alba, his captain-general, arrived with 24,000 men, the advance guard, within a league of the place which, it is said, was to be ultimately besieged by 100,000 foot, 23,000 horse, 120 pieces of artillery, and 7,000 pioneers. Quote, After one and the first encounter, says a journal of the siege, the enemy held our soldiers in good repute, not having seen them for any sort of danger, advance, or retreat, save as men of war and of assured courage, which was an advantage, for M. de Guise knew well that at the commencement of a war it was requisite that a leader should try as much as ever he could to win. End quote. It was only on the 20th of November that Charles V, ill of gout at Thionville and unable to stand on his legs, perceived the necessity of being present in person at the siege, and appeared before Metz on an Arab horse, with his face pale and worn, his eyes sunk in his head, and his beard white. At sight of him there was a most tremendous salute of arquebuses and artillery, the noise of which brought the whole town to arms. The emperor, whilst waiting to establish himself at the castle of La Hogne, took up his quarters near the Duke of Alba, in a little wooden house built out of the ruins of the Abbey of St. Clement. Quote, a beautiful palace, said he, when the keys of Metz are brought to me there. End quote. From the 20th to the 26th, the attack was continued with redoubled vigor. Fourteen thousand cannon shots were fired, it is said, in a single day. Guise had remarked that the enemy seemed preparing to direct the principal assault against a point so strong that nobody had thought of pulling down the houses in its vicinity. This oversight was immediately repaired, and a stout wall, the height of a man, made out of the ruins. Quote, if they send us peas, said Guise, we will give them black beans, or we will give them at least as good as they bring. End quote. On the 26th of November, the old wall was battered by a formidable artillery, and breached in three places, it crumbled down on the 28th into the ditch, quote, at the same time making it difficult to climb for to come to the assault, end quote. 
The assailants uttered shouts of joy, but when the cloud of dust had cleared off, they saw a fresh rampart eight feet in height above the breach, quote, and they experienced as much and even more disgust than they had felt pleasure at seeing the wall tumble. End quote. The besieged heaped mockery and insult upon them. But Guise, quote, imperatively put a stop to the disturbance, fearing, it is said, lest some traitor should take advantage of it to give the assailants some advice, and the soldiers then conceived the idea of sticking upon the points of their pikes live cats, the cries of which seemed to show derision of the enemy. End quote. The siege went on for a month longer without making any more impression, and the imperial troops kicked against any fresh assaults. Quote, I was wont once upon a time to be followed to battle, Charles V would say, but I see that I have no longer men about me. I must bid farewell to the empire, and go shut myself up in some monastery. Before three years are over I shall turn cordelier. End quote. Whilst Metz was still holding out, the fortress of Toul was summoned by the imperialists to open its gates. But the commandant replied, quote, When the town of Metz has been taken, when I have had the honor of being besieged in due form by the emperor, and when I have made as long a defense as the Duke of Guise has, such a summons may be addressed to me, and I will consider what I am to do. End quote. On the 26th of December, 1552, the 65th day since the arrival of the imperial army, and the 45th since the batteries had opened fire, Charles V resolved to raise the siege. Quote, I see very well, said he, that fortune resembles women. She prefers a young king to an old emperor. End quote. His army filed off by night, in silence, leaving behind its munitions and its tents, just as they stood, quote, driven away, almost, by the chastisement of heaven, says the contemporary chronicler Rabutin, with but two shots by way of signal. End quote. The ditty of the soldier just quoted ends thus. At last, so stout was her defence, from Metz they moved their guns away, and with the laugh at their expense, a tramping went their whole array. And at their tail the noble lord of Guise sent forth a goodly throng of cavalry with lance and sword, to teach them how to tramp along. Guise was far from expecting so sudden and decisive a result. Quote, Sing me no more flattering strains in your letters about the Emperor's dislodgment hence, he wrote on the 24th of December to his brother the Cardinal of Lorraine. Take it for certain that unless we be very much mistaken in him, he will not, as long as he has life, brook the shame of departing hence until he has seen it all out. End, quote. End of section 28《ポピュラルヒストリー・フランス》Section 29 of Volume 4 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett.《A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times》Volume 4 by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 31 Henry II, 1547 to 1559, Part 3. Irritated, and perhaps still more shocked, at so heavy a blow to his power and his renown, Charles V looked everywhere for a chance of taking his revenge. He flattered himself that he had found it in Terouanne, a fortress of importance at that time between Flanders and Artois, which had always been a dependency of the kingdom of France, and served as a rampart against the repeated incursions of the English, the masters of Calais. Charles knew that it was ill supplied with troops and munitions of war, and the court of Henry the Second, intoxicated with the deliverance of Metz, spoke disdainfully of the emperor, and paid no heed to anything but balls, festivals, and tournaments, in honor of the marriage between Diana d'Angoulême, the king's natural daughter, and Horatio Farnese, Duke of Castro. All of a sudden it was announced that the troops of Charles V were besieging Terouenne. The news was at first treated lightly. It was thought sufficient to send to Terouanne some reinforcements under the orders of Francis de Montmorency, the nephew of the constable, but the attack was repulsed with spirit by the besiegers, and brave as was the resistance offered by the besieged, who sustained for ten hours a sanguinary assault, on the 20th of June, 1553, Francis de Montmorency saw the impossibility of holding out longer, and on the advice of all his officers, offered to surrender the place, but he forgot to stipulate 
night in the first place for a truce, the Germans entered the town, thrown open without terms of capitulation. It was given up as prey to an army itself a prey to all the passions of soldiers, as well as to their master's vengeful feelings, and Terouanne, handed over for devastation, was for a whole month diligently demolished and razed to the ground. When Charles V at Brussels received news of the capture, quote, bonfires were lighted throughout Flanders, bells were rung, cannon were fired. End quote. It was but a poor revenge for so great a sovereign after the reverse he had just met with at Metz, but the fall of Terouanne was a grievous incident for France. Francis I was in the habit of saying that Terouanne in Flanders and Ac, now Dax, on the frontier of Guienne, were to him like two pillows on which he could rest tranquilly. Whilst these events were passing in Lorraine and Flanders, Henry II and his advisers were obstinately persisting in the bad policy which had been clung to by Charles VIII, Louis XII, and Francis I, that, in fact, of making conquests and holding possessions in Italy. War continued from Turin to Naples, between France, the Emperor, the Pope, and the local princes, with all sorts of alliances and alternations, but with no tangible result. Blaise de Montluc, defended the fortress of Siena for nine months against the imperialists, with an intelligence and a bravery which earned for him, twenty years later, the title of Marshal of France. Charles de Brissac was carrying on the war in Piedmont with such a combination of valour and generosity that the king sent him as a present his own sword, writing to him at the same time, quote, The opinion I have of your merit has become rooted even amongst foreigners. The emperor says that he would make himself monarch of the whole world if he had a Brissac to second his plans. End quote. His men, irritated at getting no pay, one day surrounded Brissac, complaining vehemently. Quote, you will always get bread by coming to me, said he, and he paid the debt of France by sacrificing his daughter's dowry, and borrowing a heavy sum from the Swiss on the security of his private fortune. It was by such devotion and such sacrifices that the French nobility paid for and justified their preponderance in the state, but they did not manage to succeed in the conduct of public affairs, and to satisfy the interests of a nation progressing in activity, riches, independence, and influence." Disquieted at the smallness of his success in Italy, Henry the Second flattered himself that he would regain his ascendancy there by sending thither the Duke of Guise, the hero of Metz, with an army of about twenty thousand men, French or Swiss, and a staff of experienced officers. But Guise was not more successful than his predecessors had been. After several attempts, by arms and negotiation amongst the local sovereigns, he met with a distinct failure in the kingdom of Naples, before the fortress of Civitella, the siege of which he was forced to raise on the 15th of May, 1557. Wearied out by want of success, sick in the midst of an army of sick, regretting over, quote, the pleasures of his field sports at Joinville, and begging his mother to have just a word or two written to him to console him, End quote. All he sighed for was to get back to France, and it was not long before the state of affairs recalled him thither. It was now nearly two years ago that on the 25th of October, 1555, and on the 1st of January, 1556, Charles V had solemnly abdicated all his dominions, giving over to his son Philip the kingdom of Spain, with the sovereignty of Burgundy and the Low Countries, and to his younger brother, Ferdinand, the empire together with the original heritage of the House of Austria, and retiring personally to the monastery of Just in Estremadura, there to pass the last years of his life, distracted with gout, at one time resting from the world and its turmoil, at another vexing himself about what was doing there now that he was no longer in it. Before abandoning it for good, he desired to do his son Philip the service of leaving him, if not in a state of definite peace, at any rate in a condition of truce with France. Henry the Second also desired rest, and the constable of Montmorency wished above everything for the release of his son Francis, who had been a prisoner since the fall of Terouanne. A truce for five years was signed at Vaucelles on the 5th of February, 1556, and Coligny, quite young still, but already admiral and in high esteem, had the conduct of the negotiation. He found Charles V dressed in mourning, seated beside a little table in a modest apartment hung with black. When the admiral handed to the emperor the king's letter, Charles could not himself break the seal, and the bishop of Arras drew near to render him that service. Quote, "'Gently, my lord of Arras,' said the emperor, "'would you rob me of the duty I am bound to discharge "'towards the king, my brother-in-law? "'Please, God, none but I shall do it.'" End quote. And then turning to Coligny, he said, quote, 
"'What will you say of me, Admiral? Am I not a pretty knight to run a course and break a lance, I who can only with great difficulty open a letter?' He inquired with an air of interest after Henry the Second's health, and boasted of belonging himself also to the House of France through his grandmother Mary of Burgundy. Quote, I hold it to be an honour, said he, to have issued on the mother's side from the stock which wears and upholds the most famous crowns in the world. End quote. His son Philip, who was but a novice in kingly greatness, showed less courtesy and less good taste than his father. He received the French ambassadors in a room hung with pictures representing the Battle of Pavia. There were some who concluded that from that the truce would not be of long duration. And it was not long before their prognostication was verified. The sending of the Duke of Guise into Italy, and the assistance he brought to Pope Paul IV, then at war with the new King of Spain, Philip II, were considered as a violation of the truce of Vaucelle. Henry II had expected as much, and had ordered Coligny, who was commanding in Picardy and Flanders, to hold himself in readiness to take the field as soon as he should be, if not forced, at any rate naturally called upon, by any unforeseen event. It cost Coligny, who was a man of scrupulous honour, a great struggle to lightly break a truce he had just signed. Nevertheless, in January 1557, when he heard that the French were engaged in Italy in the war between the Pope and the Spaniards, he did not consider that he could possibly remain inactive in Flanders. He took by surprise the town of Lens, between Lille and Arras. Philip II, on his side, had taken measures for promptly entering upon the campaign. By his marriage with Mary Tudor, Queen of England, he had secured for himself a powerful ally in the North. The English Parliament were but little disposed to compromise themselves in a war with France. But, in March 1557, Philip went to London. The Queen's influence and the distrust excited in England by Henry II prevailed over the pacific desires of the nation, and Mary sent a simple herald to carry to the King of France at Reims her declaration of war. Henry accepted it politely but resolutely. Quote, I speak to you in this way, said he to the herald, because it is a queen who sends you. Had it been a king, I would speak to you in a very different tone, End quote. and he ordered him to be gone forthwith from the kingdom. A negotiation was commenced for accomplishing the marriage, long since agreed upon, between the young queen of Scotland, Mary Stuart, and Henry the Second's son, Francis, Dauphin of France. Mary, who was born on the 8th of December, 1542, at Falkland Castle in Scotland, had, since 1548, lived and received her education at the court of France, whither her mother, Mary of Lorraine, eldest sister of Francis de Guise, and Queen Dowager of Scotland, had lost no time in sending her as soon as the future union between the two children had been agreed upon between the two courts. The Dauphin of France was a year younger than the Scottish princess, but, quote, from his childhood, says Venetian Capello, he has been very much in love with her most serene little highness, the Queen of Scotland, who is destined for his wife. It sometimes happens that when they are exchanging endearments, they like to retire quite apart into a corner of the rooms, that their little secrets may not be overheard, End quote. On the 19th of April, 1558, the espousals took place in the great hall of the Louvre, and the marriage was celebrated in the church of Notre-Dame. From that time, Mary Stuart was styled in France Queen Dauphiness, and her husband, with the authorization of the Scottish commissioners, took the title of King Dauphin. Quote, Etiquette required at that time that the heir to the throne should hold his court separately, and not appear at the king's court save on grand occasions. The young couple resigned themselves without any difficulty to this exile, and retired to villers cotteret Whilst preparations were being made at Paris for the rejoicings in honour of the union of the two royal children, war broke out in Picardy and Flanders. Philip II had landed there with an army of forty-seven thousand men, of whom seven thousand were English. Never did any great sovereign and great politician provoke and maintain for long such important wars without conducting them in some other fashion than from the recesses of his cabinet, and without ever having exposed his own life on the field of battle. The Spanish army was under the orders of Emmanuel Philibert, Duke of Savoy, a young warrior of thirty who had won the confidence of Charles V. He led it to the siege of Saint-Quentin, a place considered as one of the bulwarks of the kingdom. Philip II remained at some league's distance in the environs. Henry II was ill-prepared for so serious an attack. His army, which was scarcely twenty thousand strong, mustered near Laon, under the orders of the Duke of Nevers, 
At the end of July, 1557, it hurried into Picardy, under the command of the Constable de Montmorency, who was supported by Admiral de Coligny, his nephew, by the Duke of Anguin, by the Prince of Conde, and by the Duke of Montpensier, by nearly all the great lords and valiant warriors of France. They soon saw that Saint-Quentin was in a deplorable state of defence. The fortifications were old and badly kept up. Soldiers, munitions of war, and victuals were all equally deficient. Coligny did not hesitate. However, he threw himself into the place on the 2nd of August during the night with a small corps of 700 men and Saint-Rémy, a skilled engineer who had already distinguished himself in the defence of Metz. The admiral packed off the useless mouths, repaired the walls at the points principally threatened, and reanimated the failing courage of the inhabitants. The constable and his army came within hail of the place, and Dandelot, Coligny's brother, managed with great difficulty to get 450 men into it. On the 10th of August, the battle was begun between the two armies. The constable affected to despise the Duke of Savoy's youth. Quote, I will soon show him, said he, a move of an old soldier. End quote. The French army, very inferior in numbers, was for a moment on the point of being surrounded. The Prince of Conte sent the constable warning. Quote, I was serving in the field, answered Montmorency, before the Prince of Conde came into the world. I have good hopes of still giving him lessons in the art of war for some years to come. End quote. The valour of the constable and his comrades in arms could not save them from the consequences of their stubborn recklessness and their numerical inferiority. The battalions of Gascon infantry closed their ranks with pikes to the front, and made an heroic resistance, but all in vain, against repeated charges of the Spanish cavalry, and the defeat was total. More than three thousand men were killed, the number of prisoners amounted to double, and the constable, left upon the field with his thigh shattered by a cannon-ball, fell into the hands of the Spaniards, as was also the case with the dukes of Longueville and Montpensier, La Rochefoucauld, Daubigne, etc. The Duke of Anguin, Viscount de Touraine, and a multitude of others, many great names amidst a host of obscure, fell in the fight. The Duke of Nevers and the Prince of Conde, sword in hand, reached La Fere with the remnants of their army. Coligny remained alone in Saint-Quentin with those who survived of his little garrison, and a hundred and twenty arbusiers whom the Duke of Nevers threw into the place at a loss of three times as many. Coligny held out for a fortnight longer, behind walls that were in ruins and were assailed by a victorious army. At length, on the 27th of August, the enemy entered Saint-Quentin by shoals. Quote, the admiral, who was still going about the streets with a few men to make head against them, found himself hemmed in on all sides, and did all he could to fall into the hands of a Spaniard, preferring rather to await on the spot the common fate than to incur by flight any shame and reproach. He who took him prisoner, after setting him to rest a while at the foot of the ramparts, took him away to their camp, where as he entered he met Captain Alonso de Cazières, commandant of the old bands of Spanish infantry, when up came the Duke of Savoy, who ordered the said Cazières to take the admiral to his tent. Don Delo, the admiral's brother, succeeded in escaping across the marshes. Being thus master of Saint-Quentin, Philip the Second, after having attempted to put a stop to carnage and plunder, expelled from the town, which was half in ashes, the inhabitants who had survived, and the small adjacent fortresses, Ham and Catelet, were not long before they surrendered. End of section 29section 30 of a popular history of france volume 4 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kathy barrett a popular history of france from the earliest times volume 4 by françois guizot translated by robert black chapter 31 henry the 2nd 1547 to 1559 Part four. Philip, with anxious modesty, sent information of his victory to his father, Charles, who had been in retirement since February 21, 1556, at the monastery of Eust. Quote, As I did not happen to be there myself, he said at the end of his letter, about which I am heavy at heart as to what your majesty will possibly think, I can only tell you from hearsay what took place. End quote. 
we have not the reply of Charles V to his son, but his close confidant, Quejada, wrote, quote, The emperor felt at this news one of the greatest thrills of satisfaction he has ever had. But to tell you the truth, I perceive by his manner that he cannot reconcile himself to the thought that his son was not there, and with good reason. End quote. After Saint-Quentin had surrendered, the Duke of Savoy wanted to march forward and strike a frighted France to the very heart, and the aged emperor was of his mind. Quote, "'Is the king my son at Paris?' he said, when he heard of his victory. Philip had thought differently about it instead of hurling his army on Paris. He had moved it back to Saint-Quentin, and kept it for the reduction of places in the neighborhood. Quote, the Spaniards, says Rabutin, might have accomplished our total extermination and taken from us all hope of setting ourselves up again. But the supreme ruler, the god of victories, pulled them up quite short. End quote. An unlooked-for personage, Queen Catherine de Medici, then for the first time entered actively upon the scene. We borrow the very words of the Venetian ambassadors who lived within her sphere. The first, Lorenzo Contarini, wrote in 1552, quote, The queen is younger than the king, but only thirteen days. She is not pretty, but she is possessed of extraordinary wisdom and prudence. No doubt of her being fit to govern. Nevertheless, she is not consulted, or considered so much as she well might be. End quote. Five years later, in 1557, after the battle and capture of Saint-Quentin, France was in a fit of stupor. Paris believed the enemy to be already beneath her walls. Many of the Burgesses were packing up and flying, some to Orléans, some to Bourges, some still farther. The king had gone to Compiègne, quote, to get together, says Brantome, a fresh army, end quote. Queen Catherine was alone at Paris. Of her own motion, quote, she went to the Parliament, according to the Memoire de la Châtre, it was to the Hôtel de Ville that she went and made her address, in full state, accompanied by the cardinals, princes, and princesses, and there, in the most impressive language, she set forth the urgent state of affairs at the moment. She pointed out that in spite of the enormous expenses into which the most Christian king had found himself drawn in his late wars, he had shown the greatest care not to burden the towns. In the continuous and extreme pressure of requirements Her Majesty did not think that any further charge could be made on the people of the country places, who in ordinary times always bear the greatest burden. With so much sentiment and eloquence that she touched the heart of everybody, the Queen then explained to the Parliament that the King had need of three hundred thousand livres, twenty-five thousand to be paid every two months, and she added that she would retire from the place of session so as not to interfere with liberty of discussion and she accordingly retired to an adjoining room a resolution to comply with the wishes of her majesty was voted and the queen having resumed her place received a promise to that effect a hundred notables of the city offered to give at once three thousand francs apiece the queen thanked them in the sweetest form of words and thus terminated this session of parliament with so much applause for her majesty and such lively marks of satisfaction at her behaviour that no idea can be given of them Throughout the whole city nothing was spoken of but the Queen's prudence and the happy manner in which she proceeded in this enterprise. End quote. Such is the account, not of a French courtier, but of the Venetian ambassador Giacomo Lorenzo, writing confidentially to his government. From that day the position of Catherine de Medici was changed in France, amongst the people as well as at court. Quote, the king went more often to see her. He added to his habits that of holding court at her apartments for about an hour every day after supper in the midst of the lords and ladies. End quote. It is not to be discovered anywhere in the contemporary memoir whether Catherine had anything to do with the resolution taken by Henry the Second on returning from Compiègne, but she thenceforth assumed her place and gave a foretaste of the part she was to play in the government of France. Unhappily for the honour of Catherine and for the welfare of France, that part soon ceased to be judicious, dignified, and salutary, as it had been on that day of its first exhibition. On entering Paris again, the king at once sent orders to the Duke of Guise to return in haste from Italy with all the troops he could bring. Every eye and every hope were fixed upon the able and heroic defender of Metz, who had forced Charles V to retreat before him. A general appeal was at the same time addressed to, quote, all soldiers, gentlemen, and others, who had borne, or were capable of bearing arms, to muster at Léon, under the Duke of Nevers, in order to be employed for the service of the king, and for the tuition, 
protection, of their country, their families, and their property. End quote. Guise arrived on the 20th of October, 1557, at Saint Germain en Laye, where the court happened to be just then. Every mark of favor was lavished upon him. All the resources of the state were put at his disposal. There was even some talk of appointing him viceroy but Henry II confined himself to proclaiming him, on the very day of his arrival, lieutenant-general of the armies throughout the whole extent of the monarchy, both within and without the realm. His brother, the Cardinal of Lorraine, who was as ambitious and almost as able as he, had the chief direction in civil, financial, and diplomatic affairs. Never since the great mayors of the palace, under the Merovingian kings, had similar power been in the hands of a subject. Like a man born to command, Guise saw that in so complicated a situation a brilliant stroke must be accompanied, and a great peril be met by a great success. Quote, he racked his brains for all sorts of devices for enabling him to do some remarkable deed, which might humble the pride of that haughty Spanish nation, and revive the courage of his own men. And he took it that those things which the enemy considered as the most secure would be the least carefully guarded. Some years previously it had been suggested to the constable that an attempt might be made upon Calais, negligently guarded as it was, and the place itself not being in good order. The Duke of Guise put the idea of this enterprise forward once more, and begged the king's permission to attempt it, without saying a word about it to anybody else, which the king considered to be a very good notion." End quote. Guise took the command of the army, and made a feint of directing its movements towards an expedition in the east of the kingdom. But suddenly turning westwards, he found himself on the night of January the 1st, 1558, beneath the walls of Calais, quote, whither, with right good will, all the princes, lords, and soldiers had marched, end quote. On the 3rd of January, he took the two forts of Nieulet and Risbank, which covered the approaches to the place. On the 4th he prepared for, and on the 6th he delivered, the assault upon the citadel itself, which was carried. He left there his brother, the Duke of Omal, with a sufficient force for defence. The portion of the English garrison which had escaped at the assault fell back within the town. The governor, Lord Wentworth, quote, like a man in desperation who saw he was all but lost, end quote, made vain attempts to recover this important post under cover of night and of the high sea, which rendered impossible the prompt arrival of any aid for the French. But, quote, they held their own inside the castle, end quote. The English requested the Duke of Omal, quote, to parley so as to come to some honorable and reasonable terms, end quote, and Guise assented. On the 8th of January, whilst he was conferring in his tent with the representatives of the governor, Coligny's brother, Dandelot, entered the town at the solicitation of the English themselves, who were afraid of being all put to the sword. The capitulation was signed. The inhabitants, with their wives and children, had their lives spared, and received permission to leave Calais freely and without any insult, and withdraw to England or Flanders. Lord Wentworth and fifty other persons, to be chosen by the Duke of Guise, remained prisoners of war. With this exception, all the soldiers were to return to England, but with empty hands. The place was left with all the cannons, arms, munitions, utensils, engines of war, flags and standards, which happened to be in it. The furniture, the gold and silver, coined or other, the merchandise, and the horses passed over to the disposal of the Duke of Guise. Lastly, the vanquished, when they quitted the town, were to leave it intact, having no power to pull down houses, unpave streets, throw up earth, displace a single stone, pull out a single nail. The conqueror's precautions were as deliberate as his audacity had been sudden. On the ninth of January, 1558, after a week's siege, Calais, which had been in the hands of the English for two hundred and ten years, once more became a French town, in spite of the inscription which was engraved on one of its gates, and which may be turned into the following distich, quote, A siege of Calais may seem good, when lead and iron swim like wood. End quote. The joy was so much the greater in that it was accompanied by great surprise. Save a few members of the king's council, nobody expected this conquest. Quote, I certainly thought that you must be occupied in preparing for some great exploit, and that you wished to wait until you could apprise me of the execution rather than the design, wrote Marshal de Brissac to the Duke of Guise on the 22nd of January from Italy. Foreigners were not less surprised than the French themselves. They had supposed that France would remain for a long while under the effects of the reverse experienced at Saint-Quentin, 
Quote, the loss of Calais, said Pope Paul IV, will be the only dowry that the Queen of England will obtain from her marriage with Philip. For France, such a conquest is preferable to that of half the kingdom of England. End quote. When Mary Tudor, already seriously ill, heard the news, she exclaimed from her deathbed on the 20th of January, quote, If my heart is opened, there will be found graven upon it the word Calais. End quote. And when the Grand Prior of France, on repairing to the court of his sister Mary of Lorraine in Scotland, went to visit Queen Elizabeth, who had succeeded Mary Tudor, she, after she had made him dance several times with her, said to him, quote, My dear Prior, I like you very much, but not your brother, who robbed me of my town of Calais. End, quote. End of section 30. Section 31 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 31. Henry the Second, fifteen forty seven to fifteen fifty nine, part five. Guise was one of those who knew that it is as necessary to follow up a success accomplished as to proceed noiselessly in the execution of a sudden success. When he was master of Calais, he moved rapidly upon the neighboring fortresses of Guine and Ham, and he had them in his power within a few days, notwithstanding a resistance more stout than he had encountered at Calais. During the same time, the Duke of Nevers, encouraged by such examples, also took the field again, and gained possession, in Champagne and the neighborhood, of the strong castles of Herbemont, Jamoigne, Chigny, Rosignol, and Villemont. Guise had no idea of contenting himself with his successes in the west of France. His ambition carried him into the east also, to the environs of Metz, the scene of his earliest glory. He heard that Vieilleville, who had become governor of Metz, was setting about the reduction of Thionville, quote, the best picture of a fortress I ever saw, says Montluc. Quote, I have heard, wrote Guise to Vieilleville, that you have a fine enterprise on hand. I pray you do not commence the execution of it in any fashion whatever, until I be with you. Having given a good account of Calais and Guine as lieutenant-general of his majesty in this realm, I should be very vexed if there should be done therein anything of honour and importance without my presence. End quote. He arrived before Thionville on the 4th of June, 1558. Vieilleville and his officers were much put out at his interference. Quote, the Duke might surely have dispensed with coming, said Destrée, chief officer of artillery. It will be easy for him to swallow what is all chewed ready for him. End quote. But the bulk of the army did not share this feeling of jealousy. When the pioneers, drawn up, caught sight of Guise, quote, "'Come on, sir,' they cried. "'Come and let us die before Thionville. "'We have been expecting you this long while.'" Quote. The siege lasted three weeks longer. Guise had with him two comrades of distinction, the Italian Peter Strozzi and the Gascon Blaise de Montluc. On the 20th of June, Strozzi was mortally wounded by an arquebus shot, at the very side of Guise, who was talking to him with a hand upon his shoulder. Quote, "'Ah, by God's head, sir!' cried Strozzi in Italian. The king to-day loses a good servant, and so does your excellency. End quote. Guise, greatly moved, attempted to comfort him, and spoke to him the name of Jesus Christ, but Strozzi was one of those infidels so common at that time in Italy. Quote, death, said he, what Jesus are you come hither to remind me of? I believe in no God, my game is played. End quote. Quote, you will appear to-day before his face, persisted Guise, in the earnestness of his faith. "'Is death,' replied Strozzi. "'I shall be where all the others are who have died in the last six thousand years.'" Quote. The eyes of Guise remained fixed a while upon his comrade, dying in such a frame of mind, but he soon turned all his thoughts once more to the siege of Thionville. Montluc supported him valiantly. A strong tower still held out, and Montluc carried it at the head of his men. Guise rushed up and threw his arm round the warrior's neck, saying, quote, Monseigneur, I now see clearly that the old proverb is quite infallible. A good horse will go to the last. I am off at once to my quarters to report the capture to the king. Be assured that I shall not conceal from him the service you have done. End quote. The reduction of Thionville was accomplished on that very day, June twenty second, fifteen fifty eight. That of Arlon, a rich town in the neighborhood, followed very closely. 
Guise, thoroughly worn out, had ordered the approaches to be made next morning at daybreak, requesting that he might be left to sleep until he awoke of himself. When he did awake, he inquired whether the artillery had yet opened fire. He was told that Montluc had surprised the place during the night. Quote, "'That is making the pace very fast,' said he, as he made the sign of the cross, but he did not care to complain about it. Under the impulse communicated by him, the fortunes of France were reviving everywhere. A check received before Gravelines on the 13th of July, 1558, by a division commanded by de Termes, governor of Calais, did not subdue the national elation and its effect upon the enemy themselves. Quote, "'It is an utter impossibility for me to keep up the war,' wrote Philip II, on the 15th of February, 1559, to Granvelle. On both sides there was a desire for peace, and conferences were opened at cateau Cambrecy. On the 6th of February, 1559, a convention was agreed upon for a truce which was to last during the whole course of the negotiation, and for six days after the separation of the plenipotentiaries, in case no peace took place.' It was concluded on the 2nd of April, 1559, between Henry the Second and Elizabeth, who had become Queen of England at the death of her sister Mary, November 17, 1558. And next day, April 3rd, between Henry the Second, Philip the Second, and the allied princes of Spain, amongst others the Prince of Orange, William the Silent, who, whilst serving in the Spanish army, was fitting himself to become the leader of the reformers and the liberator of the Low Countries. By the treaty with England, France was to keep Calais for eight years in the first instance, and on a promise to pay five hundred thousand gold crowns to Queen Elizabeth or her successors. The money was never paid, and Calais was never restored, and this without the English governments having considered that it could make the matter a motive for renewing the war. By the treaty with Spain, France was to keep Metz, Toul, and Verdun, and have back saint quentin le catelet and ham but she was to restore to spain or her allies a hundred and eighty-nine places in flanders piedmont tuscany and corsica the malcontents for the absence of political liberty does not suppress them entirely raised their voices energetically against this last treaty signed by the king with the sole desire it was supposed of obtaining the liberation of his two favourites the constable de montmorency and marshal de saint andre who had been prisoners in spain since the defeat at saint quentin quote, their ransom it was said has cost the kingdom more than that of francis i guise himself said to the king Quote, a stroke of your majesty's pen costs more to france than thirty years of war cost End quote. ever since that time the majority of historians even the most enlightened have joined in the censure that was general in the sixteenth century but their opinion will not be endorsed here the places which france had won during the war and which she retained by the peace metz toul and verdun on her frontier in the northeast facing the imperial or spanish possessions and boulogne and calais on her coasts in the northwest facing england were as regarded the integrity of the state and the security of the inhabitants of infinitely more importance than those which she gave up in flanders and italy the treaty of cateau cambrecy too marked the termination of those wars of ambition and conquest which the kings of France had waged beyond the Alps an injudicious policy which, for four reigns, had crippled and wasted the resources of France in adventurous expeditions beyond the limits of her geographical position and her natural and permanent interests. More or less happily, the Treaty of cateau cambrecy had regulated all those questions of external policy which were burdensome to France. She was once more at peace with her neighbours, and seemed to have nothing more to do than to gather in the fruits thereof. But she had in her own midst questions far more difficult of solution than those of her external policy, and these perils from within were threatening her more seriously than any from without. Since the death of Francis I, the religious ferment had pursued its course, becoming more general and more fierce. The creed of the reformers had spread very much. Their number had very much increased. Permanent churches, professing and submitting to a fixed faith and discipline, had been founded. That of Paris was the first in 1555. And the example had been followed at Orléans, at Chartres, at Lyon, at Toulouse, at Rochelle, in Normandy, in Touraine, in Guienne, in Poitou, in Dauphiny, in Provence, and in all the provinces, more or less. In 1561 it was calculated that there were twenty-one hundred and fifty reformed, or, as the expression then was, rectified, dressé, churches. 
Quote, and this is no fanciful figure, it is the result of a census taken at the instigation of the deputies who represented the reformed churches at the conference of Poissy on the demand of Catherine de Medici, and in conformity with the advice of Admiral de Coligny. End quote. It is clear that the movement of the Reformation in the sixteenth century was one of those spontaneous and powerful movements which have their source and derive their strength from the condition of men's souls and of whole communities, and not merely from the personal ambitions and interests which soon come and mingle with them, whether it be to promote or to retard them. One thing has been already stated here, and confirmed by facts. It was specially in France that the Reformation had this truly religious and sincere character. Very far from supporting or tolerating it, the sovereign and public authorities opposed it from its very birth. Under Francis I it had met with no real defenders but its martyrs, and it was still the same under Henry II. During the reign of Francis I, within a space of twenty-three years, there had been eighty-one capital executions for heresy. During that of Henry II, twelve years, there were ninety-seven for the same cause. And at one of these executions Henry II was present in person, on the space in front of Notre Dame, a spectacle which Francis I had always refused to see. In 1551... 1557 and 1559, Henry II, by three royal edicts, kept up and added to all the prohibitions and penalties in force against the reformers. In 1550, the massacre of the Vaudiens was still in such lively and odious remembrance that a noble lady of Provence, Madame de Santal, did not hesitate to present a complaint in the name of her despoiled, proscribed, and murdered vassals against the Cardinal de Tournon, the Comte de Grignan, and the premier président, Meignier d'Opède, as having abused, for the purpose of getting authority for this massacre, the religious feelings of the king, who on his deathbed had testified his remorse for it. Quote, this cause, says de Thou, was pleaded with much warmth, and accompanied fifty audiences, with a large concourse of people, but the judgment took all the world by surprise. Guerin alone, advocate-general in 1545, having no support at court, was condemned to death, and was scapegoat for all the rest. Doped defended himself with fanatical pride, saying that he only executed the king's orders, like Saul, whom God commanded to exterminate the Amalekites. He had the Duke of Guise to protect him, and he was sent back to discharge the duties of his office. Such was the prejudice of the Parliament of Paris against the Reformers, that it interdicted the hedge-schools, or école buissonnière, schools which the Protestants held out in the country to escape from the jurisdiction of the precentor of Notre-Dame de Paris, who had the sole supervision of primary schools. Hence comes the proverb, to play truant, faire l'école buissonnière, to go to hedge-school. All the resources of French civil jurisdiction appeared to be insufficient against the Reformers. Henry the Second asked the Pope for a bull, transplanting into France the Spanish Inquisition, the only real means of extirpating the root of the errors. End quote. It was the characteristic of this Inquisition that it was completely in the hands of the clergy, and that its arm was long enough to reach the lay and the clerical indifferently. Pope Paul the Fourth readily gave the King in April fifteen fifty seven the bull he asked for but the parliament of paris refused to enregister the royal edict which gave force in france to the pontifical brief in fifteen fifty nine the pope replied to this refusal by a bull which comprised in one and the same anathema all heretics though they might be kings or emperors and declared them to have quote, forfeited their benefices states kingdoms or empires the which should devolve on the first to seize them without power on the part of the holy see itself to restore them end quote the Parliament would not consent to enregister the decree, unless there were put in it a condition to the effect that clerics alone should be liable to the Inquisition, and that the judges should be taken from amongst the clergy of France. For all their passionate opposition to the Reformation, the magistrates had no idea of allowing either the kingship or France to fall beneath the yoke of the papacy. Amidst all these disagreements and distractions in the very heart of Catholicism, the Reformation went on growing from day to day. In 1558, Lorenzo, the Venetian ambassador, set down even then the number of the reformers at 400,000. In 1559, at the death of Henry II, Claude Aton, a priest and contemporary chronicler on the Catholic side, calculated that they were nearly a quarter of the population of France. 
they held at Paris in May 1559 their first general synod, and eleven fully established churches sent deputies to it. This synod drew up a form of faith called the Gallican Confession, and likewise a form of discipline. Quote, the Burgess class, for a long while so indifferent to the burnings that took place, were astounded at last at the constancy with which the pile was mounted by all those men and all those women who had nothing to do but to recant in order to save their lives. Some could not persuade themselves that people so determined were not in the right. Others were moved with compassion. Their very hearts, say contemporaries, wept together with their eyes. End quote. It needed only an opportunity to bring these feelings out. Some of the faithful one day in the month of May, 1558, on the public walk in the pré aux Clairs, began to sing the psalms of Marot. Their singing had been forbidden by the Parliament of Bordeaux, but the practice of singing those psalms had but lately been so general that it could not be looked upon as peculiar to heretics. All who happened to be there, suddenly animated by one and the same feeling, joined in with the singers as if to protest against the punishments which were being repeated day after day. This manifestation was renewed on the following days. The King of Navarre, Anthony de Bourbon, Prince Louis de Conde, his brother, and many lords took part in it together with a crowd, it is said, of five or six thousand persons. It was not in the pré aux Clairs only, and by singing, that this new state of mind revealed itself amongst the highest classes, as well as amongst the populace. The Queen of Navarre, Jeanne d'Albret, in her early youth, quote, was as fond of a ball as of a sermon, says Brantome, and she had advised her spouse, Anthony de Bourbon, who inclined towards Calvinism, not to perplex himself with all these opinions. In 1559 she was passionately devoted to the faith and the cause of the Reformation. With more levity, but still in sincerity, her brother-in-law, Louis de Conde, put his ambition and his courage at the service of the same cause. Admiral de Coligny's youngest brother, Francis d'Andelot, declared himself a reformer to Henry the Second himself, who in his wrath threw a plate at his head, and sent him to prison in the castle of Melun. Coligny himself, who had never disguised the favourable sentiments he felt towards the reformers, openly sided with them on the ground of his own personal faith, as well as of the justice due to them. At last the Reformation had really great leaders, men who had power and were experienced in the affairs of the world. It was becoming a political party as well as a religious conviction, and the French reformers were henceforth in a condition to make war as well as die at the stake for their faith. Hitherto they had been only believers and martyrs. They became the victors and the vanquished, alternately, in a civil war. A new position for them, and as formidable as it was grand. It was destined to bring upon them cruel trials and the worth of them in important successes first the saint bartholomew then the accession of henry the fourth and the edict of nantes at a later period under louis the thirteenth and louis the fourteenth the complication of the religious question and the political question cost them the advantages they had won the edict of nantes disappeared together with the power of the protestants in the state they were no longer anything but heretics and rebels a day was to come, when by the force alone of moral ideas, and in the name alone of conscience and justice, they would recover all the rights they had for a time possessed, and more also. But in the sixteenth century that day was still distant, and armed strife was for the reformers their only means of defence and salvation. God makes no account of centuries, and a great deal is required before the most certain and the most salutary truths get their place and their rights in the minds and communities of men. On the 29th of June, 1559, a brilliant tournament was celebrated in lists erected at the end of the street of St. Antoine, almost at the foot of the Bastille. Henry II, the Queen, and the whole court had been present at it for three days. The entertainment was drawing to a close. The King, who had run several tilts, quote, like a sturdy and skilful cavalier, end quote, wished to break yet another lance, and bade the Comte de Montgomery, captain of the guards, to run against him. Montgomery excused himself, but the king insisted. The tilt took place. The two jousters, on meeting, broke their lances skilfully, but Montgomery forgot to drop at once, according to usage, the fragment remaining in his hand. He unintentionally struck the king's helmet, and raised the visor, and a splinter of wood entered Henry's eye, who fell forward upon his horse's neck. 
All the appliances of art were useless. The brain had been injured. Henry II languished for eleven days, and expired on the 10th of July, 1559, aged forty years and some months. An insignificant man, and a reign without splendor, though fraught with facts pregnant of grave consequences. End of section 31《Section 32 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Fricker. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4 by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 32. Francis the Second, July tenth, fifteen fifty nine to December fifth, fifteen sixty, Part One. During the course and especially at the close of Henry the Second's reign, two rival matters: on the one hand, the numbers, the quality, and the zeal of the reformers; and on the other, the anxiety, prejudice, and power of the Catholics had been simultaneously advancing in development and growth. Between the 16th of May, 1558, and the 10th of July, 1559, fifteen capital sentences had been executed in Dauphiny, in Normandy, in Puito, and at Paris. Two royal edicts, one dated July 24th, 1558, and the other June 14th, 1559, had renewed and aggravated the severity of penal legislation against heretics. To secure the registration of the latter, Henry the Second, together with the princes and the officers of the crown, had repaired in person to Parliament. Some disagreement had already appeared in the midst of that great body, which was then composed of a hundred and thirty magistrates. The seniors who sat in the great chamber had in general shown themselves to be more inclined to severity, and the juniors who formed the chamber, called La Tournelle, were more inclined to indulgence towards accusations of heresy. The disagreement reached its climax in the very presence of the king. Two councillors, Dubourg and Dufal, spoke so warmly of reforms which were, according to them, necessary and legitimate, that their adversaries did not hesitate to tax them with being reformers themselves. The king had them arrested, and three of their colleagues with them. Special commissioners were charged with the preparation of the case against them. It has already been mentioned that one of the most considerable amongst the officers of the army, Francis d'Andelot, brother of Admiral Coligny, had, for the same cause, been subjected to a burst of anger on the part of the king. He was in prison at Meaux, when Henry the Second died. Such were the personal feelings and the relative positions of the two parties when Francis the Second, a boy of sixteen, a poor creature both in mind and body, ascended the throne. Deputies from Parliament went, according to custom, to offer their felicitations to the new king, and to ask him to whom it was his pleasure that they should thenceforward apply for to learn his will and receive his commands. Francis the Second replied, With the approbation of the Queen my mother, I have chosen the Duke of Guise and the Cardinal of Lorraine, my uncles, to have the direction of the state. The former will take charge of the Department of War, the latter the administration of finance and justice. Such had, in fact, been his choice, and it was no doubt with his mother's approbation that he had made it. Equally attentive to observe the proprieties and to secure her own power, Catherine de' Medici, when going out to drive with her son and her daughter-in-law Mary Stuart on the day of Henry the Second's death, said to Mary, Step in, madam, it is now your turn to go first. During the first days of mourning she kept herself in a room entirely hung with black, and there was no light beyond two wax candles burning on an altar covered with black cloth. She had upon her head a black veil, which shrouded her entirely, and hid her face, and when any one of the household went to speak to her, she replied in so agitated and so weak a tone of voice that it was impossible to catch her words, whatever attention might be paid to them but her presence of mind and her energy, so far as the government was concerned, were by no means affected by it. He who had been the principal personage of the court under Henry the Second, the constable de Montmorency, perfectly understood, 
at his first interview with the Queen Mother, that he was dismissed, and all he asked of her was that he might go and enjoy his repose in freedom at his residence of Chantilly, begging her at the same time to take under her protection the heirs of his house. Henry II's favourite, Diana de Poitiers, was dismissed more harshly. The king sent to tell Madame de Valentinois, writes the Venetian ambassador, that for her evil influence, Mali Officii, over the king, his father, she would deserve heavy chastisement, but, in his royal clemency, he did not wish to disquiet her any further. She must, nevertheless, restore to him all the jewels given her by the king, his father. To bend Catherine de Medici, Diana was so obliged, says de Thou, to give up her beautiful house at Chenoncourt on the Cher, and she received in exchange the castle of Chaumont at the Loire. The Guises obtained all of the favours of the court at the same time that they were invested with all the powers of state. In order to give a good notion of Duke Francis of Guise and his brother, the Cardinal of Lorraine, the two heads of the house, we will borrow the very words of those two men of their age who had the best means of seeing them close and judging them correctly. The French historian de Thou and the Venetian ambassador John Michelli. The Cardinal of Lorraine, says de Thou, was of an impetuous and violent character. The Duke of Guise, on the contrary, was of gentle and moderate disposition. But as ambition soon overleaps the confines of restraint and equity, he was carried away by the violent counsels of the Cardinal, or else surrendered himself to them of his own accord, executing with admirable prudence and address the plans which were always chalked out by his brother. The Venetian ambassador enters into more precise and full details. The cardinal, he says, who is the leading man of the house, would be, by common consent, if it were not for the defects of which I shall speak, the greatest political power in this kingdom. He has not yet completed his thirty-seventh year. He is endowed with a marvellous intellect which apprehends from half a word the meaning of those who converse with him. He has an astonishing memory a fine and noble face, and a rare eloquence which shows itself freely on any subject, but especially in matters of politics. He is very well versed in letters. He knows Greek, Latin, and Italian. He is very strong in the sciences, chiefly in theology. The externals of his life are very proper and very suitable to his dignity, which could not be said of the other cardinals and prelates, whose habits are too scandalously irregular. But his great defect is shameful cupidity which would employ to attain its ends even criminal means, and likewise great duplicity, whence comes his habit of scarcely ever saying that which is. There is worse behind. He is considered to be very ready to take offence, vindictive, envious, and far too slow in benefaction. He excited universal hatred by hurting all the world as long as it was in his power to. As for Monseigneur de Guy, who is the eldest of the six brothers, he cannot be spoken of save as the man of war, a good officer. None in this realm has delivered more battles and confronted more dangers. Everybody lauds his courage, his vigilance, his steadiness in war, and his coolness, a quality wonderfully rare in a Frenchman. His peculiar defects are, first of all, stinginess towards soldiers, then he makes large promises, and even when he means to keep his promise he is infinitely slow about it. To the sketch of the Cardinal of Lorraine, Brantome adds that he was, as indeed he said, a coward by nature, a strange defect in a Guy. It was a great deal towards securing the supremacy of a great family and its leading members, to thus possess the favour of the court and the functions of government, but the power of the Guise had a still higher origin and still deeper foundation. It was then, said Michel de Castenal, one of the most intelligent and most impartial among the chroniclers of the sixteenth century, that schism and divisions in religious matters began to be mixed up with affairs of state. Well, all the clergy of France, and nearly all the noblesse of the people who belonged to the Roman religion, considered that the Cardinal of Lorraine and the Duke of Guy were, as it were, called of God to preserve the Catholic religion established in France for the last twelve hundred years, and it seemed to them not only an act of impiety to change or alter it in any way whatever, but also an impossibility to do so without ruin to the state. The late King Henry had made a decree in the month of June 1559, being then at Ecouen, by which the judges were bound to sentence all Lutherans to death, 
and which was published and confirmed by all the parliaments without any limitation or modification whatever and with a warning to the judges not to mitigate the penalty as they had done for some years previously different judgments were pronounced upon the decree those who took the most political and most zealous view of religion considered that it was necessary as well to preserve and maintain the catholic religion as to keep down the seditious who under the cloak of religion were doing all they could to upset the political condition of the kingdom others who cared nothing for religion or for the state or for order in the body politic also thought the decree necessary not at all for the purpose of exterminating the protestants for they held it would tend to multiply them but because it would offer a means of enriching themselves by the confiscations ensuing upon condemnation and because the king would thus be able to pay off forty-two millions of livres which he owed and have money in hand and besides that satisfy those who were demanding recompense for the services they had rendered the crown wherein many placed their hopes the guise were in the sixteenth century the representatives and the champions of these different cliques and interests religious or political sincere in their belief or shameless in their avidity and all united under the flag of the catholic church and so when they came into power there was nothing says a protestant chronicler but fear and trembling at their name their acts of government soon confirmed the fears as well as the hopes they had inspired during the last six months of fifteen fifty nine the edict issued by henry the second from echoen was not only strictly enforced but aggravated by fresh edicts a special chamber was appointed and chosen among the parliament of paris which was to have sole cognizance of crimes and offences against the catholic religion a proclamation of the new king francis the second ordained that houses in which assemblies of reformers took place should be razed and demolished it was death to the promoters of unlawful assemblies for purposes of religion or for any other cause another royal act provided that all persons even relatives who received amongst them any one condemned for heresy should seize him and bring him to justice in default whereof they would suffer the same penalty as he individual condemnations and executions abounded after these general measures between the second of august and the thirty first of december fifteen fifty nine eighteen persons were burned alive for open heresy or for having refused to communicate according to the rites of the catholic church or go to mass or for having hawked about forbidden books finally in december the five councillors of the parliament of paris whom six months previously henry the second had ordered to be arrested and shut up in the bastille were dragged from prison and brought to trial the chief of them Anne du bourg nephew of antony du bourg chancellor of france under the francis the second defended himself with pious and patriotic persistency being determined to exhaust all points of law and all the chances of justice he could hope for without betraying his faith everything shows that he had nothing to hope for from his judges one of them the president minard as he was returning from the palace on the evening of december the twelfth fifteen fifty nine was killed by a pistol shot the assassin could not be discovered but the crime naturally ascribed to some friend of dubourg served only to make certain and to hasten the death of the prisoner on trial dubourg was condemned on the twenty second of december and heard unmoved the reading of his sentence i forgive my judges said he they have judged according to their own lights not according to the light that comes from on high put out your fires ye senators be converted and live happily think without ceasing of god and on god after these words which were taken down by the clerk of the court and which i have here copied says de thou dubourg was taken on the twenty third of december in a tumbrel to the palace de grieve as he mounted the ladder he was heard repeating several times forsake me not my god for fear lest i forsake thee he was strangled before he was cast into the flames the sole favour his friends could obtain for him but extreme severity on the part of the powers that be is effectual only when it falls upon a country or upon parties that are effete with age or already vanquished and worn out by long struggles when on the contrary it is brought to bear upon parties in the flush of youth eager to proclaim and propagate themselves so far from intimidating them it animates them and thrusts them into the arena into which they were themselves quite eager to enter 
As soon as the rule of the Catholic, in the persons and the actions of the Guise, became sovereign and aggressive, the threatened reformers put themselves into the attitude of defence. They too had got for themselves great leaders, some valiant and ardent, others prudent or even timid, but forced to declare themselves when the common cause was greatly imperilled. The House of Bourbon, issuing from St. Louis, had for its representatives in the sixteenth century Antony de Bourbon, King of Navarre, and husband of Jean d'Albret, and his brother Louis de Bourbon, Prince of Conde. The King of Navarre, weak and irresolute, though brave enough, wavered between Catholicism and the Reformation, inclining rather in his heart to the cause of the Reformation, to which the Queen, his wife, who at first showed indifference, had been long before passionately attached. His brother, the Prince of Conde, young, fiery, and often flighty and rash, put himself openly at the head of the reformed party. The House of Bourbon held itself to be the rival per force of the House of Lorraine. It had among the high noblesse of France two allies, more fitted than any others for fighting and for command. Admiral de Coligny and his brother, Francis d'Anvelot, both of them nephews of the constable Anne de Montmorency, both of them already experienced and famous warriors, and both of them devoted heart and soul to the cause of the Reformation. Thus, at the ascension of Francis the Second, when the Catholic party, by means of the Guise, and with the support of the majority of the country, took in hand the government of France, the reforming party ranged themselves round the King of Navarre, the Prince of Conde, and Admiral de Coligny, and became, under their direction, though in a minority, a powerful opposition, able and ready on the one hand to narrowly watch and criticize the actions of those who were in power, and on the other to claim for their own people, not by any means freedom as a general principle in the constitution of the state, but free manifestation of their faith, and free exercise of their own form of worship. Apart from, we do not mean to say above, these two great parties, which were arrayed in the might and appeared as the representatives of the national ideas and feelings, the Queen Mother, Catherine de Medici, was quietly labouring to form another, more independent of the public, and more docile to herself, and above all faithful to the crown and to the interests of the kingly house and its servants a party strictly catholic but regarding as a necessity the task of humouring the reformers and granting them such concessions as might prevent explosions fraught with peril to the state a third party thiers part as we should say nowadays politic and prudent somewhat lavish of promises without being sure of the power to keep them not much embarrassed at having to change attitude and language according to the shifting phases of the moment, and anxious above everything to maintain public peace and to put off questions which it could not solve pacifically. In the sixteenth century, as at every other time, worthy folk of moderate views and nervous temperaments, ambitious persons combining greed with suppleness, old servants of the crown, and officials full of scruples and far from bold in the practical part of government, were the essential elements of this party. The constable de Montmorency sometimes issued forth from Chantilly to go and aid the Queen Mother, in whom he had no confidence, but whom he preferred to the Guise. A former councillor of the Parliament, for a long while Chancellor under Francis I and Henry II, and again summoned under Francis II by Catherine de' Medici to the same post, Francis Olivier was an honourable executant of the party's indecisive but moderate policy. He died on the 15th of March, 1560, and Catherine, in concert with the Cardinal of Lorraine, had the chancellorship thus vacated, conferred upon Michael de l'Hôpital, a magistrate already celebrated and designed to become still more so. As soon as he entered upon this great office, he made himself remarkable by the marvellous ability he showed in restraining within bounds the Lorraines themselves, whose servant he was, says the Protestant chronicler Renier de la Planche, to those who had the public weal at heart, he gave hope that all would at last turn out well, provided that he were let alone, and, to tell the truth, it would be impossible to adequately describe the prudence he displayed, for, assuredly, although if he had taken a shorter road towards manfully opposing the mischiefs, he would have had more deserved praise, and God would perhaps have blessed his constancy, yet, so far as one can judge, he alone, by his moderate behaviour, was the instrument made use of by God for keeping back many an impetuous flood, under which every Frenchman would have been submerged. 
external appearances however seemed to the contrary in short when any one represented to him some trouble that was coming he always had these words on his lips patience patience all will go well this philosophical and patriotic confidence on the part of chancellor de l'hôpital was fated to receive some cruel falsifications end of section thirty two recording by john fricker Section 33 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Fricker. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 32. Francis the Second july tenth fifteen fifty nine to december fifth fifteen sixty part two a few months and hardly so much after the accession of francis the second a serious matter brought into violent collision the three parties whose characteristics and dispositions have just been described the supremacy of the guise was insupportable to the reformers and irksome to many lukewarm or wavering members of the catholic nobility an edict of the king's had revoked all the graces and alienations of domains granted by his father the crown refused to pay its most lawful debts and duns were flocking to the court to get rid of them the cardinal of lorraine had a proclamation issued by the king warning all persons of whatever condition who had come to dun for payment of debts for compensations or for graces to take themselves off within twenty-four hours on pain of being hanged and that it might appear how seriously meant the threat was a very conspicuous gibbet was erected at fontainebleau close to the palace it was a shocking affront the malcontents at once made up to the reformers independently of the general oppression and perils under which these latter laboured they were liable to meet everywhere at the corners of streets men posted on the lookout who insulted them and denounced them to the magistrates if they did not uncover themselves before the madonnas set up in their way or if they did not join in the litanies chanted before them a repetition of petty requisitions soon becomes an odious tyranny an understanding was established between very different sorts of malcontents they all said and spread about that the guise were the authors of these oppressive and unjustifiable acts they made common cause in seeking for means of delivering themselves at the same time drawing an open distinction between the guise and the king the latter of whom there was no idea of attacking the inviability of kings and the responsibility of ministers those two fundamental maxims of a free monarchy had already become fixed ideas but how were they to be taken advantage of and put in practice when the institutions whereby political liberty exerts its power and keeps itself secure were not in force the malcontents whether reformers or catholics all cried out for the states-general those of tours in fourteen eighty four under charles the eighth had left behind them a momentous and an honoured memory but the guise and their partisans energetically rejected this cry they told the king that whoever spoke of convoking the states-general was his personal enemy and guilty of high treason for his people would fain impose law upon him from whom they ought to take it in such sort there would be left to him nothing of a king but the bare title the queen mother though all the while giving fair words to the malcontents whether reformers or others was also disquieted at their demands and she wrote to her son-in-law philip the second king of spain that they wanted by means of the said states to reduce her to the condition of a maid of all work whereupon philip replied that he would willingly employ all his forces to uphold the authority of the king his brother-in-law and of his ministers and that he had forty thousand men all ready in case anybody should be bold enough to attempt to violate it in their perplexity the malcontents amongst whom the reformers were becoming day by day the most numerous and the most urgent determined to take the advice of the greatest lawyers and most celebrated theologians of france and germany they asked whether it would be permissible with a good conscience and without falling into the crime of high treason to take up arms for the purpose of securing the persons of the duke of guy and the cardinal of lorraine and forcing them to render an account of their administration 
the doctors on being consulted answered that it would be allowable to oppose by force the far from legitimate supremacy of the guise provided that it were done under the authority of princes of the blood born administrators of the realm in such cases and with the consent of the orders composing the state or the greatest and soundest portion of these orders a meeting of the princes who were hostile to the guise were held at vendome to deliberate as to the conduct to be adopted in this condition of opinions and parties the king of navarre and his brother the prince of conde coligny dandelot and some of their most intimate friends took part in it and d'andre confidential secretary to the constable de montmorency was present the prince of conde was for taking up arms at once and swoop down upon the guise taking them by surprise coligny formerly opposed to this plan the king at his majority had a right he said to choose his own advisers no doubt it was a deplorable thing to see foreigners at the head of affairs but the country must not for the sake of removing them be rashly exposed to the scourge of civil war perhaps it would be enough if the queen mother were made acquainted with the general discontent the constable's secretary coincided with coligny whose opinion was carried it was agreed that the prince of conde should restrain his ardour and let himself be vaguely regarded as the possible leader of the enterprise if it were to take place but without giving it until further notice his name and co-operation he was called the mute captain there was need of a less conspicuous and more pronounced leader for that which was becoming a conspiracy and one soon presented itself in the person of godfrey de barry lord of la renaudie a nobleman of an ancient family of perigord well known to duke francis of guy under whose orders he had served valiantly at metz in 1552 and who had for some time protected him against the consequences of a troublesome trial at which la renaudie had been found guilty by the parliament of paris of forging and uttering false titles being forced to leave france he retired into switzerland to lausanne and geneva where it was not long before he showed the most passionate devotion for the reformation he was a man says de thole of quick and insinuating wits ready to undertake anything and burning with desire to avenge himself and wipe out by some brilliant deed the infamy of a sentence which he had incurred rather through another's than his own crime he then readily offered his services to those who were looking out for a second leader and he undertook to scour the kingdom in order to win over the men whose names had been given him he got from them all a promise to meet at nantes in february fifteen sixty and he there made them a long and able speech against the guise ending by saying god bids us to obey kings even when they ordain unjust things and there is no doubt but that they who resist the powers that god has set up to do resist his will we have this advantage that we ever full of submission to the prince are set against none but the traitors hostile to their king and their country and so much more dangerous in that they nestle in the very bosom of the state and in the name and clothed with the authority of a king who is a mere child are attacking the kingdom and the king himself now in order that you may not suppose that you will be acting herein against your consciences i am quite willing to be the first to protest and take god to witness that i will not think or say or do anything against the king against the queen his mother against the princes his brothers or against those of his blood and that on the contrary i will defend their majesty and their dignity and at the same time the authority of the laws and the liberty of the country against the tyranny of a few foreigners out of so large an assemblage adds the historian there was not found to be one whom so delicate an enterprise caused to recoil or who asked for time to deliberate it was agreed that before anything else a large number of persons without arms and free from suspicion should repair to court and there present a petition to the king beseeching him not to put pressure upon consciences any more and to permit the free exercise of religion that at almost the same time a chosen body of horsemen should repair to blois where the king was that their accomplices should admit them into the town and present a new petition to the king against the guise and that if the princes would not withdraw and give an account of their administration they should be attacked sword in hand and lastly that the prince of conde who had wished his name to be kept secret up to that time should put himself at the head of the conspirators the fifteenth of june was the day fixed for the execution of it all but the guise were warned one of la renaudie's friends had revealed the conspiracy to the cardinal of lorraine's secretary 
and from Spain, Germany, and Italy they received information as to the conspiracy hatched against them. The cardinal, impetuous and pusillanimous too, was for calling out the troops at once, but his brother the duke, who was not easily startled, was opposed to anything demonstrative. They removed the king to the castle of Amboise, a safer place than the town of Blois, and they concerted measures with the queen mother, to whom the conspirators were, both in their plans and in their personas, almost as objectionable as to them. She wrote in a style of affectionate confidence to Coligny, begging him to come to Amboise and give her his advice. He arrived in company with his brother Dandelot, and urged the Queen Mother to grant the reformers liberty of conscience and of worship, the only way to checkmate all the mischievous designs and to restore peace to the kingdom. Something of what he advised was done. A royal decree was published and carried up to the Parliament, on the 15th of March, ordaining the abolition of every prosecution on account of religion, in respect of the past only, and under reservations which rendered the grace almost inappreciable. The Guise, on their side, wrote to the constable de Montmorency to inform him of the conspiracy, of which you will feel as great horror as we do. And they signed, Your Thoroughly Best Friends. The Prince of Conde himself, though informed about the discovery of the plot, repaired to Amboise without showing any signs of being disconcerted at the cold reception offered him by the Lorraine princes. The Duke of Guy, always bold, even in his precautions, found an honourable means of making sure of him, says Castelnau, by giving him the guard at a gate of the town of Amboise, where he had him under watch and ward himself. The lords and gentlemen attached to the court made sallies all around Amboise to prevent any unexpected attack. They caught a great many troops badly led and badly equipped. Many poor folks in utter despair and without a leader asked pardon as they threw down upon the ground some wretched arms they bore, and declared that they knew no more about the enterprise than that there had been a time appointed to them to see a petition presented to the king, which concerned the welfare of his service and that of the kingdom. On the 18th of March, La Renaudie, who was scouring the country, seeking to rally his men, encountered a body of royal horse, who were equally hotly in quest of the conspirators. The two detachments attacked one another furiously. La Renaudie was killed, and his body, which was carried to Amboise, was strung up to a gallows on the bridge above the Loire with this scroll. This is La Renaudie, called La Forest, captain of the rebels, leader and author of the sedition. Disorder continued for several days in the surrounding country, but the surprise attempted against the Guise was a failure, and the important result of the riot of Amboise, tumult d'Amboise, as it was called, was an ordinance of Francis the Second, who, on the 17th of March, 1560, appointed Duke Francis of Guise his lieutenant-general, representing him in person absent and present in this good town of Amboise and other places of the realm, with full power, authority, commission, and special mandate to assemble all the princes, lords, and gentlemen, and generally to command, order, provide, and dispose of all things requisite and necessary. The young king was, nevertheless, according to what appears, somewhat troubled at all this uproar, and at the language of the conspirators. I don't know how it is, said he sometimes to Guy, but I hear it said that people are against you only. I wish you could be away from here for a time, that we might see whether it is you or I that they are against. But the Guise set about removing this idea by telling the king that neither he nor his brothers would live one hour after their departure, and that the house of Bourbon were only seeking how to exterminate the king's house. The caresses of the young queen Mary Stuart were enlisted in support of these assertions of her uncles. They made a cruel use of their easy victory for a whole month, according to contemporary chronicles. There was nothing but hanging or drowning folks. The Loire was covered with corpses strung six, eight, ten, and fifteen to long poles. What was strange to see, says Renier de la Planche, and had never been wont under any form of government, they were led out to execution without having any sentence pronounced against them publicly, or having the cause of their death declared, or having their names mentioned. They of the Guise reserved the chief of them, after dinner, to make sport for the ladies. The two sexes were ranged at the windows of the castle, as if it were a question of seeing some mummery played, 
and what is worse the king and his young brothers were present at these spectacles as if the desire were to blood them the sufferers were pointed out to them by the cardinal of lorraine with all the signs of a man greatly rejoiced and when the poor wretches died with more than usual firmness he would say see sir what brazenness and madness the fear of death cannot abate their pride and felonry what would they do then if they had you in their clutches it was too much vengeance to take and too much punishment to inflict for a danger so short-lived and so strictly personal so hideous was the spectacle that the duchess of guy anne d'este daughter of rene of france duchess of ferrara took her departure one day saying as she did so to catherine de medici ah madame what a whirlwind of hatred is gathering about the heads of my poor children there was throughout a considerable portion of the country a profound feeling of indignation against the guise one of their victims Villemony, just as it came to his turn to die plunged his hands into his comrade's blood saying heavenly father this is the blood of thy children thou wilt avenge it jean d'aubigny a nobleman of saint ogne as he passed through amboise one market-day with his son a little boy eight years old stopped before the heads fixed upon the posts and said to the child my boy spare not thy head after mine to avenge these brave chiefs if thou spare thyself thou shalt have my curse upon thee the chancellor olivier himself for a long while devoted to the guise but now seriously ill and disquieted about the future of his soul said to himself quite low as he saw the cardinal of lorraine from whom he had just received a visit going out ah cardinal you are getting us all damned the mysterious chieftain the mute captain of the conspiracy of amboise prince louis of conde remained unattained and he remained at amboise itself people were astounded at his security he had orders not to move away his papers were seized by the grand prelate but his coolness and his pride did not desert him for an instant we will borrow from the histoire des princes de conde by the duke of Aumal, the present heir and a worthy one of that line the account of his appearance before francis the second in full council in presence of the two queens the knights of the order and the great officers of the crown as i am certified said he that i have near the king's person enemies who are seeking the ruin of me and mine i have begged him to do me so much favour as to hear my answer in this company here present now i declare that save his own person and the persons of his brothers of the queen his mother and of the queen regent those who have reported that i was chief and leader of certain sedition mongers who are said to have conspired against his person and state have falsely and miserably lied and renouncing for the nonce my quality as prince of the blood which i hold however of god alone i am ready to make them confess at the sword's point that they are cowards and rascals themselves seeking the subversion of the state and the crown whereof i am bound to promote the maintenance by a better title than my accusers if there be amongst those present any one who has made such a report and will maintain it let him declare as much this moment the duke of guy rising to his feet protested that he could not bear to have so great a prince any longer calumniated and offered to be his second conde profiting by the effect produced by his proud language demanded and obtained leave to retire from the court which he quitted at once end of section thirty three recording by john fricker Section thirty four of a popular history of France, volume four. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Fricker. A popular history of France from the earliest times, volume four, by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter thirty two. Francis the second july tenth fifteen fifty nine to december fifth fifteen sixty part three all seemed to be over 
but the whole of France had been strongly moved by what had just taken place, and though the instructions which invite a people to interfere in its own destinies were not, at the date of the sixteenth century, in regular and effective working order, there was everywhere felt, even at court, the necessity of ascertaining the feeling of the country. On all sides there was a demand for the convocation of the States General. The Guise and the Queen Mother, who dreaded this great and independent national power, attempted to satisfy public opinion by calling an assembly of notables, not at all numerous and chosen by themselves. It was summoned to meet on August 21st, 1560, at Fontainebleau, in the apartments of the Queen Mother. Some great lords, certain bishops, the Constable de Montmorency, two marshals of France, the privy councillors, the knights of the order, the secretaries of state and finance, Chancellor de l'Hôpital and Coligny took part in it. The King of Navarre and the Prince of Conde did not respond to the summons they received. The constable rode up with the following of six hundred horse. The first day was fully taken up by a statement presented to the assembly by l'Hôpital of the evils that had fallen upon France, and by a declaration on the part of the Guise that they were ready to render an account of their administration and of their actions. Next day, just as the Bishop of Valence was about to speak, Coligny went up to the king, made two genuflections, stigmatized in energetic terms the Amboise conspiracy and every similar enterprise, and presented two petitions one intended for the king himself, and the other for the queen mother. They were forwarded to me in Normandy, said he, by faithful Christians, who make their prayers to God in accordance with the true rules of piety. They ask for nothing but the liberty of holding their own creed, and that of having temples and celebrating their worship in certain fixed places. If necessary, this petition would be signed by fifty thousand persons. And I, said the Duke of Guy, brusquely, would find a million to sign a contrary petition. This incident went no further between the two speakers. A great discussion began as to the reforms desirable in the church, and as to the convocation of a general council, or, in default thereof, a national council. The Cardinal of Lorraine spoke last, and vehemently attacked the petitions presented by Admiral de Coligny. Though couched in moderate and respectful terms, said he, this document is, at bottom, insolent and seditious. It is as much as to say that those gentry would be obedient and submissive if the king would be pleased to authorise their mischievous sentiments. For the rest, he added, as it is merely a question of improving morals and putting in force strict discipline, the meeting of a council, whether general or national, appears to me quite unnecessary. I consent to the holding of the states-general." the opinion of the cardinal of lorraine was adopted by the king the queen mother and the assemblage an edict dated august twenty sixth convoked a meeting of the states-general at meaux on the tenth of december following as to the question of a council general or national it was referred to the decisions of the pope and the bishops of france Meanwhile, it was announced that the punishment of sectaries would for the present be suspended, but that the king reserved to himself and his judges the right of severely chastising those who had armed the populace and kindled sedition. Thus it was, adds to Tho, that the Protestant religion hitherto so hated began to be tolerated, and in a manner authorised by consent of its enemies themselves. The elections to the states-general were very stormy. All parties displayed the same ardour the Guise, by identifying themselves more and more with the Catholic cause, and employing to further its triumph all the resources of the government, the reformers, by appealing to the rights of liberty and to the passions bred of sect and of local independence. A royal decree was addressed to all the bailiffs of the kingdom. Ye shall not fail, said the king to them, to keep your eyes open and give orders that such mischievous spirits as may be composed of the remnants of the Amboise rebellion or other gentry, studious of innovation and alteration in the state, be so discovered and restrained that they be not able to corrupt by their machinations, under whatsoever pretext they may hide them, simple folks led on by confidence in the clemency whereof we have heretofore made use. The bailiffs followed, for the most part, successfully, but in some cases vainly, the instructions they had received. One morning in December 1560, the Duke of Guy was visited by a courier from the Comte de Villar, governor of Languedoc. He informed the Duke that the deputies of that province had just been appointed, and that they all belonged to the new religion, and were amongst the most devoted to the sect. 
there was not a moment to lose for they were men of wits general reputation and circumspection the governor was very vexed at not having been able to prevent their election and departure but plurality of votes had carried the day against him this dispatch was no sooner received than some men were got ready to go and meet those deputies in order to put them in the place where they would never have been able to do good or harm the deputies of Languedoc escaped this ambuscade, and arrived safe and sound at Orleans, but they were kept under strict watch, and their papers were confiscated up to the moment when the death of the king occurred to deliver them from all fear. In Provence, in Dauphiny, in the courtship of Avignon, at Lyon, on occasion, and in the midst of the electoral struggle, several local risings, seizures of arms, and surprisals of towns took place and disturbed the public peace. There was not yet religious civil war, but there were the preparatory note and symptoms of it. At the same time that they were thus labouring to keep out of the approaching states-general adversaries of obscure rank and belonging to the people, the Guise had very much at heart a desire that the general leaders of the reformers and of the Catholic malcontents, especially the two princes of the House of Bourbon, the King of Navarre and the Prince of Conde, should come to this assembly, and there find themselves under the thumb of their enemies. They had not gone to the assemblage of notables of Fontainebleau, and their hostility to the Guise had been openly shown during and since that absence. Nothing was left untried to attract them, not to Meaux any longer, but to Orleans, whither the meeting of the States-General had been transferred. King Francis the Second, a docile instrument in the hands of his uncles and his young queen, their niece, wrote letter after letter to the King of Navarre, urging him to bring with him his brother, the Prince of Conde, to clear himself of the accusations brought against him by these miserable heretics who made marvellous charges against him. Conde would easily prove the falsity of the assertions made by these rascals. The King of Navarre still hesitated. The King insisted haughtily. I should be sorry, he wrote on the 30th of August, 1560, that into the heart of a person of such good family, and one that touches me so nearly, so miserable an inclination should have entered. Being able to assure you that wherein soever he refuses to obey me, I shall know perfectly well how to make it felt that I am king. The Prince of Conde's mother-in-law, the Countess of Roy, wrote to the Queen Mother that the Prince would appear at court if the King commanded it but she begged her beforehand not to think it strange if, on going to a place where his most cruel enemies had every power, he went attended by his friends. Whether she really were, or only pretended to be, shocked at what looked like a threat, Catherine replied that no person in France had a right to approach the king in any other wise than his ordinary following, and that, if the Prince of Conde went to court with a numerous escort, he would find the king still better attended. At last the King of Navarre and his brother made up their minds. How could they elude formal orders? Armed resistance had become the only possible resource, and the Prince of Conde lacked means to maintain it. His scarcity of money was such that, in order to procure him a thousand gold coins, his mother-in-law had been obliged to pledge her castle of Germany to the Constable de Montmorency. In spite of fears and remonstrances on the part of their most sincere friends, the two chiefs of the House of Bourbon left their homes and set out for Orleans. On their arrival before Poitiers, great was their surprise. The governor, Montpezat, shut the gates against them as public enemies. They were on the point of abruptly retracing their steps, but Montpezat had ill understood his instructions. He ought to have kept an eye upon the Bourbons without displaying any bad disposition towards them, so long as they prosecuted their journey peacefully. The object was, on the contrary, to heap upon them marks of respect and neglect nothing to give them confidence. Marshal de Terme, dispatched in hot haste, went to open the gates of Poitiers to the princes, and receive them there with the honours due to them. They resumed their route, and arrived on the 30th of October at Orleans. The reception they there met with cannot be better described than it has been by the Duke of Ormal. Not one of the Crown's officers came to receive the princes. No honour was paid to them. The streets were deserted, silent, and occupied by a military guard. In conformity with usage, the King of Navarre presented himself on horseback at the great gate of the royal abode. It remained closed. He had to pocket the insult and pass on foot through the wicket, between a double row of gentlemen wearing an air of insolence. The King awaited the princes in his chamber. Behind him were ranged the Guise and the principal lords. 
not a word, not a salutation on their part. After this freezing reception, Francis the Second conducted the two brothers to his mother, who received them, according to the Renier de la Planche's expression, with crocodile's tears. The Guise did not follow them thither, in order to escape any personal dispute, and so as not to be hearers of the severe words which they had themselves dictated to the young monarch. The king questioned Conde sharply, but the latter, who was endowed with great courage and spoke as well as ever any prince or gentleman in the world, was not at all startled, and defended his cause with many good and strong reasons, protesting his own innocence and accusing the Guise of calumniation. When he haughtily alluded to the word of honour which had been given him, the king, interrupting him, made a sign, and the two captains of the guard, Brise and Chauvigny, entered and took the prince's sword. He was conducted to a house in the city near the Jacobins, which was immediately barred, crenellated, surrounded by soldiers, and converted into a veritable Bastille. Whilst they were removing him thither, Conde exclaimed loudly against this brazen violation of all the promises of safety by which he had been lured on when urged to go to Orleans. The only answer received was his committal to absolutely solitary confinement and the withdrawal of his servants. The King of Navarre vainly asked to have his brother's custody confided to him. He obtained nothing but a coarse refusal, and he himself, separated from his escort, was kept under ocular supervision in his apartment. The trial of the Prince of Conde commenced immediately. He was brought before the Privy Council. He claimed, as a Prince of the Blood and Knight of the Order of St. Michael, he had his right to be tried only by the Court of Parliament furnished with the proper complement of peers and knights of the Order. This latter safeguard was worth noting in his case, for there had been created just lately eighteen new knights, all friends and creatures of the Guise. His claim, however, was rejected, and he repeated it, at the same time refusing to reply to any interrogation, and appealing from the king ill-advised to the king better advised. A priest was sent to celebrate mass in his chamber, but I came, said he, to clear myself from the calumnies alleged against me, which is of more consequence to me than hearing mass. He did not attempt to conceal his antipathy towards the Guise, and the part he had taken in the hostilities directed against them. An officer to whom permission had been given to converse with him in presence of his custodians told him that an appointment, accommodation, with the Duke of Guy would not be an impossibility for him. Appointment between him and me, answered Conde, it can only be at the point of the lance. The Duchess Renée of Ferrara, daughter of Louis the Twelfth, having come to France at this time, went to Orleans to pay her respects to the king. The Duke of Guy was her son-in-law, and she reproached him bitterly with Conde's trial. "'You have just opened,' said she, "'a wound which will bleed a long while. They who have dared to attack the persons of the blood royal have always found it a bad job.' The prince asked to see, in the presence of such persons as the knight might appoint his wife, Eleanor of Roy, who, from the commencement of the trial, solicited this favour night and day, often throwing herself on her knees before the king with tears incredible. But the cardinal of Lorraine, fearing lest his majesty should be moved with compassion, drove away the princess most rudely, saying that if she had her due, she would herself be placed in the lowest dungeon. For them of Guy, the princess was a thorn in the flesh, for she lacked not wits or language or courage, insomuch that they had some discussion about making away with her. She demanded that at any rate able lawyers might act as counsel for her husband. Peter Robert and Francis de Marillac, advocates of renown in the Parliament of Paris, were appointed by the king for that purpose, but their assistance proved perfectly useless. On the 26th of November, 1560, the Prince of Conde was sentenced to death, and the sentence was to be carried out on the 10th of December, the very day of the opening of the States General. Most of the historians say that when it came to a question of signing it, three judges only, Chancellor de l'Hôpital, the Councillor of State de Portail, and the aged Count of Sancerre, Louis de Beul, refused to put their names to it. For my part, said the scrupulous to Thule, I can see nothing quite certain as to all that. I believe that the sentence of death was drawn up and not signed. I remember to have heard it so said a long while afterwards by my father, a truthful and straightforward man, to whom this form of sentence had always been distasteful. 
Many contemporaries report, and to throw a cause credence to the report, that in order to have nothing more to fear from the house of Bourbon, the Guise had resolved to make away with King Antony of Navarre, as well as his brother the Prince of Conde, but by another process. Feeling persuaded that it would be impossible to obtain against the elder brother a sentence ever so little in accordance with justice, for his conduct had been very reserved, they had, it is said, agreed that King Francis the Second should send for the King of Navarre into his closet, and reproach him severely for his secret complicity with his brother Conde, and that if the King of Navarre defended himself stubbornly, he should be put to death on the spot by men posted there for the purpose. It is even added that Francis the Second was to strike the first blow. Catherine de Medici, who was beginning to be disquieted at the arrogance and success of the Lorraine princes, sent warning of this peril to the King of Navarre by Jacqueline de Longueville, Duchess of Montpensier, and just as he was proceeding to the royal audience from which he was not sure to return, Antony de Bourbon, who was wanting in head rather than in heart, said to Renty, one of his gentlemen, If I die yonder, carry my blood-stained shirt to my wife and my son and tell my wife to send it round to the foreign princes of Christendom, that they may avenge my death, as my son is not yet of sufficient age. We may remark that the wife was Jeanne d'Albret, and the son was to be Henry the Fourth. According to the chroniclers, when Francis the Second looked in the eyes of the man he was to strike, his fierce resolve died away. The King of Navarre retired safe and sound from the interview, and the Duke of Guy, irritated at the weakness of the King, his master, muttered between his teeth, "'Tis the very whitest liver that ever was." In spite of de Thau's endorsement of this story, it is doubtful whether its authenticity can be admitted. If the interview between the two kings took place, prudence on the part of the King of Navarre seems to be quite as likely an explanation of the result as hesitation to become a murderer on the part of Francis the Second. One day Conde was playing cards with some officers on guard over him, when a servant of his, who had been permitted to resume attendance on his master, pretending to approach him for the purpose of picking up a card, whispered in his ear, "'Our gentleman is crocked.' The prince, mastering his emotion, finished his game. He then found means of being for a moment alone with his servant, and learned from him that Francis the Second was dead." on the seventeenth of november fifteen sixty as he was mounting his horse to go hunting he fainted suddenly he appeared to have recovered and was even able to be present when the final sentence was pronounced against cond but on the twenty ninth of november there was a fresh fainting fit it appears that ambrose pere at that time the first surgeon of his day and a faithful reformer informed his patron admiral coligny that there would not be long to wait and that it was all over with the king up to the very last moment, either by themselves or through their niece Mary Stuart, the Guise preserved their influence over him. Francis the Second sent for the King of Navarre to assure him that it was quite of his own accord, and not by advice of the Guise, that he had brought Conde to trial. He died on the 5th of December, 1560, of an effusion of the brain, resulting from a fistula and an abscess in the ear through a fog of brief or doubtful evidence we can see at the bedside of this dying king his wife mary stuart who gave him to the last of her tender ministrations and admiral de coligny who when the king had heaved his last sigh rose up and with his air of pious gravity said aloud before the cardinal of lorraine and the others who were present gentlemen the king is dead a lesson to us to live at the same moment the constable de montmorency who had been ordered some time ago to orleans but had according to his practice travelled but slowly arrived suddenly at the city gate threatening to hang the ill-informed keepers of it who hesitated to let him enter and hastened to fold in his arms his niece the princess of conde whom the death of francis the second restored to hope end of section thirty four recording by john fricker Section 35 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate McKenzie. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, 
Volume Four by Francois Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter Thirty Three, Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, fifteen sixty to fifteen seventy four, Part One. We now enter upon the era of the civil wars, massacres, and assassinations caused by religious fanaticism or committed on religious pretexts. The latter half of the sixteenth century is the time at which the human race saw the opening of that great drama of which religious liberty is the beginning and the end, and France was then the chief scene of it. At the close of the fifteenth and at the commencement of the sixteenth centuries, religious questions had profoundly agitated Christian Europe, but towards the middle of the latter century, they had obtained in the majority of European states solutions which, however incomplete, might be regarded as definitive. Germany was divided into Catholic states and Protestant states, which had established between themselves relations of an almost pacific character. Switzerland was entering upon the same course. In England, Scotland, the Low Countries, the Scandinavian states, and the free towns their neighbours, the Reformation had prevailed, or was clearly tending to prevail. In Italy, Spain, and Portugal, on the contrary, the Reformation had been stifled, and Catholicism remained victorious. It was in France that, notwithstanding the inequality of forces, the struggle between Catholicism and Protestantism was most obstinately maintained, and appeared for the longest time uncertain. After half a century of civil wars and massacres, it terminated in Henry the Fourth, a Protestant king, who turned Catholic, but who gave Protestants the Edict of Nantes, a precious though insufficient and precarious pledge, which served France as a point of departure towards religious liberty, and which protected it for nearly a century, in the midst of the brilliant victory won by Catholicism. Note, the Edict of Nantes, published by Henry IV in 1598, was revoked by Louis XIV in 1685. For more than three centuries, civilized Europe has been discussing, pro or con, the question of religious liberty. But from instinct, and with passion far more than with a serious understanding of what is at the bottom of things. Even in our own day, it is not without difficulty that a beginning is being made to understand and accept that principle in its true sense and in all its bearings. Men were wonderfully far from it in 1560, at the accession of Charles the Ninth, a child ten years old. They were entering, in blind confidence, upon a religious war, in order to arrive, only after four centuries of strife and misconception, at a vindication of religious liberty. Woe to thee, O country, that hast a child for king, said, in accordance with the Bible, the Venetian Michael Suriano, ambassador to France at that time. Around that royal child, and seeking to have the mastery over France by being masters over him, were struggling the three great parties at that time occupying the stage in the name of religion. The Catholics rejected altogether the idea of religious liberty for the Protestants. The Protestants had absolute need of it, for it was their condition of existence. But they did not wish for it in the case of the Catholics, their adversaries. The third party, Thiers' party, as we call it nowadays, wished to hold the balance continually wavering between the Catholics and the Protestants, conceding to the former and the latter, alternately, that measure of liberty which was indispensable for most imperfect maintenance of the public peace, and reconcilable with the sovereign power of the kingship. On such conditions was the government of Charles the Ninth to establish its existence. The death of Francis the Second put an end to a grand project of the Guises, which we do not find expressly indicated elsewhere than in the memoir of Michel de Castelnau one of the best informed and most intelligent historians of the time. Many Catholics, says he, were then of opinion that, if the authority of the Duke of Guise had continued to be armed with that of the King as it had been, the Protestants would have had enough to do, for orders had been sent to all the principal lords of the kingdom, officers of the crown and knights of the order, 
to show themselves in the said city of Orléans on Christmas Day at the opening of the state, for that they might be all made to sign the confession of the Catholic faith, in presence of the king and the chapter of the order, together with all the members of the privy council, reporting masters of petitions, domestic officers of the king's household, and all the deputies of the estates. The same confession was to be published throughout all the said kingdom, in order to have it sworn by all the judges, magistrates and officers, and, finally, all private persons from parish to parish. And, in default of doing so, proceedings were to be taken by seizures, condemnations, executions, banishments and confiscations. And they who did repent themselves and abjured their Protestant religion were to be absolved. It is not to be supposed that, even if circumstances had remained as they were under the reign of Francis the Second, such a plan could have been successful. But it is intelligible that the Guises had conceived such an idea. They were victorious. They had just procured the condemnation to death of the most formidable amongst the Protestant princes, their adversary, Louis de Conde. They were threatening the life of his brother, the King of Navarre, and the House of Bourbon seemed to be on the point of disappearing beneath the blows of the ambitious, audacious, and by no means scrupulous House of Lorraine. Not even the prospect of Francis the Second's death arrested the Guises in their work and their hopes. When they saw that he was near his end, they made a proposal to the Queen Mother to unite herself completely with them, leaving the Prince of Conde to execution, rid herself of the King of Navarre, and become regent of the kingdom during the minority of her son Charles, taking them, the Lorraine princes and their party, for necessary partners in her government. But Catherine de' Medici was more prudent, more judicious, and more egotistical in her ambition than the Guises were in theirs. She was not, as they were, exclusively devoted to the Catholic party. It was power that she wanted, and she sought for it every day amongst the party or the mixtures of parties in a condition to give it her. She considered the Catholic party to be the strongest, and it was hers. But she considered the Protestant party strong enough to be feared, and to give her a certain amount of security and satisfaction. A security necessary, moreover, if peace at home and not civil war were to be the habitual and general condition of France. Catherine was, finally, a woman, and very skilful in the strifes of court and of government, whilst, on the field of battle, the victories, though won in her name, would be those of the Guise more than her own. Without openly rejecting the proposals they made to her, under their common apprehension of Francis the Second's approaching death, she avoided making any reply. She had, no doubt, already taken her precautions and her measures in advance. Her confidant, Jacqueline de Longry, Duchess of Montpensier, and a zealous Protestant, had brought to her rooms at night Antony de Bourbon, King of Navarre, and Catherine had come to an agreement with him about the partition of power between herself and him at the death of the king, her son. She had written to the constable de Montmorency, a rival of the Guise, and their foe, though a staunch Catholic, to make haste to Orléans, where his presence would be required. As soon as Chancelot de l'Hôpital became aware of the proposals which were being made by the Guise to the Queen Mother, he flew to her and opposed them with all the energy of his great and politic mind and sterling nature. Was she going to deliver the Prince of Conde to the scaffold, the House of Bourbon to ruin France to civil war, and the independence of the crown and of that royal authority which she was on the point of wielding herself, to the tyrannical domination of her rivals, the Lorraine princes, and of their party? Catherine listened with great satisfaction to this judicious and honest language. When the crown passed to her son Charles, she was free from any serious anxiety as to her own position and her influence in the government. The new king, on announcing to the parliament the death of his brother, wrote to them that, confiding in the virtues and prudence of the queen mother, he had begged her to take in hand the administration of the kingdom with the wise counsel and advice of the King of Navarre, 
and the notables and great personages of the late king's council. A few months afterwards, the States General, assembling first at Orléans and afterwards at Pontoise, ratified this declaration by recognizing the placement of the young King Charles the Ninth's guardianship in the hands of Catherine de Medici, his mother, together with the principal direction of affairs, but without the title of regent. The King of Navarre was to assist her in the capacity of Lieutenant General of the Kingdom. Twenty-five members, specially designated, were to form the king's privy council and in the privacy of her motherly correspondence catherine wrote to the queen of spain her daughter elizabeth wife of philip the second madame my dear daughter all i shall tell you is not to be the least anxious and to rest assured that i shall spare no pains to so conduct myself that god and everybody may have occasion to be satisfied with me you have seen the time when i was as happy as you are not dreaming of ever having any greater trouble than that of not being loved as I should have liked to be by the king your father. God took him from me, and is not content with that. He has taken from me your brother, whom I loved you well know how much, and has left me with three young children, and in a kingdom where all is division, having therein not a single man in whom I can trust, and who has not some particular object of his own the queen mother of france who wrote to her daughter the queen of spain with such firmness of tone and such independence of spirit was to use the words of the venetian ambassador john micieli who had lived at her court a woman of forty-three of affable manners great moderation superior intelligence and ability in conducting all sorts of affairs especially affairs of state as mother she has the personal management of the king she allows no one else to sleep in his room she is never away from him as regent and head of the government she holds everything in her hands public offices benefices graces and the seal which bears the king's signature and which is called the cachet privy seal or signet in the council she allows the others to speak she replies to anyone who needs it she decides according to the advice of the council or according to what she may have made up her own mind to she opens the letters addressed to the king by his ambassadors and by all the ministers she has great designs and does not allow them to be easily penetrated as for her way of living she is very fond of her ease and pleasure she observes few rules she eats and drinks a great deal she considers that she makes up for it by taking a great deal of exercise afoot and a horseback. She goes a-hunting, and last year she always joined the king in his stag-chases, through the woods and thick forests, a dangerous sort of chase for anyone who is not an excellent rider. She has an olive complexion, and is already very fat. Accordingly, the doctors have not a good opinion of her life. She has a dower of 300,000 francs a year, double that of other queen's dowager she was formerly always in money difficulties and in debt now she not only keeps out of debt but she spends and gives more liberally than ever as soon as the reign of charles the ninth and the queen mother's government were established notice was sent to the prince of conde that he was free he refused to stir from prison he would wait he said until his accusers were confined there he was told that it was the king's express order and was what francis the second on his deathbed had himself impressed upon the king of navarre conde determined to set out for la fere a place belonging to his brother antony de bourbon and there await fresh orders from the king in february fifteen sixty one he left la fere for fontainebleau on his road to paris his friends flocked to him and made him a splendid escort. On approaching the king's palace, Conn separated himself from his following and advanced alone with two of his most faithful friends. All the lords of the court, the Duke of Guise amongst them, went to meet him. On the 15th of March he was admitted to the Privy Council. Chancellor de l'Hôpital, on the prince's own demand, affirmed that no charge had been found against him the king declared his innocence in a deed signed by all the members of the council 
and on the 13th of June, in solemn session, the Parliament of Paris, sitting as a court of peers, confirmed this declaration. Notwithstanding the Duke of Guise's cooperation in all these acts, Con desired something of a more personal kind on his part. On the 24th of August at Saint-Germain, in presence of the king, the queen mother, the princes, and the court, the Duke of Guise, in reply to a question from the king, protested that he had not, and would never have desired to, put forward anything against the prince's honour, and that he had been neither the author nor the instigator of his imprisonment. Sir, said Conde, I consider wicked and contemptible him or them who caused it. So I think, sir, answered Guise, and it does not apply to me at all. Whereupon they embraced, and a report was drawn up of the ceremony, which was called their reconciliation. Just as it was ending, Marshal Francis de Montmorency, eldest son of the constable, and far more inclined than his father was towards the cause of the reformers, arrived with a numerous troop of friends, whom he had mustered to do honour to Conde. The court was a little excited at this incident. The constable declared that, having the honour to be so closely connected with the princes of Bourbon, his son would have been to blame if he had acted differently. The aged warrior had himself negotiated this reconciliation, and when it was accomplished, and the Duke of Guise had performed his part in it with so much complaisance, the constable considered himself to be quits with his former allies, and free to follow his leaning towards the Catholic party. The veteran, says the Duke of Autnal, did not pique himself on being a theologian, but he was sincerely attached to the Catholic faith, because it was the old religion and the king's, and he separated himself definitively from those religious and political innovators whom he had at first seemed to countenance, and amongst whom he reckoned his nearest relatives. In vain did his eldest son try to hold him back. A close union was formed between the constable de Montmorency, the Duke of Guise, and Marshal de Saint-Andre, and it became the Catholic triumvirate against which Catherine de Medici had at one time to defend herself, and of which she had at another to avail herself in order to carry out the policy of seesaw she had adopted as her chief means of government. Before we call to mind and estimate as they deserve the actions of that government, we must give a correct idea of the moral condition of the people governed, of their unbridled passions, and of the share of responsibility reverting to them in the crimes and shocking errors of that period. It is a mistake and an injustice, only too common, to lay all the burden of such facts, and the odium justly due to them, upon the great actors, almost exclusively whose name has remained attached to them in history. The people themselves have very often been the prime movers in them. They have very often proceeded and urged on their masters in the black deeds which have sullied their history, and on the masses as well as on the leaders ought the just sentence of posterity to fall. The moment we speak of the Saint Bartholomew, it seems as if Charles the Ninth, Catherine de Medici, and the Guises issued from their grave to receive that sentence, and, God forbid, that we should wish to deliver them from it. But, it hits the nameless populace of their day as well as themselves, and the hands of the people far more than the will of kings, began the tale of massacres for religion's sake. This is no vague and general assertion, and, to show it, we shall only have to enumerate, with their dates, the principal facts of which history has preserved the memory, whilst stigmatising them, with good reason, as massacres or murders. The greater number, as was to be expected, are deeds done by Catholics, for they were by far the more numerous and more frequently victorious. But Protestants also have sometimes deserved a place in this tragic category, and when we meet with them, we will assuredly not blot them out. End of section 35section thirty six of a popular history of france volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kate mackenzie 
A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot, translated by Robert Black. Chapter 33. Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, 1560 to 1574, Part 2. We confine the enumeration to the reign of Charles the Ninth, and in it we place only such massacres and murders as were not the results of any legal proceeding. We say nothing of judicial sentences and executions, however outrageous and iniquitous they may have been. The first fact which presents itself is a singular one. Admiral de Coligny's eldest brother, Audet de Chatillon, was a Catholic, Bishop of Beauvais, and a Cardinal. In 1550, he had gone to Rome and had cooperated in the election of Pope Julius III. In 1554, he had published some Constitution Synodal, Synodal Regulations, to remedy certain abuses which had crept into his diocese, and in 1561, he proposed to make in the celebration of the Lord's Supper some modifications which smacked, it is said, of the innovations of Geneva. The populace of Beauvais were so enraged at this that they rose up against him, massacred a schoolmaster whom he tried to protect, and would have massacred the bishop himself if troops sent from Paris had not come to his assistance. In the same year, 1561, the Protestants had a custom of meeting at Paris for their religious exercises in a house called the Patriarch's House, very near the church of saint Medard. On the 27th of December, whilst the reformed minister was preaching, the Catholics had all the bells of saint Medard rung in full peal. The minister sent two of his congregation to beg the incumbent to have the bell ringing stopped for a short time. The mob threw themselves upon the two messengers. One was killed, and the other, after making a stout defence, returned badly wounded to the patriarch's house, and fell dead at the preacher's feet. The provost of tradesmen was for having the bells stopped. The riot became violent, the house of the reformers was stormed, and the provost's archers had great difficulty in putting a stop to the fight. More than a hundred persons, it is said, were killed or wounded. In 1562, in the month of February, whilst the Guise were travelling in Germany, with the object of concluding, in the interests of policy, alliances with some German Lutheran princes, disturbances broke out at Cahors, Amiens, Sens, and Tours, between the Protestants and the Catholics. Which of the two began them? It would be difficult to determine. The passions that lead to insult, attack, defence, and vengeance were mutually felt and equally violent on both sides. Montluc was sent to Guienne by the Queen Mother to restore order there, but nearly everywhere he laid the blame on the Protestants. His memoir proved that he harried them without any form of justice. At Sauveterre, says he, I caught five or six all of whom I had hanged without expense of paper or ink, and without giving them a hearing, for those gentry are regular chrysostoms, parle d'or. I was informed that at Gironde there were sixty or eighty Huguenots belonging to them of La Réole, who had retreated thither, the which were all taken, and I had them hanged to the pillars of the market-place without further ceremony. One hanged has more effect than a hundred slain. When Montluc took Montségur, the massacre lasted for ten hours or more, says he, because search was made for them in the houses. The dead were counted, and found to be more than seven hundred. Almost at the very time at which Montluc, who had been sent to Guienne to restore order there between the Catholics and the Protestants, was treating the latter with the shocking severity, an incident, more serious because of the rank of the persons concerned, took place at Vassy, a small town in Champagne, near which the Duke of Guise passed on returning from Germany. Hearing as he went the sound of bells, he asked what it meant. "'It is the church of the Huguenots of Vassy,' was the answer. "'Are there many of them?' asked the Duke. He was told that there were, and that they were increasing more and more. "'Then,' says the chronicler, "'he began to mutter and to put himself in a white heat, gnawing his beard,' as he was wont to do when he was enraged or had a mind to take vengeance. 
did he turn aside out of his way with his following to pass right through vassy or did he confine himself to sending some of his people to bring him an account of what was happening there when a fact which was at the outset insignificant has become a great event it is hardly possible to arrive at any certain knowledge of the truth as to the small details of its origin whatever may have been the case in the first instance a quarrel and before long a struggle began between the preacher's congregation and the prince's following being informed of the matter whilst he was at table the duke of guise rose up went to the spot found the combatants very warmly at work and himself received several blows from stones and when the fight was put a stop to forty-nine persons had been killed in it nearly all on the protestant side more than two hundred others it is said came out of it severely wounded and whether victors or vanquished all were equally irritated the protestants complained vehemently and conde offered in their name fifty thousand men to resent this attack but his brother the king of navarre on the contrary received with a very bad grace the pleading of theodore de bez it is true that the church of god should endure blows and not inflict them said de bez but remember i pray you that it is an anvil which has used up a great many hammers the massacre of vassy the name which has remained affixed to it in history rapidly became contagious from fifteen sixty two to fifteen seventy two in languedoc in provence in dauphiny in poitou in orleans in normandy even and in picardy at toulouse at gaillac at fréjoux at troyes at Sens, at amiens at rouen and in many other towns spontaneous and disorderly outbreaks between religiously opposed portions of the populace took place suddenly were repeated and spread sometimes with the connivance of the local authorities judicial or administrative but more often through the mere brutal explosion of the people's passions it is distasteful to us to drag numerous examples from oblivion but we will cite just two faithful representations of those sad incidents and attested by authentic documents the little town of gaillac was almost entirely catholic the protestants less numerous had met the day after pentecost may the eighteenth fifteen sixty two to celebrate the lord's supper the inhabitants in the quarter of the chateau de l'orme who are all artisans or vine dressers says the chronicler rush to arms hurry along with them all the catholics of the town invest the place of assembly and take prisoners all who were present after this capture they separate some remain in the meeting-house on guard over the prisoners the rest go into dwellings to work their will upon those of the religion who had remained there then they take the prisoners to the number of sixty or eighty into a gallery of the abbey of st michael situated on a steep rock at the base of which flows the river tarn and there a field labourer named cabral having donned the robe and cape of the judge's deputy whom he had slain with his own hand pronounces judgment and sentences all the prisoners to be thrown from the gallery into the river telling them to go and eat fish as they had not chosen to fast during lent which was done forthwith divers boatmen who were on the river dispatched with their oars those who tried to save themselves by swimming at troyes in champagne during the early part of august fifteen seventy two the majority of the protestants of the town who were returning from eslemont where they had a meeting-house and a pastor under authorization from the king were assailed in the neighbourhood of Cancel by the excited populace a certain number of individuals accompanying a mother carrying a child which had just received baptism were pursued with showers of stones several were wounded and the child was killed in its mother's arms this affair did not give rise to any prosecution it is no use to think about it any longer said the delegate of the bailiff and of the mayor of troyes in a letter from paris on the twenty seventh of august the saint bartholomew had just taken place on the twenty fourth of august where they happened to be the stronger and where they had either vengeance to satisfy or measures of security to take the protestants were not more patient or more humane than the catholics at nimes in fifteen sixty seven they projected and carried out in the town and the neighbouring country a massacre in which a hundred and ninety-two catholics perished 
and several churches and religious houses were damaged or completely destroyed. This massacre, perpetrated on St. Michael's Day, was called the Michaelade. The barbarities committed against the Catholics in Dauphiny and in Provence by Francis de Beaumont, Baron of Adre, have remained as historical as the massacre of Vassy, and he justified them on the same grounds as Montluc had given for his in Guienne. Nobody commits cruelty in repaying it, said he. The first are called cruelties, the second, justice. The only way to stop the enemy's barbarities is to meet them with retaliation. Though experience ought to have shown them their mistake, both Adre and Montluc persisted in it. A case, however, is mentioned in which Adre was constrained to be merciful. After the capture of Montbrison, he had sentenced all the prisoners to throw themselves down, with their hands tied behind them from the top of the citadel. One of them made two attempts, and thought better of it. "'Come, twice is enough to take your soundings,' shouted the baron who was looking on. "'I'll give you four times to do it in,' rejoined the soldier, and this good saying saved his life. The weak and undecided government of Catherine de' Medici tried several times, but in vain, to prevent or repress these savage explosions of passion and strife amongst the people. The sterling moderation of Chancellor de l'Hôpital was scarcely more successful than the hypocritical and double-faced attentions paid by Catherine de' Medici to both the Catholic and the Protestant leaders. The great maladies and the great errors of nations require remedies more heroic than the adroitness of a woman the wisdom of a functionary, or the hopes of a philosopher. It was formal and open civil war between the two communions and the two parties that, with honest and patriotic desire, L'Hôpital and even Catherine were anxious to avoid. From 1561 to 1572, there were in France 18 or 20 massacres of Protestants, four or five of Catholics, and 30 or 40 single murders sufficiently important to have been kept in remembrance by history and during that space of time formal civil war religious and partisan broke out stopped and recommenced in four campaigns signalized each of them by great battles and four times terminated by impotent or deceptive treaties of peace which on the twenty fourth of august fifteen seventy two ended for their sole result in the greatest massacre of french history the Saint Bartholomew. The first religious war under Charles the Ninth appeared on the point of breaking out in April 1561, some days after that the Duke of Guise, returning from the massacre of Vassy, had entered Paris on the 16th of March in triumph. The Queen Mother, in dismay, carried off the King to Melun at first, and then to Fontainebleau, whilst the Prince of Conde, having returned to Meaux, summoned to his side his relatives, his friends, and all the leaders of the reformers, and wrote to Coligny that Caesar had not only crossed the Rubicon, but was already at Rome, and that his banners were beginning to wave all over the neighbouring country. For some days Catherine and L'Hôpital tried to remain out of Paris with the young king, whom Guise, the constable de Montmorency, and the king of Navarre, the former being members and the latter an ally of the triumvirate, went to demand back from them. They were obliged to submit to the pressure brought to bear upon them. The constable was the first to enter Paris, and went on the 2nd of April, and burned down the two places of worship which, by virtue of the decree of January the 17th, 1561, had been granted to the Protestants. Next day, the King of Navarre and the Duke of Guise, in their turn, entered the city in company with Charles IX and Catherine. A council was assembled at the Louvre to deliberate as to the declaration of war, which was deferred. Whilst the king was on his way back to Paris, Conde hurried off to take up his quarters at Orléans, where the colony went promptly to join him. They signed, with the gentlemen who came to them from all parts, a compact of association, for the honour of God, for the liberty of the king, his brothers and the queen mother, and for the maintenance of decrees and conde in writing to the protestant princes of germany to explain to them his conduct took the title of protector of the house and crown of france negotiations still went on for nearly three months 
the chiefs of the two parties attempted to offer one another generous and pacific solutions they even had two interviews but catherine was induced by the catholic triumvirate to expressly declare that she would not allow in france more than one single form of worship cond and his friends said that they could not lay down their arms until the triumvirate was overthrown and the execution of decrees granting them liberty of worship in certain places and to a certain extent had been secured to them neither party liked to acknowledge itself beaten in this way without having struck a blow and in the early part of july fifteen sixty two the first religious war began we do not intend to dwell upon any but its leading facts facts which at the moment when they were accomplished might have been regarded as decisive in respect of the future in this campaign there were two the battle of dreux on the nineteenth of december fifteen sixty two and the murder of the duke of guise by poltron on the eighteenth of february fifteen sixty three the two armies met in the plain of dreux with pretty nearly equal forces the royal army being superior in artillery and the protestant in cavalry when they had arrived in front of one another the triumvirs sent to ask the queen mother's authority to give battle i am astounded said catherine to her favourite adviser michael de castelnau that the constable the duke of guise and saint andre being good prudent and experienced captains should send to ask counsel of a woman and a child both full of sorrow at seeing things in such extremity as to be reduced to the risk of a battle between fellow countrymen hereupon says castelnau in came the king's nurse who was a huguenot and the queen at the same time that she took me to see the king who was still in bed said to me with great agitation and jeeringly we had better ask the king's nurse whether to give battle or not what think you then the nurse as she followed the queen into the king's chamber according to her custom said several times that as the huguenots would not listen to reason she would say give battle whereupon there was at the privy council much discourse about the good and the evil that might result therefrom but the resolution arrived at was that they who had arms in their hands ought not to ask advice or orders from the court and i was dispatched on the spot to tell them from the king and the queen that as good and prudent captains they were to do what they considered most proper next day at ten in the morning the armies met then every one says lanoue one of the bravest amongst the reformers leaders steadied himself reflecting that the men he saw coming towards him were not spaniards or english or italians but frenchmen that is the bravest of the brave amongst whom there were some who were his own comrades relatives and friends and that within an hour they would have to be killing one another which created some sort of horror of the fact without however diminution of courage one thing worthy of being noted continues lanoue is the long duration of the fight it being generally seen in battles that all is lost or won within a single hour whereas this began about one p m and there was no issue until after five of a surety there was marvellous animosity on both sides whereof sufficient testimony is to be found in the number of dead which exceeded seven thousand as many persons say the majority whereof were killed in the fight rather than the pursuit another incident was the capture of the two chiefs of the armies a thing which rarely happens because generally they do not fight until the last moment and in extremity and often a battle is as good as won before they come to the point but in this case they did not put it off so long for at the very first each was minded to set his men an example of not sparing themselves the constable de montmorency was the first taken and seriously wounded having always received wounds in seven battles at which he was present which shows the boldness that was in him the prince of conde was taken at the end also wounded as both of them had good seconds it made them the less fearful of danger to their own persons for the constable had monsieur de guise and the prince of conde admiral de coligny who showed equally well to the front in the melee finally i wish to bring forward another matter which will be supernumerary because it happened after the battle and that is the courteous and honourable behaviour of the duke of guise 
victorious towards the Prince of Conde a prisoner, which most men, on one side as well as on the other, did not at all think he would have been disposed to exhibit, for it is well known how hateful, in civil wars, are the chiefs of parties, and what imputations are made upon them. Nevertheless, here quite the contrary happened, for, when the prince was brought before the duke, the latter spoke to him respectfully and with great gentleness of language, wherein he could not pretend that there was any desire to pique him or blame him. And, whilst the prince stayed in the camp, the duke often dined with him. And, for as much as on this day of the battle there were but few beds arrived, for the baggage had been half plundered and dispersed, the Duke of Guise offered his own bed to the Prince of Conde, which the Prince would accept in respect of the half only. And so these two great princes, who were like mortal foes, found themselves in one bed, one triumphant and the other captive, taking their repast together. End of section 36「Section 37 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Mackenzie. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 33. Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, 1560 to 1574, Part 3. The results of the Battle of Breux were serious, and still more serious, from the fate of the chiefs than from the number of the dead. The commanders of the two armies, the Constable de Montmorency and the Prince of Conde, were wounded and prisoners. One of the triumvirs, Marshal de Saint-Andre, had been killed in action. The Catholic's wavering ally, Antony de Bourbon, King of Navarre, had died before the battle of a wound which he had received at the siege of Rouen, and, on his deathbed, had resumed his Protestant bearing, saying that, if God granted him grace to get well, he would have nothing but the gospel preached throughout the realm. The two staffs, état-major, as we should now say, were disorganized. In one, the Duke of Guise alone remained unhurt and at liberty. In the other, Coligny, in Conde's absence, was elected general-in-chief of the Protestants. At Paris, for a while, it was believed that the battle was lost. If it had been, says Montluc, I think that it was all over with France, for the state would have changed and so would the religion. A young king can be made to do as you please. Catherine de' Medici showed a facile resignation to such a change. Very well, she had said, then we will pray to God in French. When the victory became known, there was general enthusiasm for the Duke of Guise, but he took only a very modest advantage of it, being more anxious to have his comrades' merits appreciated than his own. At Blois, as he handed the Queen Mother her table napkin at dinner time, he asked her if he might have an audience of her after the repast. Jesu, my dear cousin, said Catherine, whatever are you saying? I say it, madame, because I would fain show you in the presence of everybody what I have done since my departure from Paris with your army which you gave in charge to me together with the constable, and also present to you all the good captains and servants of the king and of yourself who have served you faithfully, as well as your own subjects as also foreigners and horsemen and foot. Whereupon he discoursed about the Battle of Breux, and painted it so well and so to the life, says Brantome, that you would have said that they were still about it, whereat the Queen felt very great pleasure. Every one listened very attentively, without the least noise in the world, and he spoke so well that there was none who was not charmed, for the Prince was the best of speakers and eloquent, not with a forced and overladen eloquence, but simple and soldierly, with a grace of his own to match, so much so that the Queen Mother said that she had never seen him in such good form. The good form, however, was not enough to prevent the ill-humour and jealousy felt by the Queen Mother and her youthful son the King at such a great success which made Guise so great a personage. 
after the victory of Breux, he had written to the king to express his wish to see conferred upon a candidate of his own choosing the marshal's baton left vacant by the death of saint andre see now said charles the ninth to his mother and some persons who were by if the duke of guise does not act the king well you would really say that the army was his and that victory came from his hand making no mention of god who by his great goodness hath given it us he thrusts the bargain into my fist dictates to me yet must i give him a civil answer to satisfy him for i do not want to make trouble in my kingdom and irritate a captain to whom my late father and i have given so much credit and authority the king almost apologized for having already disposed of the baton in favour of the marquis de vieilleville and he sent the duke of guise the collar of the order for two of his minions and at the same time the commission of lieutenant-general of the kingdom and commander-in-chief of the army for himself guise thanked him pretending to be satisfied the king smiled as he read his letter and non ti fida e non sarai gabato don't trust and you'll not be duped he said in the words of the italian proverb he had not to disquiet himself for long about this rival on the eighteenth of february fifteen sixty three the duke of guise was vigorously pushing forward the siege of orleans the stronghold of the protestants stoutly defended by coligny he was apprised that his wife the duchess anne d'est had just arrived at a castle near the camp with the intention of using her influence over her husband in order to spare orleans from the terrible consequences of being taken by assault he mounted his horse to go and join her and he was chatting to his aide-de-camp rostang about the means of bringing about a pacification when on arriving at a crossroad where several ways met he felt himself struck in the right shoulder almost under the arm by a pistol shot fired from behind a hedge at a distance of six or seven paces a white plume upon his head had made him conspicuous and as for so short a ride he had left off his cuirass three balls had passed through him from side to side that shot has been in keeping for me a long while said he i deserve it for not having taken precautions he fell upon his horse's neck as he vainly tried to draw his sword from the scabbard his arm refused its office when he had been removed to the castle where the duchess in tears received him i am vexed at it said he for the honour of france and to his son henry prince of Jeanville, a boy of thirteen he added kissing him god grant you grace my son to become a good man he languished for six days amidst useless attentions paid him by his surgeons giving catherine de medici who came daily to see him the most pacific counsels and taking of the duchess his wife the most tender farewells mingled with the most straightforward and honest avowals i do not mean to deny he said to her that the counsels and frailties of youth have led me sometimes into something at which you had a right to be offended i pray you to be pleased to excuse me and forgive me his brother the cardinal de guise bishop of metz which the duke had so gloriously defended against charles v warned him that it was time to prepare himself for death by receiving the sacraments of the church ah my dear brother said the duke to him i have loved you greatly in times past but i love you now still more than ever for you are doing me a truly brotherly turn on the twenty fourth of february they still offered him ailment to sustain his rapidly increasing weakness but away away said he i have taken the manner from heaven whereby i feel myself so comforted that it seems to me as if i were already in paradise this body has no further need of nourishment and so he expired on the twenty fourth of february fifteen sixty three an object at his death of the most profound regret amongst his army and his party as well as his family after having been during his life the object of their lively admiration i do not forget says his contemporary stephen pasquier in reference to him that it was no small luck for him to die at this period when he was beyond reach of the breeze and when shifting fortune had not yet played him any of those turns 
whereby she is so cunning in lowering the horn of the bravest. It is a duty to faithfully depict this pious and guileless death of a great man at the close of a vigorous and a glorious life, made up of good and evil, without the evils having choked the good. This powerful and consolatory intermixture of qualities is the characteristic of the eminent men of the sixteenth century, Catholics or Protestants, soldiers or civilians, and it is a spectacle wholesome to be offered in times when doubt and moral enfeeblement are the common malady even of sound minds and of honest men. The murderer of Duke Francis of Guise was a petty nobleman of Angoumois, Jean Poltro, Lord of Mer, a fiery Catholic in his youth, who, afterwards, became an equally fiery Protestant, and was engaged with his relative La Renaudie in the conspiracy against the Guise. He had been employed constantly from that time as a spy, it is said, by the chiefs of the reformers, a vocation for which it would seem he was but little adapted, for the indiscretion of his language must have continually revealed his true sentiments. When he heard, in 1562, of the death of Antony de Bourbon, King of Navarre, that, said he, is not what will put an end to the war. What is wanted is the dog with the big collar. Whom do you mean? asked somebody. The great Guizard, and here's the arm that will do the trick. He used to show, says Dobin, bullets cast to slay the Guizard, and thereby rendered himself ridiculous. After the Battle of Dreux, he was bearer of a message from the Lord of Soubise to Admiral de Coligny, to whom he gave an account of the situation of the reformers in Dauphiny and Lyonnais. His report no doubt interested the Admiral, who gave him twenty crowns to go and play spy in the camp of the Duke of Guise, and, some days later, a hundred crowns to buy a horse. It was thus that Poltro was put in a position to execute the design he had been so fond of proclaiming before he had any communication with Coligny. As soon as, on the 18th of February, 1563, in the outskirts of Orléans, he had, to use his own expression, done his trick, he fled full gallop, so as not to bear the responsibility of it. But, whether it were that he was troubled in his mind, or that he was ill-acquainted with the region, he wandered round and round the place where he had shot the Duke of Guise, and was arrested on the 20th of February by men sent in search of him. Being forthwith brought before the Privy Council, in the presence of the Queen Mother, and put to the torture, he said that Admiral de Coligny, Théodore de Bez, La Rochefoucauld, Soubise, and other Huguenot chiefs had incited him to murder the Duke of Guise, persecutor of the faithful, as a meritorious deed in the eyes of God and men. Coligny repudiated this allegation point-blank. Shrinking from the very appearance of hypocrisy, he abstained from any regret at the death of the Duke of Guise. The greatest blessing, said he, which could come to this realm and to the Church of God, especially to myself and all my house, and he referred to conversations he had held with the Cardinal of Lorraine and the Duchess of Guise, and to a notice which he had sent a few days previously to the Duke of Guise himself, to take care, for there was somebody under a bond to kill him. Lastly, he demanded that, to set in a clear light, his integrity, innocence, and good repute, Poltro should be kept, until peace was made, in strict confinement, so that the admiral himself and the murderer might be confronted. It was not thought to be obligatory or possible to comply with this desire. Amongst the public, there was a passionate outcry for prompt chastisement. Poltro, removed to Paris, put to the torture and questioned by the commissioners of Parliament, at one time confirmed and at another disavowed his original assertions. Coligny, he said, had not suggested the project to him, but had cognizance of it, and had not attempted to deter him. The decree sentenced Poltro to the punishment of regicides. He underwent it on the 18th of March, 1563, in the Place de Greve, preserving to the very end that fierce energy of hatred and vengeance which had prompted his deed. He was heard saying to himself in the midst of his torments, as if to comfort himself, for all that he is dead and gone, 
the persecutor of the faithful, and he will not come back again. The angry populace insulted him with yells. Poltreau added, If the persecution does not cease, vengeance will fall upon this city, and the avengers are already at hand. Catherine de' Medici, well pleased perhaps that there was now a question, personally embarrassing for the admiral, and as yet in abeyance, had her mind entirely occupied apparently with the additional weakness and difficulty resulting to the position of the crown and the catholic party from the death of the duke of guise she considered peace necessary and for reasons of a different nature chancellor de l'hôpital was of the same opinion he drew attention to scruples of conscience the perils of foreign influence and the impossibility of curing by an application of brute force a malady concealed in the very bowels and brains of the people negotiations were entered into with the two captive generals the prince of conde and the constable de montbrancy they assented to that policy and on the nineteenth of march peace was concluded at amboise in the form of an edict which granted to the protestants the concessions recognized as indispensable by the crown itself and regulated the relations of the two creeds pending the remedy of time the decisions of a holy council and the king's majority liberty of conscience and the practice of the religion called reformed were recognized for all barons and lords high justiciary in their houses with their families and dependents for nobles having fiefs without vassals and living on the king's lands but for them and their families personally the burgesses were treated less favourably the reformed worship was maintained in the towns in which it had been practised up to the seventh of march in the current year but beyond that and noblemen's mansions this worship might not be celebrated save in the faubourgs of one single town in every bailiwick or seneschalty paris and its district were to remain exempt from any exercise of the said reformed religion during the negotiations and as to the very basis of the edict of march nineteenth fifteen sixty three the protestants were greatly divided the soldiers and the politicians with conde at their head desired peace and thought that the concessions made by the catholics ought to be accepted the majority of the reformed pastors and theologians cried out against the insufficiency of the concessions and were astonished that there should be so much hurry to make peace when the catholics had just lost their most formidable captain coligny moderate in his principles but always faithful to his church when she made her voice heard showed dissatisfaction at the selfishness of the nobles to confine the religion to one town in every bailiwick he said is to ruin more churches by a stroke of the pen than our enemies could have pulled down in ten years the nobles ought to have recollected that example had been set by the towns to them and by the poor to the rich calvin in his correspondence with the reformed churches of france severely handled cond on this occasion at the moment when peace was made the pacific were in the right the death of the duke of guise had not prevented the battle of dreux from being a defeat for the reformers and when war had to be supported for long it was especially the provincial nobles and the people on their estates who bore the burden of it but when the edict of amboise had put an end to the first religious war when the question was no longer as to who won or lost battles but whether the conditions of that peace to which the catholics had sworn were loyally observed and whether their concessions were effective in ensuring the modest amount of liberty and security promised to the protestants the question changed front and it was not long before facts put the malcontents in the right between fifteen sixty three and fifteen sixty seven murders of distinguished protestants increased strangely and excited amongst their families anxiety accompanied by a thirst for vengeance the guise and their party on their side persisted in their outcries for proceedings against the instigators known or presumed of the murder of duke francis it was plainly against admiral de coligny that these cries were directed and he met them by a second declaration very frank as a denial of the deed which it was intended to impute to him but more hostile than ever to the guise and their party the late duke said he 
was of the whole army the man I had most looked out for on the day of the last battle. If I could have brought a gun to bear upon him to kill him, I would have done it. I would have ordered ten thousand arquebusiers, had so many been under my command, to single him out amongst all the others, whether in the field or from over a wall or from behind a hedge. In short, I would not have spared any of the means permitted by the laws of war in time of hostility to get rid of so great an enemy as he was for me and for so many other good subjects of the king. After three years of such deadly animosity between the two parties and the two houses, the king and the queen mother could find no other way of stopping an explosion than to call the matter on before the privy council and cause to be there drawn up on the twenty ninth of january fifteen sixty six a solemn decree declaring the admiral's innocence on his own affirmation given in the presence of the king and the council as before god himself that he had not had anything to do with or approved of the said homicide silence for all time to come was consequently imposed upon the attorney-general and everybody else inhibition and prohibition were issued against the continuance of any investigation or prosecution the king took the parties under his safeguard and enjoined upon them that they should live amicably in obedience to him by virtue of this injunction the guise the colignies and the montmorencies ended by embracing the first named accommodating themselves with a pretty good grace to this demonstration but god knows what embraces words used in la harenga a satire of the day in burlesque verse upon the cardinal of lorraine six years later the saint bartholomew brought the true sentiments out into broad daylight at the same time that the war was proceeding amongst the provinces with this passionate dogginess royal decrees were alternately confirming and suppressing or weakening the securities for liberty and safety which the decree of amboise on the nineteenth of march fifteen sixty three had given to the protestants by way of re-establishing peace it was a series of contradictory measures which were sufficient to show the party strife still raging in the heart of the government on the fourteenth of june fifteen sixty three protestants were forbidden to work with shops open on the days of catholic festivals on the fourteenth of december fifteen sixty three it was proclaimed that protestants might not gather arms for the poor of their religion unless in places where that religion was practised and nowhere else on the twenty fourth of june fifteen sixty four a proclamation from the king interdicted the exercise of the reformed religion within the precincts of any royal residence on the fourth of august fifteen sixty four the reformed churches were forbidden to hold synods and make collections of money and their ministers to quit their places of residence and to open schools on the twelfth of november fifteen sixty seven a king's ordinance interdicted the conferring of judiciary offices on non-catholics in vain did conde and coligny cry out loudly against these violations of the peace of amboise in vain on the sixteenth of august fifteen sixty three at the moment of proclaiming the king's majority was an edict issued giving full and entire confirmation to the edict of the nineteenth of march preceding with the addition of prescriptions favourable to the royal authority as well as at the same time to the maintenance of the public peace scarcely any portion of these prescriptions was observed the credit of chancellor de l'hôpital was clearly very much on the decline and whilst the legal government was thus falling to pieces or languishing away gaspard de Tavannes, a proved soldier and royalist who however was not yet marshal of france was beginning to organize under the name of brotherhood of the holy spirit a secret society intended to renew the civil war if it happened that occasion should offer for repressing and chastising them of the religion called reformed it was the league in its cradle at the same time the king had orders given for a speedy levy of six thousand swiss and an army corps was being formed on the frontiers of champagne the queen mother neglected no pains no caresses to hide from cond the true moving cause at the bottom of all these measures and as he was says the historian de Vila, by nature very ready to receive all sorts of impressions he easily suffered himself to be lulled to sleep one day however in june fifteen sixty seven 
he thought it about time to claim the fulfilment of a promise that had been made him at the time of the peace of amboise of a post which would give him the rank and authority of lieutenant-general of the kingdom as his late brother the king of navarre had been and he asked for the sword of constable which montmorency in consequence of his great age seemed disposed to resign to the king catherine avoided giving any answer but her favourite son henry duke of anjou who was as yet only sixteen repudiated this idea with so much haughtiness that con felt called upon to ask some explanations there was no longer any question of war with spain or of an army to be got together what pray will you do he asked with the swiss you are raising the answer was we shall find good employment for them end of section thirty seven Section 38 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Mackenzie. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 33. Charles IX and the Religious Wars, 1560-1574. Part 4. It is the failing of a hypocritical and lying policy, however able, that if it do not succeed promptly, a moment arrives when it becomes transparent and lets in daylight. Even Cond could not delude himself any longer. The preparations were for war against the reformers. He quitted the court to take his stand again with his own party, Coligny, Dandelot, the rochefoucauld lanou and all the accredited leaders amongst the protestants whom his behaviour too full of confidence or of complaisance towards the court had shocked or disquieted went and joined him in september fifteen sixty seven the second religious war broke out it was short and not decisive for either party at the outset of the campaign success was with the protestants forty towns orleans Montereau, Lagny, Montauban, Castres, Montpellier, Ouz, etc., opened their gates to them, or fell into their hands. They were within an ace of surprising the king at Monceux, and he never forgot, says Montluc, that the Protestants had made him do the stretch from Meaux to Paris at something more than a walk. It was around Paris that Conde concentrated all the efforts of the campaign he had posted himself at saint denis with a small army of four thousand foot and two thousand horse the constable de montmorency commanded the royal army having a strength of sixteen thousand foot and three thousand horse attempts were made to open negotiations but the constable broke them off brusquely roaring out that the king would never tolerate two religions on the tenth of november fifteen sixty seven the battle began at saint denis and was fought with alternations of partial success and reverse which spread joy and sadness through the two hosts in turn but in resisting a charge of cavalry led to victory by conde the constable fell with and under his horse a scot called out to him to surrender for sole response the aged warrior abandoned by his men but not by his manhood says Dobigny, smashed the scot's jaw with the pommel of his broken sword and at the same moment he fell mortally wounded by a shot through the body his death left the victory uncertain and the royal army disorganized the campaign lasted still four months thanks to the energetic perseverance of coligny and the inexhaustible spirits of conde both of whom excelled in the art of keeping up the courage of their men where are you taking us now asked an ill-tempered officer one day to meet our german allies said conde and suppose we don't find them then we will breathe on our fingers for it is mighty cold they did at last at pont a mousson meet the german reinforcements which were being brought up by prince john casimir son of the elector palatine and which made conde's army strong enough for him to continue the war in earnest but these newcomers declared that they would not march any farther unless they were paid the hundred thousand crowns due to them 
Conde had but two thousand. Thereupon, says Lanoux, was there nothing for it but to make a virtue of necessity, and he, as well as the admiral, employed all their art, influence, and eloquence to persuade every man to divest himself of such means as he possessed, for to furnish this contribution which was so necessary. They themselves were the first to set an example, giving up their own silver plate. Half from love and half from fear, this liberality was so general that, down to the very soldier's varlets, every one gave, so that at last it was considered a disgrace to have contributed little. When the whole was collected, it was found to amount in, what was coined as well as in plate and gold chains, to more than eighty thousand livres, which came in so timely, that without it there would have been a difficulty in satisfying the raters. Was it not a thing worthy of astonishment to see an army, itself unpaid, despoiling itself of the little means it had of relieving its own necessities, and sparing that little for the accommodation of others, who, peradventure, scarcely gave them a thank you for it. So much generosity and devotion, amongst the humblest as well as the most exalted ranks of the army, deserved not to be useless, but it turned out quite differently. Conde and Coligny led back to Paris their new army, which, it is said, was from eighteen to twenty thousand strong, and seemed to be in a condition either to take Paris itself, or to force the royal army to enter the field, and accept a decisive battle. To bring that about, Conde thought the best thing was to besiege Chartres, the key to the granary of Paris, as it was called, and a big thorn, according to Lanou, to run into the foot of the Parisians. But Catherine de' Medici had quietly entered once more into negotiations with some of the Protestant chiefs, even with Conde himself. Charles the Ninth published an edict in which he distinguished between heretics and rebels, and assured of his protection all Huguenots who should lay down arms. Chartres seemed to be on the point of capitulating, when news came that peace had just been signed at Longjumeau on the 23rd of March. The king put again in force the Edict of Amboise of 1563, suppressing all the restrictions which had been tacked on to it successively. The Prince of Conde and his adherents were reinstated in all their possessions, offices, and honours. And Conde was held and reputed good relative, faithful subject, and servant of the king. The reformers had to disband, restore the new places they had occupied, and send away their German allies, to whom the king undertook to advance the hundred thousand gold crowns which were due to them. He further promised, by a secret article, that he too would, at a later date, dismiss his foreign troops and a portion of the French. This news caused very various impressions amongst the Protestant camp and people. The majority of the men of family engaged in the war, who most frequently had to bear the expense of it, desired peace. The personal advantages accruing to Conde himself made it very acceptable to him, but the ardent reformers, with Coligny at their head, complained bitterly of others being lured away by fine words and exceptional favours, and not prosecuting the war when, to maintain it, there was so good an army and the chances were so favourable. A serious dispute took place between the Pacific negotiators and the malcontents. Chancellor de l'Hôpital wrote, in favour of peace, a discourse on the Pacific settlement of the troubles of the year 1567, containing the necessary causes and reasons of the treaty, together with the means of reconciling the two parties to one another, and keeping them in perpetual concord, composed by a high personage, true subject, and faithful servant of the French crown. But, if the Chancellor's reasons were sound, the hopes he hung upon them were extravagant. The parties were at that pitch of passion at which reasoning is in vain against impressions and promises are powerless against suspicions, concluded through the vehemence of the desire to get home again, as Lanoue says, the peace of Longjumeau was none the less known as the little peace, the patched-up peace, the lame and rickety peace, and neither they who wished for it, nor they who spurned it, 
prophesied its long continuance. Scarcely six months having elapsed, in August 1568, the Third Religious War broke out. The written guarantees given in the Treaty of Longjumeau for security and liberty on behalf of the Protestants were misinterpreted or violated. Massacres and murders of Protestants became more numerous and were committed with more impunity than ever. In 1568 and 1569, at Amiens, at Auxerre, at Orléans, at Rouen, at Bourges, at Troyes, and at Bois, Protestants, at one time to the number of 140 or 120 or 53 or 40, and at another singly, with just their wives and children, were massacred, burned, and hunted by the excited populace without any intervention on the part of the magistrates to protect them or to punish their murderers. The contemporary Protestant chroniclers set down at 10,000 the number of victims who perished in the course of these six months, which were called a time of peace. We may, with de Vaux, believe this estimate to be exaggerated. But, without doubt, the peace of Longjumeau was a lie even before the war began again. During this interval, Conde was living in Burgundy, at Neue, a little fortress he possessed through his wife, Frances of Orléans, and Coligny was living not far from Neue, at Tanley, which belonged to his brother, Dandolo. They soon discovered, both of them, not only what their party had to suffer, but what measures were in preparation against themselves. Agents went and sounded the depth of the moats of Neues, so as to report upon the means of taking the place. The Queen Mother had orders given to Gaspard de Tavannes to surround the Prince of Conde at Neue. "'The Queen is counselled by passion rather than by reason,' answered the old warrior. "'I am not the sort of man to succeed in this ill-planned enterprise of distaff and pen. If Her Majesty will be pleased to declare open war, I will show how I understand my duty.' Shocked at the dishonourable commands given him, Tavannes resolved to indirectly raise Con's apprehension in order to get him out of Burgundy, of which he, Tavannes, held the governorship, and he sent close past the walls of Noyes bearers of letters containing these words, The stag is in the toils, the hunt is ready. Con had the bearers arrested, understood the warning, and communicated it to Coligny, who went and joined him at Noyes, and they decided, both of them, upon quitting Burgundy without delay, to go and seek over the Loire at La Rochelle, which they knew to be devoted to their cause, a sure asylum and a place suitable for their purposes as a centre of warlike operations. They set out together on the 24th of August, 1568. Conn took with him his wife and his four children, two of tender age. Coligny followed him in deep mourning. He had just lost his wife, Charlotte de Laval, that worthy mate of his who, six years previously, in a grievous crisis for his soul, as well as his cause, had given him such energetic counsels. She had left him one young daughter and three little children, the two youngest still in the nurse's arms. His sister-in-law, Anne d'Orsan, wife of his brother Dandolo, was also there with a child of two years, whilst her husband was scouring Anjou and Brittany to rally the friends of his cause and his house. A hundred and fifty men, soldiers and faithful servants, escorted these three noble and pious families who were leaving their castles to go and seek liberties and perils in a new war. When they arrived at the bank of the Loire, they found all points in the neighbourhood guarded. The river was low, and a boatman pointed out to them, near Sancerre, a possible ford. Conde went over first, with one of his children in his arms. They all went over singing the psalm, when Israel went out of Egypt. And on the 16th of September, 1568, Conde entered La Rochelle. I fled as far as I could, he wrote the next day. But when I got here, I found the sea. And inasmuch as I don't know how to swim, I was constrained to turn my head round and gain the land, not with feet, but with hands. He assembled the burgesses of La Rochelle and laid before them the pitiable condition of the kingdom, the wicked designs of people who were their enemies as well as his own he called upon them to come and help he promised to be aidful to them in all their affairs and as a pledge of my good faith said he i will leave you my wife and children 
the dearest and most precious jewels I have in this world. The mayor of La Rochelle, Laise, responded by offering him lives and property in the name of all the citizens, who confirmed this offer with an outburst of popular enthusiasm. The Protestant nobles of saint ongue and Poitou flocked in. A royal ally was announced. The Queen of Navarre, Jeanne d'Albre, was bringing her son Henry, fifteen years of age, whom she was training up to be Henry the Fourth. Conde went to meet them, and, on the 28th of September, 1568, all this flower of French Protestantism was assembled at La Rochelle, ready and resolved to commence the Third Religious War. It was the longest and most serious of the four wars of this kind which so profoundly agitated France in the reign of Charles the Ninth. This one lasted from the 24th of August, 1568, to the 8th of August, 1570, between the departure of Conde and Coligny for La Rochelle and the Treaty of Peace at Saint-Germain-en-Laye, a hollow peace like the rest, and only two years before the St. Bartholomew. On starting from Noyer with Coligny, Conde had addressed to the king, on the 23rd of August, a letter and a request, wherein, after having set forth the grievances of the reformers, he attributed all the mischief to the cardinal of Lorraine, and declared that the Protestant nobles felt themselves constrained for the safety of the realm, to take up arms against that infamous priest, that tiger of France, and against his accomplices. He bitterly reproached the Guise with treating as mere policists, that is, men who sacrificed religion to temporal interests, the Catholics inclined to make concessions to the reformers, especially the Chancellor de l'Hôpital and the sons of the late Constable de Montmorency. The Guise, indeed, and their friends did not conceal their distrust of l'hôpital any more than he concealed his opposition to their deeds and their designs. Whilst the peace of Longjumeau was still in force, Charles the Ninth issued a decree interdicting all reformers from the chairs of the university and the officers of the judicature. L'hôpital refused to seal it. God save us from the Chancellor's mass, was the remark at court. L'hôpital convinced that he would not succeed in preserving france from a fresh civil war made up his mind to withdraw and go and live for some time at his estate of vigny a little hamlet in the commune of gironville near tomp saying it was the queen mother eagerly took advantage of his withdrawal to demand of him the seals of which she said she might have need daily l'hôpital gave them up at once at the same time retaining his title of chancellor and letting the queen know that he would take pains to recover his strength in order to return to his post if and when it should be the king's and the queen's pleasure from his rural home he wrote to his friends i am not downhearted because the violence of the wicked has snatched from me the seals of the kingdom i have not done as sluggards and cowards do who hide themselves at the first show of danger and obey the first impulses of fear as long as i was strong enough i held my own Deprived of all support, even that of the king and the queen, who dared no longer defend me, I retired, deploring the unhappy condition of France. Now I have other cares. I return to my interrupted studies and to my children, the props of my old age and my sweetest delight. I cultivate my fields. The estate of Vignet seems to me a little kingdom, if any man may consider himself master of anything here below. I will tell you more. This retreat, which satisfies my heart, also flatters my vanity. I like to imagine myself in the wake of those famous exiles of Athens or Rome, whom their virtues rendered formidable to their fellow citizens. Not that I dare compare myself with those great men, but I say to myself that our fortunes are similar. I live in the midst of a numerous family whom I love. I have books, I read, write, and meditate— I take pleasure in the games of my children. The most frivolous occupations interest me. In fine, all my time is filled up, and nothing would be wanting to my happiness if it were not for the awful apparition hard by which sometimes comes, bringing trouble and desolation to my heart. This apparition hard by was war, everywhere present or imminent in the centre and southwest of France, accompanied by all those passions of personal hatred and vengeance which are characteristic of religious wars, and which add so much of the moral sufferings to the physical calamities of life. L'Hôpital, when sending the seals to the Queen Mother, 
who demanded them of him, considered it his bounden duty to give her without any mincing, and the king whom she governed, a piece of patriotic advice. At my departure, he says in his will and testament, I prayed of the king and queen this thing, that, as they had determined to break the peace, and proceed by war against those with whom they had previously made peace, and, as they were driving me from the court, because they had heard it said that I was opposed to, and ill-content with their enterprise, I prayed them, I say, that if they did not acquiesce in my counsel, they would, at the very least, some time after they had glutted and satiated their hearts and their thirst with the blood of their subjects, embrace the first opportunity that offered itself for making peace, before that things were reduced to utter ruin, for whatever there might be at the bottom of this war, it could not but be very pernicious to the king and the kingdom. During the two years that it lasted, from August 1568 to August 1570, the third religious war under Charles the Ninth entailed two important battles and many deadly faction fights, which spread and inflamed to the highest pitch the passions of the two parties. On the 13th of March, 1569, the two armies, both about 20,000 strong, and appearing both of them anxious to come to blows, met near Jarnac on the banks of the Charente. The royal army had for its chief Catherine de Medici's third son, Henry, Duke of Anjou, advised by the veteran warrior Gaspard de Tavannes, and supported by the young Duke Henry of Guise, who had his father to avenge and his own spurs to win. End of section 38section thirty nine of a popular history of france volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by cathy barrett a popular history of france from the earliest times volume four by francois guizot translated by robert black chapter thirty three Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, fifteen sixty to fifteen seventy four, part five. The Prince of Conde, with Admiral de Coligny for second, commanded the Protestant army. We make no pretension to explain and discuss here the military movements of that day, and the merits or demerits of the two generals confronted. The Duke of Aumel has given an account of them, and criticized them in his Histoire des Princes de Conde, with a complete knowledge of the facts, and with the authority that belongs to him. Quote, the encounter on the 13th of March, 1569, scarcely deserves, he says, to be called a battle. It was nothing but a series of fights, maintained by troops separated and surprised, against an enemy which more numerous to begin with, was attacking with its whole force united. End quote. A tragic incident at the same time gave this encounter an importance which it has preserved in history. Admiral de Coligny, forced to make a retrograde movement, had sent to ask the Prince of Conde for aid. By a second message he urged the Prince not to make a fruitless effort, and to fall back himself in all haste. Quote, "'God forbid,' answered Conde, "'that Louis de Bourbon should turn his back to the enemy.' End quote. and he continued his march, saying to his brother-in-law, Francis de la Rochefoucauld, who was marching beside him, quote, My uncle has made a clerical error, pas de clair, a slip, but the wine is drawn, and it must be drunk. End quote. On arriving at battlefield, whither he had brought with him but three hundred horse, at the very moment when with this weak escort he was preparing to charge the deep column of the Duke of Anjou, he received from la Rochefoucauld's horse a kick which broke one of the bones of his leg and he had already crushed an arm by a fall. We will borrow from the Duke of Aumale the glorious and piteous tale of this incident. Quote, Conde turned round to his men-at-arms, and showing first his injured limbs, and then the device, Sweet is danger for Christ and for fatherland, which fluttered upon his banner in the breeze. Nobles of France, he cried, this is the desired moment. Remember in what plight Louis de Bourbon enters the battle for Christ and fatherland. Then, lowering his head, he charges with his three hundred horse upon the eight hundred lances of the Duke of Anjou. The first shock of this charge was irresistible. Such for a moment was the disorder among the Catholics, that many of them believed the day was lost. But fresh bodies of royalists arrive one after another. The prince has his horse killed under him, and in the midst of the confusion, hampered by his wounds, he cannot mount another. 
In spite of all, his brave comrades do not desert him. Soubies, and a dozen of them covered with wounds, are taken. An old man named La Vergne, who had brought with him twenty-five sons or nephews, is left upon the field with fifteen of them, all in a heap, says Daubigne. Left almost alone with his back against a tree, one knee upon the ground, and deprived of the use of one leg, Conde still defends himself, but his strength is failing him. He sees two Catholic gentlemen to whom he had rendered service, St. Jean and D'Argence. He calls to them, raises the visor of his helmet, and holds out to them his gauntlets. The two horsemen dismount, and swear to risk their lives to save his. Others join them, and are eager to assist the glorious captive. Meanwhile the royal cavalry continues the pursuit. The squadrons successively pass close by the group which has formed round Conde. Soon he spies the red cloaks of the Duke of Anjou's guards. He points to them with his finger. D'Argence understands him, and, "'Hide your face!' he cries. "'Ah, D'Argence, D'Argence, you will not save me!' replies the prince. Then, like Caesar, covering up his face, he awaited death. The poor soul knew only too well the perfidious character of the Duke of Anjou, the hatred with which he was hunting him down, and the sanguinary orders he would give. The guards had gone by when their captain, Montesquion, learned the name of this prisoner. Quote, slay, slay, Mordieu, he shouted, then suddenly wheeling his horse round, he returns at a gallop, and with a pistol shot, fired from behind, shatters the hero's skull. End quote. The death of Conde gave to the battle of Jarnac an importance not its own. A popular ditty of the day called that prince, quote, the great enemy of the mass. End quote. Quote, his end, says the Duke of Aumale, was celebrated by the Catholics as a deliverance. A solemn te deum was chanted at court and in all the churches of France. The flags taken were sent to Rome, where Pope Pius IV went with them in state to St. Peter's. As for the Duke of Anjou, he showed his joy and his baseness together with the ignoble treatment he caused to be inflicted upon the remains of his vanquished relative, a prince of the blood who had fallen sword in hand. At the first rumour of Conde's death, the Duke of Montpensier's secretary, Coustureau, had been dispatched from headquarters with Baron de Magnac to learn the truth of the matter. Quote, we found him there, he relates, laid upon an ass. The said Sir Baron took him by the hair of the head for to lift up his face, which he had turned towards the ground, and asked me if I recognised him. But as he had lost an eye from his head, he was mightily disfigured, and I could say no more than it was certainly his figure and his hair, and further than that I was unable to speak. Meanwhile, continues the Duke of Aumale, the accounts of those present removed all doubt, and the corpse, thus thrown across an ass, with arms and legs dangling, was carried to Jarnac, where the Duke of Anjou lodged on the evening of the battle. There the body of Conde was taken down, amidst the sobs of some Protestant prisoners, who kissed as they wept the remains of their gallant chief. This touching spectacle did not stop the coarse ribaldry of the Duke of Anjou and his favourites, and for two days the prince's remains were left in a ground-floor room, there exposed to the injurious action of the air and to the gross insults of the courtiers. The Duke of Anjou at last consented to give up the body of Conde to the Duke of Longueville, his brother-in-law, who had it interred with due respect at Vendôme in the burial-place of his ancestors." End quote. When in 1569 he thus testified, from a mixture of hatred and fear, an ignoble joy at the death of Louis de Conde, the valiant chief of Protestantism, the Duke of Anjou did not foresee that, nearly twenty years later, in 1588, when he had become Henry III, King of France, he would also testify, still from a mixture of hatred and fear, the same ignoble joy at sight of the corpse of Henri de Guise, the valiant chief of Catholicism, murdered by his order and in his palace. As soon as Conde's death was known at La Rochelle, the Queen of Navarre, Jeanne d'Albret, hurried to tonnay charente whither the Protestant army had fallen back. She took with her her own son Henry, fifteen years old, and Henri de Bourbon, the late Prince of Conde's son, who was seventeen, and she presented both of them to the army. The younger, the future Henry the Fourth, stepped forward briskly. Quote, "'Your cause,' said he, "'is mine. Your interests are mine. I swear on my soul.' honour and life to be wholly yours. End quote. The young Conde took the same oath. The two princes were associated in the command, under the authority of Coligny, who was immediately appointed lieutenant general of the army. For two years their double signature figured at the bottom of the principal official acts of the reformed party, and they were called quote, the admiral's pages. End quote. 
On both of them Jeanne passionately enjoined union between themselves, and equal submission on their part to Coligny, their model and their master in war and in devotion to the common cause. Queen, princes, admiral, and military leaders of all ranks stripped themselves of all the diamonds, jewels, and precious stones which they possessed, and which Elizabeth, the Queen of England, took in pledge for the twenty thousand pounds sterling she lent him. The Queen of Navarre reviewed the army, which received her with bursts of pious and warlike enthusiasm, and leaving to Coligny her two sons, as she called them, she returned alone to La Rochelle, where she received a like reception from the inhabitants, quote, rough and loyal people, says La Noue, and as warlike as mercantile, end quote. After her departure, a body of German horse, commanded by Count Mansfield, joined Coligny in the neighborhood of Limoges. Their arrival was an unhoped-for aid. Coligny distributed amongst them a medal bearing the effigy of Queen Jeanne of Navarre, with this legend, quote, Alone and with the rest for God, the King, the laws, and peace. End quote. With such dispositions on one side and the other, war was resumed and pushed forward eagerly from June 1569 to June 1570, with alternations of reverse and success. On the 23rd of June, 1569, a fight took place at roche l'Abeille, near saint heriège in Limousin, wherein the Protestants had the advantage. The young Catholic noblemen, with Henri de Guise at their head, began it rashly, against the desire of their general, Gaspard de Tavannes, to show off their bravery before the eyes of the Queen Mother and the Cardinal of Lorraine, both of whom considered the operations of the army too slow and its successes too rare they lost five hundred men and many prisoners amongst others philip strozzi whom charles the ninth had just made colonel-general of the infantry they took their revenge on the seventh of september fifteen sixty nine by forcing coligny to raise the siege of poitiers which he had been pushing forward for more than two months and on the third of october following at the battle of montcontour in poitou the most important of the campaign which they won brilliantly and in which the protestant army lost five or six thousand men, and a great part of their baggage. Before the action began, quote, two gentlemen on the side of the Catholics, being in an out-of-the-way spot, came to speech, said La Noue, with some of the Protestant religion, there being certain ditches between them. Sirs, said they, we bear the marks of enemies, but we do not hate you in any wise, or your party. Warn the admiral to be very careful not to fight, for our army is marvellously strong by reason of reinforcements that have come into it, and it is very determined withal. Let the admiral temporize for a month only, for all the nobles have sworn and said to Monseigneur that they will not wait any longer, that he must employ them within that time, and they will then do their duty. Let the admiral remember that it is dangerous to stem the fury of Frenchmen, the which, however, will suddenly ooze away if they have not victory speedily they will be constrained to make peace and will offer it you on advantageous terms tell him that we know this from a good source and greatly desired to advertise him of it afterwards they retired the others continues la Noue, went incontinently to the admiral for to make their report which was to his taste they told it also to others of the principals and some there were who desired that it should be acted upon but the majority opined that this notice came from suspected persons who had been accustomed to practice fraud and deceit and that no account should be made of it the latter opinion prevailed and the battle of montcontour was fought with extreme acrimony especially on the part of the catholics who were irritated by the cruelties as la Noue himself says which the protestants had but lately practised at the fight of la roche l'abeille coligny was wounded in the action after having killed with his own hand the marquis philibert of baden and the melee had been so hot that the admiral's friends found great difficulty in extricating him and carrying him off the field to get his wound attended to three weeks before the battle on the thirteenth of september coligny had been sentenced to death by the parliament of paris and hanged in effigy on the place de greve and a reward of fifty thousand gold crowns had been offered to whosoever should give him up to the king's justice dead or alive words added it is said to the decree at the desire of charles the ninth himself Family sorrows were in Coligny's case added to political reverses. On the 27th of May, in this same year, 1569, he had lost his brother Dandelot, his faithful comrade in his religious as well as his warlike career. Quote, he found himself, says Daubigne, saddled with the blame due to accident, his own merits being passed over in silence. 
with the remnant of an army which when it was whole was in despair even before the late disaster with weak towns dismayed garrisons and foreigners without baggage himself moneyless his enemies very powerful and pitiless towards all especially towards him abandoned by all the great except one woman the queen of navarre who having nothing but the title had advanced to niort in order to lend a hand to the afflicted and to affairs in general this old man worn down by fever endured all these causes of anguish and many others that came back to rack him more painfully than his grievous wound as he was being borne along in a litter l'estrange an old nobleman and one of his principal counsellors travelling in similar fashion and wounded likewise had his own litter where the road was broad moved forward in front of the admiral's and putting his head out at the door he looked steadily at his chief saying with tears in his eyes yet god is very merciful thereupon they bade one another farewell perfectly at one in thought without being able to say more this great captain confessed to his intimates that these few friendly words restored him and set him up again in the way of good thoughts and firm resolutions for the future he was so much restored that between the end of fifteen sixty nine and the middle of fifteen seventy he marched through the south and the centre of france the army which he had reorganized and with which wherever he went he restored, if not security, at any rate confidence and zeal to his party. On arriving at Arnay-le-Duc in Burgundy, he found himself confronted by Marshal de Cosse with thirteen thousand men of the king's troops. Coligny had barely half as many, but he did not hesitate to attack, and on the 13th of June, 1570, he was so near victory that the road was left open before him. On the 7th of July he arrived at charette sur loire alarm prevailed at paris a truce for ten days was signed and negotiations were reopened for a fresh attempt at peace Quote, if any one in these lamentable wars worked hard both with body and mind says lanou it may be said to have been the admiral for as regards the greatest part of the burden of military affairs and hardships it was he who supported them with much constancy and buoyancy and he was as respectful in his bearing towards the princes his superiors as he was modest towards his inferiors he always had piety in singular esteem and a love of justice which made him valued and honoured by them of the party which he had embraced he did not seek ambitiously for commands and honours they were thrust upon him because of his competence and his expertness when he handled arms and armies he showed that he was very conversant with them as much so as any captain of his day and he always exposed himself courageously to danger in difficulties he was observed to be full of magnanimity and resource in getting out of them always showing himself quite free from swagger and parade in short he was a personage worthy to re-establish an enfeebled and a corrupted state i was fain to say these few words about him in passing for having known him and been much with him and having profited by his teaching i should have been wrong if i had not made truthful and honourable mention of him End quote. End of section thirty nine Section 40 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 33. Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, fifteen sixty to fifteen seventy four, part six. The negotiations were short. The war had been going on for two years. The two parties, victorious and vanquished by turns, were both equally sick of it. In vain did Philip the Second, King of Spain, offer Charles the Ninth an aid of nine thousand men to continue it. In vain did Pope Pius V write to Catherine de Medici, quote, As there can be no communication between Satan and the children of the light, it ought to be taken for certain that there can be no compact between Catholics and heretics, save one full of fraud and faint. End quote. Quote, we have beaten our enemies, says Moluc, over and over again, but notwithstanding that, they had so much influence in the king's council that the decrees were always to their advantage we won by arms but they won by those devils of documents peace was concluded at st germain en laye on the eighth of august fifteen seventy and it was more equitable and better for the reformers than the preceding treaties 
for besides a pretty large extension as regarded free exercise of their worship and their civil rights in the state, it granted, quote, for two years to the princes of Navarre and Conde, and twenty noblemen of the religion, who were appointed by the king, the wardenship of the towns of La Rochelle, Cognac, Montauban, and La Charite, whither those of the religion who dared not return so soon to their own homes might retire, end quote. All the members of the Parliament, all the royal and municipal officers, and the principal inhabitants of the town, where the two religions existed, were further bound over on oath, quote, to maintenance of the edict, end quote. Peace was made, but it was the third in seven years, and very shortly after each new treaty, civil war had recommenced. No more was expected from the Treaty of Saint-Germain-en-Laye than had been effected by those of Amboise and Longjumeau, and on both sides men sighed for something more stable and definitive. By what means to be obtained, and with what pledges of durability? A singular fact is apparent between 1570 and 1572. There is a season, as it were, of marriages and matrimonial rejoicings. Charles the Ninth went to receive at the frontier of his kingdom his affianced bride, Archduchess Elizabeth of Austria, daughter of the Emperor Maximilian the Second, who was escorted by the Archbishop of Treves, Chancellor of the Empire. The nuptials were celebrated at Mezières on the twenty sixth of November, fifteen seventy. The princes and great lords of the Protestant party were invited. They did not think it advisable to withdraw themselves from their asylum at La Rochelle, but Coligny wrote to the Queen Mother to excuse himself, whilst protesting his forgetfulness of the past and his personal devotion. Four months afterwards, Coligny himself married again. It was three years since he had lost his noble wife, Charlotte de Laval, and he had not contemplated anything of the kind, when in the concluding weeks of 1570 he received from the castle of Saint-André de Briard, in Le Bugy, a letter from a great lady, thirty years of age, Jacqueline de Montbel, daughter of Count d'Entremont, herself a widow, who wrote to him, quote, that she would fain marry a saint and a hero, and that he was that hero, end quote. Quote, I am but a tomb, replied Coligny. But Jacqueline persisted, in spite of the opposition shown by her sovereign, Emmanuel Philibert, Duke of Savoy, who did not like his fair subjects to marry foreigners, and in February 1571 she furtively quitted her castle, dropped down the Rhone in a boat as far as Lyon, mounted on horseback, and escorted by five devoted friends, arrived at La Rochelle. All Coligny's friends were urgent for him to accept this passionate devotion, proffered by a lady who would bring him territorial possessions valuable to the Protestants, quote, for they were an open door to Geneva, end quote. Coligny accepted, and the marriage took place at La Rochelle on the 24th of March, 1571. Quote, Madame Jacqueline wore on this occasion, says a contemporary chronicler, a skirt in the Spanish fashion, of black gold tissue, with bands of embroidery in gold and silver twist, and above a doublet of white silver tissue embroidered in gold, with large diamond buttons. End quote. She was nevertheless at that moment almost as poor as the German Arbusier who escorted her litter, for an edict issued by the Duke of Savoy on the 31st of January, 1569, caused her the loss of all her possessions in her own country. She was received in France with the respect due to her, and when five months after the marriage Charles the Ninth summoned Coligny to Paris, quote, to serve him in his most important affairs as a worthy minister, whose virtues were sufficiently known and tried, end quote, he sent at the same time to Madame l'Amiral a safe conduct in which he called her my fair cousin. Was there any one belonging to that august and illustrious household who had at that time a presentiment of their impending and tragic destiny? At the same period, the Queen of Navarre, Jeanne d'Albret, obtained for her young nephew, Henri de Bourbon, Prince of Conde, son of the hero of Jarnac, and companion of Henry of Navarre, the hand of his cousin, Mary of Cleves, and there was still going on in London, on behalf of one of Charles the Ninth's brothers, at one time the Duke of Anjou, and at another the Duke of Alençon, the negotiation which was a vain attempt to make Queen Elizabeth espouse a French prince. Coincidentally with all these marriages, or projects of marriage amongst princes and great lords, came the most important of all, that which was to unite Henry of Navarre and Charles the Ninth's sister, Marguerite de Valois. There had already, thirteen or fourteen years previously, been some talk about it, in the reign of King Henry the Second, when Henry of Navarre and Margaret de Valois, each born in 1553, were both of them mere babies. 
This union between the two branches of the royal house, one Catholic and the other Protestant, ought to have been the most striking sign and the purest pledge of peace between Catholicism and Protestantism. The political expediency of such a step appeared the more evident and the more urgent in proportion as the religious war had become more direful and the desire for peace more general. Charles the Ninth embraced the idea passionately. At the outset he encountered an obstacle. The young Duke of Guise had already paid court to Marguerite, and had obtained such marked favor with her that the ambassador of Spain wrote to the king, quote, There is no public topic in France just now save the marriage of my lady Marguerite with the Duke of Guise. End quote. People even talked of a tender correspondence between the princess and the duke, which was carried on through one of the queen's ladies, the Countess of Mirandola, who was devoted to the Guises and a favorite with Marguerite. Quote, if it be so, said Charles the Ninth savagely, we will kill him. End quote. And he gave such peremptory orders on this subject that Henri de Guise, somewhat disquieted, avoided for a while taking part in the royal hunts, and thought it well that there should be resumed on his behalf a project of marriage with Catherine of Cleves, widow of the Prince of Porcien, or Le Porcien, and the wealthy heiress to some great domains, especially the countship of U. So long as he had some hope of marrying Marguerite de Valois, the Duke of Guise had repudiated, not without offensiveness, all idea of union with Catherine of Cleves. Quote, "'Anybody who can make me marry the Princess of Porcien,' said he, "'could make me marry a negress.'" End quote. He nevertheless contracted this marriage, so greatly disdained, on the 4th of October, 1570, and at this price recovered the good graces of Charles the Ninth. The Queen Mother charged the Cardinal Louis de Lorraine, him who the people called Cardinal Bottles, from his conviviality, to publicly give the lie to any rumour of a possible engagement between her daughter Marguerite and Henri de Guise, and a grand council of the kings, after three holdings, adopted in principle the marriage of Marguerite de Valois with, quote, the little Prince of Bern, end quote. Charles the Ninth at once set his hand to the work to turn this resolution to good account, being the only means, he said, of putting a stop at last to this incessantly renewed civil war, which was the plague of his life as well as of his kingdom. He first of all sent Marshal de Cosse to La Rochelle to sound Soligny as to his feelings upon this subject, and to urge him to thus cut short public woes and the reformers' grievances. Quote, the king has always desired peace, said the marshal. He wishes it to be lasting. He has proved only too well, to his own misery and that of his people, that of all the evils which can inflict a state, the most direful is civil war. But what means this withdrawal since the signing of peace at Saint-Germain, of the Queen of Navarre and her children, of the Prince of Conde, and so many lords and distinguished nobles, still separated from their houses and their families, and collected together in a town like Rochelle, which has great advantages by land and sea for all those who would fain begin the troubles again? Why have they not returned home? During the hottest part of the war they ardently desired to see once more their houses, their wives, and their children, and now, when peace leaves them free to do so, they prefer to remain in a land which is in some sort foreign, and where, in addition to great expenses, they are deprived of the conveniences they would find at home. The king cannot make out such absurdity, or rather he is very apprehensive that this long stay means the hatching of some evil design." End quote. The Protestants defended themselves warmly against this supposition. They alleged, in explanation of their persistent disquietude, the very imperfect execution of the conditions granted by the Peace of Saint-Germain, and the insults, the attacks which they had still to suffer in many parts of the kingdom, and quite recently at Rouen and at Orange. The king attempted, without any great success, to repress these disorders amongst the populace. The Queen of Navarre, the two princes, Coligny, and many Protestant lords remained still at La Rochelle, where was being held at this time a general synod of the Reformed churches. Charles the Ninth sent thither Marshal de Biron, with formal orders to negotiate the marriage of Marguerite de Valois and the Prince of Navarre, and to induce that prince, his mother the Queen of Navarre, and Coligny to repair to the court in order to conclude the matter. The young prince was at that time in Warn. The queen, his mother, answered, quote, that she would consult her spiritual advisers, and as soon as her conscience was at rest, there were no conditions she would not accept, with a view of giving satisfaction to the king and the queen, of marking her obedience and respect towards them, and of securing the tranquillity of the state, an object for which she would willingly sacrifice her own life. But, she added, I would rather sink to the condition of the humblest demoiselle in France than sacrifice to the aggrandizement of my family, my own soul, and my sons. End quote. 
In September 1571, Charles the Ninth and the Queen Mother repaired to Blois, and at their urgent request Coligny went thither to talk over the projected marriage and the affairs of Europe. The king received him with emotional satisfaction, calling him my father, and saying to him, quote, Now we have you, and you shall not escape us when you wish to. End quote. Jeanne d'Albret, more distrustful, or, one ought rather to say, more clear-sighted, refused to leave La Rochelle, and continued to negotiate vaguely and from a distance. Catherine de Medici insisted, quote, Satisfy, she wrote to her, the extreme desire we have to see you in this company. You will be loved and honoured therein as accords with reason and with what you are. End quote. Jeanne still waited. It was only in the following year, at the end of January, that having earnestly exhorted her son, quote, to remain barnwards whilst she was at the court of France, end quote, she set out for Blois, where Charles the Ninth received her most affectionately, calling her my good aunt, my dear aunt, and lavishing upon her promises as well as endearments. Jeanne was a strict and a judicious person, and the manners and proceedings of the court at Blois displeased her. On the 8th of March, 1572, she wrote to her son, quote, I find it necessary to negotiate quite contrary-wise to what I had expected, and what had been promised me. I have no liberty to speak to the king or my lady Marguerite, only to the queen mother, who treats me as if I were dirt. Seeing, then, that no advance is made, and that the desire is to make me hurry matters, and not conduct them orderly, I have thrice spoken thereof to the queen, who does nothing but make a fool of me, and tell everybody the opposite of what I told her in such sort that my friends find fault with me and i know not how to bring her to book for when i say to her madame it is reported that i said so and so to you though it was she herself who reported it she denies it flatly and laughs in my face and uses me in such wise that you might really say that my patience passes that of griselda Thenceforward I have a troop of Huguenots who come to converse with me, rather for the purpose of being spies upon me, than of assisting me. Then I have some of another humour, who hamper me no less, and who are religious hermaphrodites. I defend myself as best I may. I am sure that if you only knew the trouble I am in, you would have pity upon me, for they give me empty speeches and raillery, instead of treating with me gravely, as the matter deserves. In such sort that I am bursting, because I am so resolved not to lose my temper, that my patience is a miracle to see. I found your letter very much to my taste. I will show it to my lady Marguerite, if I can. She is beautiful and discreet, and of good demeanour, but brought up in the most accursed and most corrupt society that ever was. I would not, for anything in the world, have you here to remain here. That is why I desire to get you married, and you and your wife withdraw from this corruption. For though I believed it to be very great, I find it still more so." here it is not the men who solicit the women it is the women who solicit the men if you were here you would never escape without a great deal of god's grace End quote. side by side with this motherly and christianly scrupulous negotiation coligny set on foot another noble and dignified also but even less in harmony with the habits and bent of the government which it concerned the Puritan warrior was at the same time an ardent patriot. He had at heart the greatness of France as much as he had his personal creed. The reverses of Francis I and the preponderance of Spain in Europe oppressed his spirit with a sense of national decadence, from which he wanted France to lift herself up again. The moment appeared to him propitious. Let the king ally himself with Queen Elizabeth of England, the Prince of Orange in the Low Countries, and the Protestant princes of Germany. Here was for France a certain guarantee of power in Europe, and at the same time a natural opportunity for conquering Flanders, a possession so necessary to her strength and her security. But high above this policy, so thoroughly French, towered a question still more important than that of even the security and the grandeur of France. That was the partition of Europe between Catholicism and Protestantism, and it was in a country Catholic in respect of the great majority, and governed by a kingship with which Catholicism was hereditary, that in order to put a stop to civil war between French Catholics and Protestants, Coligny pressed the king to put himself at the head of an essentially Protestant coalition, and make it triumphant in Europe. This was, in the sixteenth century, a policy wholly chimerical, however patriotic its intention may have been and the french protestant hero who recommended it to charles the ninth did not know that protestantism was on the eve of the greatest disaster it would have to endure in france a fact of a personal character tended to mislead coligny by his renown by the loftiness of his views by the earnest gravity of his character and his language he had produced a great effect upon charles the ninth 
a young king of warm imagination and impressible and sympathetic temperament, but at the same time of weak judgment. He readily gave way, in Coligny's company, to outpourings which had all the appearance of perfect and involuntary frankness. Quote, speaking one day to the admiral about the course of conduct to be adopted as to the enterprise against Flanders, and well knowing that the Queen Mother lay under his suspicion, My dear father, said he, there is one thing herein of which we must take good heed, and that is that the Queen my mother, who likes to poke her nose everywhere, as you know, learn nothing of this enterprise, at any rate as regards the main spring of it, for she will spoil all for us as you please sir but i take her to be so good a mother and so devoted to the welfare of your kingdom that when she knows of it she will do nothing to spoil it you are mistaken my dear father said the king leave it to me only i see quite well that you do not know my mother she is the greatest meddler in all the world Another time, when he was speaking likewise to Teligny, Coligny's son-in-law, about this enterprise against Flanders, the king said, quote, Wouldst have me speak to thee freely, Teligny? I distrust all these gentry. I am suspicious of Tavannes' ambition. Vieilleville loves nothing but good wine. Cosse is too covetous. Montmorency cares only for his hunting and hawking. The Count de Retz is a Spaniard. The other lords of my court and those of my council are mere blockheads. My secretaries of state, to hide nothing of what I think, are not faithful to me, insomuch that to tell the truth I know not at what end to begin. End quote. This tone of freedom and confidence had inspired Coligny with reciprocal confidence. He believed himself to have a decisive influence over the king's ideas and conduct and when the protestants testified their distrust upon this subject he reproached them vehemently for it he affirmed the king's good intentions and sincerity and he considered himself in fact said catherine de medici with temper quote, a second king of france end quote. how much sincerity was there about these outpourings of charles the ninth in his intercourse with coligny and how much reality in the admiral's influence over the king we are touching upon that great historical question which has been so much disputed was the saint bartholomew a design long ago determined upon and prepared for of charles the ninth and his government or an almost sudden resolution wrought about by events and the situation of the moment to which charles the ninth was egged on not without difficulty by his mother catherine and his advisers End of section forty. Section 41 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter thirty three Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, fifteen sixty to fifteen seventy four, part seven. We recall to mind here what was but lately said in this very chapter as to the condition of minds and morals in the sixteenth century, and as to the tragic consequences of it. Massacre, we add no qualifying term to the word, was an idea, a habit, we might say almost a practice familiar to that age, and one which excited neither the surprise nor the horror which are inseparable from it in our day. So little respect for human life and for truth was shown in the relations between man and man. Not that those natural sentiments which do honour to the human race were completely extinguished in the hearts of men, they reappeared here and there as a protest against the vices and the crimes of the period. But they were too feeble and too rare to struggle effectually against the sway of personal passions and interests, against atrocious hatreds and hopes, against intellectual aberrations and moral corruption. To betray and to kill were deeds so common that they caused scarcely any astonishment, and that people were almost resigned to them beforehand. We have cited fifteen or twenty cases of the massacres which in the reign of Charles the Ninth, from 1562 to 1572, grievously troubled and steeped in blood such and such a part of France, without leaving any lasting traces in history. Previously to the massacre called the St. Bartholomew, the massacre of Vassy is almost the only one which received and kept its true name. The massacre of Vassy was undoubtedly an accident, a deed not at all forecast or prepared for. 
the St. Bartholomew Massacre, was an event for a long time forecast and announced, promised to the Catholics, and thrown out as a threat to the Protestants, written beforehand, so to speak, in the history of the religious wars of France. But nevertheless, at the moment at which it was accomplished, and in the mode of its accomplishment, a deed unexpected so far as the majority of the victims were concerned, and a cause of contest even among its originators. Accordingly, it was from the very first a subject of surprise and horror throughout Europe as well as in France, not only because of the torrents of blood that were shed, but also because of the extraordinary degree in which it was characterized by falsehood and ferocious hatred. We will bring forward, in support of this double assertion, only such facts and quotations as appear to us decisive. In 1565 Charles the Ninth and Catherine de' Medici had an interview at Bayonne with the Duke of Alba, representative of Philip the Second, to consult as to the means of delivering France from heretics. Quote, they agreed at last, says the contemporary historian Adriani, continuer of Guicciardini, he had drawn his information from the journal of Cosmo de' Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany, who died in 1574 in the opinion of the catholic king who thought that this great blessing could not have accomplishment save by the death of all the chiefs of the huguenots and by a new addition as the saying was of the sicilian vespers take the big fish said the duke of alba and let the small fry go one salmon is worth more than a thousand frogs they decided that the deed should be done at moulins in bourbonnais whither the king was to return the execution of it was afterwards deferred to the date of the St. Bartholomew in 1572, at Paris, because of certain suspicions which had been manifested by the Huguenots, and because it was considered easier and more certain to get them all together at Paris than at Moulins. End quote. Catherine de Medici charged Cardinal Santa Croce to assure Pope Pius V quote, that she and her son had nothing more at heart than to get the admiral and all his confidants together some day and make a massacre un macello, of them, but the matter, she said, was so difficult that there was no possibility of promising to do it at one time more than at another. Lanoux bears witness in his memoir to quote, the resolution taken at Bayonne with the Duke of Alba aiding to exterminate the Huguenots of France and the beggars, or gueux, of Flanders, whereof warning had been given by those about whom there was no doubt. All these things, and many others as to which I am silent, mightily waked up those, he adds, who had no desire to be caught napping. And I remember that the chiefs of the religion held within a short time three meetings, as well at Valéry as at Châtillon, to deliberate upon present occurrences, and to seek out legitimate and honourable expedients for securing themselves against so much alarm, without having recourse to extreme remedies." End quote. De Thou regards these facts as certain, and after having added some details, he sums them all up in the words, quote, This is what passed at Bayonne in 1565. End quote. In 1571, after the Third Religious War and the Peace of Saint Germain en Laye, Marshal de Tavannes wrote to Charles the Ninth, quote, Peace has a chance of lasting, because neither of the two parties is willing or able to renew open war but if one of the two sees quite a safe opportunity for putting a complete end to what is at the root of the question this it will take for to remain for ever in the state now existing is what nobody can or ought to hope for and there is no such near approximation to a complete victory as to take the persons for to surprise what they the reformers hold to put down their religion and to break off all at once the alliances which support them this is impossible thus there is no way but to take the chiefs all together for to make an end of it end quote. next year on the twenty fourth of august fifteen seventy two when the saint bartholomew broke out tavannes took care to himself explain what he meant in fifteen seventy one by those words to take the chiefs all together for to make an end of it being invested with the command in paris quote, he went about the city all day says brantome and seeing so much blood spilt he said and shouted to the people bleed bleed the doctors say that bleeding is as good all through this month of august as in may End quote. in the year which preceded the outbreak of the massacre when the marriage of marguerite de valois with the prince of navarre was agreed upon and coligny was often present at court sometimes at blois and sometimes at paris there arose between the king and the queen mother a difference which there had been up to that time nothing to foreshadow it was plain that the union between the two branches, Catholic and Protestant, of the royal house and the patriotic policy of Coligny, were far more pleasing to Charles the Ninth than to his mother. 
On the matrimonial question, the king's feeling was so strong that he expressed it roughly. Jeanne d'Albret, having said to him one day that the Pope would make them wait a long while for the dispensation requested for the marriage, quote, No, no, my dear aunt, said the king, I honor you more than I do the Pope, and I love my sister more than I fear him. I am not a Huguenot, but no more am I an ass. If the Pope has too much of his nonsense, I will myself take Margot by the hand and carry her off to be married in open conventicle. End quote. Toligny, for his part, was so pleased with the measures that Charles the Ninth had taken in favour of the Low Countries in their quarrels with Philip the Second, and so confident himself of his influence over the king, that when Tavannes was complaining in his presence, quote, that the vanquished should make laws for the victors, end quote, Coligny said to his face, quote, whoever is not for war with Spain is not a good Frenchman, and has the Red Cross inside him, end quote. The Catholics were getting alarmed and irritated. The Guises and their partisans left the court. It was near the time fixed for the marriage of Henry of Navarre and Marguerite de Valois. The new Pope, Gregory the Thirteenth, who had at first shown more pliancy than his predecessor Pius V, attached to the dispensation conditions to which neither the intended husband nor King Charles the Ninth himself was inclined to consent. The Queen of Navarre, Jeanne d'Albret, who had gone to Paris in preparation for the marriage, had died there on the 8th of June, 1572, a death which had given rise to very likely ill-founded accusations of poisoning. Quote, a princess, says Daubing, with nothing of a woman but the sex, with a soul full of everything manly, a mind fit to cope with affairs of moment, and a heart invincible in adversity. End quote. It was in deep mourning that her son, become king of Navarre, arrived at court, attended by eight hundred gentlemen, all likewise in mourning. Quote, but, says Margaret de Valois herself, the nuptials took place a few days afterward with such triumph and magnificence as none others of my quality. The king of Navarre and his troop, having changed their mourning for very rich and fine clothes, and I being dressed royally with crown and corset of tufted ermine, all blazing with crown jewels, and the grand blue mantle with a train four ells long, borne by three princesses, the people choking one another down below to see us pass. End quote. The marriage was celebrated on the 18th of August by the Cardinal of Bourbon, in front of the principal entrance of Notre Dame. When the Princess Marguerite was asked if she consented, she appeared to hesitate a moment, but King Charles the Ninth put his hand a little roughly on her head, and made her lower it in a token of assent. Accompanied by the King, the Queen Mother, and all the Catholics present, Marguerite went to hear Mass in the choir. Henry and his Protestant friends walked about the cloister and the nave. Marshal de Damville pointed out to Coligny the flags hanging from the vaulted roof of Notre Dame, which had been taken from the vanquished at the Battle of Montcontour. Quote, I hope, said the admiral, that they will soon have others better suited for lodgment in this place. End quote. He was already dreaming of victories over the Spaniards. Meanwhile, Charles the Ninth was beginning to hesitate. He was quite willing to disconnect himself from the King of Spain, and even to incur his displeasure, but not to be actively embroiled with him and make war upon him. He could not conceal from himself that this policy, thoroughly French though it was, was considered in France too Protestant for a Catholic king. Coligny urged him vehemently. Quote, if you want men, he said, I have ten thousand at your service. Whereupon Tavannes said to the king, quote, Sir, whoever of your subjects uses such words to you, you ought to have his head struck off. How is it that he offers you that which is your own? It is that he has won over and corrupted them, and that he is a party leader to your prejudice. End quote. Tavan, a rough and faithful soldier, did not admit that there could be amongst men moral ties of a higher kind than political ties. Charles the Ninth, too weak in mind and character to think and act with independence and consistency in the great questions of the day, only sought how to elude them, and to leave time, that inscrutable master, to settle them in his place. His indecision brought him to a state of impotence, and he ended by inability to do anything but dodge and lie, like his mother, and even with his mother. Whilst he was getting his sister married to the King of Navarre, and concerting his policy with Coligny, he was adopting towards the three principal personages who came to talk over those affairs with him three different sorts of language. To Cardinal Alessandrino, whom Pope Pius V had sent to him to oppose the marriage, he said, quote, My Lord Cardinal, all that you say to me is sound. I acknowledge it, and I thank the Pope and you for it. If I had any other means of taking vengeance on my enemies, I would not make this marriage, but I have no other. End quote. 
With Jeanne d'Albret he lauded himself for the marriage as the best policy he could pursue. Quote, I give my sister, he said, not to the Prince of Navarre, but to all the Huguenots, to marry them, as it were, and take from them all doubt as to the unchangeable fixity of my edicts. End quote. And to humor his mother Catherine, he said to her, on the very evening of his interview with Jeanne d'Albret, What think you, madam? Do I not play my partlet well? End quote. Quote, yes, very well, but it is nothing if it is not continued. End quote. And Charles continued to play his part, even after the Bartholomew was over, for he was fond of saying, with a laugh, quote, My big sister Margot caught all these Huguenot rebels in the bird catching style. What has grieved me most is being obliged to dissimulate so long. End quote. His contemporary Catholic biographer, Papirius Masson, who was twenty-eight years old at the time of the St. Bartholomew, says of him, quote, He is impatient in waiting, ferocious in his fits of anger, skillfully masked when he wishes, and ready to break faith as soon as that appears to his advantage. End quote. Such was the prince, fiery and flighty, inconsistent and artful, accessible to the most opposite sympathies as well as hatreds, of whom Catherine de' Medici and Admiral Coligny were disputing the possession. In the spring of 1572 Coligny might have considered himself the victor in this struggle. At his instance Charles the Ninth had written on the 27th of April to Count Louis of Nassau, leader of the Protestant insurrection in Hainaut. Quote, that he was determined, so far as opportunities and the arrangements of his affairs permitted him, to employ the powers which God had put into his hands for the deliverance of the Low Countries from the oppression under which they were groaning. End quote. Fortified by this promise of the king's, Coligny had raised a body of French Protestants, and had sent it under the command of La Noue to join the army of Louis of Nassau. The reformers had at first had some successes. They had taken Valenciennes and Mons, but the Duke of Alba restored the fortunes of the King of Spain. He re-entered Valenciennes, and he was besieging Mons. Coligny sent to the aid of that place a fresh body of French under the orders of Saint-Lys, one of his comrades in faith and arms. Before setting out, Saint-Lys saw Charles the Ninth, received from him money together with encouragement, and in the corps he led, some Catholics were mixed with the Protestants but from the very court of france there came to the duke of alba warnings which put him in a position to surprise the french corps and Saint-Lys was beaten and made prisoner on the tenth of july quote, i have in my hands the duke of alba sent word to his king a letter from the king of france which would strike you dumb if you were to see it for the moment it is expedient to say nothing about it End quote. Quote, news of the defeat of Saint-Lys, says tavannes comes flying to court and changes hearts and counsels Disdain, despite, is engendered in the admiral, who hurls this defeat upon the heads of those who have prevented the king from declaring himself. He raises a new levy of three thousand foot, and not regarding who he is and where he is, he declares, in the presumption of his audacity, that he can no longer hold his partisans, and that it must be one of two wars, Spanish or civil. It is all thunderstorm at court. Every one remains on the watch at the highest pitch of resolution." End quote. A grand council was assembled. Coligny did not care. He had already, at the king's request, set forth in a long memorial all the reasons for his policy of a war with Spain. The king had appeared struck with them. But, quote, as he only sought, says de Thou, to gain time without its being perceived, end quote, he handed the admiral's memorial to the keeper of the seals, John de Morvilliers, requesting him to set forth also all the reasons for a pacific policy. Coligny, a man of resolution and of action, did not take any pleasure in thus prolonging the discussion. Nevertheless, he again brought forward and warmly advocated at the Grand Council the views he had so often expressed. They were almost unanimously rejected. Coligny did not consider himself bound to give them up. Quote, I have promised, said he, on my own account, my assistance to the Prince of Orange. I hope the King will not take it ill if by means of my friends, and perhaps in person, I fulfill my promise." End quote. This reservation excited great surprise. Quote, Madame, said Coligny to the Queen Mother, the King is to-day shunning a war which would promise him great advantages. God forbid that there should break out another which he cannot shun. End quote. The council broke up in great agitation. Quote, Let the Queen beware, said Taban, of the King her son's secret counsels, designs, and sayings. If she do not look out, the Huguenot will have him. At any rate, before thinking of anything else, let her exert herself to regain the mother's authority which the Admiral has caused her to lose. End, quote. End of section 41
Section 42 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 33. Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, 1560 to 1574, Part 8. The king was hunting at Brie. The queen mother went and joined him. She shut herself up with him in a cabinet, and bursting into tears, she said, quote, I should never have thought that in return for having taken so much pains to bring you up and preserve to you the crown, you would have had heart to make me so miserable a recompense. You hide yourself from me, me who am your mother, in order to take counsel of your enemies. I know that you hold secret counsels with the admiral. You desire to plunge rashly into war with Spain, in order to give your kingdom, yourself, and the persons that are yours, over as a prey to them of the religion. I am so miserable a creature, yet before I see that, give me leave to withdraw to the place of my birth. Remove from you your brother, who may call himself unfortunate in having employed his own life to preserve yours." give him at least time to withdraw out of danger and from the presence of enemies made in doing you service huguenots who desire not war with spain but with france and the subversion of all the estates in order to set up themselves tavannes himself terms these expressions quote, an artful harangue end quote. but he says quote, it moved astounded and dismayed the king, not so much on the score of the Huguenot as of his mother and brother, whose subtlety, ambition, and power in the state he knew. He marvelled to see his counsels thus revealed. He avowed them, asked pardon, promised obedience. Having sown this distrust, having shot this first bolt, the queen mother, still in displeasure, withdrew to Monceau. The trembling king followed her. He found her with his brother, and Sieur de Tavannes, de Retz, and the secretary of state de Sauve, the last of whom threw himself upon his knees, and received the majesty's pardon for having revealed his counsels to his mother. The infidelity, the bravado, the audacity, the manassas, and the enterprises of the Huguenots were magnified with so much of truth and art, that from friends behold them converted into enemies of the king, who nevertheless, wavering as ever, could not yet give up the desire he had conceived of winning glory and reputation by war with Spain." End quote. A fresh incident increased the agitation in the royal circle. In July 1572 the throne of Poland had become vacant. A Polish embassy came to offer it to the Duke of Anjou. On his part, and his mother's, there was at first great eagerness to accept it. Catherine was charmed to see her favorite son becoming a king. Quote, if we had required, says a Polish historian, that the French should build a bridge of solid gold over the Vistula, they would have agreed. End quote. Hesitation soon took the place of eagerness. Henry demanded information, and took time to reply. He had shown similar hesitation at the time of the negotiations entered upon in London in 1572, with a view of making him the husband of Elizabeth, Queen of England. Coligny, who was very anxious to have him away, pressed Charles the Ninth to insist upon a speedy solution. Quote, "'If Monsieur,' said he, "'who would not have England by marriage will not have Poland either by election, let him declare once and for all that he will not leave France.'" End quote. The relations between the two brothers became day by day more uncomfortable. Two years later, Henry, for a brief period king of Poland, himself told the story of them to his physician Miron. Quote, when by any chance, he said, the queen mother and I, after the admiral's departure, approached the king to speak to him of any matters, even those which concerned merely his pleasure, we found him marvellously quick-tempered and cross-grained, with rough looks and bearing, and his answer still more so. One day, a very short time before the St. Bartholomew, setting out expressly from my quarters to go and see the king, somebody told me on inquiry that he was in his cabinet, whence the admiral, who had been alone with him a very long while, had just that instant gone out. I entered at once, as I had been accustomed to do. But as soon as the king my brother perceived me, he, without saying anything to me, began walking about furiously and with long steps, often looking towards me askance and with a very evil eye, sometimes laying his hand upon his dagger, and in so excited a fashion that I expected nothing else but that he would come and take me by the collar to poniard me. I was very vexed that I had gone in, reflecting upon the peril I was in, but still more upon how to get out of it. 
which I did so dexterously that whilst he was walking with his back turned to me, I retreated quickly towards the door, which I opened, and with a shorter obeisance than at my entry, I made my exit, which was scarcely perceived by him until I was outside. And straightway I went to look for the Queen, my mother, and putting together all reports, notifications, and suspicions, the time and past circumstances, in conjunction with this last meeting, we remained, both of us, easily persuaded, and as it were certain, that it was the Admiral who had impressed the King with some bad and sinister opinion of us, and we resolved from that moment to rid ourselves of him. End quote. One idea immediately occurred to Catherine and her son. Two persons felt a passionate hatred towards Coligny, they were the widow of duke francis of guise anne d'est become duchess of nemours by a second marriage and her son henri de guise a young man of twenty-two they were both convinced that coligny had egged on poltrot to murder duke francis and they had sworn to exact vengeance being informed of the queen mother's and the duke of anjou's intention they entered into it eagerly the young duke of guise believed his mother quite capable of striking down the admiral in the very midst of one of the great assemblies at court the fair ladies of the sixteenth century were adepts in handling dagger and pistol in default of the duchess of nemours her son was thought of for getting rid of coligny Quote, it was at one time decided says the duke of bouillon in his memoir that m de guise should kill the admiral during a tilt at the ring which the king gave in the garden of the louvre and which all messieurs were to lead sides i was on that of the duke who was believed to have an understanding with the admiral on this occasion it was so managed that our dresses were not ready and the late duke and his side did not tilt at all the resolution against the admiral was changed prudently inasmuch as it was very perilous for the person of the king and of monsieur to have determined to kill him in that place there being present more than four hundred gentlemen of the religion who might have gone very far in case of an assault upon that lord who was so much beloved by them End quote. Everything considered, it was thought more expedient to employ for the purpose an inferior agent. Catherine and the Duke of Anjou sent for a Gascon captain, a dependent of the House of Lorraine, whom they knew to be resolute and devoted. Quote, we had him shown the means he should adopt, says the Duke of Anjou, in attacking him who we had in our eye. But having well scanned him, himself, and his movements, and his speech and his looks, which had made us laugh and afforded us good pastime, we considered him too hare-brained, and too much of a windbag to deal the blow well. End quote. They then applied to an officer, quote, of practice and experience in murder, end quote, Charles de Louvier, Sieur de Morivert, who was called the King's Slaughterman, or le tueur du roi, because he had already rendered such a service, and they agreed with him as to all the circumstances of place, time, and procedure most likely to secure the success of the deed, whilst giving the murderer chances of escape. In such situations there is scarcely any project the secret of which is so well kept that there does not get abroad some rumour to warn an observant mind and when it is the fate of a religious or a popular hero that is in question there is never any want of devoted friends or servants about him ready to take alarm for him when coligny mounted his horse to go from chatillon to paris a poor countrywoman on his estates threw herself before him sobbing quote, ah sir ah our good master you are going to destruction i shall never see you again if once you go to paris you will die there you and all those who go with you End quote. At Paris, on the approach of the St. Bartholomew, the Admiral heard that some of his gentlemen were going away. Quote, they treat you too well here, said one of them, Languarin, to him. Better to be saved with the fools than lost for the sake of being thought overwise. End quote. Quote, the Admiral was beset by letters which reminded him of the Queen Mother's crooked ways, and the detestable education of the King, trained to every sort of violence and horrible sin. His Bible is Machiavelli. He has been prepared by the blood of beasts for the shedding of human blood. He has been persuaded that a prince is not bound to observe an edict extorted by his subjects. End quote. To all these warnings Coligny replied at one time by affirming the king's good faith, and at another by saying, quote, I would rather be dragged dead through the muck heaps of Paris than go back to civil war. End quote. This great soul had his seasons, not of doubt as to his faith, or discouragement as to his cause, but of profound sorrow at the atrocious or shameful spectacles and the public or private woes which had to be gone through. Charles the Ninth himself felt some disquietude as to the meeting of the Guises and Coligny at his court. 
The Guises had quitted it before the 18th of August, the day fixed for the marriage of King Henry of Navarre with Marguerite de Valois. When the marriage was over, they were to return, and they did. At the moment of their returning, the king said to Coligny, with demonstrations of the most sincere friendship, quote, "'You know, my dear father, the promise you made me not to insult any of the Guises as long as you remained at court. On their side they have given me their word that they will have for you, and all the gentry of your following, the consideration you deserve. I rely entirely upon your word, but I have not so much confidence in theirs. I know that they are only looking for an opportunity of letting their vengeance burst forth. I know their bold and haughty character, and as they have the people of Paris devoted to them, and as on coming hither under the pretext of the rejoicings at my sister's marriage, they have brought a numerous body of well-armed soldiers, I should be inconsolable if they were to take anything in hand against you. Such an outrage would recoil upon me." that being so if you think as i do i believe the best thing for me is to order into the city the regiment of guards with such and such captains he mentioned none but those who were not objects of suspicion to coligny this reinforcement added the king will secure public tranquillity and if the factious make any disturbance there will be men to oppose to them End quote. The admiral assented to the king's proposal. He added that he was ready to declare, quote, that never had he been guilty or approving of the death of Duke Francis of Guise, and that he set down as a calumniator and a scoundrel whoever said that he had authorized it, End quote. Though frequently going to the palace, both he and the Guises, they had not spoken when they met. Charles had promised the Lorraine princes, quote, not to force them to make friends with Coligny more than was agreeable to them, End quote he believed that he had taken every precaution necessary to maintain in his court for some time at least the peace he desired on friday the twenty second of august fifteen seventy two coligny was returning on foot from the louvre to the rue des fosses saint germain auxerrois where he lived he was occupied in reading a letter which he had just received a shot fired from the window of a house in the cloister of saint germain l'auxerrois smashed two fingers of his right hand and lodged a ball in his left arm he raised his eyes pointed out with his injured hand the house whence the shot had come and reached his quarters on foot two gentlemen who were in attendance upon him rushed to seize the murderer it was too late morivert had been lodging there and on the watch for three days at the house of a canon an old tutor to the duke of guise a horse from the duke's stable was waiting for him at the back of the house and having done his job he departed at a gallop he was pursued for several leagues without being overtaken coligny sent to apprise the king of what had just happened to him Quote, there, said he, was a fine proof of fidelity to the agreement between him and the Duke of Guise. End quote. Quote, I shall never have rest then, cried Charles, breaking the stick with which he was playing tennis with the Duke of Guise and Teligny, the admiral's son-in-law, and he immediately returned to his room. The Duke of Guise took himself off without a word. Teligny speedily joined his father-in-law. Ambrose Père had already attended to him, cutting off the two broken fingers. Somebody expressed a fear that the balls might have been poisoned. Quote, it will be as God pleases as to that, said Coligny, and turning towards the minister, Merlin, who had hurried to him, he added, quote, Pray that he may grant me the gift of perseverance. End quote. Towards midday, Marshals de Damville, de Cosse, and de Villars went to see him, quote, out of pure friendship, they told him, and not to exhort him to endure his mishap with patience. We know that you will not lack patience. End quote. Quote, I do protest to you, said Coligny, that death affrights me not. It is of God that I hold my life. When he requires it back from me, I am quite ready to give it up but i should very much like to see the king before i die i have to speak to him of things which concern his person and the welfare of his state and which i feel sure none of you would dare to tell him of end quote. Quote, i will go and inform his majesty rejoined damville and he went out with villars and telligny leaving marshal de cosse in the room quote, do you remember said coligny to him the warnings i gave you a few hours ago you will do well to take your precautions end quote. About 2 p.m., the king, the queen-mother, and the dukes of Anjou and Alençon, her two other sons, with many of their high officers, repaired to the admiral's. Quote, My dear father, said the king as he went in, the hurt is yours, the grief and the outrage mine, but I will take such vengeance that it shall never be forgotten, end quote, to which he added his usual imprecations. 
Quote, then the admiral, who lay in bed sorely wounded, says the Duke of Anjou himself, in his account of this interview, requested that he might speak privately to the king, which the king granted readily, making a sign to the queen my mother, and to me to withdraw, which we did incontinently into the middle of the room, where we remained standing during the secret colloquy, which caused us great misgiving. We saw ourselves surrounded by more than two hundred gentlemen and captains of the admiral's party, who were in the room and another adjoining, and besides in the ball below, the which, with sad faces and the gestures and bearing of malcontents, were whispering in one another's ears, frequently passing and repassing before and behind us, not with so much honour and respect as they ought to have done, and as if they had some suspicion that we had somewhat to do with the admiral's hurt. We were seized with astonishment and fear at seeing ourselves shut in there, as my mother has since many times confessed to me, saying that she had never been in any place where there was so much cause for fright, and whence she had gone away with more relief and pleasure. This apprehension caused us to speedily break in upon the conversation the admiral was having with the king, under a polite excuse invented by the queen my mother, who, approaching the king, said out loud that she had no idea he would make the admiral talk so much, and that she saw quite well that his physicians and surgeons considered it bad for him, as it certainly was very dangerous, and enough to throw him into a fever, which was above everything to be guarded against. She begged the king to put off the rest of their conversation to another time, when the admiral was better. This vexed the king mightily, for he was very anxious to hear the remainder of what the admiral had to say to him. However, he being unable to gainsay so specious an argument, we got the king away. And incontinently the queen mother, and I too, begged the king to let us know the secret conversation which the admiral had held with him, and in which he had been unwilling that we should be participators, which the king refused several times to do. But finding himself importuned and hard-pressed by us, he told us abruptly and with displeasure, swearing by God's death that what the admiral said was true, that kings realized themselves as such in France only in so far as they had the power of doing harm or good to their subjects and servants, and that this power and management of affairs had slipped imperceptibly into the hands of the queen my mother and mine. This superintendent dominion, the admiral told me, might some day be very prejudicial to me and to all my kingdom, and that I should hold it in suspicion and beware of it, of which he was anxious to warn me, as one of my best and most faithful subjects, before he died. There, God's death, as you wish to know, is what the admiral said to me. This, said as it was with passion and fury, went straight home to our hearts, which we concealed as best we might, both of us, however, defending ourselves in the matter." We continued this conversation all the way from the admiral's quarters to the Louvre, where, having left the king in his room, we retired to that of the queen my mother, who was piqued and hurt to the utmost degree at this language used by the admiral to the king, as well as at the credence which the king seemed to accord it, and was fearful lest it should bring about some change and alteration in our affairs, and in the management of the state. Being unable to resolve upon any course at the moment, we retired, putting off the question till the morrow, when I went to see my mother, who was already up. I had a fine racket in my head, and so had she, and for the time there was no decision come to, save to have the admiral dispatched by some means or other. It being impossible any longer to employ stratagems and artifices, it would have to be done openly, and the king brought round to that way of thinking." we agreed that in the afternoon we would go and pay him a visit in his closet whither we would get the sieur de nevers marshals de tavannes and de retz and chancellor de birag to come merely to have their opinion as to the means to be adopted for the execution which we had already determined upon my mother and i End End of section forty two Section 43 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter thirty three Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars fifteen sixty to fifteen seventy four Part nine On Saturday the twenty third of August in the afternoon the Queen Mother, the Duke of Anjou, Marshals de Tavannes and de Retz, the Duke of Nevers, and the Chancellor de Birag met in the King's closet, who was irresolute and still talking of exacting from the Guises heavy vengeance for the murderous attack upon Coligny. 
Catherine, quote, represented to him that the party of the Huguenots had already seized this occasion for taking up arms against him. They had sent, she said, several dispatches to Germany to procure a levy of ten thousand writers, and to the cantons of the Swiss for another levy of ten thousand foot. The French captains, partisans of the Huguenots, had already, most of them, set out to raise levies within the kingdom. Time and place of meeting had already been assigned and determined." all the catholics on their side added catherine disgusted with so long a war and harassed by so many kinds of calamities have resolved to put a stop to them they have decided amongst them to elect a captain-general to form a league offensive and defensive against the huguenots the whole of france would thus be seen armed and divided into two great parties between which the king would remain isolated without any command and with about as much obedience for so much ruin and calamity in anticipation and already within a finger's reach and for the slaughter of so many thousands of men a preventive may be found in a single sword thrust all that is necessary is to kill the admiral the head and front of all the civil wars the designs and the enterprises of the huguenots will die with him and the catholics satisfied with the sacrifice of two or three men will remain forever in obedience to the king End quote. Quote, at the beginning continues the duke of anjou in his account the king would not by any means consent to have the admiral touched feeling however some fear of the danger which we had so well depicted and represented to him he desired that in a case of such importance every one should at once state his opinion when each of those present had spoken the king appeared still undecided the queen mother then resolved quote, to let him hear the truth in toto from marshal de retz from whom she knew that he would take it better than from any other says his sister marguerite de valois in her memoir as one who was more in his confidence and favour than any other the witch came to see him in the evening about nine or ten and told him that as his faithful servant he could not conceal from him the danger he was in if he were to abide by his resolution to do justice on m de guise because it was necessary that he should know that the attack upon the admiral was not m de guise's doing alone but that my brother henry the king of poland afterwards king of france and the queen my mother had been concerned in it which m de guise and his friends would not fail to reveal and which would place his majesty in a position of great danger and embarrassment End quote. towards midnight the queen mother went down to the king followed by her son henry and four other counsellors they found the king more put out than ever the conversation began again and resolved itself into a regular attack upon the king Quote, the guises he was told will denounce the king himself together with his mother and brother the huguenots will believe that the king was in concert with the party and they will take the whole royal family to task war is inevitable better to win a battle in paris where we hold all the chiefs in our clutches than put it to hazard in the field after a struggle of an hour and a half charles in a violent state of agitation still hesitated when the queen mother fearing lest if there were further delay all would be discovered said to him permit me and your brother sir to retire to some other part of the kingdom charles rose from his seat by god's death said he since you think proper to kill the admiral i consent but all the huguenots in paris as well in order that there remain not one to reproach me afterwards give the orders at once End quote and he went back into his room. In order to relieve and satisfy her own passions and those of her favorite son, which were fear and love of power, the queen mother had succeeded in working her king's son into a fit of weakness and mad anger. Anxious to profit by it, quote, she gave orders on the instant for the signal, which was not to have been given until an hour before daybreak, says de Tout and instead of the bell at the palace of justice the tocsin was sounded by the bell at saint germain au charrois which was nearer End quote. even before the king had given his formal consent the projectors of the outrage had carefully prepared for its execution they had apportioned out amongst themselves or to their agents the different quarters of the city 
the guises had reserved for themselves that in which they considered they had personal vengeance as well as religious enmity to satisfy the neighbourhood of saint germain le charrois and especially rue de bétisy and rue des fosses saint germain awakened by the noise around his house and before long by arquebus shots fired in his courtyard coligny understood what was going to happen he jumped out of bed put on his dressing-gown and as he stood leaning against the wall he said to the clergyman merlin who was sitting up with him quote, monsieur merlin say me a prayer i commit my soul to my saviour one of his gentlemen cornaton entered the room quote, what is the meaning of this riot asked ambrose par who had also remained with the admiral quote, my lord said cornaton to coligny it is god calling us End quote. Quote, I have long been ready to die, said the admiral, but you, my friends, save yourselves if it is still possible. End quote. All ran upstairs and escaped, the majority by the roof. A German servant, Nicholas Miss, alone remained with the admiral, quote, as little concerned, says Cornaton, as if there were nothing going on around him. End quote. The door of his room was forced. Two men, servants of the Guises, entered first. One of them, Bem, attached to the Duke of Guise's own person, came forward, saying, quote, Art thou not the admiral? End quote. Quote, Young man, said Coligny, thou comest against a wounded and an aged man. Thou'lt not shorten my life by much. End quote. Bem plunged into his stomach a huge pointed boar spear, which he had in his hand, and then struck him on the head with it. Coligny fell, saying, quote, If it were but a man, but tis a horse boy. End quote. Others came in and struck him in their turn. Quote, Bem, shouted the Duke of Guise from the courtyard, hast done. End quote. Quote, tis all over, my lord, was the answer, and the murderers threw the body out of the window, where it stuck for an instant, either accidentally or voluntarily, and as if to defend a last remnant of life. Then it fell. The two great lords who were waiting for it turned over the corpse, wiped the blood off the face, and said, quote, Faith, tis he, sure enough. End quote. Some have said that Guise gave him a kick in the face. A servant of the Duke of Nevers cut off the head, and took it to the Queen Mother, the King, and the Duke of Anjou. It was embalmed with care, to be sent, it is said, to Rome. What is certain is that a few days afterwards, Mandelot, governor of Lyon, wrote to the king, quote, I have received, sir, the letter your majesty was pleased to write to me, whereby you tell me that you have been advertised that there is a man who has set out from over yonder with the head he took from the admiral after killing him, for to convey it to Rome, and to take care, when the said man arrives in this city, to have him arrested, and to take from him the said head whereupon i incontinently gave such strict orders that if he presents himself the command which it pleases your majesty to lay upon me will be acted upon there hath not passed for these last few days by way of this city any person going romewards save a squire of the duke of guise's named paul the which had departed four hours previously on the same day on which i received the said letter from your majesty End quote. We do not find anywhere, in reference to this incident, any information going further than this reply of the governor of Lyon to Charles the Ninth. However it may be, the remains of Coligny's body, after having been hung and exposed for some days on the gibbet of Montfaucon, were removed by Duke Francis de Montmorency, the admiral's relative and friend, who had them transferred to Chantilly and interred in the chapel of the castle after having been subjected in the course of three centuries at one time to oblivion and at others to diverse transferences these sad relics of a great man a great christian and a great patriot have been resting for the last two and twenty years in the very castle of chatillon sur loin his ancestor's own domain having once more become the property of a relative of his family the duke of luxembourg to whom count anatole de montesquieu transferred them and who in eighteen fifty one had them sealed up in a bit of wall in ruins at the foot of an old tower under the site of the bedchamber of the duchesses of chantillon where in all probability coligny was born the more tardy the homage the greater 
the actual murderers of Coligny, the real projectors of the St. Bartholomew, Catherine de' Medici and her son the Duke of Anjou, at the very moment when they had just ordered the massacre, were seized with a fright at the first sound of their crime. The Duke of Anjou finishes his story with this page. Quote, After but two hours' rest during the night, just as the day was beginning to break, the King, the Queen my mother, and I went to the frontal of the Louvre adjoining the tennis court into a room which looks upon the area of the stable yard to see the commencement of the work we had not been there long when as we were weighing the issues and the consequence of so great an enterprise on which sooth to say we had up to that time scarcely bestowed a thought we heard a pistol shot fired i could not say in what spot or whether it knocked over anybody but well know i that the sound wounded all three of us so deeply in spirit that it knocked over our senses and judgment stricken with terror and apprehension at the great troubles which were then about to set in to prevent them we sent a gentleman at once and with all haste to m de guise to tell him and command him expressly from us to retire into his quarters and be very careful to take no steps against the admiral this single command putting a stop to everything else because it had been determined that in no spot in the city should any steps be taken until as a preliminary the admiral had been killed but soon afterwards the gentleman returning told us that m de guise had answered him that the command came too late that the admiral was dead and the work was begun throughout the rest of the city so we went back to our original determination and let ourselves follow the thread and the course of the enterprise End quote. The enterprise, in fact, followed its thread and natural course without its being in the power of anybody to arrest or direct it it had been absolutely necessary to give information of it the evening before to the provost of tradesmen of paris le charron president in the court of taxation or board of excise and to the chief men of the city according to brantome quote, they made great difficulties in imported conscience into the matter but m de tavannes in the king's presence rebuked them strongly and threatened them that if they did not make themselves busy the king would have them hanged the poor devils unable to do aught else thereupon answered ha is that the way you take it sir and you monsieur we swear to you that you shall hear news thereof for we will ply our hands so well right and left that the memory shall abide for ever of a right well kept saint bartholomew End quote. Quote, wherein they did not fail continues brantome but they did not like it at first End quote. According to other reports, the first opposition of the provost of tradesmen, the Charon, was not without effect. It was not till the next day that he let the orders he had received take their course, and it was necessary to apply to his predecessor in his office, the ex-provost Marcel, a creature of the Queen Mother's, to set in motion the turbulent and the fanatical amongst the populace, quote, which it never does to blood for it is afterwards more savage than is desirable once let loose upon the st bartholomew the parisian populace was eager indeed but not alone in its eagerness for the work of massacre the gentlemen of the court took part in it passionately from a spirit of vengeance from religious hatred from the effect of smelling blood from covetousness at the prospect of confiscations at hand Telligny, the admiral's son-in-law, had taken refuge on a roof. The Duke of Anjou's guards make him a mark for their arquebus. La Rochefoucauld, with whom the king had been laughing and joking up to eleven o'clock the evening before, heard a knocking at his door in the king's name. It is opened. Enter six men in masks and poniard him. The new queen of Navarre, Marguerite de Valois, had gone to bed by express order of her mother Catherine. Quote, just as i was asleep says she behold a man knocking with feet and hands at the door and shouting navarre navarre my nurse thinking it was the king my husband runs quickly to the door and opens it it was a gentleman named m de larin who had a sword cut on the elbow a gash from a halberd on the arm and was still pursued by four archers who all came after him into my bedroom he wishing to save himself threw himself on to my bed as for me feeling this man who had hold of me i threw myself out of bed towards the wall and he after me still holding me round the body i did not know this man and i could not tell whether he had come thither to offer me violence or whether the archers were after him in particular or after me we both screamed and each of us was as much frightened as the other 
At last it pleased God that M. de Nanquet, captain of the guards, came in, who, finding me in this plight, though he felt compassion, could not help laughing, and flying into a great rage with the archers for this indiscretion, he made them be gone, and gave me the life of that poor man who had hold of me, whom I had put to bed, and attended to in my closet until he was well. End, quote. End of section 43《セクション44 of a Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 33 Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, 1560 to 1574, Part 10. We might multiply indefinitely these anecdotical scenes of the massacre, most of them brutally ferocious, others painfully pathetic, some generous and calculated to preserve the credit of humanity amidst one of its most direful aberrations. History must show no pity for the vices and crimes of men, whether princes or people, and it is her duty as well as her right to depict them so truthfully that men's souls and imaginations may be sufficiently impressed by them to conceive disgust and horror at them. But it is not by dwelling upon them and by describing them minutely, as if she had to exhibit a gallery of monsters and madmen, that history can lead men's minds to sound judgments and salutary impressions. It is necessary to have moral sense and good sense always in view, and set high above great social troubles, just as sailors, to struggle courageously against the tempest, need to see a luminous corner where the sky is visible, and a star which reveals to them the port. We take no pleasure, and we see no use, in setting forth in detail the works of evil. We should be inclined to fear that by familiarity with such a spectacle men would lose the perception of good and cease to put hope in its legitimate and ultimate superiority. Nor will we pause either to discuss the secondary questions which meet us at the period of which we are telling the story. For example, the question whether Charles the Ninth fired with his own hand on his Protestant subjects, whom he had delivered over to the evil passions of the aristocracy and of the populace, or whether the balcony from which he is said to have indulged in this ferocious pastime existed at that time, in the sixteenth century, at the palace of the Louvre and overlooking the Seine. These questions are not without historic interest, and it is well for learned men to study them, but we consider them incapable of being resolved with certainty, and even were they resolved, they would not give the key to the character of Charles the Ninth, and to the portion which appertains to him, in the deed of cruelty with which his name remains connected. The great historic fact of the Saint Bartholomew is what we confine ourselves to, and we have attempted to depict it accurately as regards Charles the Ninth's hesitations and equally feverish resolutions, his intermixture of open heartedness and double dealing in his treatment of Coligny, towards whom he felt himself drawn without quite understanding him, and his puerile weakness in presence of his mother, whom he feared far more than he trusted. When he had plunged into the orgies of the massacre, when after having said, Kill them all, he had seen the slaughter of his companions in his royal amusements, Teligny and La Rochefoucauld, Charles the Ninth abandoned himself to a fit of mad passion. He was asked whether the two young Huguenot princes, Henry of Navarre and Henry de Conde, were to be killed also. Marshal de Retz had been in favor of it, Marshal de Tavannes had been opposed to it, and it was decided to spare them. On the very night of the Saint Bartholomew, the king sent for them both. Quote, I mean for the future, said he, to have but one religion in my kingdom, the mass or death, make your choice. End quote. Henry of Navarre reminded the king of his promises, and asked for time to consider. Henry de Conde quote, answered that he would remain firm in the true religion, though he should have to give up his life for it. End quote. Quote, seditious madman, rebel, and son of a rebel, said Charles, if within three days you do not change your language, I will have you strangled. End quote. At this first juncture, the king saved from the massacre none but his surgeon, Ambrose Parr, and his nurse, both Huguenot. On the very night after the murder of Coligny, he sent for Ambrose Parr into his chamber, and made him go into his wardrobe, says Brantome, quote, ordering him not to stir, and saying that it was not reasonable that one who was able to be of service to a whole little world should be thus massacred. A few days afterwards, quote, Now, said the king to Pierre, you really must be a Catholic. 
Quote, by God's light, answered Pere, I think you must surely remember, sir, to have promised me, in order that I might never disobey you, never, on the other hand, to bid me do four things, find my way back into my mother's womb, catch myself fighting in a battle, leave your service, or go to Mass. End quote. After a moment's silence, Charles rejoined, quote, Ambrose, I don't know what has come over me for the last two or three days, but I feel my mind and my body greatly excited, in fact, just as if I had a fever. Meseems every moment just as much waking as sleeping that those massacred corpses keep appearing to me with their faces all hideous and covered with blood. I wish the helpless and the innocent had not been included. End quote. Quote, and in consequence of the reply made to him, adds Sully in his Economie Royale, page 244 in the Petitot collection, he next day issued his orders, prohibiting, on pain of death, any slaying or plundering, the which were nevertheless very ill observed, the animosities and fury of the populace being too much inflamed to defer to them. End quote. The historians, Catholic or Protestant, contemporary or researchful, differ widely as to the number of the victims in this cruel massacre. According to de Thou, there were about two thousand persons killed in Paris the first day. D'Aubigne says three thousand. Brantome speaks of four thousand bodies that Charles the Ninth might have seen floating down the Seine. La Popeliniere reduces them to one thousand. There is to be found in the account books of the city of Paris a payment to the grave diggers of the cemetery of the Innocents for having interred eleven hundred dead bodies stranded at the turns of the Seine near Chaillot, Auteuil, and Saint Cloud. It is probable that many corpses were carried still farther, and the corpses were not all thrown into the river. The uncertainty is still greater when one comes to speak of the number of victims throughout the whole of France. De Thou estimates it at thirty thousand, Sully at seventy thousand, Perifix, Archbishop of Paris in the seventeenth century, raises it to one hundred thousand. Papirius Masson and de Villa reduce it to ten thousand, without clearly distinguishing between the massacre of Paris and those of the provinces. Other historians fix upon forty thousand. Great uncertainty also prevails as to the execution of the orders issued from Paris to the governors at the provinces. The names of the Viscount d'Ordre, governor of Bayonne, and of John le Hennuyer, bishop of Lisieux, have become famous from their having refused to take part in the massacre, but the authenticity of the letter from the Viscount d'Ort to Charles the Ninth is disputed, though the fact of his resistance appears certain. And as for the bishop, John le Hennuyer, M. de Formeville seems to us to have demonstrated in his Histoire de l'Ancien Évêche, Comte de Lisieux, pages 299 to 314, quote, that there was no occasion to save the Protestants of Lisieux in 1572, because they did not find themselves in any danger of being massacred, and that the merit of it cannot be attributed to anybody, to the bishop, le Hennuyer, any more than to Captain Fumichon, governor of the town. It was only the general course of events, and the discretion of the municipal officers of Lisieux that did it all. End quote. One thing which is quite true, and which is good to call to mind in the midst of so great a general criminality, is that at many spots in France it met with a refusal to be associated in it. President Genet at Dijon, the Count de Tende in Provence, Philibert de Leguiche at Macon, Tanguy le Venard de Carouge at Rouen, the Count de Gord in Dauphiny, and many other chiefs, military or civil, openly repudiated the example set by the murderers of Paris. And the municipal body of Nantes, a very Catholic town, took upon this subject, as has been proved from authentic documents by M. Verigot, pastor of the Reformed Church at Nantes, a resolution which does honour to its patriotic firmness as well as to its Christian loyalty. A great good man, a great functionary, and a great scholar, in disgrace for six years past, the Chancellor Michael de l'Hospital received about this time in his retreat at Vignier, a visit from a great philosopher, Michael de Montaigne, quote, anxious, said the visitor, to come and testify to you the honour and reverence with which I regard your competence and the special qualities which are in you, for as to the extraneous and the fortuitous, it is not to my taste to put them down in the account, End quote. Montaigne chose a happy moment for disregarding all but the personal and special qualities of the Chancellor. Shortly after his departure, L'Hospital was warned that some sinister-looking horsemen were coming, and that he would do well to take care of himself. Quote, no matter, no matter, he answered, it will be as God pleases when my hour has come. End quote. Next day he was told that those men were approaching his house, and he was asked whether he would not have the gates shut against them, and have them fired upon in case they attempted to force an entrance. 
Quote, no, said he, if the small gate will not do for them to enter by, let the big one be opened. End quote. A few hours afterwards, L'Hospital was informed that the king and the queen mother were sending other horsemen to protect him. Quote, I didn't know, said the old man, that I had deserved either death or pardon. End quote. A rumor of his death flew abroad amongst his enemies, who rejoiced at it. Quote, we are told, wrote Cardinal Granvelle to his agent at Brussels, October 8, 1572, that the king has had Chancellor de l'Hospital and his wife dispatched, which would be a great blessing. End quote. The agent, more enlightened than his chief, denied the fact, adding, quote, They are a fine bit of rubbish left, L'Hospital and his wife. End quote. Charles the Ninth wrote to his old adviser to reassure him, quote, Loving you as I do. End quote. Some time after, however, he demanded of him his resignation of the title of Chancellor, wishing to confer it upon La Birague, to reward him for his cooperation in the St. Bartholomew. L'Hospital gave in his resignation on the 1st of February, 1573, and died six weeks afterwards, on the 18th of March. Quote, I am just at the end of my long journey, and shall have no more business but with God, he wrote to the king and the queen mother. Quote, I implore him to give you his grace, and to lead you with his hand in all your affairs, and in the government of this great and beautiful kingdom, which he hath committed to your keeping, with all gentleness and clemency towards your good subjects, in imitation of himself, who is good, and patient in bearing our burdens, and prompt to forgive you and pardon you everything. End quote. From the 24th to the 31st of August, 1572, the bearing and conduct of Charles the Ninth and the Queen Mother produced nothing but a confused mass of orders and counter-orders, affirmations and denials, words and actions incoherent and contradictory, all caused by a habit of lying and the desire of escaping from the peril or embarrassment of the moment. On the very first day of the massacre, about midday, the provost of tradesmen and the sheriffs, who had not taken part in the, quote, Paris Matins, end quote, came complaining to the king, quote, of the pillage, sack, and murder which were being committed by many belonging to the suite of his majesty, as well as to those of the princes, princesses, and lords of the court, by noblemen, archers, and soldiers of the guard, as well as by all sorts of gentry and people mixed with them and under their wing, end quote. Charles ordered them, quote, to get on horseback, take with them all the forces in the city, and keep their eyes open day and night to put a stop to the said murder, pillage, and sedition arising, he said, because of the rivalry between the houses of Guise and Châtillon, and because they of Guise had been threatened by the admiral's friends, who suspected them of being at the bottom of the hurt inflicted upon him, end quote. He, the same day, addressed to the governors of the provinces a letter in which he invested the disturbance with the same character, and gave the same explanation of it. The Guises complained violently at being thus disavowed by the king, who had the face to throw upon them alone the odium of the massacre which he had ordered. Next day, August 25, the king wrote to all his agents, at home and abroad, another letter, affirming that, quote, what had happened at Paris had been done solely to prevent the execution of an accursed conspiracy which the admiral and his allies had concocted against him, his mother, and his brothers, end quote. And on the 26th of August, he went with his two brothers to hold in state a bed of justice, and make to the Parliament the same declaration against Coligny and his party. Quote, he could not, he said, have parried so fearful a blow, but by another very violent one, and he wished all the world to know that what had happened at Paris had been done not only with his consent, but by his express command. End quote. Whereupon it was enjoined upon the court, says de Thou, quote, to cause investigations to be made as to the conspiracy of Coligny, and to decree what it should consider proper, conformably with the laws and with justice. End quote. The next day but one, August 28, appeared a royal manifesto, running, quote, The king willeth and intendeth that all noblemen and others whosoever of the religion styled reformed be empowered to live and abide in all security and liberty with their wives, children, and families, in their houses, as they have heretofore done, and were empowered to do, by the benefit of the edicts of pacification." and nevertheless for to obviate the troubles scandals suspicion and distrust which might arise by reason of the services and assemblies that might take place both in the houses of the said noblemen and elsewhere as is permitted by the aforesaid edicts of pacification his majesty doth lay very express inhibitions and prohibitions upon all the said noblemen and others of the said religion against holding assemblies on any account whatsoever until that by the said lord the king after having provided for the tranquillity of his kingdom, it be otherwise ordained. 
and that on pain of confiscation of body and goods in case of disobedience. End quote. These tardy and lying accusations officially brought against Coligny and his friends. These promises of liberty and security for the Protestants renewed in the terms of the edicts of pacification, and in point of fact annulled at the very moment at which they were being renewed. The massacre continuing here and there in France, at one time with the secret connivance, and at another notwithstanding the publicly given word of the king and the queen mother. All this policy, at one and the same time violent and timorous, incoherent and stubborn, produced amongst the Protestants two contrary effects. Some grew frightened, others angry. At court, under the direct influence of the king and his surroundings, quote, submission to the powers that be, end quote, prevailed. Many fled. Others, without abjuring their religion, abjured their party. The two reformer princes, Henry of Navarre and Henry de Conde, attended Mass on the 29th of September, and on the 3rd of October wrote to the Pope, deploring their errors and giving hopes of their conversion. Far away from Paris, in the mountains of the Pyrenees and of Languedoc, in the towns where the reformers were numerous and confident, at Sancerre, at Montauban, at Nîmes, at La Rochelle, the spirit of resistance carried the day. An assembly, meeting at Milau, drew up a provisional ordinance for the government of the Reformed Church, quote, until it please God, who has the hearts of kings in his keeping, to change that of King Charles the Ninth, and restore the state of France to good order, or to raise up such neighboring prince as is manifestly marked out, by his virtue and by distinguishing signs, for to be the liberator of this poor, afflicted people. End quote. In November 1572, the fourth religious war broke out. The siege of La Rochelle was its only important event. Charles the Ninth and his counsellors exerted themselves in vain to avoid it. There was everything to disquiet them in this enterprise. So sudden a revival of the religious war after the grand blow they had just struck, the passionate energy manifested by the Protestants in asylum at La Rochelle, and the help they had been led to hope for from Queen Elizabeth, whom England would never have forgiven for indifference in this cause. Marshal de Biron, who was known to favor the reformers, was appointed governor of La Rochelle, but he could not succeed in gaining admittance within the walls, even alone and for the purpose of parleying with the inhabitants. The king heard that one of the bravest Protestant chiefs, La New Iron Arm, had retired to Mons with Prince Louis of Nassau. The Duke of Longueville, his old enemy, induced him to go to Paris. The king received him with great favor, gave up to him the property of Teligny, whose sister La Noue had married, and pressed him to go to La Rochelle and prevail upon the inhabitants to keep the peace. La Noue refused, saying that he was not at all fitted for this commission. The king promised that he would ask nothing of him which could wound his honor. La Noue at last consented and repaired, about the end of November 1572, to a village close by La Rochelle, whither it was arranged that deputies from the town would come and confer with him and they came in fact but at their first meeting quote, we are come they said to confer with m de la noue but we do not see him here end quote. la noue got angry quote, i am astonished he said that you have so soon forgotten one who has received so many wounds and lost an arm fighting for you end quote. Quote, yes there is a m de la noue who was one of us and who bravely defended our cause but he never flattered us with vain hopes he never invited us to conferences to betray us end quote. La Noue got more fiercely angry. Quote, All I ask of you is to report to the Senate what I have to say to them. End quote. They complied, and came back with permission for him to enter the town. The people looked at him, as he passed, with a mixture of distrust and interest. After hearing him, the Senate rejected the pacific overtures made to them by La Noue. Quote, We have no mind to treat specially and for ourselves alone. Our cause is that of God, and of all the churches of France. We will accept nothing but what shall seem proper to all our brethren. For yourself, we give you your choice between three propositions. Remain in our town as a simple burgess, and we will give you quarters. If you like better to be our commandant, all the nobility and the people will gladly have you for their head, and will fight with confidence under your orders. If neither of these propositions suits you, you shall be welcome to go aboard one of our vessels, and cross over to England, where you will find many of your friends." La Noue did not hesitate. He became under the authority of the mayor Jacques-Henri, the military head of La Rochelle, whither Charles the Ninth had sent him to make peace the king authorized him to accept this singular position 
Lanou conducted himself so honorably in it, and everybody was so convinced of his good faith as well as bravery, that for three months he commanded inside La Rochelle and superintended the preparations for defense, all the while trying to make the chances of peace prevail. At the end of February, 1573, he recognized the impossibility of his double commission, and he went away from La Rochelle, leaving the place in better condition than that in which he had found it, without either King or Rochelle's considering that they had any right to complain of him. End of section 44. Section 45 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 33. Charles the Ninth and the Religious Wars, 1560-1574, to Part 11. Biron first, and then the Duke of Anjou in person, took the command of the siege. They brought up, it is said, forty thousand men and sixty pieces of artillery. The Rochelis, for defence of strength, had but twenty-two companies of refugees or inhabitants, making in all thirty-one hundred men. The siege lasted from the twenty-sixth of February to the thirteenth of June, 1573. Six assaults were made on the place. In the last, the ladders had been set at night against the wall of what was called Gospel Bastion. The Duke of Guise, at the head of the assailants, had escalated the breach, but there he discovered a new ditch, and a new rampart erected inside. And confronted by these unforeseen obstacles, the men recoiled and fell back. La Rochelle was saved. Charles the Ninth was more and more desirous of peace. His brother, the Duke of Anjou, had just been elected King of Poland. Charles the Ninth was anxious for him to leave France and go to take possession of his new kingdom. Thanks to these complications, the Peace of La Rochelle was signed on the 6th of July, 1573. Liberty of creed and worship was recognized in the three towns of La Rochelle, Montauban, and Nîmes. They were not obliged to receive any royal garrison on condition of giving hostages to be kept by the king for two years. Liberty of worship throughout the extent of their jurisdiction continued to be recognized in the case of Lord's High Judiciary. Everywhere else the reformers had promises of not being persecuted for their creed, under the obligation of never holding an assembly of more than ten persons at a time. These were the most favorable conditions they had yet obtained. Certainly this was not what Charles the Ninth had calculated upon when he consented to the massacre of the Protestants. Quote, provided, he had said, that not a single one is left to reproach me. End quote. The massacre had been accomplished almost without any resistance but that offered by certain governors of provinces or towns, who had refused to take part in it. The chief leader of French Protestantism, Coligny, had been the first victim. Far more than that, the Parliament of Paris had accepted the royal lie which accused Coligny of conspiring for the downfall of the king and the royal house. A decree on that very ground sentenced to condemnation the memory, the family, and the property of Coligny, with all sorts of rigorous, we should rather say atrocious, circumstances. And after having succeeded so well against the Protestants, Charles the Ninth saw them recovering again, renewing the struggle with him, and wresting from him such concessions as he had never yet made to them. More than ever might he exclaim, quote, Then I shall never have rest. End quote. The news that came to him from abroad was not more calculated to satisfy him. The St. Bartholomew had struck Europe with surprise and horror, not only amongst the princes and in the countries that were Protestant, in England, Scotland, and Northern Europe, but in Catholic Germany itself there was a very strong feeling of reprobation. The Emperor Maximilian II and the Elector Palatine Frederick III, called the Pious, showed it openly. When the Duke of Anjou, elected King of Poland, went through Germany to go and take possession of his kingdom, he was received at Heidelberg with premeditated coolness. When he arrived at the gate of the castle, not a soul went to meet him. Alone he ascended the steps, and found in the hall a picture representing the massacre of St. Bartholomew. The elector called his attention to the portraits of the principal victims, amongst others that of Coligny, and at table he was waited upon solely by French Protestant refugees. 
At Rome itself, in the midst of official satisfaction and public demonstrations of it exhibited by the pontifical court, the truth came out, and Pope Gregory the Thirteenth was touched by it when certain of my lords the cardinals, who were beside him, quote, asked wherefore he wept, and was sad at so goodly a dispatch of those wretched folk, enemies of God and of his holiness. I weep, said the Pope, at the means the king used, exceeding unlawful and forbidden of God, for to inflict such punishment. I fear that one will fall upon him, and that he will not have a very long bout of it, or will not live very long. I fear, too, that amongst so many dead folk there died as many innocent as guilty. End quote. Only the King of Spain, Philip the Second, a fanatical despot and pitiless persecutor, showed complete satisfaction at the event and he offered Charles the Ninth the assistance of his army, if he had need of it, against what there was remaining of heretics in his kingdom. Charles the Ninth had not mind or character sufficiently sound or sufficiently strong to support without great perturbation the effect of so many violent, repeated, and often contradictory impressions. Catherine de' Medici had brought up her three sons solely with a view of having their confidence and implicit obedience. Quote, all the actions of the Queen Mother, said the Venetian ambassador Sigismund Cavalli, who had for a long while resided at her court, have always been prompted and regulated by one single passion, the passion of ruling. End quote. Her son Charles had yielded to it without an effort in his youth. Quote, he was accustomed to say that until he was five and twenty he meant to play the fool, that is to say, to think of nothing but of enjoying his heyday. Accordingly, he showed aversion for speaking and treating of business, putting himself altogether in his mother's hands. Now he no longer thinks and acts in the same way. I have been told that since the late events he requires to have the same thing said more than three times over by the Queen before obeying her. End quote. It was not with regard to his mother only that Charles had changed. Quote, his looks, says Cavalli, have become melancholy and sombre. In his conversations and audiences he does not look the speaker in the face. He droops his head, closes his eyes, opens them all at once, and as if he found the movement painful, closes them again with no less suddenness. It is feared that the demon of vengeance has possessed him. He used to be merely severe. It is feared that he is becoming cruel. He is temperate in his diet, drinks nothing but water. To tire himself at any price is his object." He remains on horseback for twelve or fourteen consecutive hours, and so he goes, hunting and coursing through the woods the same animal, the stag, for two or three days, never stopping but to eat, and never resting but for an instant during the night. He was passionately fond of all bodily exercises, the practice of arms, and the game of tennis. Quote, he had a forge set up for himself, says Brantome, and I have seen him forging cannon and horseshoes and other things as stoutly as the most robust farriers and forgemen. End quote. He at the same time showed a keen and intelligent interest in intellectual works and pleasures. He often had a meeting in the evening of poets, men of letters and artists, Ronsard, Amadis Jamin, Jodel, Dorat, Baif. In 1570 he gave them letters patent for the establishment of an academy of poetry and music, the first literary society founded in France by a king, but it disappeared amidst the civil wars. Charles the Ninth himself sang in the choir, and he composed a few hunting airs. Ronsard was a favorite, almost a friend, with him. He used to take him with him on his trips, and give him quarters in his palace, and there was many an interchange of verse between them, in which Ronsard did not always have the advantage. Charles gave a literary outlet to his passion for hunting. He wrote a little treatise entitled La Chasse Royale, which was not published until 1625, and of which M. Henri Chevreul brought out in 1857 a charming and very correct edition. Charles the Ninth dedicated it to his lieutenant of the hunt, Mesnil, in terms of such modest and affectionate simplicity that they deserve to be kept in remembrance. Quote, Mesnil, said the king, I should feel myself far too ungrateful and expect to be chidden for presumption if in this little treatise that I am minded to make upon stag-hunting I did not, before any one begins to read it, avow and confess that I learned from you what little I know. I beg you also, Mesnil, to be pleased to correct and erase what there is wrong in the said treatise, the which, if peradventure it is so done that there is nothing more required than to reword and alter, the credit will be firstly yours for having so well taught me, and then mine for having so well remembered. Well, then, having been taught by so good a master, I will be bold enough to essay it, begging you to accept it as heartily as I present it and dedicate it to you. End quote. 
These details and this quotation are allowable in order to shed full light upon the private and incoherent character of this king, who bears the responsibility of one of the most tragic events in French history. In the spring of 1574, at the age of twenty-three years and eleven months, and after a reign of eleven years and six months, Charles the Ninth was attacked by an inflammatory malady, which brought on violent hemorrhage. He was revisited in his troubled sleep by the same bloody visions about which, a few days after the St. Bartholomew, he had spoken to Ambrose Père. He no longer retained in his room anybody but two of his servants and his nurse, quote, of whom he was very fond, although she was a Huguenot, end quote, says the contemporary chronicler Peter de l'Estoile. Quote, when she had lain down upon a chest, and was just beginning to doze, hearing the king moaning, weeping, and sighing, she went full gently up to the bed. Ah, nurse, nurse, said the king, what bloodshed and what murders! Ah, what evil counsel have I followed! Oh, my God, forgive me them, and have mercy upon me, if it may please thee. I know not what hath come to me, so bewildered and agitated do they make me. What will be the end of it all? What shall I do? I am lost, I see it well. Then said the nurse to him, Sir, the murders be on the heads of those who made you do them. Of yourself, sir, you never could. And since you are not consenting thereto, and are sorry therefore, believe that God will not put them down to your account, and will hide them with the cloak of justice of his Son, to whom alone you must have recourse. But for God's sake, let your majesty cease weeping. And thereupon, having been to fetch him a pocket-handkerchief, because his own was soaked with tears, after that the king had taken it from her hand, he signed to her to go away and leave him to his rest. End quote. On Sunday, May 30, 1574, Whit Sunday, about three in the afternoon, Charles the Ninth expired, after having signed an ordinance conferring the regency upon his mother Catherine, quote, who accepted it, was the expression in the letters patent, at the request of the Duke of Alençon, the King of Navarre, and other princes and peers of France, end quote. According to Daubing, Charles used often to say of his brother Henry that, quote, when he had a kingdom on his hands, the administration would find him out, and that he would disappoint those who had hopes of him. End quote. The last words he said were, quote, that he was glad not to have left any young child to succeed him, very well knowing that France needs a man, and that with a child the king and the reign are unhappy. End, quote. End of section 45. Section 46 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 34. Henry III and the Religious Wars, 1574-1589, to Part 1. Though elected King of Poland on the 9th of May, 1573, Henry, Duke of Anjou, had not yet left Paris at the end of the summer. Impatient at his slowness to depart, Charles the Ninth said, with his usual oath, quote, by God's death, my brother or I must at once leave the kingdom. My mother shall not succeed in preventing it. End quote. Quote, go, said Catherine to Henry, you will not be away long. End quote. She foresaw, with no great sorrow, one would say, the death of Charles the Ninth, and her favourite son's accession to the throne of France. Having arrived in Poland on the twenty fifth of January, fifteen seventy four, and been crowned at Krakow on the twenty fourth of February, Henry had been scarcely four months king of Poland when he was apprised about the middle of June that his brother Charles had lately died on the thirtieth of May, and that he was king of France. Quote, Do not waste your time in deliberating, said his French advisers. You must go and take possession of the throne of France without abdicating that of Poland. Go at once and without fuss. End quote. Henry followed this counsel. He left Krakow on the 18th of June, with a very few attendants. Some Poles were apprehensive of his design, but said nothing about it. He went a quarter of a league on foot to reach the horses which were awaiting him, set off at a gallop, rode all night, and arrived next day early on the frontier of Moravia, an Austrian province. The royal flight created a great uproar at Krakow. The noblemen, and even the peasants, armed with stakes and scythes, set out in pursuit of their king. 
They did not come up with him. They fell in with his chancellor only, Guy de Fort, Sieur de Pibrac, who had missed him at the appointed meeting-place, and who, whilst seeking to rejoin him, had lost himself in the forests and marshes, concealed himself in the osiers and reeds, and been obliged now and then to dip his head in the mud to avoid the arrows discharged on all sides by the peasants in pursuit of the king. Being arrested by some people who were for taking him back to Krakow and paying him out for his complicity in his master's flight, he with great difficulty obtained his release and permission to continue his road. Destined to become more celebrated by his writings and by his Catrin Moreau than by his courtly adventures, Pibrac rejoined King Henry at Vienna, where the Emperor Maximilian II received him with great splendor delivered from fatigue and danger henry appeared to think of nothing but resting and diverting himself he tarried to his heart's content at vienna venice ferrara mantua and turin he was everywhere welcomed with brilliant entertainments which the emperor maximilian and the senators of venice accompanied with good advice touching the government of france in her religious troubles and the nominal sovereign of two kingdoms took nearly three months in going from that whence he had fled to that of which he was about to take possession having started from krakow on the eighteenth of june fifteen seventy four he did not arrive until the fifth of september at lyons whither the queen mother had sent his brother the duke of alencon and his brother-in-law the king of navarre to receive him going herself as far as bourgoin and dauphiny in order to be the first to see her darling son again the king's entry into France caused, says de Thou, a strange revulsion in all minds. Quote, During the lifetime of Charles the Ninth, none had seemed more worthy of the throne than Henry, and everybody desired to have him for master. But scarcely had he arrived when disgust set in, to the extent of auguring very ill of his reign. There was no longer any trace in this prince, who had been nursed, so to speak, in the lap of war, of that manly and warlike courage which had been so much admired he no longer rode on horseback he did not show himself amongst his people as his predecessors had been wont to do he was only to be seen shut up with a few favourites in a little painted boat which went up and down the sun he no longer took his meals without a balustrade which did not allow him to be approached by any hearer and if anybody had any petitions to present to him they had to wait for him as he came out from dinner when he took them as he hurried by for the greater part of the day he remained closeted with some young folks who alone had the prince's ear without anybody's knowing how they had arrived at this distinction whilst the great and those whose services were known could scarcely get speech of him showiness and effeminacy had taken the place of the grandeur and majesty which had formerly distinguished our kings the time was ill-chosen by Henry the Third for this change of habits, and for becoming an indolent and voluptuous king, set upon taking his pleasure in his court, and isolating himself from his people. The condition and ideas of France were also changing, but to issue in the assumption of quite a different character, and to receive development in quite a different direction. Catholics or Protestants, agents of the king's government or malcontents, all were getting a taste for, and adopting the practice, of independence, and of vigorous and spontaneous activity. The bonds of the feudal system were losing their hold, and were not yet replaced by those of a hierarchically organized administration. Religious creeds and political ideas were becoming, for thoughtful and straightforward spirits, rules of conduct, powerful motives of action, and they furnished the ambitious with effective weapons. The theologians of the Catholic Church and of the Reformed Churches, on one side the Cardinal of Lorraine, Cardinals Campeggi and Sadolette, and other learned priests or prelates, and on the other side Calvin, Theodore de Bise, Melanchthon and Busser, were working with zeal to build up into systems of dogma their interpretations of the great facts of Christianity, and they succeeded in implanting a passionate attachment to them in their flocks independently of these religious controversies superior minds profound lawyers learned scholars were applying their energies to founding on a philosophical basis and historic principles the organization of governments and the reciprocal rights of princes and peoples ramu one of the last and of the most to be lamented victims of the saint bartholomew 
Francis Hotman, who, in his Franco-Gallia, aspired to graft the new national liberties upon the primitive institutions of the Franks, Hubert Languet, the eloquent author of the Vindicici contra Tyrannos, or de la puissance légitime du prince cure le peuple, et du peuple sur le prince, John Baudin, the first in original merit amongst the publicists of the sixteenth century, in his Six Livres de la République, all these eminent men boldly tackled the great questions of political liberty or of legislative reforms. Le Contrun, that Republican Treatise by de la Boétie, written in 1546, and circulated at first in manuscript only, was inserted, between 1576 and 1578, in the Mémoire de l'État de France, and passionately extolled by the independent thinker Michael de Montaigne in his Essai, of which nine editions were published between 1580 and 1598, and evidently very much read in the world of letters. An intellectual movement so active and so powerful could not fail to have a potent effect on political life. Before the St. Bartholomew, the great religious and political parties, the Catholic and the Protestant, were formed and at grips. The House of Lorraine at the head of the Catholics, and the House of Bourbon, Condé, and Coligny at the head of the Protestants, with royalty trying feebly and vainly to maintain between them a hollow peace. To this stormy and precarious but organized and clearly defined condition, the St. Bartholomew had caused anarchy to succeed. Protestantism, vanquished but not destroyed, broke up into provincial and municipal associations without recognized and dominant heads, without discipline or combination in respect of either their present management or their ultimate end. Catholicism, though victorious, likewise underwent a break-up. Men of mark, towns and provinces would not accept the St. Bartholomew and its consequences. A new party, the party of the policists, sprang up opposed to the principle and abjuring the practice of persecution, having no mind to follow either the Catholics in their outrages or royalty in its tergiversations, and striving to maintain in the provinces and the towns, where it had the upper hand, enough of order and of justice to at least keep at a distance the civil war which was elsewhere raging. Languedoc owed to Marshal de Danville, second son of the constable Anne de Montmorency, this comparatively bearable position but the degree of security and of local peace which it offered the people was so imperfect so uncertain that the break-up of the country and of the state went still farther in a part of languedoc in the vivarais the inhabitants in order to put their habitations and their property in safety resolved to make a league amongst themselves without consulting any authority not even marshal de danville the peace-seeking governor of their province their treaty of alliance ran that arms should be laid down throughout the whole of the vivarais that none foreigner or native should be liable to trouble for the past that tillers of the soil and traders should suffer no detriment in person or property that all hostilities should cease in the towns and all forays in the country that there should everywhere be entire freedom for commerce that cattle which had been lifted should be immediately restored gratis that concerted action should be taken to get rid of the garrisons out of the country and to raise the fortresses according as the public weal might require and finally that whosoever should dare to violate these regulations should be regarded as a traitor and punished as a disturber of the public peace Quote, as soon as the different authorities in the state, Marshal de Danville as well as the rest, were informed of this novelty, says de Thou, they made every effort to prevent it from taking effect. Nothing could be of more dangerous example, they said, than to suffer the people to make treaties in this way, and on their own authority, without waiting for the consent of his majesty, or of those who represented him in the provinces." the folks of the vivarais on the contrary presumed to justify themselves by saying that the step they had taken did not in any way infringe the king's authority that it was rather an opening given by them for securely establishing tranquillity in the kingdom that nothing was more advantageous or could contribute more towards peace than to raise all those fortresses set up in the heart of the state which were like so many depots of revolt that by a diminution of the garrisons the revenues of his majesty would be proportionate augmented that at any rate there would result this advantage that the lands which formed almost the whole wealth of the kingdom would be cultivated 
that commerce would flourish and that the people delivered from fear of the many scoundrels who found a retreat in those places would at last be able to draw breath after the many misfortunes they had experienced End quote it was in this condition of disorganization and red-hot anarchy that henry the third on his return from poland and after the saint bartholomew found france it was in the face of all these forces full of life but scattered and excited one against another that with the aid of his mother catherine he had to re-establish unity in the state the effectiveness of the government and the public peace it was not a task for which the tact of an utterly corrupted woman and an irresolute prince sufficed what could the artful manoeuvrings of catherine and the waverings of henry the third do towards taming both catholics and protestants at the same time and obliging them to live at peace with one another under one equitable and effective power henry the fourth was as yet unformed nor was his hour yet come for this great work henry the third and catherine de medici failed in it completely their government of fifteen years served only to make them lose their reputation for ability and to aggravate for france the evils which it was their business to heal in fifteen seventy five a year only after henry the third's accession revolt penetrated to the royal household the duke of alencon the king's younger brother who since his brother's coronation took the title of duke of anjou escaped on the fifteenth of september from the louvre by a window and from paris by a hole made in the wall of circumvallation he fled to dreux a town in his appanage and put himself at the head of a large number of malcontents nobles and burgesses catholic and reformed mustered around him under this name of no religious significance between the two old parties on the seventeenth of september in his manifesto he gave as reasons for his revolt excessive taxation waste of the public revenues the feebleness of the royal authority incapable as it was of putting a stop to the religious troubles and the disgrace which had been inflicted upon himself quote, by pernicious ministers who desire to have the government in their sole patronage excluding from it the foremost and the most illustrious of the court and devouring all that there is remaining to the poor people End quote. He protested his devotion to the king his brother, at the same time declaring war against the Guises. King Henry of Navarre, testifying little sympathy with the Duke of Anjou, remained at court, abandoning himself apparently to his pleasures alone. Two of his faithful servants, the poet-historian Daubing was one of them, heard him one night sighing as he lay in bed, and humming half aloud this versicle from the eighty-eighth psalm. Quote, removed from friends i sigh alone in a loathed dungeon laid where none a visit will vouchsafe to me confined past hope of liberty End quote. Quote, sir said daubing eagerly it is true then that the spirit of god worketh and dwelleth in you still you sigh unto god because of the absence of your friends and faithful servants and all the while they are together sighing because of yours and labouring for your freedom but you have only tears in your eyes and they arms in hand are fighting your enemies as for us too we were talking of taking to flight to-morrow when your voice made us draw the curtain bethink you sir that after us the hands that will serve you would not dare refuse to employ poison and the knife henry much moved resolved to follow the example of the duke of anjou his departure was fixed for the third of february fifteen seventy six he went and slept at st lys hunted next day very early and on his return from hunting finding his horses baited and ready quote, what news he asked quote, sir said daubing we are betrayed the king knows all the road to death and shame is paris that to life and glory is anywhere else End quote. Quote, that is more than enough away replied henry they rode all night and arrived without misadventure at alencon two hundred and fifty gentlemen having been apprised in time went thither to join the king of navarre he pursued his road in their company from st lys to the loire he was silent but when he had crossed the river quote, praised be god who has delivered me he cried at paris they were the death of my mother there they killed the admiral and my best servants and they had no mind to do any better by me if god had not had me in his keeping i return thither no more unless i am dragged i regret only two things that i have left behind at paris mass and my wife as for mass i will try to do without it but as for my wife i cannot i mean to see her again End quote. 
he disavowed the appearances of catholicism he had assumed again made open profession of protestantism by holding at the baptismal font in the conventicle the daughter of a physician amongst his friends then he reached berne declaring that he meant to remain there independent and free a few days before his departure he had written to one of his bernese friends quote, the court is the strangest you ever saw we are almost always ready to cut one another's throats we wear daggers shirts of mail and very often the whole cuirass under the cape i am only waiting for the opportunity to deliver a little battle for they tell me they will kill me and i want to be beforehand End quote. Mesdames de Carnavalet and de Sauvé, two of his fair friends, had warned him that, far from giving him the lieutenant-generalship which had been so often promised him, it had been decided to confer this office on the king's brother, in order to get him back to court and seize his person as soon as he arrived. End of section 46 Section 47 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 34. Henry III and the Religious Wars, 1574 to 1589, Part 2. It was the increasing preponderance of the Guises, at court as well as in the country, which caused the two princes to take this sudden resolution. Since Henry III's coming to the throne, war had gone on between the Catholics and the Protestants, but languidly and with frequent suspensions through local and short-lived truces. The king and the queen-mother would have been very glad that the St. Bartholomew should be short-lived also, as a necessary but transitory crisis. It had rid them of their most formidable adversaries, Coligny and the reformers of note who were about him. Henry and Catherine aspired to no more than resuming their policy of manoeuvring and wavering between the two parties engaged in the struggle. But it was not for so poor a result that the ardent Catholics had committed the crime of the St. Bartholomew. They promised themselves from it the decisive victory of their church and of their supremacy. Henry de Guise came forward as their leader in this grand design. There are to be read, beneath a portrait of him done in the sixteenth century, these verses, also of that date. Quote, the virtue, greatness, wisdom from on high, of yonder duke, triumphant far and near, do make bad men to shrink with coward fear, and God's own Catholic Church to fructify. In armor clad, like maddened Mars he moves, the trembling Huguenot cowers at his glance. A prop for holy church is his good lance. His eye is ever mild to those he loves. End quote. Guise cultivated very carefully this ardent confidence on the part of Catholic France. He recommended to his partisans attention to little pious and popular practices. Quote, I send you some paternosters, meaning, in the plural, the beads of a chaplet, or the chaplet entire. End quote. He wrote to his wife, Catherine of Cleves, quote, You will have strings made for them, and string them together. I don't know whether you dare offer some of them to the queens and to my lady mother. Ask advice of Mesdames de Retz and de Villeroy about it. End quote. The flight and insurrection of the Duke of Anjou and the King of Navarre furnished the Duke of Guise with a very natural occasion for re-engaging in the great struggle between Catholicism and Protestantism, wherein the chief part belonged to him. Let us recur for a moment to the origin of that struggle and the part taken in it at the outset by the princes of the House of Lorraine. Quote, as early as the year 1562, twenty-six years before the affair of the barricades, says M. Vitet in the excellent introduction which he has put at the head of his beautiful historic dramas from the last half of the sixteenth century, Cardinal Charles of Lorraine, being at the Council of Trent, conceived the plan of a Holy League, or Association of Catholics, which was to have the triple object of defending by armed force the Romish Church in France, of obtaining for the Cardinal's brother, Duke Francis de Guise, the lieutenant-generalship of the kingdom, and of helping him to ascend the throne, in case the line of the Valois should become extinct. The death of Duke Francis, murdered in front of Orléans by Poltrot, did not permit the Cardinal to carry out his plan. 
Five years afterwards, Henry de Guise, eldest son of Francis, and then eighteen years of age, caused to be drawn up for the first time a form of oath whereby the dignitaries bound themselves to sacrifice their goods and lives in defense of the Catholic religion, in the face of and against all, except the king, the royal family, and the princes of their connection. This form was signed by the nobility of Champagne and Brie a province of which Henry de Guise was governor, and on the 25th of July, 1568, the bishop and the clergy of Troyes signed it likewise. The association is named in the form Holy League, Christian and Royal. Up to the year 1576 it remained secret, and did not cross the boundaries of Champagne. To this summary of M. Vitesse may be added that, independently of the Champagny's League of 1568, and in the interval between 1568 and 1575, there had been formed, in some provinces and towns, other local associations for the defense of the Catholic Church against the heretics. When in 1575, first the Duke of Anjou and after him the King of Navarre were seen flying from the court of Henry III, and commencing an insurrection with the aid of a considerable body of German auxiliaries and French refugees, already on French soil and on their way across Champagne, the peril of the Catholic Church appeared so grave and so urgent that in the threatened provinces the Catholics devoted themselves with ardor to the formation of a grand association for the defense of their cause. Then and thus was really born the League, secret at first, but before long publicly and openly proclaimed, which held so important a place in the history of the sixteenth century. Picardy and Champagne were the first scene of its formation. But in the neighboring provinces the same travail took place and brought forth fruits. At Paris, a burgess named La Roche Blanc, and devoted to the Guises, a perfumer named Peter de la Bruyère, and his son Mathieu de la Bruyère, councillor at the Châtelet, were, says de Thou, the first and most zealous preachers of the Union. Quote, at their solicitation, continues the austere magistrate, all the debauchees were there in this great city, all folks whose only hope was in civil war for the indulgence of their libertinism, or for a safe means of satisfying their avarice or their ambition, enrolled themselves emulously in this force. Many, even of the richest burgesses, whose hatred for Protestants blinded them so far as not to see the dangers to which such associations expose public tranquillity in a well-regulated state, had the weakness to join the seditious. End quote. Many asked for time to consider, and before making any engagement they went to see President de Thou, informed him of these secret assemblies and all that went on there, and begged him to tell them whether he approved of them, and whether it was true that the court authorized them. M. de Thou answered them at once, with the straightforwardness which was innate in him, that these kinds of proceedings had not yet come to his knowledge, that he doubted whether they had the approbation of his majesty, and that they would do wisely to hold aloof from all such associations. The authority of this great man began to throw suspicion upon the designs of the Unionists, and his reply prevented many persons from casting in their lot with the party but they who found themselves at the head of this faction were not the folks to so easily give up their projects for they felt themselves too well supported at court and amongst the people they advised the lorraine princes to have the union promulgated in the provinces and to labor to make the nobility of the kingdom enter it henry de guise did not hesitate at the same time that he avowed the league and labored to propagate it he did what was far more effectual for its success he entered the field and gained a victory the german allies and french refugees who had come to support prince henry de conde and the duke of anjou in their insurrection advanced into champagne guise had nothing ready neither army nor money he mustered in haste three thousand horse who were to be followed by a body of foot and a moiety of the king's guards Quote, i haven't a son he wrote to his wife take some out of the king's chest if there is anything there provided you know that there is something there don't be afraid take it and send it me at once as for the Rêtres, they are more afraid of us than we of them. Don't be frightened about them on my account. The greatest danger I shall run will be that a glass of wine may break in my hand. End quote. He set out in pursuit of the Germans, came up with them on the 10th of October, 1575, at port a on the Marne, and ordered them to be attacked by his brother, the Duke of Mayenne, whom he supported vigorously. They were broken and routed. The hunt, according to the expression at the time, lasted all the rest of the day and during the night. Quote, a world of dead covers the field of battle, wrote Guise. He had himself been wounded. 
he went in obstinate pursuit of a mounted foe whom he had twice touched with his sword, and who in return had fired two pistol-shots, of which one took effect in the leg, and the other carried away part of his cheek and his left ear. Thence came his name of Henry the Scard, le Balafré, which has clung to him in history. Scarcely four years had rolled away since St. Bartholomew. In vain had been the massacre of ten thousand Protestants, according to the lowest, and of one hundred thousand, according to the highest estimates, besides nearly all the renowned chiefs of the party. Charles the Ninth's earnest prayer, quote, that none remained to reproach me, end quote, was so far from accomplishment that the war between Catholicism and Protestantism recommenced in almost every part of France with redoubled passion, with a new importance of character and with symptoms of much longer duration than at its first outbreak. Both parties had found leaders made, both from their position and their capacity, to command them. Admiral Coligny was succeeded by the King of Navarre, who was destined to become Henry the Fourth, and Duke Francis of Guise by his son Henry, if not as able, at any rate as brave a soldier, and a more determined Catholic than he. Amongst the Protestants, Sully and Duplessis Mornay were assuming shape and importance by the side of the King of Navarre. Catherine de Medici placed at her son's service her Italian adroitness, her maternal devotion, and an energy rare for a woman between sixty and seventy years of age, for forty-three years a queen, and worn out by intrigue and business and pleasure. Finally, to the question of religion, the primary cause of the struggle was added a question of kingship, kept in the background, but ever present in thought and deed, which of the three houses of Valois, Bourbon, and Lorraine should remain in or enter upon the possession of the throne of France. The interests and the ambition of families and of individuals were playing their part simultaneously with the controversies and the passions of creed. This state of things continued for twelve years, from 1576 to 1588, with constant alternations of war, truce, and precarious peace, and in the midst of constant hesitation on the part of Henry III between alliance with the League, commanded by the Duke of Guise, and adjustment with the Protestants, of whom the King of Navarre was every day becoming the more and more avowed leader. Between 1576 and 1580, four treaties of peace were concluded. In 1576, the peace called Messieurs, signed at Chastenay in Orléanès. In 1577, the peace of Bergerac, or of Poitiers. In 1579, the peace of Nerac. In 1580, the peace of Flèche in Périgord. In November 1578, the States General were convoked and assembled at Blois, where they sat and deliberated up to March 1577, without any important result. Neither these diplomatic conventions nor these national assemblies had force enough to establish a real and lasting peace between the two parties, for the parties themselves would not have it. In vain did Henry III make concessions and promises of liberty to the Protestants. He was not in a condition to guarantee their execution and make it respected by their adversaries. At heart, neither Protestants nor Catholics were for accepting mutual liberty. Not only did they both consider themselves in possession of all religious truth, but they also considered themselves entitled to impose it by force upon their adversaries. The discovery, and the term is used advisedly, so slow to come, and so long awaited has been the fact which it expresses, the discovery of the legitimate separation between the intellectual world and the political world, and of the necessity also of having the intellectual world free in order that it may not make upon the political world a war, which in the inevitable contact between them the latter could not support for long, this grand and salutary discovery, be it repeated, and its practical influence in the government of people, cannot be realized save in communities already highly enlightened and politically well ordered. Good order, politically, is indispensable if liberty, intellectually, is to develop itself regularly and do the community more good than it causes of trouble and embarrassment. They only who have confidence in human intelligence sincerely admit its right to freedom, and confidence in human intelligence is possible only in the midst of a political regimen which likewise gives the human community the guarantees whereof its interests and its lasting security have absolute need. The sixteenth century was a long way from these conditions of harmony between the intellectual world and the political world, the necessity of which is beginning to be understood and admitted by only the most civilized and best governed among modern communities. 
It is one of the most tardy and difficult advances that people have to accomplish in their life of labor. The sixteenth century helped France to make considerable strides in civilization and intellectual development, but the eighteenth and nineteenth have taught her how great still in the art of governing and being governed as a free people are her children's want of foresight and inexperience, and to what extent they require a strong and sound organization of political freedom in order that they may without danger enjoy intellectual freedom, its pleasures and its glories. From 1576 to 1588, Henry III had seen the difficulties of his government continuing and increasing. His attempt to maintain his own independence and the mastery of the situation between Catholics and Protestants by making concessions and promises at one time to the former and at another to the latter had not succeeded. And in 1584 it became still more difficult to practice. On the 10th of June in that year, Henry III's brother, the Duke of Anjou, died at Chateau-Thierry. By this death, the leader of the Protestants, Henry, King of Navarre, became lawful heir to the throne of France. The leaguers could not stomach that prospect. The Guises turned it to formidable account. They did not hesitate to make the future of France a subject of negotiation with Philip II of Spain, at that time her most dangerous enemy in Europe. By a secret convention concluded at Joinville on the 31st of December, 1584, between Philip and the Guises, it was stipulated that at the death of Henry III the crown should pass to Charles, Cardinal of Bourbon, sixty-four years of age, the King of Navarre's uncle, who in order to make himself king undertook to set aside his nephew's hereditary right, and forbid absolutely heretical worship in France. He published on the 31st of March, 1585, a declaration wherein he styled himself Premier Prince of the Blood, and conferred upon the Duke of Guise the title of Lieutenant General of the League. By a bull of September 10, 1585, Sixtus V, but lately elected Pope, excommunicated the King of Navarre as a heretic, and relapsed, denying him any right of succession to the crown of France, and releasing his Navarrese subjects from their oath of fidelity. Sixtus V did not yet know what manner of man he was thus attacking. The King of Navarre did not confine himself to protesting in France on the 10th of June, 1585, against this act of the Pope's. He had his protest placarded at Rome itself upon the statues of Pasquin and Marforio, and at the very doors of the Vatican, referring the Pope, as to the question of heresy, to a council which he claimed at an early date, and at the same time appealing against this alleged abuse of power to the court of peers of France, quote, of whom, said he, I have the honor to be the premier. End quote. The whole of Italy, including Sixtus V himself, a pope of independent mind and proud heart, was struck with this energetic resistance on the part of a petty king. Quote, it would be a good thing, said the Pope to Marquis Passani, Henry III's ambassador, if the king your master showed as much resolution against his enemies as the king of Navarre shows against those who attack him. End quote. At the first moment, Henry III had appeared to unravel the intentions of the League and to be disposed to resist it. By an edict of March 28, 1585, he had ordered that its adherents should be prosecuted but Catherine de' Medici frightened him with the war which would infallibly be kindled, and in which he would have for enemies all the Catholics more irritated than ever. And Henry III very easily took fright. Catherine undertook to manage the recoil for him. Quote, I care not who likes it and who doesn't, end quote, she was wont to say in such cases. She asked the Duke of Guise for an interview, which took place, first of all at Epernay, and afterwards at Rheims. The hard demands of the Lorrainers did not deter the Queen Mother, and on the 7th of July, 1585, a treaty was concluded at Nemours between Henry III and the League, to the effect, quote, that by an irrevocable edict the practice of the new religion should be forbidden, and that there should henceforth be no other practice of religion throughout the realm of France save that of the Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman, that all the ministers should depart from the kingdom within a month that all the subjects of his majesty should be bound to live according to the catholic religion and make profession thereof within six months on pain of confiscation both of person and goods that heretics of whatsoever quality they might be should be declared incapable of holding benefices public offices positions and dignities 
that the places which had been given in guardianship to them for their security should be taken back again forthwith, and lastly, that the princes designated in the treaty, amongst whom were all the Guises at the top, should receive as guarantee certain places to be held by them for five years. End quote. This treaty was signed by all the negotiators, and specially by the Queen Mother, the Cardinals of Bourbon and Guise, and the Dukes of Guise and Mayenne. It was the decisive act which made the war a war of religion. End of section 47. Section 48 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 34. Henry III and the Religious Wars, 1574 to 1589, Part 3. On the 18th of July following, Henry III, on his way to the Palace of Justice, to be present at the publication of the edict he had just issued in virtue of this treaty with the League, said to the Cardinal of Bourbon, quote, My dear uncle, against my conscience, but very willingly, I published the edicts of pacification, because they were successful in giving relief to my people. And now I am going to publish the revocation of those edicts in accordance with my conscience, but very unwillingly, because on its publication hangs the ruin of my kingdom and of my people. End quote. When he issued from the palace, cries of long live the king were heard, quote, at which astonishment was expressed, says Peter de l'Estoile, page 294, because for a long time past no such favor had been shown him but it was discovered that these acclamations were the doing of persons posted about by the leaguers and that for doing it money had been given to idlers and sweetmeats to children some days afterwards the king of navarre received news of the treaty of nemours he was staying near bergerac at the castle of the lord of la force with whom he was so intimate that he took with him none of his household as he preferred to be waited upon by m de la force's own staff Quote, I was so grievously affected by it, said he himself at a later period to M. de la Force, that as I pondered deeply upon it, and held my head supported upon my hand, my apprehensions of the woes I foresaw for my country were such as to whiten one half of my moustache. Henry the Third, for his part, was but little touched by the shouts of Long Live the King that he heard as he left the palace. He was too much disquieted to be rejoiced at them. He did not return the greeting of the municipal functionaries or of the mob that blocked his way. Quote, you see how reluctant he is to embroil himself with the Huguenots, said the partisans of the Guises to the people. It was the recommencement of the religious civil war, with more deadliness than ever. The King of Navarre left no stone unturned to convince everybody, friends and enemies, great lords and commonality, Frenchmen and foreigners, that this recurrence of war was not his doing, and that the leaguers forced it upon him against his wish, and despite of the justice of his cause. He wrote to Henry the Third, quote, Monseigneur, as soon as the originators of these fresh disturbances had let the effects appear of their ill will towards your majesty and your kingdom, you were pleased to write to me the opinion you had formed, with very good title, of their intentions. You told me that you knew, no matter what pretext they assumed, that they had designs against your person and your crown, and that they desired their own augmentation and aggrandizement at your expense and to your detriment such were the words of your letters monseigneur and you did me the honour whilst recognising the connection between my fortunes and those of your majesty to add expressly that they were compassing my ruin together with your own and now monseigneur when i hear it suddenly reported that your majesty has made a treaty of peace with those who have risen up against your service providing that your edict be broken your loyal subjects banished and the conspirators armed and armed with your power and your authority against me who have the honour of belonging to you i leave your majesty to judge in what a labyrinth i find myself if it is i whom they seek or if under my shadow on my account they trouble this realm i have begged that without henceforth causing the orders and estates of this realm to suffer for it and without the intervention of any army home or foreign this quarrel be decided in the duke of guise's person and my own one to one two to two ten to ten twenty to twenty in any number that the said lord of guise shall think proper with the arms customary amongst gentlemen of honour 
it will be a happiness for us my cousin henry de conde and myself to deliver at the price of our blood the king our sovereign lord from the travails and trials that are a-brewing for him his kingdom from trouble and confusion his noblesse from ruin and all his people from extreme misery and calamity End quote. The Duke of Guise respectfully declined, at the same time that he thanked the King of Navarre for the honour done him, saying that he could not accept the offer, as he was maintaining the cause of religion and not a private quarrel. On his refusal, war appeared to everybody and in fact became inevitable. At his re-engagement in it, the King of Navarre lost no time about informing his friends at home and his allies abroad, the noblesse, the clergy, and the third estate of France, the city of Paris, the Queen of England, the Protestant princes of Germany, and the Swiss cantons, of all he had done to avoid it. He evidently laid great store upon making his conduct public, and his motives understood. He had for his close confidant and his mouthpiece Philip du Plessis Mornay, at that time thirty-six years of age, one of the most learned and most hard-working as well as most zealous and most sterling amongst the royalist Protestants of France. It was his duty to draw up the documents, manifestos, and letters published by the King of Navarre, when Henry did not himself stamp upon them the seal of his own language, vivid, eloquent, and captivating in its brevity henry the third and the queen mother were very much struck with this intelligent energy on the part of the king of navarre and with the influence he acquired over all that portion of the french noblesse and burgesses which had not fanatically enlisted beneath the banner of the league catherine accustomed to count upon her skill in the art of seductive conversation was for putting it to fresh proof in the case of the king of navarre louis de gonzaga duke of nevers an italian like herself and one of her confidants was sent in advance to sound henry of navarre he wrote to henry the third such sir as you have known this prince such is he even now nor years nor difficulties change him he is still agreeable still merry still devoted as he has sworn to me a hundred times to peace and your majesty's service catherine proposed to him an interview Henry hesitated to comply. From Jarnac, where he was, he sent Viscount de Turenne to Catherine to make an agreement with her for a few days' truce. Quote, Catherine gave Turenne to understand that in order to have peace, the King of Navarre must turn Catholic and put a stop to the exercise of the Reformed religion in the towns he held. End quote. When this was reported by his envoy, Henry, who had set out for the interview, was on the point of retracing his steps he went on however as he was curious to see catherine to satisfy his mind upon the point and to answer her they met on the fourteenth of december fifteen eighty six at the castle of st brice near cognac both of them with gloomy looks catherine asked henry whether turenne had spoken to him about what she said was her son's most expressed desire quote, i am astounded said henry that your majesty should have taken so much pains to tell me what my ears are split with hearing and likewise that you whose judgment is so sound should delude yourself with the idea of solving the difficulty by means of the difficulty itself you propose to me a thing that i cannot do without forfeiture of conscience and honour and without injury to the king's service i should not carry with me all those of the religion and they of the league would be so much the more irritated in that they would lose their hope of depriving me of the right which i have to the throne they do not want me with you madame for they would then be in sorry plight you better served and all your good subjects more happy the queen mother did not dispute the point she dwelt quote, upon the inconveniences henry suffered during the war quote. Quote, i bear them patiently madame said henry since you burden me with them in order to unburden yourself of them she reproached him with not doing as he pleased in rochelle quote, Pardon me, madam, said he, I please only as I ought. End quote. The Duke of Nevers, who was present at the interview, was bold enough to tell him that he could not impose a tax upon Rochelle. Quote, that is true, said Henry, and so we have no Italian amongst us. End quote. He took leave of the Queen Mother, who repeated what she had said to Viscount de Turenne, quote, charging him to make it known to the noblesse who were of his following. End quote. Quote, it is just eighteen months madame said he since i ceased to obey the king he has made war upon me like a wolf you like a lioness quote. Quote, the king and i seek nothing but your welfare quote. Quote, excuse me madame i think it would be the contrary quote. Quote, my son 
Would you have the pains I have taken for the last six months remain without fruit? End quote. Quote, Madame, it is not I who prevent you from resting in your bed. It is you who prevent me from lying down in mine. End quote. Quote, Shall I be always at pains, I who ask for nothing but rest? End quote. Quote, Madame, the pains please you and agree with you. If you were at rest, you could not live long. End quote. Catherine had brought with her what was called her flying squadron of fair creatures of her court, but, quote, Madame, said Henry, as he withdrew, there is nothing here for me. End quote. Before taking part in the war which was day by day becoming more and more clearly and explicitly a war of religion, the Protestant princes of Germany and the four great free cities of Strasbourg, Ulm, Nuremberg, and Frankfurt resolved to make, as the King of Navarre had made, a striking move on behalf of peace and religious liberty. They sent to Henry the Third ambassadors who on the 11th of October, 1586, treated him to some frank and bold speaking. Quote, our princes and masters, they said to him, have been moved with surprise and Christian compassion towards you as faithful friends and good neighbors of yours, on hearing that you, not being pleased to suffer in your kingdom any person not of the Roman religion, have broken the edict of peace which was so solemnly done, and based upon your majesty's faith and promise, and which is the firm prop of the tranquillity of your majesty and your dominions the which changes have appeared to them strange seeing that your royal person your dominions your conscience your honour your reputation and good fame happened to be very much concerned therewith End quote. shocked at so rude an admonition henry the third answered quote, it is god who made me king and as i bear the title of most christian king i have ever been very zealous for the preservation of the catholic religion it appertains to me alone to decide according to my discernment what may contribute to the public weal to make laws for to procure it to interpret those laws to change them and to abolish them just as i find it expedient i have done so hitherto and i shall still do so for the future End quote. and he dismissed the ambassadors that very evening on reflecting upon his words and considering that his answer had not met the requirements of the case he wrote with his own hand on a small piece of paper quote, that whoever said that in revoking the edict of pacification he had violated his faith or put a blot upon his honour had lied end quote. and he ordered one of his officers though the night was far advanced to carry that paper to the ambassadors and read it to them textually they asked for a copy but henry the third always careful not to have to answer for his words had bidden his officer to suppress the document after having read it and the germans departed determined upon war as well as quite convinced of the king's arrogant pusillanimity except some local and short-lived truces war was already blazing throughout nearly the whole of france in provence in dauphigny in nivernais in guienne in anjou in normandy in picardy in champagne we do not care to follow the two parties through the manifold but monotonous incidents of their tumultuous and passionate strife we desire to review only those events that were of a general and a decisive character they occurred naturally in those places which were the arena and in those armies which were under the command of the two leaders duke henry of guise and king henry of navarre the former took upon himself the duty of repulsing in the northwest of france the german and swiss corps which were coming to the assistance of the french reformers the latter put himself at the head of the french protestant forces summoned to face in the provinces of the centre and southwest the royalist armies guise was successful in his campaign against the foreigners on the twenty sixth of october fifteen eighty seven his scouts came and told him that the germans were at vimory near montargis dispersed throughout the country without vedettes or any of the precautions of warfare he was at table with his principal officers at courtenay almost seven leagues away from the enemy he remained buried in thought for a few minutes and then suddenly gave the order to sound boot and saddle or boot sel that is put on saddle Quote, what for pray said his brother the duke of mayenne quote, to go and fight end quote. Quote, pray reflect upon what you are going to do end quote. Quote, reflections that i haven't made in a quarter of an hour i shouldn't make in a year end quote. mounting at once the leader and his squadrons arrived at midnight at the gates of vimory they found it is said the germans drunk asleep and scattered according to the reporters on the side of the league the victory of guise was complete he took from the germans twenty-eight hundred horses 
the protestants said that the body he charged were nothing but a lot of horse-boys and that the two flags he took had for device nothing but a sponge and a curry-comb but fifteen days later on the eleventh of november at ono near chartres guise gained an indisputable and undisputed victory over the germans their general baron dona and some of his officers only saved themselves by cutting their way through sword in hand the swiss being discouraged and seeing in the army of henry the eighth eight thousand of their countrymen who were serving in it not like themselves as adventurers but under the flags and with the authorization of their cantons separated from the germans and withdrew after receiving from henry the third four hundred thousand crowns as the price of their withdrawal in burgundy in champagne and in orleanes the campaign terminated to the honour of guise which henry the third was far from regarding as a victory for himself but almost at the same time at which the league obtained this success in the provinces of the east and centre it experienced in those of the southwest a reverse more serious for the leaguers than the duke of guise's victory had been fortunate for them henry the third had given the command of his army south of the loire to one of his favourites anne duke of joyeuse a brilliant brave and agreeable young man whose fortunes he advanced beyond measure to the extent of marrying him to marguerite de lorraine the queen's sister and raising for him the viscountship of joyeuse to a duchy peerage giving him rank too after the princes of the blood and before the dukes of old creation joyeuse was at the head of six thousand foot two thousand horse and six pieces of cannon he entered poitou and marched towards the dordogne whilst the king of navarre was at la rochelle engaged in putting into order two pieces of cannon which formed the whole of his artillery and in assembling round him his three cousins the prince of conde the count of soissons and the prince of conti that he might head the whole house of bourbon at the moment when he was engaging seriously in the struggle with the house of valois and the house of lorraine a small town coutras situated at the confluence of the two rivers of lille and la Dronne, in the gironde offered the two parties an important position to occupy Quote, according to his want says the duke of aumale in his histoire des princes de conde the bernese was on horseback while his adversary was banqueting he outstripped joyeuse and when the latter drew near to contrat he found the town occupied by the protestant advance guard and had barely time to fall back upon la roche chalet the battle began on the twentieth of october fifteen eighty seven shortly after sunrise we will here borrow the equally dramatic and accurate account of it given by the duke of aumale Quote, at this solemn moment the king of navarre calls to his side his cousins and his principal officers then in his manly and sonorous voice he addresses his men-at-arms my friends here is a quarry for you very different from your past prizes it is a brand-new bridegroom with his marriage-money still in his coffers and all the cream of the courtiers are with him will you let yourselves go down before this handsome dancing master and his minions no they are ours i see it by your eagerness to fight still we must all of us understand that the event is in the hands of god pray we him to aid us this deed will be the greatest that we ever did the glory will be to god the service to our sovereign lord the king the honour to ourselves and the benefit to the state henry uncovers the clergymen chandieu and damour intone the army's prayer and the men-at-arms repeat in chorus the twenty-fourth versicle of the hundred and eighteenth psalm this is the day which the lord hath made we will rejoice and be glad in it as they were hastening each to his post the king detains his cousins a moment gentlemen he shouts i have just one thing to say remember that you are of the house of bourbon and as god liveth i will let you see that i am your senior and we will show you some good juniors answered conde before midday the battle was won and the royalist army routed but not without having made a valiant stand during the action d'epigny saint luc one of the bravest royalist soldiers met the duke of joyeuse already wounded quote, what's to be done he asked quote, die answered joyeuse and a few moments afterwards as he was moving away some paces to the rear in order to get near to his artillery says d'aubigne he was surrounded by several huguenots who recognized him quote, there are a hundred thousand crowns to be gained he shouted but rage was more powerful than cupidity and one of them shattered his skull with a pistol shot quote, his body was taken to the king's quarters there it lay in the evening upon a table in the very room where the conqueror's supper had been prepared 
but the king of navarre ordered all who were in the chamber to go out had his supper things removed else whither and with every mark of respect committed the remains of the vanquished to the care of viscount de turenne his near relative henry showed a simple and modest joy at his splendid triumph it was five-and-twenty years since the civil war commenced and he was the first protestant general who had won a pitched battle he had to regret only twenty-five killed whereas the enemy had lost more than three thousand and had abandoned to him their cannon together with twenty-nine flags or standards the victory was so much the more glorious in that it was gained over an army superior in numbers and almost equal in quality it was owing to the king's valor decision vigilance quick eye comprehension of tactics and that creative instinct which he brought into application in politics as well as in war and which was destined to render him so happily inspired in the beautiful defensive actions of arc at the affair of ivry and on so many other occasions End quote. End of section forty eight Section 49 of A Popular History of France, Volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 34. Henry III and the Religious Wars, 1574 to 1589. Part 4 and what was henry the third king of france doing whilst two great parties and two great men were thus carrying on around his throne and in his name so passionate a war on the one side to maintain the despotic unity of catholic christianism and on the other to win religious liberty for christian protestantism we will borrow here the words of the most enlightened and most impartial historian of the sixteenth century m de Thou if we acted upon our own personal impressions alone there would be danger of appearing too severe towards a king whom we profoundly despise Quote, after having stayed some time in bourbonness henry the third went to lyon in order to be within hail of his two favourites joyeuse and epernon who were each on the march with an army whilst he was at lyon as unconcerned as if all the realm were enjoying perfect peace he took to collecting those little dogs which are thought so much of in that town everybody was greatly surprised to see a king of france in the midst of so terrible a war and in extreme want of money expending upon such pleasures all the time he had at disposal and all the sums he could scrape together how lavish soever this prince may have been yet if comparison be made between the expenditure upon the royal household and that incurred at lyons for dogs the latter will be found infinitely higher than the former without counting expenses for hunting dogs and birds which always come to a considerable sum in the households of kings it cost him every year more than a hundred thousand gold crowns for little lyonnaise dogs and he maintained at his court with large salaries a multitude of men and women who had nothing to do but to feed them he also spent large sums in monkeys parrots and other creatures from foreign countries of which he always kept a great number sometimes he got tired of them and gave them all away then his passion for such creatures returned and they had to be found for him at no matter what cost since i am upon the subject of this prince's attachment to matters anything but worthy of the kingly majesty i will say a word about his passion for those miniatures which were to be found in manuscript prayer-books and which before the practice of printing were done by the most skilful painters henry the third seemed to buy such works intended for princes and laid by in cabinets of curiosities only to spoil them as soon as he had them he cut them out and then pasted them upon the walls of his chapels as children do an incomprehensible character of mind in certain things capable of upholding his rank in some rising above his position in others sinking below childishness End quote a mind and character incomprehensible indeed if corruption lassitude listlessness and fear would not explain the existence of everything that is abnormal and pitiable about human nature in a feeble cold and selfish creature excited and at the same time worn out by the business and the pleasures of kingship which henry the third could neither do without nor bear the burden of his perplexity was extreme in his relations with the other two henrys who gave like himself their name to this war which was called by contemporaries the war of the three henrys 
the successes of henry de guise and of henry de bourbon were almost equally disagreeable to henry de valois it is probable that if he could have chosen he would have preferred those of henry de bourbon if they caused him jealousy they did not raise in him the same distrust he knew the king of navarre's loyalty and did not suspect him of aiming to become whilst he himself was living king of france besides he considered the protestants less powerful and less formidable than the leaguers henry de guise on the contrary was evidently in his eyes an ambitious conspirator determined to push his own fortunes on to the very crown of france if the chances were favourable to him and not only armed with all the power of catholicism but urged forward by the passions of the league perhaps further and certainly more quickly than his own intentions travelled since fifteen eighty four the leaguers had at paris acquired strong organization amongst the populace the city had been partitioned out into five districts under five heads who shortly afterwards added to themselves eleven others in order that in the secret council of the association each amongst the sixteen quarters of paris might have its representative and director thence the famous committee of sixteen which played so great and so formidable a part in the history of that period it was religious fanaticism and democratic fanaticism closely united and in a position to impose their wills upon their most eminent leaders upon the duke of guise himself in vain did henry the third attempt to resume some sort of authority in paris his government his public and private life and his person were daily attacked insulted and menaced from the elevation of the pulpit and in the public thoroughfares by qualified preachers or mob orators on the sixteenth of december fifteen eighty seven the sorbonne voted after a deliberation which it was said was to be kept secret quote, that the government might be taken away from princes who were found not what they ought to be just as the administration of a property from a guardian opened to suspicion end quote. on the thirtieth of december the king summoned to the louvre his court of parliament and the faculty of theology quote, i know of your precious resolution of the sixteenth of this month said he to the sorbonne i have been requested to take no notice of it seeing that it was passed after dinner i have no mind to avenge myself for these outrages as i might and as pope sixtus v did when he sent to the galleys certain cordeliers for having dared to slander him in their sermons there is not one of you who has not deserved as much and more but it is my good pleasure to forget all and to pardon you on condition of its not occurring again if it should i beg my court of parliament here present to exact exemplary justice and such as the seditious like you may take warning by so as to mind their own business at their exit after this address the parliament and the sorbonne being quite sure that the king would not carry the matter further withdrew smiling and saying quote, he certainly has spirit, but not enough of it. Or, habet quidum animum, sed non satis animi. The Duke of Guise's sister, the Duchess of Montpensier, took to getting up and spreading about all sorts of pamphlets against the king and his government. Quote, the king commanded her to quit his city of Paris. She did nothing of the kind, and three days after she was even brazen enough to say that she carried at her waist the scissors which would give a third crown to brother Henry de Valois. End quote at the close of fifteen eighty seven the duke of guise made a trip to rome quote, with a suite of five and he only remained three days so disguised that he was not recognized there and discovered himself to nobody but cardinal Pelev, with whom he was in communication day and night End quote. eighteen months previously the cardinal had given a very favorable reception to a case drawn up by an advocate in the parliament of paris named david who maintained that quote, although the line of the capet had succeeded to the temporal administration of the kingdom of charlemagne it had not succeeded to the apostolic benediction which appertained to none but the posterity of the said charlemagne and that the line of capet being some of them possessed by a spirit of giddiness and stupidity and others heretic and excommunicated the time had come for restoring the crown to the true heirs End quote. that is to say to the house of lorraine which claimed to be issue of charlemagne this case was passed on it is said from rome to philip the second king of spain and m de saint gor ambassador of france at madrid sent henry the third a copy of it whatever may have been the truth about this trip to rome on the part of the duke of guise and its influence upon what followed the chiefs of the leaguers resolved to deal a great blow 
the Lorraine princes and their intimate associates met at Nancy in January 1588, and decided that a petition should be presented to the king, that he should be called upon to join himself more openly and in good earnest to the League and to remove from offices of consequence all the persons that should be pointed out to him that the holy inquisition should be established at any rate in the good towns that important places should be put into the hands of specified chiefs who should have the power of constructing fortifications there that heretics should be taxed a third or at the least a fourth of their property as long as the war lasted and lastly that the life should be spared of no enemy taken prisoner unless upon his swearing and finding good surety to live as a catholic and upon paying in ready money the worth of his property if it had not already been sold these monstrous proposals drawn up in eleven articles were immediately carried to the king he did not reject them but he demanded and took time to discuss them with the authors the negotiation was prolonged the ferment in paris was redoubled the king it was said meant to withdraw his person must be secured the committee of sixteen took measures to that end one of its members got into his hands the keys of the gate of st denis from soissons where he was staying the duke of guise sent to paris the count of brissac with four other captains of the league to hold themselves in readiness for any event and he ordered his brother the duke of aumale to stoutly maintain his garrisons in the places of picardy which the king it was said meant to take from him Quote, if the king leaves paris the duke wrote to bernard de mendoza philip the second's ambassador in france i will make him think about returning thither before he has gone a day's march towards the picard philip the second made guise an offer of three hundred thousand crowns six thousand lunxnexts and twelve hundred lances as soon as he should have broken with henry the third the abscess will soon burst wrote the ambassador to the king his master on the eighth of may fifteen eighty eight at eleven p m the duke of guise set out from soissons after having commended himself to the prayers of the convents in the town he arrived the next morning before paris which he entered about midday by the gate of st martin the leaguers had been expecting him for several days though he had covered his head with his cloak he was readily recognized and eagerly cheered the burgesses left their houses and the tradesmen their shops to see him and follow him shouting hurrah for guise hurrah for the pillar of the church the crowd increased at every step he arrived in front of the palace of catherine de medici who had not expected him and grew pale at sight of him Quote, my dear cousin said she to him i am very glad to see you but i should have been better pleased at another time End quote. Quote, madame i am come to clear myself from all the calumnies of my enemies do me the honour to conduct me to the king yourself catherine lost no time in giving the king warning by one of her secretaries on receipt of this notice henry the third who had at first been stolid and silent rose abruptly from his chair quote, tell my lady mother that as she wishes to present the duke of guise to me i will receive him in the chamber of the queen my wife the envoy departed the king turning to one of his officers colonel alfonso corso said to him quote, monsieur de guise has just arrived at paris contrary to my orders what would you do in my place End quote. Quote, sir do you hold the duke of guise for friend or enemy End quote. the king without speaking replied by a significant gesture quote, if it please your majesty to give me the order i will this very day lay the duke's head at your feet End quote the three councillors who happened to be there cried out the king held his peace during this conversation at the louvre the duke of guise was advancing along the streets dressed in a doublet of white damask a cloak of black cloth and boots of buffalo hide he walked on foot bareheaded at the side of the queen mother in a sedan chair he was tall with fair clustering hair and piercing eyes and his scar added to his martial air the mob pressed upon his steps flowers were thrown to him from the windows some adoring him as a saint touched him with chaplets which they afterwards kissed a young girl darted towards him and removing her mask kissed him saying quote, brave prince since you are here we are all saved End quote. guise with a dignified air quote, saluted and delighted everybody says a witness with eye and gesture and speech End quote. Quote, by his side, said Madame de Retz, the other princes are commoners. End quote. 
Quote, the Huguenots, said another, become leaguers at the very sight of him. End quote. On arriving at the Louvre, he traversed the court between two rows of soldiers, the archers on duty in the hall, and the forty-five gentlemen of the king's chamber at the top of the staircase. Quote, what brings you hither, said the king, with difficulty restraining his anger? Quote, I entreat your majesty to believe in my fidelity, and not allow yourself to go by the reports of my enemies. End quote. Quote, did I not command you not to come at this season so full of suspicions, but to wait yet a while? End quote. Quote, Sir, I was not given to understand that my coming would be disagreeable to you. End quote. Catherine drew near, and in a low tone told her son of the demonstrations of which the Duke had been the object on his way. Guise was received in the chamber of the Queen, Louise de Vaudemont, who was confined to her bed by indisposition. He chatted with her a moment, and saluting the king, retired without being attended by any one of the officers of the court. Henry the Third confined himself to telling him that results should speak for the sincerity of his words. Guise returned to his house in the Faubourg Saint Antoine, still accompanied by an eager and noisy crowd, but somewhat disquieted at heart both by the king's angry reception and the people's enthusiastic welcome brave as he was he was more ambitious in conception than bold in execution and he had not made up his mind to do all that was necessary to attain the end he was pursuing the committee of sixteen his confidants and all the staff of the league met at his house during the evening and night between the ninth and tenth of may preparing for the morrow's action without well knowing what it was to be proposing various plans collecting arms and giving instructions to their agents amongst the populace an agitation of the same sort prevailed at the louvre the king too was deliberating with his advisers as to what he should do on the morrow guise would undoubtedly present himself at his morning levee should he at once rid himself of him by the poniards of the five-and-forty bravos which the duke of epernon had enrolled in gascony for his service or would it be best to summon to paris some troops french and swiss to crush the parisian rebels and the adventurers that had hurried up from all parts to their aid but on the tenth of may guise went to the louvre with four hundred gentlemen well armed with breastplates and weapons under their cloaks the king did nothing no more did guise the two had a long conversation in the queen mother's garden but it led to no result on the eleventh of may in the evening the provost of tradesmen hector de perreuse assembled the town council and those of the district colonels on whom he had reliance to receive the king's orders orders came to muster the burgher companies of certain districts and send them to occupy certain positions that had been determined upon they mustered slowly and incompletely and some not at all and scarcely had they arrived when several left the posts which had been assigned to them the king being informed of this sluggishness sent for the regiment of the french guards and for four thousand swiss cantoned in the outskirts of paris and he himself mounted his horse on the twelfth of may in the morning to go and receive them at the gate of st honore these troops quote, filed along without fife or drum towards the cemetery of the innocents end quote the populace regarded them as they passed with a feeling of angry curiosity and uneasy amazement when all the corps had arrived at the appointed spot quote, they put themselves in motion towards different points now making a great noise with their drums and fifes which marvellously astonished the inhabitants of the quarter End quote. noise provokes noise quote, incontinently says l'estoile everybody seizes his arms goes out on guard in the streets and cantons in less than no time chains are stretched across and barricades made at the corners of the streets the mechanic leaves his tools the tradesman his business the university their books the attorneys their bags the advocates their bands the presidents and councillors themselves take halberds in hand nothing is heard but shouts murmurs and the seditious speeches that heat and alarm a people the tocsin sounded everywhere barricades sprang up in the twinkling of an eye they were made within thirty paces of the louvre the royal troops were hemmed in where they stood and deprived of the possibility of moving the swiss being attacked lost fifty men and surrendered holding up their chaplets and exclaiming that they were good catholics it was thought sufficient to disarm the french guards 
the king remaining stationary at the louvre sent his marshals to parley with the people massed in the thoroughfares the queen mother had herself carried over the barricades in order to go to guise's house and attempt some negotiation with him he received her coldly demanding that the king should appoint him lieutenant-general of the kingdom declare the huguenot princes incapacitated from succeeding to the throne and assemble the states-general at the approach of evening guise determined to go himself and assume the conqueror's heir by putting a stop to the insurrection he issued from his house on horseback unarmed with a white wand in his hand he rode through the different districts exhorting the inhabitants to keep up their barricades whilst remaining on the defensive and leaving him to complete their work he was greeted on all sides with shouts of hurrah for guise Quote, you wrong me my friends said he you should shout hurrah for the king End quote. he had the french guards and the swiss set at liberty and they defiled before him arms lowered and bareheaded as before their preserver next morning may thirteen he wrote to d'entragues governor of orleans quote, notify our friends to come to us in the greatest haste possible with horses and arms but without baggage which they will easily be able to do for i believe that the roads are open hence to you i have defeated the swiss and cut in pieces a part of the king's guards and i hold the louvre invested so closely that i will render good account of whatsoever there is in it this is so great a victory that it will be remembered for ever that same day the provost of tradesmen and the royalist sheriffs repaired to the louvre and told the king that without great and immediate concessions they could not answer for anything the louvre was not in a condition of defence there were no troops to be depended upon for resistance no provisions no munitions the investment was growing closer and closer every hour and the assault might commence at any instant henry the third sent his mother once more to the duke of guise and himself went out about four o'clock dressed in a country suit and scantily attended as if for a walk in the tuileries catherine found the duke as inflexible as he had been the day before he peremptorily insisted upon all the conditions he had laid down already the lieutenant-generalship of the kingdom for himself the unity of the catholic faith forfeiture on the part of the king of navarre and every other huguenot prince as heir to the throne perpetual banishment of the king's favourites and convocation of the states-general the king he said purposes to destroy all the grandees of the kingdom and to harry all those who oppose his wishes and the elevation of his minions it is my duty and my interest to take all the measures necessary for my own preservation and that of the people catherine yielded on nearly every point at the same time however continually resuming and prolonging the discussion one of the duke's most trusty confidants francis de mainville entered and whispered in his ear Quote, madame cried the duke whilst your majesty has been amusing me here the king is off from paris to harry me and destroy me End quote. henry the third indeed had taken horse at the tuileries and attended by his principal councillors unbooted and cloakless had issued from the new gate and set out on the road to st cloud equipping him in haste his squire duald had put his spur on wrong and would have it set right but quote, that will do said the king i am not going to see my mistress i have a longer journey to make End quote. it is said that the corps on guard at the nesle gate fired from a distance a salute of arbus after the fugitive king and that a crowd assembled on the other bank of the river shouted insults after him at the height of chaillot henry pulled up and turning round towards paris quote, ungrateful city he cried i have loved thee more than my own wife i will not enter thy walls again but by the breach End quote. End of section forty nine section fifty of a popular history of france volume four this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kathy barrett a popular history of france from the earliest times volume 4 by françois guizot translated by robert black chapter 34 henry the 3rd and the religious wars 1574 to 1589 part 5 it is said that on hearing of the duke of guise's sudden arrival at paris pope sixtus v exclaimed quote, ah what rashness to thus go and put himself in the hands of a prince he has so outraged End quote. 
and some days afterwards, on the news that the king had received the Duke of Guise, and nothing had come of it, quote, "'Oh, dastard prince, poor creature of a prince, to have let such a chance escape him of getting rid of a man who seems born to be his destruction.'" When the king was gone, Guise acted the master in Paris. He ordered the immediate delivery into his hands of the Bastille, the arsenal, and the castle of Vincennes. Ornano, governor of the Bastille, sent an offer to the king, who had arrived at Chartres, to defend it to the last extremity. Quote, I will not expose to so certain a peril a brave man who may be necessary to me elsewhere, replied the king. Guise caused to be elected at Paris a new town council and a new provost of tradesmen, all taken from amongst the most ardent leaguers. He at the same time exerted himself to restore order. He allowed all royalists who wished to depart to withdraw to Chartres. He went in person and pressed the premier president of Parliament, Achille de Harlay, to resume the course of justice. Quote, it is great pity, sir, said Harlay, when the servant drives out the master. This assembly is founded, or seated, on the fleur de lis. Being established by the king, it can act only for his service. We will all lose our lives to a man rather than give way a wit to the contrary. End quote. Quote, I have been in many battles, said Guise as he went out, in assaults and encounters the most dangerous in the world, and I have never been so overcome as at my reception by this personage. End quote. At the same time that he was trying to exercise authority and restore order, unbridled violence and anarchy were making head around him. The sixteen and their friends discharged from the smallest offices, civil or religious, whoever was not devoted to them. They changed all the captains and district officers of the city militia. They deposed all the incumbents, all the ecclesiastics whom they termed Huguenot and Policists. The pulpits of Christians became the platforms of demagogues. The preachers Guitisestre, Boucher, Rose, John Prévost, Aubry, Pigana, Cuilly, Pelletier, and a host of others, whose names have fallen into complete obscurity, were the popular apostles, the real firebrands of the troubles of the League, says Pasquier there was scarcely a chapel where there were not several sermons a day quote, you know not your strength they kept repeating to their auditors paris knows not what she is worth she has wealth enough to make war upon four kings france is sick and she will never recover from that sickness till she has a draught of french blood given her if you receive henry de valois into your towns make up your minds to see your preachers massacred your sheriffs hanged your women violated and the gibbets garnished with your members one of these raving orators claude trahi provincial of the cordeliers devoted himself to hounding on the populace of Auxerre against their bishop james amiot the translator of plutarch whom he reproached with quote, having communicated with henry the third and administered to him the eucharist end quote. brother john morassin one of trahi's subalterns went about brandishing a halbert in the public place at Auxerre and shouting quote, Courage, lads! Messire Amiot is a wicked man, worse than Henry de Valois. He has threatened to have our master Trahi hanged, but he will repent it. End quote. And, quote, at the voice of this madman, there hurried up vine dressers, boatmen, and marchandeaux, or costermongers, a whole angry mob, who were for having Amiot's throat cut and Trahi made bishop in his stead. End quote. Whilst the blind passions of fanatics and demagogues were thus let loose, the sensible and clear-sighted spirits, the earnest and moderate royalists, did not all of them remain silent and motionless. After the appearance of the letters written in 1588 by the Duke of Guise to explain and justify his conduct in this crisis, a grandson of Chancellor de l'Hospital, Michael Hurot, Sieur du Fay, published a document entitled Frank and Free Discourse Upon the Condition of France, one of the most judicious and most eloquent pamphlets of the sixteenth century, a profound criticism upon the acts of the Duke of Guise, their causes and consequences, and a true picture of the falsehoods and servitude into which an eminent man may fall when he makes himself the tool of a popular faction, in the hope of making that faction the tool of his personal ambition. But even the men who were sufficiently enlightened and sufficiently courageous to tell the League and its leader plain truths spoke only rather late in the day, and at first without giving their names. The document written by L'Hospital's grandson did not appear until 1591, after the death of Henry III and Henry de Guise, and it remained anonymous for some time. 
one cannot be astonished at such timidity. Guise himself was timid before the leaguers, and he always ended by yielding to them in essentials, after having attempted to resist them upon such and such an incidental point. His own people accused him of lacking boldness, and his sister, the Duchess of Montpensier, openly patronized the most violent preachers, whilst boasting that she wielded more influence through them than her brother by his armies. Henry the Third, under stress of his enemy's zeal and his own servant's weakness, Catherine de' Medici included, after having fled from Paris and taken refuge at Chartres to escape the triumph of the barricades, once more began to negotiate, that is, to capitulate with the League. He issued at Rouen, on the 19th of July, 1588, an edict in eleven articles, whereby he granted more than had been demanded, and more than he had promised in 1585 by the Treaty of Nemours. Over and above the measures contained in that treaty against the Huguenots, in respect of the present and the future, he added four fresh surety towns, amongst others Bourges and Orléans, to those of which the leaguers were to remain in possession. He declared, moreover, quote, that no investigation should be made into any understandings, associations, and other matters into which our Catholic subjects might have entered together, inasmuch as they have given us to understand, and have informed us, that what they did was but owing to the zeal they felt for the preservation and maintenance of the Catholic religion. End quote. By thus releasing the League from all responsibility for the past, and by giving this new treaty the name of Edict of Union, Henry the Third flattered himself, it is said, that he was thus putting himself at the head of a new Grand Catholic League, which would become royalist again, inasmuch as the King was granting it all it had desired. The Edict of Union was enregistered at the Parliament of Paris on the 21st of July. The States General were convoked for the 15th of October following. Quote, on Tuesday, August 2, His Majesty, says L'Estoile, being entertained by the Duke of Guise during his dinner, asked him for drink, and then said to him, To whom shall we drink? To whom you please, sir, answered the Duke. It is for your Majesty to command. Cousin, said the King, drink we to our good friends the Huguenots. It is well said, sir, answered the Duke. And to our good barricaders, said the King, let us not forget them whereupon the duke began to laugh a little says l'estoile but a sort of laugh that did not go beyond the knot of the throat being dissatisfied at the novel union the king was pleased to make of the huguenots with the barricaders what must have to some extent reassured the duke of guise was that a te deum was celebrated at notre dame for the king of navarre's exclusion from all right to the crown and that on the fourteenth of august henry de guise was appointed generalissimo of the royal armies the states-general met at blois on the sixteenth of october fifteen eighty eight they numbered five hundred and five deputies one hundred and ninety one of the third estate one hundred and eighty of the noblesse one hundred and thirty four of the clergy the king had given orders quote, to conduct each deputy as they arrived to his cabinet that he might see hear and know them all personally end quote. When the five hundred and five deputies had taken their places in the hall, the Duke of Guise went to fetch the king, who made his entry attended by the princes of the blood, and opened the session with the dignity and easy grace which all the Valois seemed to have inherited from Francis I. The Duke of Guise, in a coat of white satin, was seated at the king's feet, as high steward of his household, scanning the whole assembly with his piercing glance, as if to keep watch over those who were in his service. Quote, he seemed, says a contemporary, by a single flash of his eye to fortify them in the hope of the advancement of his designs, his fortunes and his greatness, and to say to them, without speaking, I see you. End quote. The king's speech was long, able, well delivered, and very much applauded, save by Guise himself and his particular friends. The firmness of tone had displeased them, and one sentence excited in them a discontent which they had found difficulty in restraining. Quote, certain grandees of my kingdom have formed such leagues and associations as in every well-ordered monarchy are crimes of high treason without the sovereign's permission but showing my wanted indulgence i am quite willing to let bygones be bygones in this respect guise grew pale at these words on leaving the royal session he got his private committee to decide that the cardinal of guise and the archbishop of lyons should go to see the king and beg him to abandon the printing of his speech and meanwhile guise himself sent to the printers to stop the immediate publication 
Discussion took place next day in the king's cabinet, and a threat was held out to him that a portion of the deputies would quit the meeting of states. The queen mother advised her son to compromise. The king yielded, according to his custom, and gave authority for cutting out the strongest expressions, amongst others those just quoted. Quote, the correction was accordingly made, says M. Picot, the latest and most able historian of the States-General and henry the third had to add this new insult to all that were rankling at the bottom of his heart since the affair of the barricades this was for the duke of guise a first trial of his power and great was his satisfaction at this first success on leaving the opening session of the states-general he wrote to the spanish ambassador mendoza quote, i handled our states so well that i made them resolve to require confirmation of the edict of union of july twenty one preceding as fundamental law of the state the king refused to do so in rather sharp terms to the deputies who brought the representation before him and from that it is presumed that he inclines towards a peace with the heretics but at last he was so pressed by the states the which were otherwise on the point of breaking up that he promised to swear the edict and have it sworn before entering upon consideration of any matter the next day but one in fact on the eighteenth of october at the second session of the states-general the edict of july twenty one was read and published with the greatest solemnity the king swore to maintain it in terms calculated to dissipate all anxieties on the part of the catholics the deputies swore after him the archbishop of bourges delivered an address on the sanctity of oaths and those present began to think the session over when the king rose a second time to recommend the deputies not to leave blois before the papers were drawn up and the ordinances made he reminded them that at the last assembly of the states the suggestions and counsels of the three estates had been so ill carried out that instead of a reformation and an establishment of good laws everything had been thrown into confusion accordingly the king added to this suggestion a solemn oath that he would not budge from the city until he had made an edict sacred and inviolable the enthusiasm of the deputies was at its height a rush took place to the church of saint sauveur to chant a te deum all the princes were there to give thanks to god never were king court and people so joyous the duke of guise wrote to the spanish ambassador quote, at length we have in full assembly of the states had our edict of union solemnly sworn and established as fundamental law of this realm having surmounted all the difficulties and hindrances which the king was pleased to throw in the way i found myself four or five times on the point of rupture but i was verily assisted by so many good men after as well as before the opening of the states-general the friends of the duke of guise were far from having all of them the same confidence that he had in his position and in his success quote, stupid owl of a lorrainer said sieur de vin commanding on behalf of the league in dauphiny on reading the duke's dispatches quote, has he so little sense as to believe that a king whose crown he by dissimulating has been wanting to take away is not dissimulating in turn to take away his life End quote. Quote, as they are so thick together said m de vin's sister when she knew that the duke of guise was at blois with the king you will hear at the very first opportunity that one or the other has killed his fellow End quote. guise himself was no stranger to this idea Quote, we are not without warnings from all quarters that there is a design of attempting my life he wrote on the twenty first of september fifteen eighty eight but i have thank god so provided against it both by the gathering i have made of a good number of my friends and in having by presents and money secured a portion of those whose services are relied upon for the execution of it that if once things begin i shall finish more roughly than i did at paris End quote after the opening of the states-general and the success he obtained thereat guise appeared if not more anxious at any rate more attentive to the warnings he received on the tenth of december fifteen eighty eight he wrote to commander moreo confidential agent from the king of spain to him quote, you cannot imagine what alarms have been given me since your departure i have so well provided against them that my enemies have not seen their way to attempting anything but expenses have grown upon me to such an extent that i have great need of your prompt assistance i have now so much credit with this assembly that i have hitherto made it dance to my tune and i hope that as to what remains to be decreed i shall be quite able to maintain the same authority 
Some of his partisans advised him to go away for a while to Orléans, but he absolutely refused, repeating, with the Archbishop of Lyon, quote, he who leaves the game loses it, end quote. One evening, in a little circle of intimates, on the 21st of December, a question arose whether it would not be advisable to prevent the king's designs by striking at his person. The Cardinal of Guise begged his brother to go away, assuring him that his own presence would suffice for the direction of affairs, but, quote, "'They are in such case, my friend,' said the Balafre, "'that if I saw death coming in at the window, I would not consent to go out by the door to avoid it.'" End quote. His cousin, the Duke of Elbeuf, paid him a visit at night to urge him to withdraw himself from the plot hatched against him. Quote, if it were necessary to lose my life in order to reap the proximate fruits of the state's good resolution, said Guise, that is quite what I have made up my mind to. Though I had a hundred lives, I would devote them all to the service of God and his church, and to the relief of the poor people for whom I feel the greatest pity. End quote. Then, touching the Duke of Elbeuf upon the shoulder, he said, quote, Go to bed, cousin. And taking away his hand, and laying it upon his own heart, he added, quote, here is the doublet of innocence. End quote. On the evening of the twenty second of December, fifteen eighty eight, when Charlotte de Semblancé, Marchioness of Noirmoutier, to whom he was tenderly attached, pressed him to depart, or at any rate not to be present at the council next day, the only answer he made her was to hum the following ditty by Desportes, a poet of the day quote, my little rose, a little spell of absence changed that heart of thine, and I, who know the change full well, have found another place for mine. No more such fair but fickle she shall find me her obedient, and flighty shepherdess will see which of the twain will first repent. End quote. Henry the Third was scarcely less disturbed, but in quite a different way, than the Duke of Guise. For a long time past he had been thinking about getting rid of the latter, just as he had thought for a long time, twenty years before, about getting rid of Admiral de Coligny. But since the date of his escape from the popular rising on the day of the barricades, he had hoped that thanks to the adoption of the Edict of Union, and to the convocation of the States General, he would escape the yoke of the Duke of Guise. He saw every day that he had been mistaken." The League, and consequently the Duke of Guise, had more power than he with the States-General. In vain had the King changed nearly all his ministers. In vain had he removed his principal favourite, the Duke of Epernon, from the government of Normandy to that of Provence. He did not obtain from the States-General what he demanded, that is, the money he wanted. And the States required of him administrative reforms, sound enough at bottom, but suggested by the Duke of Guise with an interested object, and calculated to shackle the kingly authority even more than could be done by Guise himself directly. At the same time that Guise was urging on the States General in this path, he demanded to be made constable, not by the king any longer, but by the States themselves. The kingship was thus being squeezed between the haughty supremacy of the great lords, substitutes for the feudal regimen, and the first essays of that free government which is nowadays called the parliamentary regimen. Henry the Third determined with fear and trembling to disembarrass himself of his two rivals, of the Duke of Guise by assassination, and of the States General by packing them off home. He did not know how intimately the two great questions of which the sixteenth century was the great cradle, the question of religious liberty and that of political liberty, were connected one with the other, and would be prosecuted jointly or successively in the natural progress of Christian civilization, or through what trials kings and people would have to pass before succeeding in any effectual solution of them. End of section 50《セクション51 of a popular history of France, volume 4. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A popular history of France from the earliest times, volume 4, by Francois Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 34. Henry the Third and the Religious Wars, 1574 to 1589, part 6. On the 18th of December, 1588, during an entertainment given by Catherine de Medici on the marriage of her niece, Christine de Lorraine, with Ferdinand de Medici, Grand Duke of Tuscany, Henry III summoned to his cabinet three of his most intimate and safest confidants, Marshal Daumont, 
Nicolas d'Angennes, Lord of Rambouillet, and Sieur de Beauvais Nangy. After having laid before them all the Duke of Guise's intrigues against him and the perils of the position in which they placed him, quote, What ought I to do? he said. Help me to save myself by some speedy means. End quote. They asked the king to give them twenty four hours to answer in. Next day, the 19th, Sieur de Maintenon, brother of Rambouillet, and Alfonso Corso d'Ornano were added to the party. Only one of them was of opinion that the Duke of Guise should at once be arrested and put upon his trial. The four others were for a shorter and a surer process, that of putting the Duke to death by a sudden blow. He is evidently making war upon the king, they said, and the king has a right to defend himself. Henry the Third, who had his mind made up, asked Crillon, commandant of the regiment of guards, quote, "Think you that the Duke of Guise deserves death?" End quote. Quote, yes, sir. End quote. Quote, Very well. Then I choose you to give it to him. End quote. Quote, I am ready to challenge him. End quote. Quote, that is not what is wanted. As leader of the league, he is guilty of high treason. End quote. Quote, very well, sir, then let him be tried and executed. End quote. Quote, but Crillon, nothing is less certain than his conviction in a court of law. He must be struck down unexpectedly. End quote. Quote, sir, I am a soldier, not an assassin. End quote. The king did not persist, but merely charged Crillon, who promised, to keep the proposal secret. At this very time, Guise was requesting the king to give him a constable's grand provost and archers to form his guard in his quality of lieutenant-general of the kingdom. The king deferred his reply. Catherine de' Medici supported the Lorrainer prince's request. Quote, in two or three days it shall be settled, said Henry. He had ordered twelve poniards from an armourer's in the city. On the 21st of December he told his project to Loignac an officer of his guards, who was less scrupulous than Crillon, and undertook to strike the blow, in concert with the forty-five trusty guards. At the council on the 22nd of December, the king announced his intention of passing Christmas in retreat at Notre-Dame de Cléry, and he warned the members of the council that next day the session would take place very early in order to dispose of business before his departure. On the evening of the 22nd, the Duke of Guise, on sitting down at table, found under his napkin a note to this effect, quote, The king means to kill you. End quote. Guise asked for a pen, wrote at the bottom of the note, quote, He dare not, end quote, and threw it under the table. Next day, December 23rd, Henry III, rising at 4 a.m. after a night of great agitation, admitted into his cabinet, by a secret staircase, the nine guards he had chosen, handed them the poniards he had ordered, placed them at the post where they were to wait for the meeting of the council, and bade Charles d'Entraigues to go and request one of the royal chaplains, quote, to say mass, that God might give the king grace to be able to carry out an enterprise which he hoped would come to an issue within an hour, and on which the safety of France depended. End quote. Then the king retired into his closet. The members of the council arrived in succession. It is said that one of the archers on duty, when he saw the Duke of Guise mounting the staircase, trod on his foot as if to give him warning. But if he observed it, Guise made no account of it, any more than of all the other hints he had already received. Before entering the council chamber, he stopped at a small oratory connected with the chapel, said his prayer, and as he passed the door of the Queen Mother's apartments, signified his desire to pay his respects and have a few words with her. Catherine was indisposed, and could not receive him. Some vexation, it is said, appeared in Guise's face, but he said not a word. On entering the council chamber, he felt cold, asked to have some fire lighted, and gave orders to his secretary, Pericard, the only attendant admitted with him, to go and fetch the silver gilt shell he was in the habit of carrying about him with damsons or other preserves to eat of a morning. Pericard was some time gone. Guise was in a hurry, and, quote, be kind enough, he said to M. de Morfontaine, to send word to M. de saint Prix, first groom of the chamber to Henry the Third, that I beg him to let me have a few damsons or a little preserve of roses or some trifle of the king's, end quote. Four brignol plums were brought him, and he ate one. His uneasiness continued. The eye close to his scar became moist. According to M. de Thou, he bled at the nose. He felt in his pocket for a handkerchief to use, but could not find one. Quote, my people, said he, have not given me my necessaries this morning. There is great excuse for them. They were too much hurried. At his request, Saint-Prix had a handkerchief brought to him. 
Pelicard passed his bonbon box to him, as the guards would not let him enter again. The duke took a few plums from it, threw the rest on the table, saying, quote, "'Gentlemen, who will have any?' and rose up hurriedly upon seeing the Secretary of State Revol, who came in and said to him, quote, "'Sir, the king wants you. He is in his old cabinet.' As soon as he knew that the Duke of Guise had arrived, and whilst these little incidents were occurring in the council chamber, Henry the Third had in fact given orders to his secretary, Revol, to go on his behalf and summon the Duke. But Nambu, usher to the council faithful to his instructions, had refused to let anybody, even the King's secretary, enter the hall. Revol, of a timid disposition, and impressed, it is said, with the sinister importance of his commission, returned to the cabinet with a very troubled air. The king, in his turn, was troubled, fearing lest his project had been discovered. Quote, "'What is the matter, Revol?' said he. "'What is it? How pale you are! You will spoil all! Rub your cheeks! Rub your cheeks!' End quote. Quote, "'There is nothing wrong, sir. Only M. de Nambu would not let me in without your majesty's express command.' End quote. Revol entered the council chamber and discharged his commission. The Duke of Guise pulled up his cloak as if to wrap himself well in it, took his hat, gloves, and his sweetmeat box, and went out of the room, saying, quote, Adieu, gentlemen, with a gravity free from any appearance of mistrust. He crossed the king's chamber contiguous to the council hall, courteously saluted, as he passed Loignac and his comrades, whom he found drawn up, and whom, returning him a frigid obeisance, followed him as if to show him respect. On arriving at the door of the old cabinet, and just as he leaned down to raise the tapestry that covered it, Guise was struck five poniard blows in the chest, neck, and reins. Quote, "'God have mercy!' he cried, and though his sword was entangled in his cloak, and he was himself pinned by the arms and legs, and choked by the blood that spurted from his throat, he dragged his murderers by a supreme effort of energy to the other end of the room, where he fell down backwards and lifeless before the bed of Henry the Third, who, coming to the door of his room and asking, quote, "'If it was done,' end quote, contemplated with mingled satisfaction and terror the inanimate body of his mighty rival." Quote, who seemed to be merely sleeping, so little was he changed. End quote. Quote, My God, how tall he is! cried the king. He looks even taller than when he was alive. End quote. Quote, they are killing my brother! cried the cardinal of Guise when he heard the noise that was being made in the next room, and he rose up to run thither. The archbishop of Lyon, Peter d'Espignac, did the same. The Duke of Aumont held them both back, saying, quote, Gentlemen, we must wait for the king's orders. End quote. Orders came to arrest them both and confine them in a small room over the council chamber. They had quote, eggs, bread, wine from the king's cellar, their breviaries, their nightgowns, a palliasse, and a mattress end quote, brought to them there, and they were kept under ocular supervision for four and twenty hours. The Cardinal of Guise was released the next morning, but only to be put to death like his brother. The king spared the Archbishop of Lyon. Quote, I am sole king, said Henry the Third to his ministers, as he entered the council chamber. And shortly afterwards, going to see the Queen Mother, who was ill of the gout, quote, How do you feel? he asked. Quote, Better, she answered. Quote, so do I, replied the king. I feel much better. This morning I have become king of France again. The king of Paris is dead. End quote. Quote, you have had the Duke of Guise killed? asked Catherine. Have you reflected well? God grant that you become not king of nothing at all. I hope the cutting is right. Now for the sewing. End quote. According to the majority of the historians, Catherine had neither been in the secret nor had anything to do with the preparations for the measure granted that she took no active part in it and that she avoided even the appearance of having any previous knowledge of it she was not fond of responsibility and she liked better to negotiate between the different parties than to make her decisive choice between them prudent tendencies grow with years and in fifteen eighty eight she was sixty nine it is difficult however to believe that being the habitual confidant of her favourite son she was ignorant of a design long meditated and known to many persons many days before its execution the event once accomplished ill as she was and contrary to the advice of her physicians she had herself carried to the cardinal of bourbon's who was still under arrest by the king's orders to promise him speedy release Quote, "'Ah, madame,' said the cardinal, as he saw her enter, "'these are some of your tricks. You are death to us all.'" End quote. 
however it may be thirteen days after the murder of the duke of guise on the fifth of january fifteen eighty nine catherine de medici herself died nor was her death so far as affairs and the public were concerned an event her ability was of the sort which is worn out by the frequent use made of it and which when old age comes on leaves no long or grateful reminiscence time has restored catherine de medici to her proper place in history she was quickly forgotten by her contemporaries she had good reason to say to her son as her last advice quote, now for the sewing end quote. it was not long before henry the third perceived that to be king it was not sufficient to have murdered his rival he survived the duke of guise only seven months and during that short period he was not really king all by himself for a single day never had his kingship been so embarrassed and impotent the violent death of the duke of guise had exasperated much more than enfeebled the league the feeling against his murderer was passionate and contagious the catholic cause had lost its great leader it found and accepted another in his brother the duke of mayenne far inferior to his elder brother in political talent and prompt energy of character but a brave and determined soldier a much better man of party and action than the sceptical undecided and indolent henry the third the majority of the great towns of france paris rouen orleans toulouse lyon amiens and whole provinces declared eagerly against the royal murderer he demanded support from the states-general, who refused it, and he was obliged to dismiss them. The Parliament of Paris, dismembered on the 16th of January, 1589, by the Council of Sixteen, became the instrument of the Leaguers. The majority of the other parliaments followed the example set by that of Paris. The Sorbonne, consulted by a petition presented in the name of all Catholics, decided that Frenchmen were released from their oath of allegiance to Henry the Third, and might, with a good conscience, turn their arms against him. Henry made some obscure attempts to come to an arrangement with certain chiefs of the Leaguers, but they were rejected with violence. The Duke of Mayenne, having come to Paris on the 15th of February, was solemnly received at Notre-Dame, amidst shouts of, Hurrah for the Catholic princes! Hurrah for the House of Lorraine! He was declared Lieutenant-General of the Crown and State of France. He organized a Council-General of the League, composed of forty members, and charged with the duty of providing for all matters of war, the finance, and the police of the realm, pending a fresh convocation of States-General to counterbalance in some degree the popular element mayenne introduced into it fourteen personages of his own choice and a certain number of magistrates and bishops the delegates of the united towns were to have seats at the council whenever they happened to be at paris Quote, never says m henri very truly could the league have supposed itself to be so near becoming a government of confederated municipalities under the directorate of paris End quote there was clearly for henry the third but one possible ally who had a chance of doing effectual service and that was henry of navarre and the protestants it cost henry the third a great deal to have recourse to that party his conscience and his pusillanimity both revolted at it equally in spite of his moral corruption he was a sincere catholic and the prospect of excommunication troubled him deeply catholicism besides was in a large majority in france how then was he to treat with its foes without embroiling himself utterly with it meanwhile the case was urgent henry was apprised by one of his confidants nicolas de rambouillet that one of the king of navarre's confidants sully who was then only sieur de rosny was passing by blois on his way to his master he saw him and expressed to him his quote, desire for a reconciliation with the king of navarre and to employ him on confidential service end quote the difficulty was to secure to the protestant king and his army then engaged in the siege of chatellerault a passage across the loire rosny undertook henry the third's commission he at the same time received another from sieur de brigueux governor of the little town of beaugency who said to him quote, i see well sir that the king is going the right way to ruin himself by timidity irresolution and bad advice and that necessity will throw us into the hands of the league for my part i will never belong to it and i would rather serve the king of navarre tell him that i hold at beaugency a passage over the loire and that if he will be pleased to send to me you or m de rebours i will admit into the town him who he sends to me End quote. upon receiving these overtures the king of navarre thought awhile scratching his head then he said to rosny quote, 
"'Do you think that the king has good intentions towards me, "'and means to treat with me in good faith?' End quote. Quote, "'Yes, sir, for the present, and you need have no doubt about it, "'for his straits constrain him thereto, "'having nothing to look to in his perils but your assistance.' End quote. "'He had some dinner brought into his own cabinet for Rosny, "'and then made him post off at once. "'On arriving in the evening at Tours, "'whither Henry the Third had fallen back, "'Rosny was taken to him about midnight at the top of the castle. "'The king sent him off that very night.' he consented to everything that the king of navarre proposed promised him a town on the loire and said he was ready to make with him not a downright peace just at first but quote, a good long truce which in their two hearts would at once be an eternal peace and a sincere reconciliation End quote. when rosny got back to chatellerault quote, there was nothing but rejoicing everybody ran to meet him he was called quote, god rosny end quote, and one of his friends said to the rest quote, do you see yon man by god we shall all worship him and he alone will restore france i said so six years ago and villandry was of my opinion end, quote. end of section fifty one section fifty two of a popular history of france volume four this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cathy Barrett. A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot. Translated by Robert Black. Chapter 34. Henry III and the Religious Wars, 1574 to 1589, Part 7. Thus was the way paved and the beginning made between the two kings of an alliance demanded by their mutual interests, and still more strongly by the interests of France, ravaged and desolated for nearly thirty years past by religious civil wars. Henry of Navarre had profound sympathy for his country's sufferings, an ardent desire to put a stop to them, and at the same time the instinct to see clearly that the day had come when the re-establishment of harmony and common action between himself and Henry de Valois was the necessary and at the same time possible means of attaining that great result. On the 4th of March, 1589, soon after the states of Blois had been dismissed, he set before France in an eloquent manifesto the expression of his anxieties and his counsels. Quote, I will speak freely, said he, to myself first and then to others, that we may be all of us without excuse. Let us not be puffed up with pride on one side or another. As for me, although I have received more favors from God in this than in all past wars, and whilst the two other parties, how sad that they must be so called, are enfeebled, mine, to all appearance, has been strengthened. Nevertheless, I well know that whenever I go beyond my duty, God will no longer bless me, and I shall do so whenever, without reason and in sheer lightness of heart, I attack my king and trouble the repose of his kingdom. I declare, then, first of all to those who belong to the party of the king my lord, that if they do not counsel him to make use of me, and of the means which god hath given me for to make war not on them of lorraine not on paris orleans or toulouse but on those who shall hinder the peace and the obedience owed to this crown they alone will be answerable for the woes which will come upon the king and the kingdom and as to those who still adhere to the name and party of the league i as a frenchman conjure them to put up with their losses as i do with mine and to sacrifice their quarrels vengeance and ambition to the welfare of france their mother to the service of their king to their own repose and ours if they do otherwise i hope that god will not abandon the king and will put it into his heart to call around him his servants myself the first who wish for no other title and who shall have sufficient might and good right to help him wipe out their memory from the world and their party from france i wish these written words to go proclaiming for me throughout the world that i am ready to ask my lord the king for peace for the repose of his kingdom and for my own and finally if i find one or another so sleepy-headed or so ill-disposed that none is moved thereby i will call god to my aid and true servant of my king worthy of the honour that belongs to me as premier prince of this realm though all the world should have conspired for its ruin i protest before god and before man that at the risk of ten thousand lives i will essay all alone to prevent it End quote. 
it is pleasing to think that this patriotic step and these powerful words were not without influence over the result which was attained the king of navarre set to work at the same time with rosny one of the most eminent and with philippe du plessis mornay the most sterling of his servants and a month after the publication of his manifesto on the third of april fifteen eighty nine a truce for a year was concluded between the two kings it set forth that the king of navarre should serve the king of france with all his might and main that he should have for the movements of his troops on both banks of the loire the place of saumur that the places of which he had made himself master should be handed over to henry the third and that he might not anywhere do anything to the prejudice of the catholic religion that the protestants should be no more disquieted throughout the whole of france and that before the expiration of the truce king henry the third should give them assurance of peace this negotiation was not concluded without difficulty especially as regarded the town of saumur there was a general desire to cede to the king of navarre only some place of less importance on the loire and when on the fifteenth of april du plessis mornay who had been appointed governor of it presented himself for admittance at the head of his garrison the royalist commandant who had to deliver the keys to him limited himself to letting them drop at his feet mornay showed alacrity in picking them up on the twenty ninth of april the two kings had each on his own behalf made their treaty public Henry the Third sent word to the King of Navarre that he wished to see him and have some conversation with him. Many of the King of Navarre's friends dissuaded him from this interview, saying, quote, They are traitors. Do not put yourself in their power. Remember the St. Bartholomew. End quote. This counsel was repeated to him on the 30th of April, at the very moment when he was stepping aboard the boat to cross the Loire and go to pay Henry the Third a visit at the castle of Plessis les Tours the king of navarre made no account of it quote, god hath bidden me to cross and see him he answered it is not in the power of man to keep me back for god is guiding me and crossing with me of that i am certain End quote. and he crossed the river quote, it is incredible says l'estoile what joy everybody felt at this interview there was such a throng of people that notwithstanding all efforts to preserve order the two kings were a full quarter of an hour in the roadway of plessis park holding out their hands to one another without being able to join them people climbed trees to see them all shouted with great vigour and exultation hurrah for the king hurrah for the king of navarre hurrah for the kings at last having joined hands they embraced very lovingly even to tears the king of navarre on retiring in the evening said i shall now die happy since god hath given me grace to look upon the face of my king and make him an offer of my services i know not if those were his words but what is certain is that everybody at this time both kings and people except fanatical leaguers regarded peace as a great public blessing and were rejoiced to have a prospect of it before their eyes the very day of the interview the king of navarre wrote to du plessis mornay monsieur du plessis the ice is broken not without numbers of warnings that if i went i was a dead man i crossed the water commending myself to god who by his goodness not only preserved me but caused extreme joy to appear on the king's countenance and the people to cheer so that never was the like even shouting hurrah for the kings whereat i was much vexed End quote some days afterwards during the night of may eight the duke of mayenne made an attack upon tours and carried for the moment the faubourg saint symphorien which gave henry the third such a fright that he was on the point of leaving the city and betaking himself to a distance but the king of navarre warned in time entered tours and at his approach the leaguers fell back Quote, when the white scarfs appeared coming to the king's rescue the duke of mayenne and his troops began shouting to them back white scarves back chatillon we are not set against you but against the murderers of your father meaning thereby that they were set against king henry de valois only and not against the huguenots but chatillon amongst the rest answered them you are all of you traitors to your country i trample under foot all vengeance and all private interests when the service of my prince and of the state is concerned which he said so loudly that even his majesty heard it and praised him for it and loved him for it End quote. the two kings determined to move on paris and besiege it and towards the end of july their camp was pitched before the walls 
Great was the excitement throughout Europe as well as France, at the courts of Madrid and Rome, as well as in the park of Plessis-les-Tours. A very serious blow for Philip II, and a very bad omen for the future of his policy, was this alliance between Henry de Valois and Henry of Navarre, between a great portion of the Catholics of France and the Protestants. Philip II had plumed himself upon being the patron of absolute power in religious as well as political matters, and the dominant power throughout Europe in the name of Catholicism and Spain. In both these respects he ran great risk of being beaten by a king of France who was a Protestant or an ally of Protestants and supported by the Protestant influence of England, Holland, and Germany. In Italy itself and in Catholic Europe Philip did not find the harmony and support for which he looked. The Republic of Venice was quietly but certainly well disposed towards France, and determined to live on good terms with a king of France, a friend of Protestants, or even himself Protestant. And what hurt Philip II still more was that Pope Sixtus V himself, though all the while upholding the unity and authority of the Roman Church, was bent upon not submitting to the yoke of Spain, and upon showing a favorable disposition towards France. Quote, France is a very noble kingdom, he said to the Venetian ambassador Gritti. The church has always obtained great advantages from her. We love her beyond measure, and we are pleased to find that the seigneurie shares our affection. End quote. Another day he expressed to him his disapprobation of the League. Quote, we cannot praise, indeed we must blame, the first act committed by the Duke of Guise, which was to take up arms and unite with other princes against the king. Though he made religion a pretext, he had no right to take up arms against his sovereign. End quote. And again, quote, the union of the King of France with the heretics is no longer a matter of doubt. But after all, Henry of Navarre is worth a great many of Henry the Third. This latter will have the measure he meted to the Guises. End quote. So much equity and mental breadth on the Pope's part was better suited for the Republic of Venice than for the King of Spain. Quote, we have but one desire, wrote the Doge Cicogna to Bodero, his ambassador at Rome, and that is to keep the European peace. We cannot believe that Sixtus V, that great pontiff, is untrue to his charge, which is to ward off from the Christian world the dangers that threaten it. In imitation of him whom he represents on earth, he will show mercy, and not proceed to acts which would drive the King of France to despair. End quote. During the great struggle with which Europe was engaged in the sixteenth century, the independence of states, religious tolerance, and political liberty thus sometimes found, besides their regular and declared champions, protectors, useful on occasion although they were timid, even amongst the habitual allies of Charles V's despotic and persecuting successor. On arriving before Paris towards the end of July, 1589, the two kings besieged it with an army of 42,000 men, the strongest and the best they had ever had under their orders. Quote, the affairs of Henry III, says de Thou, had changed face. Fortune was pronouncing for him. End quote. Quartered in the house of Count de Retz at Saint-Cloud, he could thence see quite at his ease his city of Paris. Quote, Yonder, said he, is the heart of the League. It is there that the blow must be struck. It was great pity to lay in ruin so beautiful and goodly a city. Still, I must settle accounts with the rebels who are in it, and who ignominiously drove me away. End quote. Quote, On Tuesday, August the 1st, at 8 a.m., he was told, says L'Etoile, that a monk desired to speak with him, but that his guards made a difficulty about letting him in. Let him in, said the king. If he is refused, it will be said that I drive monks away and will not see them incontinently entered the monk, having in his sleeve a knife unsheathed. He made a profound reverence to the king, who had just got up and had nothing on but a dressing-gown about his shoulders, and presented to him dispatches from Count de Brienne, saying that he had further orders to tell the king privately something of importance. Then the king ordered those who were present to retire, and began reading the letter which the monk had brought, asking for a private audience afterwards. The monk, seeing the king's attention taken up with reading, drew his knife from his sleeve and drove it right into the king's small gut, below the navel, so home that he left the knife in the hole, the which the king, having drawn out with great exertion, struck the monk a blow with the point of it on his left eyebrow, crying, "'Ah, wicked monk! He has killed me! Kill him!' 
at which cry running quickly up, the guards and others, such as happened to be nearest, massacred this assassin of a Jacobin, who, Dobing says, stretched out his two arms against the wall, counterfeiting the crucifix, whilst the blows were dealt him. Having been dragged out dead from the king's chamber, he was stripped naked to the waist, covered with his gown, and exposed to the public. End quote. Whilst Henry de Valois was thus struck down at St. Cloud, Henry of Navarre had moved with a good number of troops to the Pré aux Clairs. And seeing Rosny, who was darting along, pistol in hand, amongst the foremost, he called one of his gentlemen and said, quote, Megna, go and tell M. de Rosny to come back. He will get taken or wounded in that rash style. End quote. Quote, I should not care to speak so to him, answered Megna. I will tell him that your majesty wants him. End quote. Meanwhile up came a gentleman at a gallop, who said three or four words in the King of Navarre's ear. Quote, My friend, said Henry to Rosny, the king has just been wounded with a knife in the stomach. Let us go and see about it. Come with me. End quote. Henry took with him five and twenty gentlemen. The king received him affectionately, exhorted him to change his religion for his salvation's sake in another world, and his fortunes in this and addressing the people of quality who thronged his chamber he said quote, i do pray you as my friends and as your king i order you to recognize after my death my brother here for my satisfaction and as your bounden duty i pray you to swear it to him in my presence End quote. all present took the oath henry the third spoke in a firm voice and his wound was not believed to be mortal letters were sent in his name to the queen to the governors of the provinces and to the princes allied to the crown to inform them of the accident that had happened to the king quote, which please god will turn out to be nothing End quote. the king of navarre asked for some details as to the assassin james clement was a young dominican who according to report had been a soldier before he became a monk he was always talking of waging war against henry de valois and he was called quote, Captain Clement. End quote. He told a story about a vision he had of an angel, who had bidden him quote, to put to death the tyrant of France, in return for which he would have the crown of martyrdom. End quote. Royalist writers report that he had been placed in personal communication with the friends of Henry de Guise, even with his sister, the Duchess of Montpensier, and his brother, the Duke of Mayenne. When well informed of the facts, the King of Navarre returned to his quarters at Meudon and rosny to his lodging at the foot of the castle whilst rosny was at supper his secretary came and said to him quote, sir the king of navarre peradventure the king of france wants you m d'ortomain writes to him to make haste and come to st cloud if he would see the king alive End quote. the king of navarre at once departed just as he arrived at st cloud he heard in the streets cries of quote, ah my god we are lost End quote he was told that the king was dead. Henry III, in fact, expired on the 2nd of August, 1589, between two and three in the morning. The first persons Henry of Navarre encountered as he entered the Hotel de Retz were the officers of the Scottish Guard, who threw themselves at his feet, saying, quote, Ah, sir, you are now our king and our master. End, quote. End of section 52 End of A Popular History of France from the Earliest Times, Volume 4, by François Guizot.